What visited me in the night? I was young. I grew up on the outskirts of a small town in the Midwest. It was close to the Great Lakes. The town had a population of about 8,000 at the time and was established in 1833. We lived well outside of town in an area that was mostly well, either forest or farmland. There was a small trailer park fairly close on the other side of the railroad tracks, built on a raised mound so high that you couldn't even see the trailer park from the second floor of our house. But to give you an idea how remote we were, the half a mile stretch in the other direction only had three other houses and only on one side of the road. After that, there was a two and a half stretch of pretty much nothing but trees or crops before you reached the town proper. At the time, I would have called the farmhouse we lived in a mansion, but I was very small. We lived there for about five years, moving in about the time I just entered kindergarten. In retrospect, and looking at it on Google Street View now, it was a fairly small farmhouse, probably built in the early 1900s. The Property While this isn't directly related to the events I'll discuss later, it occurs to me it might be relevant. So I'm going to, well, I'm just going to include it now. We owned six acres of land, and even then I knew I was fortunate to have so much room to explore and play in. The property was much longer than it was wide. The house sat fairly close to the road and the mass of land had been cleared that I now assumed to be used as farmland for crops. There was a ring of trees around the perimeter and a well-worn walking path adjacent to the ring of trees. Outside of a very small grove of apple trees directly next to the house towards the front of the property, the rest of the land was an empty field full of tall weeds. While I spent most of my time playing and exploring in the closest half of the property, I would never go back in the acres alone. The stretch of trees to the north didn't bother me, nor did the patch of trees in thick forest to the northwest. The patch to the southwest, however, terrified me. I would never go anywhere near it alone, or even if I ventured that far with friends or adults made me extremely uncomfortable being near that forested corner. I occasionally still have nightmares about that patch. The Wood Pile Closer to the house, right at the start of the path to the back acres, was a massive wood pile that I spent a good deal of my time playing in. It was easily five feet if not six feet high, as tall if not taller than an adult and I'm pretty sure larger than our house. It was composed of irregular shaped planks that were made by cutting the slightly rounded edges off trees. I'm not a woodcutter, nor do I know the process, but it always hit me as odd that so much timber was left behind. While the planks were too rounded and irregular to be in shape for use in construction, it seemed like a lot of timber that could have been ground up to make particle board. I assume the wood pile was like a byproduct of clearing the land for farmland. Again, not a woodcutter, but I will mention that there were no tree trunks to be seen, nor were any stumps left in the woodpile. They obviously must have been piled up in the clearing process, but no idea what happened to them, or why they were hauled off while the irregular planks were left to rot. I can only assume this mini logging operation had happened a number of years before, probably decades. The planks were extremely old and weathered from the elements, and very, very brittle. Even though many had sections as thick as 2 by 4 they were prone to break under the weight of my small frame, and if I had put my mind to it, I was capable of breaking them in half with my 5 to 10 year old strength. I only bring all this up to establish that the land was not being used for what it was intended to be. In fact, pulling it up on Google Maps to this day, those six acres are still not used for farming, even though nearly all of the surrounding plots now are. 
the house. The house was completely square. On the bottom floor, half was divided between a dining room and a front room, and the other half split between a master bedroom with the remaining space divided between the kitchen and two flights of stairs. One leading down to an entryway, which included another flight of stairs down at the basement, and the other leading upstairs. I don't think it was remodeled. I think the upstairs were designed to basically be a livable attic. You went up half a flight of stairs to a small landing, then had to turn 180 degrees to another half flight of stairs that led up to a long alcove. From the alcove, you had two doors on either side, one to a small bedroom and one to a slightly larger L-shaped bedroom. Both bedrooms were equipped with two insanely large walk-in closets and storage areas. They sloped due to the roof, but they were large enough that my older brother used one as his bedroom, so he had enough space for couches in the bedroom proper to hanging out with his friends in. The slightly larger bedroom that eventually became mine was large enough to fit two double beds in comfortably, plus a large chest of doors and plenty of floor space to play in. Closets are scary when you're a kid, large ones even more so. Mine were large enough to fit every conceivable monster my mind could imagine. More than enough room for Dracula, a wolfman, the boogeyman, and plenty of room for a Bigfoot or two. My parents weren't much for molly coddling, and I was expected to go to bed for myself every night. There's a small window on the stairway landing that allowed some light from the yard security light, but when you made that 180 turn, you were standing at a flight of stairs leading up to pitch darkness where the next light switch could be found. Not too proud to admit that most nights, I made that ascent crying in fear. The Household I have a large family, but my siblings were all much older, and every year saw another one striking out on their own and a number of us just dwelling there getting consistently smaller. One might come to visit or stay briefly when times are tough, but we went from six when we first moved in to eventually two to four. My father traveled for work, and my older teenage brother spent most of his time out running around. So by the time I was nine, most nights it was just me and my mom. Putting this as politely as I can, my closest brother is much older than me a high school jock and kind of a dick. Even for brothers, I can't say a relationship was good at that point. Most of our interactions went between him ignoring me to tormenting me for his own amusement. I tended to avoid him as much as possible because our time spent together was never enjoyable and usually ended with me crying or our mom screaming, Leave your brother alone. The Encounter Honestly, almost no idea when this happened. Couldn't tell you what season, and only slightly comfortable in guessing it was probably about the time I was eight. Maybe barely after I turned nine. The only thing I can say for certain is, my father was away in business at the time, and while I'd share my bedroom with my older sister for the first few years, she moved out, and I had the bedroom to myself. Old houses creak. They creak and moan as they settle. Most nights I'd lie in bed terrified, listening to these sounds trying to convince myself it wasn't a monster coming to get me. Eventually a train would pass by and the motion of it shaking the house would always put me to sleep. <laughs> Weird, right? So I assume it was a night like any other. If I'd seen a scary movie or read a horror story... I'd walk up the stairs in fear and lay in bed listening to every small noise wondering what it was, until a train rocked me to sleep. Barring a nightmare, I almost never woke up in the middle of the night. I would usually be sleeping until the sun came up, or if my mom would wake me up, whichever would come first. I didn't have an alarm clock, and I have no memory of there ever being a clock in my room. Total stab in the dark 
But sometime after midnight, I was awoken to a sound outside my bedroom door, a little alcove. I'd have to say I was a fairly sound sleeper back then, because I don't ever remember being woken up by my brother coming home or any other sound for that matter. But this time, I was woken up by a very slow, very long creak of floorboards. The first immediate thought was it was the house settling, and I turned over to go back to sleep. But it didn't stop. The sound of footsteps in each creak just took forever. I wasn't even scared at first, just curious trying to figure it out. Way more noise than the house would make, but if it was someone out there... They were just moving very insanely slow. No sounds of footfall if it was someone. They'd just about have to be barefoot or in socks. Just the slow sound of one floorboard groaning in protest of the pressure followed painfully slowly by another floorboard groaning in relief as the pressure was removed. I sat up in bed just listening and arguing with myself. Something has to be there. There's no way anyone is there. It's just the house making noises. It was so slow, it wasn't even scaring me. It was just me listening intently to it. And it went on forever. Easily 20 minutes or more. Long enough that I eventually was convinced it sounded like nothing more than maybe my brother creeping home late and trying not to wake anyone up or even someone breaking in and trying to steal things in the dark without making a sound. It seemed very much like the sound of something pacing very slowly back and forth, directly in front of my door. The noise would slowly, ever so slowly, move left for a while, then so slowly move back in the opposite direction, like it had no destination in mind. Eventually I was convinced. Okay. This is absolutely not my imagination. Someone has to be there. I suspected my brother was trying to scare me. I went to call his name and found my voice frozen in my throat. My mother was sleeping directly below me, and I could absolutely hear if I would scream, and if it was my brother pranking me, yelling would be put to an end. But I never felt such terror in my life at just the thought of yelling. At that age, yelling chases everything bad away and brings your mother to your rescue. But all I felt was pure dread at the thought of releasing a scream. Then I heard the sound of the doorknob moving and had any doubt that I wasn't alone being completely erased. I dove under the covers and balled myself up. Just like the creaking, the sound of the door was painfully slow. Like a three-year-old trying to open a door unable to get a good grip. I could hear it slowly turning and then stopping. An attempt at turning then released. Just for freaking ever. I had a mental image of my brother in a sheet trying to scare me. But even at the time, it just seemed so weird. Why is he doing it this way? I could see him spending a few minutes wandering in the alcove, moaning like a ghost at the top of his lungs, until he was sure I was awake, then jumping on the bed and making me cry and laugh at me. But this style of dramatic seemed unnecessary and unlike him. After easily a dozen clumsy attempts, the doorknob was finally turned enough to open the door. Barely. You could hear the door barely moving away from the frame. Not nearly far enough for anything to fit, though. Now came the sound of something pushing on the door without enough force to open it. The door would creak slightly, open a bit, and then fall backwards to a near-closed position over and over. Like everything up to this took for frickin' ever. Me shaking under my blanket the whole time. Even allowing for a child's perception of time... I can say with confidence that we were easily at the 30 minute mark at this point. Probably much, much longer. Minimum of 30 minutes from the first time I heard the creaking of the floorboards outside of my room to the time the door was finally pushed with enough force to finally swing completely open. And that's when the groaning started.
Let me stress that this wasn't the high-pitched stereotypical look at me pretending to be a ghost moaning. This was sporadic elderly person trying to get out of bed groaning. When the door opened, I was expecting or hoping for a grand finale of my brother running around making a ghost noise at the top of his lungs. But what I got was a continuation of the slow creeping on floorboards toward my bed, now accompanied by a low groan. Like everything else so far, it was insanely stretched out and just painful waiting for what was going to happen next. By this point, I was completely balled into a fetal position, trying my best to not even cry or breathe, terrified to make even the slightest sound. Spoiler. This shit goes on for hours. I'm fully aware time moves slower for kids, but this would extend until just shy of dawn. Even if it started as late as three in the morning during the summer when nights are shortest, and I'm pretty sure it didn't happen in summer. I don't remember feeling overheated under the blankets. We're still looking at two or three hours minimum. So the entity circles the bed in what felt like forever. Somewhere about an hour in, it starts touching me. I can feel a barely there brush that would eventually, oh so slowly, become a very light poke. Somewhere before dawn, it just stopped. While I allow for my eventually falling asleep, I can't imagine sleep taking me when I was so frozen with fear and quivering violently. It just stopped. The touching and poking came at a nail's, snail's pace. And when I went five minutes without being touched, it felt like it was just looming over me. I never heard the sound of leaving. No slow departure, no creaking of floorboards, it just stopped. I waited until the room was completely illuminated, not even feeling safe to come out from under the covers when I could tell the sun was breaking. I scrambled down the stairs to tell my mom what happened, and I'm fairly certain it was a Sunday morning. Didn't have to go to school and wasn't worried about watching cartoons. I started babbling to my mom about seeing a ghost. She was irritated and didn't get a lot of days of sleep in and wasn't willing to give up her extra sleep for my imagination. She wasn't interested in hearing about it, so I caught a few hours of sleep in her bed. For years, I'd tell my friends about the night I saw a ghost. But as I got older, I realized it probably was just my older brother playing a trick on me. The Reveal my brother is still a bit of an ass, but that's just his way. When I reached adulthood, we'd get closer and form a much stronger bond. He's got his own way, but he tried to be a better big brother after I hit my teens than he ever did when I was a kid. But he still revels in the various pranks that he might pull on me. He very frequently feels the need to remind me that at one point he held all the cards. If I was playful or sometimes resentfully bringing up some of the shittier things he did, he'd gloat about it with a big grin as if remembering better days. So one holiday when I'd hit my thirties, I stayed late after a family dinner and it was just the two of us drinking coffee and talking. He has always brought up something he did to me when I was young tricking me into eating dog food when I was three, making me lick nine-volt batteries, tricking me into thinking on accident meant intentionally. So it was harder to snitch on him. Take your pick. It's a long list. And I realized that we'd never talk about it. So I threw out dressing up as a ghost to scare the shit out of me, and he countered with, What? I figured this had to be the biggest jewel in his prankster crown, Without a doubt, the most elaborate and time-intensive trick he'd ever pulled off on me. Figured he'd laugh heartily and brag about how he scared me, and how he got me. You know, and gave some details to Jock's memory. I, I never did that. Considering he remembers every crappy little thing he did to me when he was 8, 10, and 12, etc. Can't imagine something this big slipping his mind. Like I said, it never seemed his style. He was big, well, he wasn't big on subtlety. 
way more of a quick scare, make you laugh and cry in your face type. Usually very low effort for his payouts. I don't think he forgot. I have no reason to believe he's lying. Not admitting it is not a style at all. So, what happened to me? The Very Odd House Background Back in the 80s, my dad had a heart attack which put us in a bit of a financial bind. Things were tight for a while. After an aggressive bill collector got my dad worked up again, he had another heart attack. And long story short, we ended up losing our house. Outside of a brief transitional period when we relocated to another state for the first time in my life, we were no longer homeowners and money was extremely tight. I have absolutely no idea how my parents came in contact with the person who'd set us up with our next residence, quote-unquote. But eventually, they'd find us a new house which could be rented on our budget. The house. From the outside, it did look like a house, mostly. We were living in a small southern town, which at one point had been considered a very large southern town but not for a good 50 years. The building in question had most likely been built sometime between 1910 and 30. There were a few theories to what this basically abandoned building used to be. One being that it might have been a small shipping company with bedrooms to accommodate drivers overnight. Honestly, I don't think it was big enough to handle much cargo, so I lean more toward the second theory. My father suspected at one point it had been a type of company-owned boarding house where two people could live together. Each would have a side where they would have their own individual offices and bedrooms, then share a kitchen and a living room area. It was also built into a lot right next to a large brick lumber yard. It's possible that at one time it was connected to that business. The house was a large square divided into three equal sections. In the middle was a large living room area, a kitchen with a bathroom attached. On either side of that were three more rooms, one medium, one small, and one large. They were all proper bedrooms with a private bathroom. Each medium room at the front of the house had its own door for entry, but no closets. It wasn't practical as a bedroom at all which comes back to the theory that it was mostly designed to be a small office with its own entry point. All in all, the building had five doors to the outside, three in the front, and one on each side to the smaller rooms. I have no idea what it was used for, before how long it had sat empty. Easily at least ten years. Probably longer. It was in rough condition, the deal my parents had made with our new landlord was that we would handle the cleaning and the manual labor to fix the place up, and they would supply bare materials needed, but rent it to us at a reasonable price. It needed a lot of work. It was during summer break, and for weeks we would put in 12-hour days cleaning and fixing and painting and repairing the house before returning to the house that we were losing. Exhausted. It had been sitting so long and everything had to be scrubbed before we could even put a coat of paint down. The dust and grime was so thick you couldn't just paint over it. All the rooms were covered with the ugliest, faded, most out-of-date wallpaper you can imagine. Probably from like the 50s or 60s. The three-dimensional type with the fuzzy textures. We put up wood paneling over it and it was a dramatic improvement. After weeks of work, overlooking the really weird layout, we had a fairly homey-feeling residence all to ourselves. If you overlook the massive weirdness in my room... The screen windows. This was the first thing I noticed, and it creeped me out for a reason I couldn't really describe. All of my screen windows were covered with bobby pins. The screen windows were old, 
the likes I've never seen in my lifetime. Thick, solid wood frames covered with chipping black paint. The metal mesh wasn't anything like we're accustomed to in the modern age. At least twice as thick, probably more, and made from an alloy that wasn't weatherproof. They were all rusty. But on each window screen, there were at least 20 or 30 bobby pins inserted into them. If it had just been lower down, I wouldn't have thought a bored little girl maybe might have put them there. But they were all over the whole screen. Even an adult would have had needed a ladder to insert higher up ones. There was no discernible pattern, and I could recognize at least. All I knew is that it seemed to be very deliberate. It wasn't something done on a whim or out of boredom. My room was the only one that had bobby pins on the screen windows. In fact, everything I described was unique to my room. The bedroom on the opposite side had none of these anomalies. The windows. The windows were nailed shut, all of them. Five or six nails per window. I don't know why. It turns out, really, that the windows had been painted over enough times that even when I pulled the nails out, it was still too stuck, made me unable to open the windows. They were basically glued shut with paint. Whoever had stayed there at one point, though, really didn't want anyone coming through a window. This included the bathroom window. The bathroom window wasn't even half a window. It was so high you could barely see it of it. Since the building was built up on concrete blocks from the outside, the bathroom window was at least six feet off the ground. Even if you could fit through it, you'd need a fairly tall ladder to access it. Nonetheless, it was nailed shut. Again, only in my room. No other windows were nailed shut in the house. The bathroom. All original fixtures. The bathtub was exactly that. An old-school 1920s standalone porcelain bathtub, complete with the little feet. That's called a clawfoot tub. The most offsetting part about the bathroom, though, was the sliding lock. It wasn't inside the bathroom like you would expect. There was no lock inside the bathroom for privacy. But the biggest sliding lock in the whole house was on the outside of my bathroom as if someone was so afraid that something was going to come in for them that they needed an extra layer of protection on top of having the window nailed shut. And yeah, it did cross my mind that maybe it was being used to lock someone into the bathroom, but that didn't really make much sense. If they needed to, they could just break the window and escape that way. The other two bathrooms in the house had hook latches on the inside like you'd expect for privacy. The closets. Both bedrooms had two closets. One smaller closet that was just big enough for our hanging clothes and slightly larger storage closet. It's all about to get a whole lot weirder. Nothing was odd about the smaller closet. There was a lot going on with the other one, though. It was a decent-sized closet, large enough that you could walk into it. It was big enough to fit my dresser and a rack of bookshelves above it and on one side. The other side had a set of deep wood shelves that were large enough to hold a full old school stereo system, which is what I used them for. Outside of bobby pins, the next thing I noticed was the doorknob to the closet was different. It was different than any other one in the house. All the other doorknobs were rounded and made of tin or lead or bronze. I don't know, whatever old doorknobs are made of. This one was painted white with an oddly shape to it. I had suspicions, and after testing my theory, sure enough, it was of crystal or cut glass. I spent part of the day cleaning off all the paint and felt weirdly fancy for having a nice doorknob. Weird part was, it was the only one on one side. There was no knob on the inside. The door could not be opened from the inside, and, like the bathroom, there was a sliding lock on this closet's door. Inside the closet was the weirdest part. The picture. 
the picture was adhered, excuse me, the picture was adhered to a large, smooth, rounded edged square of glass. I believe it was made to be a paperweight. The glass was at least an inch thick and had some weight to it. The picture was a black and white image of a couple from probably the 30s or 40s. It could have been a man with his wife, a father with his daughter, or even a grandfather and his middle-aged daughter, I don't know. Because the part of the photo had their heads in it, it had been sort of sliced off. One long, straight, and even slightly diagonal cut was most likely a razor having sliced their heads clean off. While a very large part of me wanted to throw the picture away, something told me I shouldn't. It was very literally the only thing left in the house and apparently a number of other people had made the same decision. Just leave the creepy photo where you found it, because someone put it there for a reason. I stashed it in the back of the closet where I found it and tried not to think about it. The Encounter I'm going to skip all the could-have-been-my-imagination encounters. All the bumps in the night, all the feelings of someone else being in the room with me, the sudden cold spots like something walked through you, hell, even the sound of a closet door creaking open, even though that was witnessed by friends spending the night, or even the night I woke up to a very distinct sound of breaking glass, couldn't find anything broken in the room after. I can dismiss all of this as a teenager's overactive imagination. I'm just going to cover the one. There's no way that was my imagination sort of event. Prior to moving in, we had raised large dogs. Since we were moving into an unfenced, smaller property, we had to put our dogs up for adoption so they could have you know, more room that they needed to move around. They were given to friends and family. It was probably harder on us than the dogs. They had a nice yard and they were well taken care of. So, when we made the move, I adopted a kitten. My mom adopted one of those annoying, bug-eyed, yippy lap dogs. No idea which kind. She had a few over the years. At the risk of being a dick, I hated that dog. My own, well... My one housewarming gift was to get a small throw rug so I wasn't met with the cold hardwood floor and my feet first thing in the morning. Mom's dog had a tendency to sneak into my room in the middle of the night and use my rug as its personal bathroom. You wake up a few times where the first thing you feel is your foot going into a cold puddle of pee or straight into a pile of dog crap. You'd probably feel the same way I did about that dog. A month or two, and a number of strange encounters later, I get into bed one night. It had to be fall, probably late September or October. I get under the blankets and immediately feel my cat jump on my bed and crop next to my feet. I hear the door creak open slightly and my eyes narrow. It was most likely my mom's dog coming into my room to go potty on my rug. I shift myself into hunting position. I have thick curtains and there's not a lot of light in the room at night. I'm going off sound and I wait until I'm sure I'm hearing the dog reaching my rug. I can still feel my cat against my feet. Once I hear the movement close enough, I lurch down and snatch the barely visible shadow figure on my rug with a I gotcha, you little shit. I'm met with a confused meow. <coughs> And I realized I wasn't grabbing my dog's dog, or sorry, my mom's dog. I was scooping up my own cat. Then what's at the foot of my bed against my foot? I already have my cat in my arms. I fly out of my bed, clutching my cat, and scramble through my room in the dark and throw the light switch on. Nothing. Just me and my cat. Nothing on the bed at all. I go to sleep in the couch. There was no way I was going back into that room. There's absolutely no mistaking or imagining the weight of something jumping on the bed near your feet, let alone pressing it against you. Something had been in the bed with me, but my cat obviously came in after the fact. I'd heard the door open and tracked the sound of the movement in the dark, thinking it was my mom's dog. The only other animal in the house, too. But when the lights came up, 
there were only two of us, even though I know I could feel something against my feet after I had my cat in my hands. Aftermath My friends were already well familiar with all the weirdness of my new place. A few had already spent the night and found it unsettling themselves. On a friend's recommendation, we go and talk to that one weird teacher I'm pretty sure every school has. The one that's into white magic and astrology or other assorted hippie-type activities. Usually the art teacher, or it was in our case. From her advice, I started filling my room with various crystals, mostly amethyst, since it's supposed to have protective powers. A good part of the money from my part-time job would go into buying crystals for a while, geode crystals and whatever. I had dozens of them all over my room after that, most of them in or around the one closet with the lock on the outside and the creepy picture inside of it. After a while, the activity would almost completely stop, leaving just a general creepy vibe. I'd never talk directly to my mother about any of this, because I didn't want her to blame it on the music I was listening to or the games I was playing. Other Gen Xers will have a better idea of the general attitude towards certain bands or Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s. Mom apparently felt something was off in the house too, though. She was a Christian and always had a house blessed before he moved in. The local pastor would come in, say some prayers, sprinkle some holy water around. This time was no exception, outside of the fact that it didn't seem to help. Six or so months in, my mom did something unusual. She decided to have the house blessed again with a different church. I wasn't there for the first blessing, but I was for the second. I followed behind them, curious to see how they'd react when they hit my room. It was a different pastor and three or four members of the church. They would walk into each room and instead of holy water, the pastor was anointing the corner of each room with olive oil. Maybe it was because of all my heavy metal posters, but I found it amusing that the whole group of them became visibly uncomfortable as soon as they hit my room. The prayers got faster and shorter. He only anointed two of the four corners as they scampered out as quickly as they could. This always stuck with me. The olive oil he touched all the corners with in the other rooms either evaporated or were absorbed without trace. Except one corner of my room. In only that one spot it left a fingerprint-shaped stain in the wood paneling that may still be there to this day. I can vouch that it lasted for at least seven years afterwards. No idea why, but it reacted differently in my room than it had in all the other rooms in the house. Pulled it up on Google Maps, and it looks like it was the southeast corner of the room, in case anybody has a theory about that. The Steps, the Blow, and the Watch I'm fairly new to this, but after reading so many stories inspired me to share mine. Some might say it's fake and that's fine, but it's incredibly real to me, and although I'm 19, this still happens. So here's the backstory. I grew up in Stockton which was always moving around until I was about seven. That was when my mom bought our first house, and we got to settle down. This house wasn't old, maybe 15 at the time. The house was great at first. We had our own rooms, and nothing unusual. We were normal kids, and we played with the neighborhood kids. Our cousins would come over every so often. This was about six months after we had moved in. I was in bed, and at the time, I had to share a room with my younger brother, who was six at the time. My grandpa was using what was his room temporarily. My mom had tucked my brother and I into bed. I was laying facing the wall, and about an hour had passed. I felt something blow on my neck. My brother was sort of a butt, as most kids are, and would mess with me. I assumed it was him, so I told him to go back to sleep. He didn't answer, so I turned to look at him, 
and he's in bed and I call his name. No answer, so I get up and look at him and he's passed out. I mean like completely asleep. This kid is a heavy sleeper. So I'm thinking as a now eight-year-old, maybe like a draft, not thinking too much of it. I was finally able to fall asleep, but I was woken up to our old school box TV on static and at full volume. Mind you, this was on a TV stand to the very left top corner of the room. It was a stand that was held up by a wall. It was much too high for me or my brother to turn on, even if we were on our beds or our toy boxes. We had lost the remote about a month before this happened. I had to wake up my mom and she turned it off and everything was fine, but for a few months at least. Every so often I would feel like someone was breathing on my neck, but I would never think about it because I never saw anyone or heard anything. So fast forward and I was nine. My cousins came over for the weekend and kids being kids we played hide and seek tag. There were a total of five of us playing, me, my brother, and my three cousins. It was about midnight, and everyone was playing and the adults were downstairs. I was in my room hiding in the closet when my older cousin runs in and finds me and tags me. That means I have to start to run after her until I stopped dead in my tracks. It felt as if I ran into a wall, but I was at my door and it was open and there was nothing there. I'm looking straight in front of me into the bathroom that was directly in front of my room, and I see what looked like a little girl the same age as me, but they were wearing the stereotypical old-fashioned 1800s little girl dress, and she was this sickly pale blue color. All of the, excuse me, all of the lights were off, but it felt as if she was being lit up, but lights she stood there and ran down the hall, and I stood there for a second thinking that, it, you know, what just happened. Walked down the hall, still stuck on what happened. My cousin then ran in, and just, I asked her if she was in the bathroom. But she wasn't. No one was in the bathroom, or even in my room beside me. I eventually forget about it, but everything in the house never felt right again. The house never felt welcoming or like it was before it felt angry. And I felt like someone or something was watching me anywhere I went in the house. I would feel like something was watching me everywhere. When I would leave the house for school, I never felt something watching me. Only when I was in the house. Fast forward about five months. I was walking home by myself because I begged my mom to let me start going home after school instead of going into after school program. That was a program that my elementary school had. My brother stayed there. My older brother, who was 16 at the time, was still at his high school, and it was in a different part of town. He would usually hang out with his friends, so I would be the only one home. My grandpa, I mentioned earlier, had moved out a month after the first instant of the blowing on my neck. And I was excited. I felt like a cool teenager while only being 10. Now I'm going to describe the house setup, because it's important for this next encounter. The house was on a court, and when at the front door, you'd walk into the living room, and directly in front of the front door were the stairs that curved up to the right, and the top of the stairs was a master bedroom. That was on the left, and I guess to the left of that, my brother's room, and to the right, down a little bit of a hall, was my room, the bathroom, and my older brother's room. When you look past the stairs, you have the living room and walking back, you can see the dining room. And behind a wall on the left is the kitchen where the house phone is. That's important. Then to the right of the dining room was a half bathroom, a closet, and a garage door. The garage was directly under my room to the bathroom, and my older brother's room. The backyard was able to be seen from each window of the back of the house, and we had a dog. She was very quiet and never barked, even at the people who'd walked before an over nine foot cement walls that divided the backyard and the semi main street. I walked into the house, assuming that I'm alone. I do my normal routine, put my shoes away, hanging up my backpack, and heading to the kitchen to call my mom on the house phone. I was calling her to tell her that I was getting home safe. 
We usually had like a five minute conversation, not too long. And I asked my mom if I have a soda that I was kept. What did they write here? I was going to have a not too long conversation and I asked my mom if I can have a can of soda that was kept in the outside fridge in the garage. She says yes and we say bye. Then I hang up. I walk into the garage and as I'm grabbing the soda, I hear the floor upstairs creak like someone stood up. I didn't think anything of it until after that initial creak it sounded as if someone was walking from the bathroom to my room and then to my brother's room like someone's checking or looking for something. So I open the garage door and I stand in the doorway. The creaking stopped. I thought it was my older brother home early. So I call his name and nothing. Then I call his name again and still nothing, but I ask if he wants me to grab him a soda too. Then I heard the creaking again. But this time it sounded as if they were running with heavy stomps down the hall and down the stairs. At a reaction, I run back into the garage and hide behind the side of the fridge that you can't see if you open the garage door. I'm scared now, because those steps don't sound like my brother's. I hear the steps run down the stairs and just stop. I'm still hiding, and now getting really freaked out that no one opened the door and nothing happened for about five minutes, and then I hear the stairs creak because of where the fridge is on the wall between the garage and the stairs. The footsteps sound heavy, but walking speed up the stairs, and then down the hall back to where the creek was. And when I went into the garage in the first place, I stand there crying my heart, racing for about 20 minutes trying to work up the courage to run inside and grab the house phone. During that whole time, the creaks kept doing, still as if someone was looking for something. I keep my eyes on the clock and... We had that on the wall in the garage, and it's just now turning 2.35, meaning that no one will be home for another four hours. I stand in the front door and stand there and finally work up the courage to run inside and grab the house phone. The second I opened that door, steps turned heavy and ran again. But I made it back to the garage before it made it down the stairs all the way, and I call my mom immediately. I'm bawling, and the only thing I could manage to get out was... Steps upstairs, hiding garage. My mom's now trying to calm me down and tells me to get my dog from the backyard and stay in the garage and she's going to call my brother to have him come over and check it out. So I grab my dog and she immediately goes crazy, barking. Dead stares at the garage door to the house. She's never done this before. Her temperament's always been very calm and always collected. But now she was not close to her usual self. I sit, my dog, who is a black lab, stands in front of me, still barking. It felt like forever before my brother showed up. The entire time the steps kept going back and forth and back and forth. And things were hitting the ground. It sounds like a robber, the steps looking for something. But why would they stay if someone was already home and after hearing my voice knowing I'm a child? They had an opportunity to leave, but didn't. When my brother shows up, I hear his truck pull up and come to a shriek. I hear him and about five of his friends run into the house and run around the whole house looking for someone. My brother comes in the garage and asks if I'm okay and what happened, and I tell him. His friend comes into the garage and says there's no one here. They checked every door and window and everything was locked. Nothing was disturbed, except for a few things that were on the floor in my room. If there was someone in the house, they would have seen that person as it was in a court, and they couldn't get back over the year's fence without using a ladder. I refused to go into the house, and so my brother carries me to the truck and put me in and brings my dog too, and me and a truck full of his friends head to his best friend's house. We stayed there until my mom came and picked us up. We don't talk about it. My younger brother asks. And my mom just says I got scared. I had to be carried by force back into the house, and I refused to sleep or even go into my room for a month. After that incident, I felt as if I was just being watched, but only in the house. 
few other things happened in the house after that, but what happened that day was terrifying. But it doesn't compare to the feeling of being watched. By things being moved or broken or even seeing shadows in my peripheral. That was a daily occurrence, especially when I had to go to bed. I always had the covers over my head and music playing, so I didn't have to hear anything, but I would always feel something. I would feel something like a hand on my arm or my back or the breathing on my neck. I moved out of the house when I was 13 to live with my dad, and soon after my mom moved in with my stepdad into a different house. And what had happened in that house in Stockton just moved with me to my dad's, but then moved to the house my mom lives in currently only bothering me when I visit my mom's house. If anyone wants more of my experiences that happened after this, and what happened when it followed me and what happens now that when I go to visit my mom, I'd be more than happy to share my experience. Although terrifying, I'm glad I get the experience. Hopefully somebody else can share theirs. Maybe they won't feel like they're completely crazy like I did. Thanks for reading this. It's long, but I made sure to add everything I could because it's almost like the experience happened yesterday. I will never forget it. I'll never get away from it. Ask Reddit. When I was in high school, we lived in one of those cookie-cutter 1950s houses. 11 feet apart, one floor with a basement. I experienced a lot of things in this house, and to this day I cannot explain them, despite being a big skeptic in the supernatural. For context, my mom, my stepfather, my younger brother, and my older brother all lived in this one tiny one-floor house with a dog and a cat. The animals frequently slept with any of us, but I had went to bed alone. My bed was a full-sized bed, pushed into the corner of my bedroom away from the doors. My room was in the middle of the house, but still had a wall and a window that faced the backyard, and a door that led to the kitchen, and a door that led to the hallway. I was facing toward the wall, trying to sleep. And like many lights, not having much success. Night. The house was dark and quiet. Everyone was asleep. Behind me on the bed, I felt the familiar weight of my childhood cat, Joey, jumping onto it. I turned around to greet and pet, Hi, Joe, and I stopped. There was nothing there. I noped out, rolled over, pulled the covers over my head, and forced myself to sleep. Some time later, I was sitting on my bed, middle of the day. My bed starts vibrating. Not enough to notice if you weren't sitting on it, but could definitely feel that it was happening. The washer and dryer were in the basement on concrete, so... And that's on a different side of the house. They weren't even running. I have no idea how to explain it. Another night, both my bedroom doors were shut and it was late at night. Everybody had been in bed as it was in the middle of the school week, and both parents worked. Dead silent except me waking up in the, well, to a middle-aged man whispering, Damn. In my bedroom, at the foot of my bed. I could see my whole room from the faint glow of streetlights in the front yard and no one was there. The other night I had to hide underneath blankets and force myself to sleep. That was a separate night and, well, I was having a severe, vivid nightmare. A decrepit, rotting, elderly ghost in a white, dirty dress, long, flowing hair that looked a bit like a witch was full body floating above my bed, facing me. It was holding me down by my wrist, open mouth, angrily, screaming at me. I couldn't move. My entire body was paralyzed, and I couldn't scream, move my head, or anything. I laid there trying to close my eyes, so at least wouldn't have to look at her. I woke up at 5 a.m., same position in bed as my dream, flat on my back, almost like I was restrained in bed, which is odd, I've always been a side sleeper. The same wrist hurting that she was holding my dream, too. Sleep paralysis? Possibly. But I know that it's the only time that something like that's ever happened. Sometime after, I had yet another dream about her. 
I was sitting on the floor of what my dream logic told me was a good friend's house. They had just moved in, so there was no furniture available. We were playing some kind of board or card game to pass the time. Across from me was a room with the door slightly ajar. It was nighttime, and the only light was the room that we were in, so I couldn't really see inside. I asked about it out of curiosity to the four other people I was with. They brushed it off, saying that we weren't supposed to go in there. It was nothing. I agreed, but something was telling me to find out what was in there for whatever reason. After trying to put it off and ignoring it for a good amount of time, I finally crept up to the partially open door, very slowly opening it. I could see stacks of boxes as tall as me. 5'11", by the way, not too short. I was crowding the room and then... <laughs> the same witch, like being leaping out from me, a dark, small space behind the boxes with a noise I can only describe as a whistling teapot. I've never heard this in person, as I live in the U.S. We don't even own a teapot. Well, it was leaping or flying directly at my face with a twisted, like, rotting face with their mouth open, angry, and I woke up. My ears were still ringing from a scream. It was 3 a.m. My parents don't believe in the supernatural as they're religious. They would never talk about ghosts or anything as something that could actually happen. But I finally got my mother to begrudgingly admit that she saw something in that house, too. A six-foot-tall shadow figure of what she described as a male. She had been in bed sitting up and reading a book or a magazine. From her peripheral vision, she saw walking up to the hallway toward her room and it stopped. She thought it was my older brother. He's six-foot-tall, medium build. So she looked up. No one was there. Her room was at the end of a hallway next to the bedroom, so no headlights or stray lights could reach it by mistake to cast said shadow. To make it more alarming, it was in the middle of the day. Even with her just telling me it, I could tell it really spooked the hell out of her. She never spoke about it again, though. Not sure if it's related, but thinking on it now, oddly enough, my mother had three miscarriages in this house last one of which almost killed her. They never tried having children again. Fast forward when I'm 21, living with my now ex. We were on the top floor of an apartment. It was nighttime. He's fast asleep next to me in bed, facing away from me. I'm on my back trying to relax so I can sleep and failing miserably. My eyes are closed, but through my eyelids I can see a bright, slow white flash of light at the foot of my bed coming from the dresser drawers that are closed. Which is odd. The curtains are closed on the only window in the room, which is to our left. The doors to the room are shut. It's pitch black in here, and there's nothing but woods outside our window. I saw the lights a few more times in that room over the years and still have no explanation for it seen the same lights in a few other places, but very spaced out over the years, and always when I'm in bed trying to sleep, when I have my eyes closed too. Now jump to when I'm 22. My parents and younger brother and I moved to another state, to a house that had only had one other owner before us. So you could kind of think of it as a brand new house. We had finally gotten our things delivered by the movers. It was just barely nightfall. My younger brother and I were in his upstairs bedroom. My parents were out to dinner somewhere local. My brother and I were on the floor chatting, going through a penny jar that he found that was left behind from a previous owner. They left a lot of trash behind. This is when we heard something hit the hardwood floor downstairs. We both looked at each other like, what the fuck was that? Knowing that we were home alone, especially. We finally gathered the courage to go check it out after a whisper fighting about who would go down first and what it could be. There at the bottom of the stairs, perfectly in the middle of where you would walk down from the stairs, in the kitchen was a shrink-wrapped brand new baseball. Weird. Our parents are sleeping and much too old for that kind of mischief. We picked it up. It was dry, 
no teeth marks. Someone would have had to pull the said baseball from the medium height box that had been in from my parents' room. I remembered seeing it in the box along with other random things earlier that day. We passed that on the way down the stairs as it was directly at the top of the stairs. We threw ideas on how the noise could have happened. We determined it was the fact that it was from the baseball hitting the hardwood floor, but we would have had heard it go down every step, hit the wall on the landing at the bottom of the steps, then bounce into the floor if it was one of our pets. We specifically heard it drop once, no bounce onto the wooden floor. Testing it, somebody would have had to drop it from like waist height directly onto the wooden floor. Still, no explanation for this. Or why we even had a baseball as nobody even actively played baseball in our home since I was like 10, let alone any sports. A few years later in the same home, I'm sitting on the couch. It's really late. Everyone else had been in bed for several hours. The living room was a very open space that connected to the entire first floor. I'm watching TV. All the lights are off with the volume on low. I'm directly under my parents' bedroom, and in the insulation in this house, it's garbage. So you can hear people walking on the sidewalk outside during the day. That kind of garbage. The basement door faces the living room and sits under the stairs that lead to the second floor. This is just to give you a visual. The door is just to my left within clear view. I hear someone shuffling up the steps slowly from the basement as if tired. I leaned forward. And without sitting cross-legged on the couch, waiting for the person to come up, I distinctly remember thinking it was odd as my stepdad woke up really early and definitely sounded like my stepdad. He shuffles his feet when he walks, so I thought it was him. I waited to tell him how I didn't realize he was down there as it was so late. I waited, waited for about what felt like forever, but had to have been only about a minute. And that's when it clicked. The space between the floor and the bottom of the door was big enough to slip my hand under, and it had been dark this entire time, no light on. The door never opened. No one ever came out of the basement. I checked the time on my cell phone, and it was 3 a.m. I noped the hell out, went directly to bed. Maybe whatever it was followed me from the 1950s home that we just moved from. No idea. That was the last time I ever experienced anything I couldn't explain. I'll be 30 this year, and I watch a lot of ghost shows and consider myself to be well-educated and level-headed. Still can't explain any of that. Hope you guys enjoyed those crazy times. Well, the retelling of my crazy times in my life. They still weird me out. Conversations with Dead People When I was 13, my four-year-old sister was run over by the city garbage truck in front of our house. It wasn't the first, but the most traumatic death that I've dealt with. It was bad enough that the first responders were sent for counseling, and I still suffer from PTSD because of it. But this is my father's story. My dad owned his business and understandably couldn't work for months afterwards. When he finally did return, on his first project back, he collapsed in the middle of the job site and was rushed to the hospital. He was diagnosed with a terminal illness and was told that if he didn't receive a liver transplant, he'd be dead in six months or less. He was always a stubborn guy and, well, he made it past six months. He actually went through two transplants as they botched the first, along with multiple other surgeries and procedures before succumbing to the disease a few years later. But I often wonder if what transpired during his transplant surgeries, if they may have been something to do with why, well, why he's been able to reach out since he passed. None of my other loved ones have. I don't know the reason but I do know that the stories are worth sharing regardless. My father woke from his first transplant, and after the ventilator was removed, 
he mumbled a name or something to my aunt. She sort of dismissed it as a drug and stress induced nonsense moment until a couple of days later she was reading the newspaper, came across an obituary with the same name my father had mentioned. She asked him about it. He proceeded to tell her that a man was waiting for him on the other side of consciousness, that he had given my dad his full name and a message for his family, and proceeded to show my father his murder. Must be some strange coincidence or something, saying everyone's rational mind. But the more my father described it, prior to there being any published information about the death, the more impossible that became, including the murderer occurring the same date and time as the surgery. The police were eventually called because my father was so insistent on the message and it needed to be sent to this guy. His name was Brent and he needed to send this to his loved ones. The detective that returned the call was obviously skeptical and dismissive. He basically asked my father quite sarcastically where the murder weapon could be found, since he had a front row seat and all. Brent had been in his girlfriend's house when her soon-to-be ex-husband showed up and shot them both. The woman survived, so the shooter was in custody, but Brent died on the scene. They had not recovered the gun. It was a detail, really, never made in public. To the detective's surprise, my dad told him correctly exactly where to find the gun. It was after that that my father was told the man's mother would be calling him. He was able to tell her and the girlfriend that Brent loved them, and that they didn't need to worry, because he was fine. My father kept in touch with Brent's mother over the years. I know how crazy it sounds, but it's true. The surgeons, as brilliant as they were, had not connected a bile duct in the first liver, so it was slowly dying. And so was my father. Actually, from the diagnosis, it seemed much more like a prolonged death rather than life. It was over a year before a second liver became available. My dad was in pretty rough shape by then. My family jokingly told him not to go solving any murder mysteries this time and to just get through it. He laughed and said he'd try. I mentioned he was stubborn, but he was a sarcastic son of a bitch who taught me early that being a smartass was far superior to being a dumbass. So, he could dish the dark humor better than anyone. But this time around, there were no visions, messages, or conversations with dead people. But he was visited by one. He said that my sister sort of simply sat in his lap for the duration of the hour-long operation. He didn't see her or anything, he simply knew it was her. I don't know if the second one was that much harder on him or if it was just spending time with him and my sister, but he seemed to tip the scale even more to the side of dying after that. Not that he didn't fight, but that he had some of the fight taken out of him. Exactly one week before his 21st birthday, he died. I suppose seeing how difficult dying can be led me to do what I could to make any maternal grandparent's journey to the other side as painless as possible. My husband and I, along with our two small kids, moved in with them two years after my dad passed. This was so that way they could be at home until they died. Caring for them and my little one full-time was draining, and despite it being the goal, I felt horrible when my grandfather passed. I often cried myself to sleep, worrying about my grandma and a million other things. I'd moved into the room my grandma had slept in to be closer to my grandma, which was also weighing on me. Then one night I had what I call a dream, but I considered it in the well, to be a visit for my dad, basically. There was no visual or auditory sensory impression of any kind, and the physical sensation was very different from any dream I've ever had. My father simply sat, held my hand through the night. I simply knew it was his hand, so, well, it was just so familiar, even though it had been too long, well, two years, really, since I'd held it, 
and even longer than I'd held it enough to recognize it just by the feel. And yet I did. Still cried the following night, but they were tears of joy. It was almost like I was a little girl having a bad dream until Daddy came to wake me up, even though it was just the opposite. There aren't really any words to describe it, but it's something I'll never forget. I didn't notice how similar it was to my sister's surgery visit to my father for several years, long after both of his visits had concluded. We were still living at my grandma's second time he came. My grandma wasn't doing so well, and our boxer dog Jake, basically my third child, had suddenly developed a huge tumor. Now along with being stubborn, sarcastic smartass, my father was also a dog lover and a hippie though only the dog lover part is relevant. He'd never not had a dog, and when my niece, his first grandchild, started to speak, she called him Grandpa Doggy. And it fit so well, we literally inscribed it on his headstone. So upon the realization and devastation of having to put my dog down, but also the knowledge that my dad was around somehow, I went to the porch alone and hysterically sobbed, speaking to him out loud. I begged him to watch for Jake and let him into his heavenly dog pack or however it worked, but to please just watch out for him until we could get there too. I live in the Rocky Mountains, where the weather can be somewhat confusing. This was an afternoon around the end of April and close to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and yet there were clouds overhead and an extremely light snowfall. I still smoked at that time. So after my blabbering and begging, I sat on the porch to smoke in a nearly hypnotized state, drained and staring north. I was staring at what I thought was nothing. You see, I'd been staring at a single snowflake since I sat down, which was close to five minutes now. I'd initially assumed it had fallen on a cobweb or something until my brain kicked back. I realized that even if it had landed in the cobweb, it would have melted. Half the flakes were melting before they even hit the ground. There was a cold, electric, almost breeze all around me. I sat up straight, holding out my hand. I said, Dad, if that's you, will you... Didn't have to finish my sentence before the snowflake drifted up over a foot and from my left side where it had been hovering and into the center of my palm, where... It immediately melted. I didn't even have to finish the sentence. I could almost hear him sigh and picture him saying sarcastically, Took you long enough, dumbass. <whistles> to this day, I get goosebumps when I recall that time. And of course I cried again. It's been over 15 years since I last felt his presence. In the meantime... I've lost more people than I can say, including my mother and my son in 2017. I've had a moment or two of frustration or resentment, especially with my son, wondering why he can't just let me know he's okay or say hello, but I try to stop myself quickly. I'm lucky enough to have several experiences that continue to occur where I work. I've heard and seen things that, well, if logic were applied, in an attempt to rationalize them, they'd make even less sense. I'm lucky enough to not have one but two occasions where my dad comforted me after his life was over. Lucky enough to have a conversation with a dead person and to know in my heart, down to my core, that my father was just stubborn enough to respond without words, but still able to deliver the same message for him after he delivered to Brent's family that he'd be okay and he loves me. So I hold on to that as truth, really, for everyone I've lost. And I'm passing on the message for anybody else who could use a little bit of hope. Security guard in a haunted school. The police got involved. The reason why I dared, it was summer and a weekend shift. Evening, but still bright outside. Now the evenings and the weekend are much calmer. 
We had like 10 customers for the whole day, and we needed to do a random checkup, and on the rest we were free for the alarms. Three colleagues for 10 customers is a lot. But we had some days where it would just be extremely busy. We had a fuck ton of clients. Now we had multiple shift leaders, and one was working this day with me. He was working the main alarm car, the contact for dispatch, and I was his second hand. We're sitting outside the office when he gets a phone call. The third colleague was getting some food, so it was just me and the shift lead. Dispatch gave an alarm at our favorite customer, the damn haunted school. Now there is one more issue with this school, and that is that children who go there often threw bricks through the windows of this school. Yep, the school is in the dead center of a city, but it is really big. On the front side of the school, there's just regular houses. On the back, a small park. On the sides, there's other buildings. I think some companies, from what I remember. The alarm we got multiple detectors, and they all went off in sequence. This usually means that somebody's walking inside. Now, when dispatch sees this, they automatically call the police to join us. I mean, we're not armed, so slightly irresponsible to go without backup in such situations. So the shift lead, a bit of a nut job, gets excited and tells me to join him. Let's go scare some kids. Well, that winds up backfiring. We both take a car and drive to the school. We both park at the front of the building. And when we came there, police were already waiting for us. They had parked their cars at the back of the school in a little park. The reason they waited for us is because we have the keys. The lockdown building was just basically opening the door for them so they could check out what's going on. It's normal that we join them inside for the simple reason that we often are very familiar with the buildings, especially pretty important for bigger ones too. My shift lead proposes, considering the size of the school, that I take a cop and he takes a cop, and we work through the zones and give alarms. Now the first sensor that went off was an emergency door, which makes it very likely that somebody entered the building. Then it led through some halls, and guess what? Straight into the friggin' basement. Now I don't know who would be stupid enough to do that, but sure. The plan we had is that we entered the basement near the emergency door. My colleague and a cop entered the basement near the main entrance. The thing is, the emergency door was still closed. Now that it's, well, now that on its own, it's not very strange, I guess. Because if you let go of the door, it'll basically shut itself and lock. That's just how they're built. But the last zone they gave an alarm was in the basement. Basically meaning that somebody's in there where no one's able to go. If the person would have walked back, dispatch would have seen the last zone give alarm to the emergency exit again. So we enter the basement. Me and the cop go down and walk entirely through. We checked every freaking corner. Absolutely empty. The thing is, we never ran into my colleagues and the other cop. So we end up on the other side, back up near the main entrance. At this point, the colleague from the cop asks over the radio where we are. We said we walked entirely through and ended up at the main entrance, basically reverting the question where they are. They were in the basement. They only entered from the same side we did. When we walked downstairs and they started moving to the main entrance via the ground floor level, to also go down the stairs, they turned around and followed us. They explained later that they heard a shout for them to come back. We never shouted anything. So we wait near the main entrance and we hear a loud as hell scream. It was definitely inside the building. Remember when I told my colleague that they were a nut job? Well, that's what I told the cop. I said this was just my colleague being a pranker. The cop couldn't laugh about it, though. But right when I said that, my colleague and the cop came upstairs asking what the hell that scream was. And that scream definitely didn't come from the basement. 
At this point, the cops freak out and call in for backup. Now, in the Netherlands, when something like this happens, they call in the whole damn circus. We're talking like eight cops and kind of like a shitload of them. A captain or something, it would be in English, I guess. But when they suspect somebody's in a building, they're also bringing a police dog. Or waiting outside on command of the cops till everyone arrived. The dog is here, so everyone who's there is posted into a different section of the school. We're talking everyone. Like at the turning point of the stairs, at the emergency door, at the back door, at the main entrance. I was positioned in the most left stairwell turning point. I was standing like in between floors. So I could see a cop below near the main entrance and a cop above in the hallway near some of the other doors. Felt just fine right there. At this point, we're required to be silent, since the policeman with the dog takes the lead from here on. He shouts through the building that there's a dog about to be sent in, and you'd better make yourself known and surrender. Well, we got a response. A bang loud enough for everybody to hear it, but no one to specify where it came from. Now I'm standing on the left side, and I can see the colleague near the main entrance kind of looking surprised outside. We're standing there for about five minutes in dead silence until we get called back. What was going on? The dog refused to enter the building and put up one hell of a fight with its owner not to cross the main entrance. The dog knew. Well, that led to a change of plans. First, listen. If we hear anything, then spread out through the building find that person. At this point, my shift lead already came walking close to me, softly mentioned, they ain't gonna find shit. Not here. Two cops stand in the big open space, the student common room just listening. Everyone is dead quiet, but we hear a fuck ton of noise. Cops kept asking their colleagues outside if there really wasn't someone outside messing around. But outside, they didn't hear anything. The thing is, with so, so many people, you feel a lot more secure, and I was just happy with the school being searched top to bottom. A fun fact, one cop found a hidden room made by students, assuming with help of teachers, who wanted to make an escape room. The cop had to ask for help to get out again. Now from the outside comes a call over the radio. There's two cops at either end of the top floor, but in the middle is a person walking. Both cops rush to the middle only to meet each other, but no one else. Every cop in the building rushes upstairs at this point, only to hear a loud bang downstairs again. At this point, cops are starting to admit that we are pretty much chasing air. Their next idea was to basically turn on the alarm system and wait. If the person would move, the alarm would trigger again, right? Well, it didn't. It stayed completely quiet. The cops basically said we got to do more, or that they had more to do, rather, and that they were headed off. If the alarm triggers, we'll make sure at all times a car is nearby. My colleague, however, wants to go back inside. Because we're all headed out, the plan to return back in, we just left all inside doors open and unlocked. So here we go, just the two of us now. I had a set of keys for my car, and he had too, and, well, we decided to rush and do it as fast as possible. We walk inside, and for two seconds, we turned off the alarm and we stand in the entry when another loud-as-hell scream sounds through the school. My colleague has never been this quick with turning on an alarm system, and now took a big leap getting outside again. Me following in his footsteps. That scream felt like it was right in our face. Felt like it meant it, like you are definitely not welcome here. We left all the in-between doors open, well knowingly that the customer is phoning dispatch tomorrow to complain about that, and we didn't care at all. We spent another 20 minutes in front of the main entrance just trying to listen through the front door. The occasional loud bangs and screams coming through the glass door ended up sending us off. 
I haven't been here in a long time after that. Remember what I mentioned in an earlier post that I'm not sending interns here? Well, from that point I did. But it ended up biting me back on the ass. Wartime Ghost Stories So without giving too much detail, I did a four and a half year stint as a security contractor for a company which is pretty well known and well regarded in the industry. During the 2014 invasion of the Crimean Peninsula, after it was determined Russian contractors were being used to invade the peninsula, a certain worldwide organization decided to be cheeky and send contractors of its own. And I, an 18-year-old only a few months out of this company's boot camp, was sent along with a sizable force of other contractors. Our primary mission was to slow any progress the Russians made. This was while evacuating towns and villages of pro-Ukrainian residents who were susceptible, or excuse me, susceptible to execution and other horrendous acts, and our loyalty was discovered anyway. Now, I only was there for six miserable weeks, and neither of these stories are my own, but sources are very reliable people, and I trust that they wouldn't lie about such things. So the first one I'll tell is of Platoon 62. Platoon 62 comprised of two squads of 12 men each, and were solely tasked with evacuation duties. According to the two people who had told me what happened, P-62 had called in an approximately of 1,445 hours, 1445, being 2.45 p.m., by the way, and notified command that they had encountered heavy incoming fire and they'd been seeking an alternate route to their destination. They reported no casualties. At 1452, they called in again and advised that the one truck had been hit by an explosive and that the vehicle was immobile. They said they'd be dismounting, moving to another vehicle. Reported that all five occupants had been injured but were able to move on their own. Multiple attempts to reach them fail after this. Two hours go by. Then the last call from them came in saying that they had all been wounded, some dead, and that they needed medevac. Sixty additional contractors forming the QRF were sent to assist on the first sign of trouble at 1445 and at approximately 1,800 they had finally arrived, only to find all 24 dead in varying locations. So here's where the paranormal begins. The locals state that a firefight had in fact started at around 1445. It apparently ended after about an hour with the attackers making an aggressive push on the two squads they had ambushed. The locals state that they had gone out and checked on the contractors after the attackers had left and found several who were still alive. But life-saving attempts failed shortly after. Most had been hit by gunfire and shrapnel multiple times. Fearing the attacking forces would return, the locals left. The locals were adamant that they had checked all 24 and that all had passed away before they had left. So who called in saying they needed medevac? It's possible somebody living, and maybe they didn't realize that he was still alive, and he just sort of kept himself alive long enough to call for help. It's entirely possible the locals lied, or my fellow contractors lied. But regardless, I do know this, Platoon 62, not their real call sign by the way, they were lost on that date, and that time all 24 were killed in an ambush because they'd gone down a road we knew had been mapped off for ambushes. We know most of their equipment was damaged in the ambush, including most comms and that the official information release states that there were signs indicating somebody had tried to save a few of them. Regardless of what happened, whether or not that last call for medevac ever came in, we lost 24 great guys that day, just trying to save lives. Task Force Blitz. 
Task Force Blitz, or TF Blitz, or just Blitz as we called it. It was a slowdown task force formed to do as mentioned above, and that was to slow down any advancement made by the Russians. Compromised of 150 contractors, it was formed early on, but my squad wasn't attacked until I had been in the country for about three weeks. None of this matters to the story, it just provides some background. It was not uncommon to be given maps that were heavily outdated, or that were not completed, leading to some confusion when we stumbled upon roads or villages that weren't marked on our maps. Also, it's important to note that GPS was working, but due to the weather at the time, most of our GPS units weren't functioning properly, or at least reliably. Hence why we relied on maps. While en route to the assignment, the units in the front of our column reported a small cluster of approximately 20 houses and buildings. These were approximately half of a mile east from the road that we were on. Of course, our maps didn't show this village. It was decided early on that since we couldn't confirm previous teams had searched this village, that we had to search it again. And so, my squad of ten or another... Oh, my squad of ten and another of ten dismounted and approached joined by two armed interpreters. My squad approached from the southwest, the other from the northwest. Maintaining comms while approaching, we identified a gas station. About 15 total homes and apartment buildings. What looked to be a government-type building and three buildings I couldn't possibly identify. So little by little, we clear each building. Unfortunately, we find a few deceased people along the way. Thorough searches on our end find nothing. As we're wrapping up, the other squad comes out with two children and a dog. All three appear to be emaciated. Our medevacs began treatment. And we established like a defensive perimeter, waited for an evacuation platoon to come. The children were picked up and we carried on. Later on, I got to talk to the guys who found the children and the dog. And this is where the paranormal begins. While clearing out one of the apartment buildings, the member of the other squad who found them, who I'll call David, and Tom, and Paul, and Tom. <laughs> Excuse me, there's so many letters. The members of the other squad who found them, who I'll call David, the interpreter, Tom, and Paul. Tom and Paul were point, while David covered the rear. All three encountered a locked apartment door. Tom and Paul confirmed the door handle was locked and the door was firm in the closed position. So they prepared to breach it with a halogen. That's when the door simply popped open before we could even get the bar in the door jam. Inside they heard what they perceived as an elongated whisper, which David stated was loud enough for him to determine that it was something said in Ukrainian. He just couldn't confirm what exactly was said. They proceeded to hold their positions until additional contractors came. They entered the apartment, searched, and found the two kids and dog in the living room closet, covered by several items of thick clothing. A woman was found down in the hallway in the bedroom. She had been deceased for several days, if not a week at that point. Her injury is believed to be a result of a brutal assault. After the fact, before hearing the story, it was confirmed on evac platoon had visited this village about five days before, followed by two days later by another task force. Neither reported finding the children or woman when clearing the village, though it was determined later on members of that evac platoon committed crimes against women and children, and the time frame of when they were there lines up with her death. What stands out is the locked door. They confirmed amongst themselves that it was locked, and they were willing to risk any element of surprise both to that apartment, everybody that they hadn't cleared and break the door down before it simply popped open. I will say Tom and I worked together several times after our time in Ukraine, and he established himself as a great contractor, and he exhibited a great moral character. I know from my time with him that he wouldn't feed into a lie, so I truly believe this happened. As far as I, well, as far as truly knowing why that door popped open, I believe that woman in the afterlife waited for her kids to greet them, 
as they crossed over, knowing that she couldn't save them, and did her best to protect them by locking the door when she saw her boys coming down the hallway. Perhaps she realized they were different. Perhaps she took a chance, hoping they'd save her kids. Regardless, the last I heard, only the dog passed away. So she can rest knowing that we saved them. Paranormal experience in Hershey, Pennsylvania Hotel this past weekend. Multiple spirits and entities possible. My friends and I had multiple paranormal encounters this past weekend during our guys' weekend in, during our guys weekend in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Out of respect to the hotel, I don't want to give away the name of the establishment, but I will say it was a chain location with good reviews, very close to Hershey Park. It was overall a very nice hotel. I have yet to do a search on this hotel to see if there are any other reports of paranormal activity from prior guests, but that will probably be my next step. We checked into the hotel without issue on Friday. We were not in the room very much. We basically checked in, put our stuff down, and left. We went to Hershey Park that night, returned to the room basically to just go to bed. Three out of the four of us, including me, fell asleep without issue. My one friend that stayed awake the longest was the first one to witness what we are now considering a paranormal incident. All of the lights in the room were off. As he was just laying there on bed on his phone at around 12.30 a.m., he claims the lights next to his bed began to flicker on and off. This happened for approximately two minutes before turning itself on. He didn't think much of it and thought maybe it had been a light like a loose bulb. Maybe the switch might have been on, who knows. But he got up, made sure the bulb was in tight, and ensured the switch was off, etc. He was only able to get the light off by unscrewing the bulb and screwing it back in, which he thought was weird. After getting back in bed, he said that this happened again approximately 30 minutes later. The light flickered for several minutes before turning itself completely on, despite all the switches being off. He claimed he was slightly unnerved at this point. He once again got up, unscrewed, and re-screwed in the bulb to turn the light off. He was unable to force himself to sleep. I slept through this, so I didn't witness this flickering or light-on incident. My first encounter happened at approximately 2.30 a.m. The lights were out. I woke up with a very uneasy feeling, like the hair on the back of my neck was sticking up, with the feeling I was being watched, which I was used to as a kid. However, within a matter of a few seconds, I was immediately filled with dread. As I began hearing what I can best describe as snarling coming from the room, I immediately tried to pass it off in my head as one of my friends snoring. But I have, well, I've camped with them, and I've roomed with them several times in the past. I know what their snoring sounds like, and this was not it. It was an evil growling and snarling that was actually coming from above their bed. I lie completely still, trying to rationalize it and this noise continued on and off for approximately 60-90 to 90 seconds until I quietly shut my eyes and said a prayer. Asking for the spirit to depart, which I did when I was a child. And after I did this, the snarling noise stopped. I was extremely uneasy, and I wanted to wake my friends up and leave, but out of fear of being laughed at, I laid there and eventually went back to sleep. I slept through the rest of the evening, unaware that anything else happened, which it did. The next morning at the Continental Breakfast, I jokingly brought up that our one friend must have had some wild dreams last night, because when I heard him snarling in his sleep, when I said this, I noticed that my friend, the one that also had a light bulb experience, looked at me as if the blood had just drained from his face. He said, 
You heard it too? I told him yes. I heard the growling noise around 2.30. He said that he was also awake and described the noise as a werewolf growl coming from above the bed. He said he was lying awake most of the night terrified. He said it wasn't snoring coming from the other friend that was sleeping and that the noise was coming from above the bed. Like I described, really. He also said the light bulb incident happened again at 0330. But this time, he left the light on because he was too afraid to get up and turn it off. Our other friend confirmed this. When he said he woke up around 4 and thought it was weird the light was on, turned it off by clicking the switch a few times and playing with the bulb. Finally, he said growling noise happened again, one last time around 4.30. After the light was turned back off, he was very frightened by the whole ordeal, said he was tempted to leave the room and sleep in the van, but didn't. He ended up being extremely tired all day Saturday, and he got little to no sleep Friday night. One of our friends slept through everything, made fun of us most of the day Saturday when we would talk about what happened. He was very skeptic and didn't believe in the paranormal. He would roll his eyes at us and acted perturbed when we went to speak about it. He passed the noises off as our friends snoring and the lights as an electrical disturbance due to old or faulty wiring. Our other friend that just witnessed the light being on at 4 a.m. was very shook agreed that he did feel uneasy in the room, but couldn't fully explain why. My other friend and I, that experienced the snarly noises, we were definitely shooken up, and both knew that it wasn't snoring. We also felt very uncomfortable in the room. What was also abnormal, which I am now just thinking about, all the paranormal activity seemed to be focused on one side of the room where my two other friends were sleeping. I was sleeping on the side of the room with the skeptic. It was on the other side of the room where the snarling noises were coming from and it was their light that kept turning on. And also, the final thing that occurred was that our friends' phone chargers were constantly, mysteriously being unplugged from various outlets around that side of the room. They were totally secure in the outlet, but when we would return, the plug would be on the ground. They were accusing me and my friend of being jerks, and it was not us. It actually only stopped when they plugged their phone in and out of the side of the room. And yeah, this was occurring in multiple outlets on their side of the room, not just one. Saturday morning, before going back to Hershey Park for the day, we asked the front desk if there had ever been reports of paranormal activity in the hotel. There were two women working at the time, and they both looked at each other and then told us, yeah, there have been prior reports of paranormal activities in this hotel. They even had a name for the spirit, which was Melissa. They named it that because they believe it to be a spirit of a little girl that was staying at the hotel and was struck and killed in the road in front of the hotel several years prior. We tried to look up this incident, but couldn't find any news stories about it. We asked if the reports were specific to the room that we were staying in, but they told us no. It was multiple locations in the hotel, hallways, various rooms, reports from cleaning staff, etc., we contemplated checking out the room and not staying on our second evening. However, knowing that we would be extremely tired from a day at Hershey Park, and knowing that we wouldn't get a refund since we prepaid for a non-refundable rate, we decided to stay. My one friend, who's the skeptic, started joking about demanding the demon and evil spirit to show itself. I quickly shut him up with the most serious, You better never ever do or say that shit around me again knowing that it's only welcoming bad things to happen, really. Instead, I quickly asked Melissa to kindly leave her room, and that she was not welcome here, and I asked any and all other spirits to do the same. Luckily, our second night was mostly without issue, except for the phone chargers getting unplugged by themselves overnight. This is the kind of 
quote-unquote playful stuff I was used to as a kid. What really scared me, though, was the snarling and growling noises and the sense of dread I felt Friday night into Saturday morning. That was experienced similarly by, similarly, by two of us in that room. I keep getting creepy feelings after being in a treatment center. In March of 2019, I was admitted to a residential treatment center. It was a little unique for a treatment center. I believe, but I'm not sure, because I don't have anything to compare it to. The center was a mansion in the mountains. I think it was a vacation home for a doctor or something before the center bought it. I was with about 15 other girls there, people who were admitted and discharged every once in a while. But the maximum capacity was 16 girls. When I first got there, the girls and the staff told me that there was a ghost named Benjamin. I figured they were just playing a trick on me, or something like that, you know, I was new. I didn't believe in ghosts. I'm still not sure what to believe, but I know there was something in that house. Every day we would have a journal writing and meditation hour. The staff would put meditation music on the TV and leave the remote in the kitchen counter. There was only one remote. We wrote in our journals and stuff in the living room, which was next to the kitchen in an open floor plan type space. However, no one, including the staff, was close enough to the remote to be able to touch it without us noticing. Several times, while meditation music was playing on YouTube and the TV, the music would just stop. It would exit the video, scroll through suggested videos, and select something else. The meditation channel was a live channel, but it wasn't because the video just ended, and it wasn't just playing the watch next suggestion. It was literally scrolling through video choices. Most of the time it just chose random videos that were weird, but pretty harmless. I don't remember specifics because, again, it was over a year ago. Once, though, it selected a video of a girl killing herself. I have no idea why that video was on YouTube. Me neither. The TV was the first weird thing that I witnessed personally, but I still dismissed it. I figured we were having some kind of glitchy remote. The next thing that happened that I saw was during school. We had school in a large bedroom upstairs. The classroom had a doorway, but no door. I was talking to the school counselor at a table close to the doorway. We heard whistling and footsteps coming up the stairs. One of the therapists at the center would always whistle as he was coming up the stairs. But he had been gone for a while because his wife had died from cancer. We both jumped up and ran out of the classroom to see if it was him would have been strange because his wife had died just that week. But there was no one there. And during our school time, there's only like one regular staff member that isn't in the classroom. And they usually stay in the kitchen, though, and pretty much all the main floor is visible from the balcony upstairs. We asked the staff member who was sitting in the kitchen. Maybe she had walked up the stairs just then, but she says that she hadn't. Another time, close to bedtime, we were finishing the nightly checkup where we fill out a mood questionnaire thing and share it with the group. And we had finished chores, which usually includes vacuuming the upstairs landing. I had done this chore, and specifically remember turning the vacuum cleaner off and moving it to the corner. The upstairs landing is huge, and all of us girls and the staff were in the other corner sharing the checkups. Vacuum cleaner turned on and it was in a different place than where I had put it. At night, we aren't allowed to do the checkups until everyone is ready for bed. On the landing, with the doors to their bedrooms closed. The bedroom doors automatically locked when you close them. And one of the bedroom doors would get stuck sometimes. Girls would occasionally struggle to open it after changing. This was a long-term residential place, 
and so some of the higher level girls could be alone in the bedrooms unsupervised with the doors closed to change. Anyways, the doorknob was jiggling back and forth and the door was shaking a bit, so we figured a girl was stuck. One of the staff unlocked the room, but no one was in there. They checked the closet, but there was definitely no one in the bedroom. We'd also heard a little boy's voice in the basement most nights. I think the girls just named him Benjamin themselves, but I'm not really sure. Benjamin pretty much terrorized us, though. None of us slept alone, ever. When girls in our bedroom were out on the weekend pass, we would sleep on the landing with the staff. We weren't required to, we just were terrified of being alone in our bedrooms at night. There were security cameras everywhere, and the doors to the outside had some kind of high-tech magnetic locks that could only be opened with key cards. Whenever they were opened, a chime would sound. One night, the chime sounded when everyone was upstairs. The staff checked the security cameras to find the door to the garage open and close by itself. Another night, we heard loud slams downstairs, then a couple more. When the staff checked the cameras, the cupboard doors were slamming by themselves. I've seen this footage, so I know it isn't the staff messing with us. I doubt they would do that anyways. The faucets would turn on, like the knobs would full-on turn. This is while we were staring directly at them, mind you. When we would shower, we would hear knocks at the bathroom door, but no one would be there, and the staff were supposed to check on us every 15 minutes. But they would announce themselves by name. They don't just knock on the door. It got to the point that none of us were sleeping at night in general, and the staff wouldn't go into the basement by themselves. And when we were getting ready for bed, we would just have another girl sit outside the door and talk to us the whole time. Once in the shower... We heard the knock on the door, which eventually we just tried to ignore because it happened so much. Our shower curtains were those cheap semi-see-through ones where if you put something directly against the curtain, you can see the color and the outline of it. I thought I heard somebody inside the bathroom, so I poked my head out of the shower. But there was nothing there. I closed the curtain again. There was a hand on the other side. Like not just a handprint, but an actual hand touching the outside of the curtain. I yanked the curtain back. There was still no one there. I just got dressed as fast as I could and went back out on the landing. Other things happened there. But honestly, there were so many things that it'd take too long to list them all. I know most of these sound strange more than outright scary but there was always this feeling in the place when things would happen. I don't really know how to describe it, but it would just make all of us terrified. Some girls would get goosebumps or start sweating. I've never had something so terrifying happen in my life and I'd lived there for four months. I felt trapped because I couldn't leave, and Benjamin seemed to be getting worse every day. The treatment center was fairly new. I think it had only been open for about a year before it was admitted. But from what I can tell, Benjamin had been there the whole time. I don't really know what it was there, but I feel like it was something. Sometimes I'll sort of tell some of what happened to my friends, but I don't think they really believe that a lot of it actually happened. Ever since getting discharged last August, I still get creepy feelings. Nothing's happened since then, so don't think whatever it was has followed me. But I really haven't been able to make peace with whatever happened in that house. I think a lot of the girls that were there were feeling kind of the same. I just don't really know where to turn, and tonight's especially hard for some reason. So I guess I may as well try this platform. Or a paranormal M. I'm mostly just venting. Believe what you will, but I swear it's true even if it sounds crazy. If someone has had a similar experience with things they can't explain, any advice on how to feel less terrified
terrified and creeped out constantly would be extremely appreciated. I think I just need some advice and support for dealing with it. The Christmas party ended quick, and something tried to lure me. I had the night shift as security. I was head patrol, meaning that I got all the alarm calls from dispatch and have to divide them amongst me and my colleagues. Now, I'm not going to lie. When you hear the names of the school, the first instinct is to, well, give it another colleague, but... The phone rings. Dispatch tells me that the alarm in this particular school is not turned on yet. Some alarm systems have a reminder that it should be turned on after, for example, midnight. It triggers like a little reminder for dispatch on their PC. Now, I'm working the night with a couple of newbies and interns. I worked quite some time there already, so the company trusted me enough to complete stuff with this team. Knowing that newbies would often call for help in the first two minutes they would have arrived there, I decided due to the nature of, you know, just to go by myself. Just a quick hop in, turn on the alarm, and get the hell out of there. I arrive at the building and thank God a sigh of relief when I see the 40 or 50 people dancing upstairs. Some half-drunken people standing below. It's a Christmas party. Knowing that I don't know, or that I don't have to enter the building alone, completely took my worry away. Also, the reason I've never been caught off guard this much. So without even grabbing the keys, I just rushed through the main entrance, being greeted by the janitor. Now this guy looked sober as could be. So the first thing he says, Well, finally, we've been looking for you for like ten minutes. I get completely puzzled since I literally stepped out of my car and ten minutes ago I was still near the head office. I asked him about this and he says, Well, you've been walking around the school like you couldn't find us. Shouted for us a hundred times. At this point, a very drunk lady walks up to us and starts cheering that the janitor found me. She shouts at the top of her lungs that they can finally stop looking. Multiple people who were roaming the school appeared and heard someone shout, Security! Where are you guys? At this point, I'm well beyond confused. Someone playing a prank on the Christmas party? One of the drunkards? No alarm bells ring yet, so I decided to ask the janitor to take me to the principal off at the school. as he sort of listed as a contact person, so I needed his permission to take away the timer on the alarm system. I enter a room full of people. And I'll explain one thing about being a security guard entering a party with drunk people. The first thing you get is jokes. So everybody's laughing and making a chat. Now, I wasn't in a hurry considering that I had just begun my shift and no other alarms really got triggered, so... I'd joke along when suddenly we all get silenced by a deafening shout that says, Security! Now the scary part is, it was my voice. I recognize my own voice very well, since as a hobby I play video games and stream them. I have my voice echoing weakly in my ears, and this was me. Thing is, as I was talking there for a minute, some of the people realized it was voice very similar to mine. The look on their face gave away that it wasn't them playing a joke on me. I've never seen drunk people go sober in under a third of a second until now. Feeling strengthened by having company, I told the janitor to join me. He had all the keys, so that was my excuse for him to walk along. I told him we're going to go check who's doing this. We walk into the hall and there's where I decided to act like I'm totally fine. I shout at the top of my lungs, We're on the first floor. While I'm at it, I decided to end with a joking comment saying, I am the security guard now. Meanwhile, the principal sobered up so quickly he decided to end the party right there and then. He sent everybody home in under ten minutes. 
the dude kind of pressured them like crazy. The thing is, drunk people usually stretch to go home. Here they went completely willingly and seemingly nervous. Now keep in mind this school is freaking huge. It echoes through the mid-open sections and reverbs on every single hallway on every floor. So whoever shouted in the first place must have heard me. Yet it stayed silent. Which I didn't like, to be honest, because that would make it less likely to be a pranker from the Christmas party. I hear the last people walk out the door, but the janitor is looking for answers. He tells me to check out the school with him. He's afraid that maybe one of the students who caught air about the Christmas party sneaked in and was messing around. We decided to walk up top and go from top to bottom, since I got the time and since I wasn't alone. The backup really gives me a false sense of security. We walked top to bottom since whatever we ran into we could sweep sort of slowly down toward the entry. A little trick against burglars. Give them an exit and they'll use it. It's kind of nice for our safety, to be honest. So while we're heading upstairs we hear above us something dropping on top of the floor. We get tense and stop for a second. I decided to shout, Hello, anyone up there? This is security. We're about to close down the building. It goes dead silent again. So we get to the top of the stairs, and at this point, another sound. This time, one floor below us. This is the point where we are convinced that we are not alone. We decide to exchange phone numbers and sweep both floors at the same time. I mean, this janitor wasn't scared. I guess he didn't know about what was going on in the school. Not totally comfortable with the idea of splitting up in such a huge building, I complied anyway. I take the mid-floor section, he takes the top. When he's done, he would walk downstairs and phone me while waiting near the top entry, so we could both sweep the basement. The stairs to the basement were near the main entrance. While we're both doing our own section of the building, I hear all kinds of noises at this point. Not being silenced by our chatter, it suddenly becomes much more clear to me that we're being idiots and should just get the hell out of there. I hear the guy suddenly shout up to me that he's done with the midsection. Not what we agreed to, but sure, I'll come downstairs. Walk to the entry and he's not waiting there. I peek into the basement and I hear him running down the stairs. At this point I walk downstairs and I just catch a glimpse of one of the basement doors shutting behind him while I see kind of through the glass door and he's walking away from me. I want to speed up while my phone starts ringing. At this point I get a little jump scare because common the basement is scary as hell, the non-student part of the school. I answer the phone expecting it to be dispatch or a colleague or something, but nope, it had to be the damn janitor. Hey, I'm done sweeping the midsection. I'm waiting at the entry now. This is what I hear coming through the phone while I'm standing in the basement looking at someone's back slowly walking through the hallway away from me. Holy crap, I'm being lured by something. I bolted upstairs, told him I sweep the basement already. Let's get the fuck out of here. He must have noticed that I was terrified at this point. I was sweating like crazy and stuttering. I never stuttered before in my life and I was pushing him to be quick. He asked me if I was okay. I told him just not to make the parties here too late. Seems like he understood because looking at him being pale and not asking any questions further, he quickly took the keys and pushed them up to the alarm system. He had a tag on it which turns the alarm system if you kind of hold it near the sensor. The building's old, the alarm system was quite new. It was replaced after a lot of false triggers. We walked outside the building and I have shivers running down my spine. We look up back at the building and on the top floor it looks like a figure standing in the window. We didn't see it move, we couldn't be totally certain it was a person, but my last comment was, Whatever it is, if it moves, it will trigger the alarm. And at that point, it's a problem for the police.
my cousin and I were kind of terrorized in her basement. First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado. It has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom and bathroom and a sort of a living room area with a couch and TV. And it also has a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt and uncle, and my grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now, by the way. The basement became more or less the guest room. So that's where I would stay whenever I would visit so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement, and I'm pretty severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'm going to call her Megan, they were around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something. And then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours. We were drawing and just hanging out when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started. This is when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her, since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened. And she knew it wasn't me, since I was in the middle of just saying something. We both paused and then confirmed that we both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom. Since they'd have some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows, especially. I wanted to go upstairs, get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out herself. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet which had the door closed. She opened the door, and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover it was just some blanket spilling over the lower shelves that we'd forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough sound come from what sounded like the entrance of the basement. We slowly crept out of the basement, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word both started packing up all of our things, like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And rather than leave the basement, we went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor-length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence. Some weird primal understanding going between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside of the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us, since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of being there or someone else being down there was so strong. Megan settled into bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to her rescue. Mm, there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that there was somebody in the basement with us. While we knew there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. 
We were both so scared of making any sort of noise for any reason, and neither of us really understood why. But we made sure to walk on our toes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound that we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of somebody shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that's also kind of acting as a window for the basement bedroom, again running around. The rocks at the bottom moving and bouncing off the window. Then it went silent. About ten minutes later, it sounded like another animal fell in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much the entire hour, if I'm remembering correctly. The entire time all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended, or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster. Just plain fear, anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something's just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise. We heard my uncle get up to take their dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all. We felt suddenly exhausted as the adrenaline that had been filling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sound hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little safe without leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, a count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated in sunlight. The lights that we had left on were just sort of vacating in the living room. Excuse me. We booked it up the stairs, came to a screeching halt in the kitchen, where her dad was making coffee or something. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked, and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with, and the entire basement was empty. Megan made us some ramen for breakfast, since we were starving and just wanting something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs eating and trying to come to terms with what I'd just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying for not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then she did experience it for herself later that year. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense. It's like there was this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, that whatever it was was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they gave the resident ghost that stays down there. But I don't think so. Nothing like that's happened to anyone else ever again. And it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what's down there with us or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something scary with us that night. And it scared me in a way I've never, ever felt since. Something is happening in my apartment. I moved into John's apartment a couple of months after he started dating. I know it sounds quick, but we knew each other well before dating, and it's not the point of the story. 
on March of 2016, and he lived here since 2013 already. Not long after moving in, I started to notice some strange things. Some objects would disappear, then reappear randomly. It was always small objects, and it was a rare occurrence at first. John said that it was a thing I should get used to, because it happened to him even before I started living here. Over the months and the years, it was occurring more and more often, to the point of at least once or twice a week. We started joking about it. We pretended that there was a leprechaun stealing our things when we weren't looking. I started saying, still jokingly, that it was more of a ghost, because often we would find the lost stuff. It would be in random places, sure, but we still ended up finding them. I even realized that if I lost something and I asked out loud to please give the stuff back to me, I would often find it in the same day or the day after. Maybe in a random place or right where I already looked three times before. I have three main examples of what happens most of the time. One, we would have to go somewhere and I wanted to wear one of my favorite shirts. I searched in my wardrobe on the shelf where I put all my t-shirts. It wasn't there. I was sure that it was here and, well, it couldn't be in the washing machine since I took it out of the washing machine, put it on the clothes rack to dry, and then I put it in my wardrobe. So with all my other shirts two days prior, that's what I did. So I took all my t-shirts one by one out of my wardrobe, expecting to find the shirt that I wanted to wear. When the shelf was emptied, I still hadn't found this shirt. I asked John if, well, maybe he had taken it, but he said no. So I put every shirt one by one again, just in case I missed it, back on the shelf. Still, no trace of this shirt. Then I said out loud, Please, can you please give me my shirt back? I need it. I went to the toilet, and when I came back, the shirt was there on top of the other t-shirts. John couldn't have done it. He was and stayed in the living room. I was on the toilet, and from the living room you have to go past the toilet to go to the room where clothes are. So I would have noticed if he had left in the living room in general, so I grabbed my shirt and I said, Thank you, out loud. Two. We have two incense holders. One made out of wood, who is pretty basic, and one who is a gift from John's sister made of ceramic. The wooden one is usually in the bedroom, and the other is usually in the living room. One day John wanted to burn some incense, but he was unable to find the ceramic incense holder in the living room, where he spends most of his time. So we came to the bedroom. He was looking for the other one, and it had also disappeared. I got up and we both started to look for them. I found the wooden incense holder in the sink. I grabbed it and went to join John, while saying that I'd found the wooden one, and then I found another wooden incense holder, exactly like the one I had in my hand. That was on our freezer. Weird, but okay. Maybe we had another one and I forgot. Then I found a third wooden incense holder. It was looking like the other two were the ceramic ones usually standing. Finally. I found the ceramic incense holder in the bedroom on a shelf, where none of us had put an incense holder before. 3. I'm still upset about this one. I ordered a single blade razor online not too long ago. It took almost two months to arrive. The joy of AliExpress. I feel ya. When it finally arrived, I put it inside my makeup bag. The next day, Perfect timing. We had to go out and I wanted to wear makeup for the occasion. As I said in the preface, I spend most of my time on my bed, but... And I do pretty much almost everything on my bed, including my makeup. And when I do it, I push all the blankets to the end of the bed in a corner, so nothing can accidentally get under the blankets. I always start with my makeup with my eyebrows. So, of course, I use my new single blade razor. 
When I'm done with it, I put it back in my makeup bag and keep doing my makeup. Makeup finished, time to tidy up. I noticed that the razor is missing. I looked around me, under me, under the pillows, under the blankets. Still, no trace of the razor. I take every item one by one out of my makeup bag and it's definitely not in there. I put the items back inside the bag and I searched under the bed. Another time under the pillows and blankets. I shook the blankets. I looked once more inside the makeup bag and under the bed, but I still couldn't find it. And to this day, I still haven't found my razor despite me asking, well, out loud to the thing that steals our stuff to please give it back to me. We also moved the bed and we changed the blankets multiple times. I'm still bitter about it, because it took a lot of time to arrive and I could literally use it only once. So this is mostly what's happening within my apartment. Stuffs either disappear and reappear in random places after you ask politely. They are, sometimes they disappear forever. Or disappear and reappear in multiple places at the same time. And please note that those things never happened or are never happening outside of this apartment. I never experienced something similar when I lived with my parents. Or when I lived in my own apartment. Or when we're at my, you know, best friend's house or my mother-in-law's house or outside shopping. It only happened or is only happening inside our apartment. And I was fine with that until this week. At the beginning of the week, I can't remember the exact day, I was brushing my teeth in the bathroom. And from the corner of my eye, I saw something moving. I saw a black shape moving really fast probably running from left to right. It was in the hallway between our bathroom and the bedroom. It was pretty small, about the size of a medium-sized dog. I only saw a shape, nothing that looked like limbs or a head. It was very quick. It didn't look like an animal or a humanoid. Two days after the incident, I saw the exact same thing from the corner of my eyes, also while brushing my teeth in the bathroom still running fastly from left to right in the same hallway. Made me freak out. I don't know what it may be, but I have a bad feeling about it. I couldn't really explain why, but the thing I saw was really black and dark and it just has a bad vibe. I'm currently trying to avoid going to the bathroom as much as possible. The last thing that happened is what made me write this post happened a few hours ago when I was taking a shower. I can't stay standing up for too long, so I always have my shower sort of sitting down. I had enough energy today, so I wanted to wash my hair. While sitting down in my, with my wet hair, I was just cleaning my body, and I saw it again. My shower has a door that makes things very blurry. From inside, and blurry from outside. So... Like last times, I saw a black shape moving very quickly, but no detail, nothing definite. I saw it sound, well, I guess outside of my shower, but it was still not really big and it looked like it moved from its height to the floor and disappeared. I waited a little, got out of the shower with my wet, unwashed hair. Now I'm afraid to go to the bathroom alone. I don't want to see it again. And for now, I only saw it when I was in the bathroom and alone. Overseas Henri Ordeal This took place last month. I had planned a trip with my friends to two cities within the same country that were neighboring each other. Let's just call them City A and City B. The backstory is, is that I have no prior history of experiencing supernatural entities. Be it imagined or real. In my 21 years of life, my home country, that is. In the 24 hours before my flight to City B, I received the word death twice. 
This was over text by the same person. I considered this an omen. Thankfully, I touched down safely in City B. My friends and I then took a bus from City B to City A. My friends and I failed to observe many Chinese superstitions when selecting and entering a hotel room in City A. We chose a very corner room, failed to mess up the arrangement of our shoes, didn't knock on the wardrobe door before opening, left room chairs empty before going to sleep, etc. It didn't help that the room opposite our corner room was a numberless room, despite it being on a high floor with a beautiful city view. It just seemed unlikely for the hotel to waste a room overlooking the beautiful view as a staff room, and to more like something might have happened in that room in the past, which is why the hotel staff removed the number, perhaps. I noticed a lamp flickering at 3.08 a.m. During the last night in City A, and the very next morning when I played blackjack, a gambling game based on probabilities and luck, I lost all my money. Even though I was previously having a huge winning streak of over 200 plus games, my interpretation of this was that something had signaled its presence in the room and later turned my good or neutral luck into bad luck, resulting in my financial loss. When we returned to City B, Though we had a slight improvement, we again failed to observe several Chinese superstitions. On the second night, I heard what sounded like footsteps slightly past 3 a.m. in the morning coming from outside our room. The following night, I was playing blackjack again on my phone, when I suddenly experienced a noticeable shift in my luck from good or neutral to bad. I heard what sounded like soft thunder, followed by a shadowy figure appearing in my peripheral vision at the corner of my room. It was at our shoe area, just beside the wardrobe. We had failed to knock on the wardrobe door once again in this hotel before opening. However, we had successfully messed up the arrangement of our shoes this time around. My interpretation was that the messed up shoes confused whatever thing I saw there. So it just stuck at the shoe area without advancing closer towards me. The quote-unquote entity appeared another eight or nine times my peripheral vision, however disappearing with each time I turned my head to look at it. At the same time, I started experiencing statistically improbable losing streaks before I eventually lost all of my money once again, I proceeded to shower, which was a very bad idea in hindsight, considering what I had just witnessed. While showering, I felt as though something was watching me. There was also a sensation in my right leg twice, as though something was trying to grab it. The shower cubicle also started filling up with an unusual amount of water, such that when I opened the cubicle door, the toilet flooded immediately, which is something my friend confirmed when she entered the toilet the next morning. My interpretation of this is that something had, well, hoped that I would fall down while showering. The unsettling part is that the shower cubicle was poorly designed such that it was partially soundproof. So if something had happened to me, my friends who were already sleeping when I was showering would probably have only discovered me the next morning. After showering, I woke to my friends, and they requested to change a room. The next day I tried to build up good karma, quote-unquote, and actively donated to people requesting for donations every time I had the chance. However, for the whole day, I could feel around eight or ten times a similar sensation of my right leg being grabbed. This night, while I was waiting for my turn to shower, I took a nap. Then I heard the sound of soft thunder again, paralyzed with fear at the thought that it might have found me once again. My whole body just suddenly couldn't move. Despite hearing my friends calling me, 
couldn't respond. Just when the hotel staff paramedics and police crowded into the room, I slowly became responsive and regained control over my body. I agreed to go to the hospital, just to be safe. In the hospital, I heard thunder noises again. The next day, my friends had to return back to our home country. Around two hours after my friend left, I heard what sounded like my friends talking just outside my ward. However, I couldn't make out what they were saying. I texted my friend to ask if they were still in the hospital. They said they were already at the airport. I was transferred to a second hospital shortly after. I could sense that the second hospital was a very dirty quote-unquote place when I saw the entrance of the building, as it was a very old hospital, 40 plus years old. I saw many omens during the first few days, such as flipping to random pages in a book and the first word I'll be seeing is the Chinese word for death, as well as repeatedly seeing the number combination of 444 which is a very unlucky number combination in Chinese culture. Every night, I'd made it a point to arrange my slippers in opposite directions before going to sleep, just to be safe rather than sorry. One of the mornings when I awoke, one slipper was missing. Until this day, I still don't know where it went. On the fourth night at the second hospital, I believe, I met and saw in front of my very eyes the entity who I believed had been following me. A female Anrio, probably around my age. She tried communicating with me the next night when she appeared to me again, but ultimately we failed to have any meaningful conversation. Then I didn't see her for the remaining few days at the second hospital, possibly because I was surrounded by a lot of positivity during the remainder of my stay. However, on the day I was discharged, about an hour before boarding the plane, I met her again at the airport. It seemed like she was saying goodbye to me. The doctors being doctors claimed I was imagining things. But you can't argue that the omens, the lamp flickering, me losing all of my money in my gambling account twice, and me losing one side of my pair of shoes, especially during or near the times of the supposed supernatural encounters, like they were all uncanny incidents. So what do you think? Was this all a figment of my imagination, or did I encounter something supernatural? I'll leave it up to you to decide. I vote the latter. At least on this one. Story time from years ago. Intro. I'm 23. I've been interested and a believer of paranormal since I was about 14, I think. This happened when I was, well, about 10 to 14, I can't exactly remember. I was living with my parents in Stockbridge, Georgia. Into the event or story or whatever you want to call it. From the time period, I never really believed in ghosts, skinwalkers, and blah, blah. I watched Pet Cemetery, The Purge. We lived in a three-bed, two-bath house. This was in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, and I worked a lot. It got to the point where I'd be home alone at night, up till like four or five in the morning. So the only time that I would see them would be before school, until the weekend. There was one night in the winter where it snowed. It wasn't really snow. Instead of snow, we got ice. It was about eight or nine at night, and I was watching Adventure Time. Probably wasn't the best for my eyes, but I was watching it in the pitch black dark. As I was watching, I saw a black dot zoom past the TV. I thought nothing of it, thinking the TV was just being stupid. For some reason, my brain said, Hey, look at the bottom left of the TV. So I looked there, and what I can remember, I saw almost fingers, but they weren't. It was like I could see an outline of fingers and still see the TV. It was like it was transparent. I blinked, and they were gone. I thought to myself, 
Okay, yeah, maybe I'm tired, whatever, it's the weekend. As I continued watching, I got really cold and felt really uncomfortable, like someone was in the room with me. At the corner of my eyes, I saw some movement, so I darted my head over and happened to see, like, darkness fade away. I thought nothing of it and just assumed my eyes were adjusting to the dark from the light, kind of like a lens on a camera. I watch for a bit longer and two rolls around. So I start to pack it in, turn off the TV and start going to the stairs. As I'm walking, it feels like someone is behind me. I can feel the footsteps on the floor, so I stop. When I stop, the vibrations of the floor continued but got slower. I turned around, then they completely stopped. As I look around in the dark, still stationary, I happen to feel this heavy weight on my chest, as if the wind got knocked out of me. I was starting to freak out a bit, but wasn't showing it. Kind of like, what the fuck? Guess I need to go to the doctor. When Ma or Pa have time to take me. I turn around and continue toward the stairs. Out of nowhere, a big burst of adrenaline kicks in, and I hear what sounds like a full-on sprinting behind me. I did not stop. I hauled ass up the stairs. Once I got upstairs, I looked down. Nothing. At this point, I thought I was delusional and sleep-deprived and beyond. Until I felt a tug on my shirt from behind me. I whipped around and absolutely nothing. At this point, I thought it was a joke, so I started saying, Hello, in the dark. While well, something replied right next to my ear. I heard a deep, gargled whisper reply with, Hey. After I heard it, I froze, heart pounding out of my chest. Then I felt a long blow of cold air in the same ear, which made me basically run into my, bath, my bedroom and hit the lights and close my door. I was fully awake, and at this point, three was rolling around, at which point I heard tapping and light scratching on the other side of the door. I turned my bedroom TV on, blaring volume, the whole house. Hell, probably the whole neighborhood could hear it. At some point, I calmed down, turned the TV down, and I had to pee. At this point, it's been an hour. I was like, okay, so my imagination's getting the best of me. Pee, then bed. The minute I opened the door, I was met with a tall, dark, white-eyed figure looking at me from where the access to the attic is. I immediately shut my door and pissed out the window. I did not sleep that night at all. I told Pa about it when he got home, too. He slapped me upside my head and said I watched too many horror movies. I told my friends about it, and they said I should call 911. So I figured maybe I'm just crazy. A few days pass, nothing happens. So I figured, okay, I'm sleep-deprived. Week goes by and Saturday hits. I'm home alone playing Xbox with my door wide open. I had an Xbox Connect, and I was actually setting up the Connect part of it for just dance. I'm getting it set up for my figure and everything when all of a sudden the dots start hovering over something beside me. From my height at the time, I'd have to say this thing was eight feet tall. Thought to myself that, well, this thing thing that messed with me last week, if so, why? I turned off the connect and just decided if it exists, then we can coexist, and started playing Battlefield 3. I then feel something hit my beanbag chair. I looked around for what it was and found it was my baseball. I thought to myself, if this aimed any higher, then it would have hit my head. I got angry and screamed at the top of my lungs, leave me alone, whatever the heck you are. I guess I didn't like that. My door slowly shut. My TV fell over. All my tapestries got yanked off the wall. As all that started happening, I just sat down on my beanbag chair and just sat there. Eventually, it all stopped. I told Ma about it when she got home and she was stunned. I guess not entirely shocked. Ma helped me fix my room and set my TV back up. 
and then told me about this thing messing with me. She told me when she was younger, her and her friends played with a Ouija board in her room, which was now currently my room. She said whatever it was comes and goes as it pleases, as it has even messed with her in the mornings and late at nights when she's off, when Pa works, not asleep. She even gave it a name, Mickey. She said as long as I don't acknowledge him, he will leave me be. After that, things kept happening, though. But they weren't as intense. Instead of my ball getting thrown, it got rolled. Instead of being chased up the stairs, I was followed. Instead of things getting yanked, it got brushed against. April 19th, 2015, when moved, Mickey did not follow. However, ever since my experience with Mickey, I've been obsessed with the paranormal. As it's happened to me, the good experience is the bad with just the one entity. I want to try more, experience more, and interact with more. I refer to Mickey as a likable and respectful demon. As when Ma told me about him, I researched paranormal and found that it could have been a hell of a lot worse, honestly. I hope you guys enjoyed this tale from the past, as it's a true experience and got me to believe in the paranormal and start to actually do my own investigations and interactions with entities. I'm not much of a storyteller. Sure hope that if you guys get a demon, then hopefully it's just as chill as Mickey. My story about my grandmother's house. Let me start off by saying that these stories are 100% real. Also, let me say that I do not believe in ghosts per se, but these stories are things I think about often. They give me the willies every time I think or talk about them. Buckle up. Due to the backstory being needed, this is going to be a long one. I grew up in southern Louisiana, and as a kid, I loved going to my grandparents' house to do things such as fish, watch movies with my grandfather, and cook with my grandmother. This house is a beautiful home, still standing, surrounded by stately oaks and broad magnolias. Baton Rouge folks will get the reference. It has a long, winding driveway where moss hangs from hundreds years old, or excuse me, from hundred-year-old oak trees. This is over the gravel drive, and a beautiful pond off to the right side of the drive. It's an absolutely beautiful home on an absolutely gorgeous piece of land. The woman who built the house owned a small shop in the suburb of South Louisiana. This woman was very beautiful, and from what I've been told, never missed an opportunity to dress up in her high heels. She was married to a man who'd been in a car accident, I think. He was severely handicapped. As his condition got worse, she had to sell the house and downsize in order to pay for his medical bills. When my grandparents bought the house from her, she was extremely devastated that she had to let it go. She was legitimately obsessed with this house. It was like a child to her. She was so obsessed with this house, in fact, that there were several times that my grandparents went out to run errands and came back to her there peering into the windows of the house to quote-unquote check on it. Fast forward some years after she moved out of the house. My grandparents were settled. She was killed by a notorious Louisiana serial killer that tormented South Louisiana from 92 to 2003. She was one of the seven-plus victims in his terrible killing spree. Fast forward again years after her murder, I started spending many weeks at this house loving life, being a normal kid. I had no idea about the previous owner, but always felt very uneasy when I was in this house by myself. Hearing random knocks and footsteps was normal, and my grandparents always just attributed to the house shifting. My grandmother's two Siamese cats, Wally and Ernie, were always around and sort of comforted me when I was alone in the house. I always thought that they could also be attributed to the random noises. When my brother and I would go over there to the house as young kids, 
we would sleep in the bed in the master bedroom with my grandmother and her two cats. We would be constantly woken up by weird noises and what sounded like somebody walking on the wood floor in the hallway connected to the closet. What's extremely creepy about this is that in front of the closet there were high heel marks, or excuse me, high heel marks, permanently marked into the old creaky wood floor where the previous homeowner would get dressed and put on her high heels. One night I clearly remember knocking. It was loud enough to wake me up, and one of her cats getting extremely agitated to the point where it stood up on all fours looking in the direction of the noise with its hair standing up on its neck. The feeling that someone was in the room was extremely startling and spine-chilling. This started to happen more times than not, especially when we went over there. At this point, I started to ask my grandparents questions due to the fact that I was scared shitless every night I went there. They acted like they had no idea what I was talking about. I'm sure that, well, I'm sure. I'm sure that was to make me not scared. One day, I was in the office and computer room at the front of the house by myself while everybody else was outside fishing. I was genuinely enjoying myself drawing a picture of a pelican that I had pulled over my computer. Sitting next to me was a stack of DVD cases, stacked about four or five feet high in a desk. When I looked down to resume my pelican drawing, a stack of cases were forcefully pushed off the desk and landed about two to three feet away on the floor. I simply couldn't believe my eyes. I got up and ran outside as fast as I could. When I told the story to my grandparents, they were very skeptical just kind of laughed it off. At this point, I was genuinely convinced that something was wrong with this house. One night, not long after the event, while watching a movie with my grandfather, something happened to me that I will never forget. My grandfather had just fallen asleep and was laid back in his recliner delivering his trademark loud snores. Being that the house was away from any light source and that it was miles from town, it was extremely dark and quiet when the lights were off. I continued to watch the movie by myself and got the intense feeling like someone was watching me. I tried to brush it off, but it was so intense that it felt like someone was standing next to me just watching me watch the movie. The room started to feel like it was getting smaller and smaller around me. It genuinely felt like I was intruding on someone else's space. Eventually, in the hallway behind us, I heard footsteps as if someone was walking away in high heels. It was the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. To this day, I have no idea what happened, and it will forever perplex me. Not long after that, my grandfather told us the story of the previous homeowner and her love and obsession with the house. Both of my grandparents are chemists, and the people of science, just like me, they didn't believe in ghosts. I don't know what it was in that house, but we eventually stopped going over there because it scared us beyond belief. In the summer of 2016, the house along with most of Baton Rouge area flooded. It got eight feet of water throughout the whole house and destroyed every wall and even some of the ceiling. At that time, my family's house flooded as well, so I was living with a friend. One night, my grandmother asked if I could just go let the builders into her house. That way they could continue the work on the house. I agreed, picked up the key from her, got to the house early, just so I could experience that energy one last time before they sold it and got rid of it. I walked up to the front door, unlocked it, and walked in. To my very pleasant surprise, I didn't feel anything. The house was empty, all of the walls were knocked down, and I could see through the whole building from the kitchen all the creaky wood floors with the high heel marks were torn out. All of the belongings were gone, and it was barren. It smelled like a powerful mixture of mud and paint. I genuinely think that this flood took whatever energy that was in that house out with it when it drained. It's so weird because I have such an attachment to that house. I want to own it one day, even though it scared the ever-living fuck out of me in my youth. K.
Connecting the Dots I always was freaked out by ghosts growing up, but never truly believed in them. I would always freak myself out watching scary videos and jump at shadows for the next couple nights. But something different happened to me not too long ago. Something that sends shivers down my spine every single time I tell the story. It all started my sophomore year of high school. I had one of my buddies over for a sleepover. After staying up till midnight playing games, we decided to go to bed. I was lucky enough to have an extra bed set up in my room that I had my friend Dave sleeping in. We end up falling asleep after some time and some chit-chatting. Later in the night, I'm awoken to a blood-curdling scream coming from Dave across the room. He was sitting up in his bed, pale as a ghost. I asked him what happened and why he was screaming. He replied, Uh, nothing, I'm sorry. Must have just been a nightmare. I said, Oh, okay, no problem, I guess. Then we fell back asleep. Some years later, I was sleeping in my bed. I was alone in my room this time around. When I suddenly woke up with cold sweats and in a severe panic. I just assumed I woke up from a nightmare that I didn't remember. Some preface. I usually would sleep in my bed facing the wall because I never wanted to look out into the abyss of my room and become horrified by mere shadows. So when I woke up that night, I rolled over and checked my phone. The time was 4 a.m. When I set my phone down, I saw something that made me freeze in terror. I was staring eye to eye with a young boy, mouth agape, eyes blacker than the depths of the sea. He was wearing old-timey clothing, a white-collared button-up suspender. His hair was a neat jet black in the bowl cut. I have never been so horrified in my life. I couldn't move. All I could do was just stare at this figure who moved not a muscle. He was paralyzed with fear, just like me. After what felt like an eternity, I reluctantly rolled back over and tried to fall asleep, hoping that I was just having a bad dream that felt all too real. To my dismay, the nightmare would soon become a reality. The next day I went through my daily routine, trying to forget about the horrors I faced the night before. As the sun fell, I felt a sense of dread take over me, knowing that I would have to go back to bed eventually. I laid in bed watching my TV with the sleeper timer on. I eventually fell asleep. I was once again awoken, same cold sweats, same alarming trepidation. I checked my phone, which this time luckily was on the side of my bed closest to the wall. The time lit up to a familiar sight. It was 4 a.m., and to my dismay, I suddenly got an unstoppable urge to turn around. Once again, I saw the nightmarish gaze. I was freaking out so bad I ran out of my room and sat in the living room with all the lights on. My mom heard me running down the stairs and asked me what happened. She told her, or rather I told her everything, about both nights and that disturbing nighttime visitor. She chalked it up to sleep paralysis and explained that sometimes dreams can feel real. I assumed she was correct. I mean, she's a mom, they're usually right, right? Right. The next year, on a dark, cold night, I was hanging out with my older brother on the back porch, shooting the shit. We talked about everything. Work, school, aliens. And then we got to the topic of the hour. I asked him, Hey man, have you seen anything crazy around the house? Like anything spooky? He told me, Yeah, now that you mentioned that, you're not gonna believe, but... I've heard some creepy shit recently. I was in my room late that night, and I heard a strange, inhuman moaning coming from my door. 
There was also a nasty scratching at the bottom of the door, almost as if there was an animal of some kind on the other side of it. The only thing is, Barry, our only dog at the time, was with me in my room. I was starting to get chills, but I was intrigued. I said, Damn, that's crazy, man, but like, have you seen anything? He shrugged and said, I think it may have been a dream, or maybe I was just too high that night. My brother was a big stoner back then. But I think I saw something in the living room. I was out there by myself late at night playing games on my phone. I looked up at the fish tank and saw what looked like a strange young boy with his face pressed against the glass, hands by his side, just standing there, motionless. I was starting to panic. I mustered up the courage to ask him the question. Danny, what did he look like? And Danny told me every single detail with incredible accuracy with my encounter. I would never told anybody about this beside my mom. Even then, I didn't go into that much detail with her because she didn't seem to believe me anyways. But he described everything. The white collared shirt, the suspenders, the bowl cut. I was absolutely mortified. I told him my story. And then he started freaking the hell out, telling me that there's no way that this is a coincidence. Suddenly, I remembered my friend in my room years back. I gave him a call. And Jesus Christ, I wish I didn't. Hey, Dave, what's up, man? Hey, I got a question for you. Do you remember when you were sleeping over at my house and you, like, woke up screaming? I was just curious as to what that actually was, just wondering. He said... Oh, man, I think it was just a nightmare. Could have sworn I saw a boy in your room. I thought it was like your younger brother, but when I looked at him and looked at you, he was gone. Me and Danny are freaking the hell out at this point. He was sprinting around to my pool, yelling my ass off, and, well, he gets back to me and we recollect ourselves. Dave's on the phone still at this point. What? What's all that yelling? Dave, can you tell me what that boy looked like? Mmm, yeah. He looked like really old-timey, like early 19th century. He had, like, suspenders, a white shirt, and, oh, he had, like, a black bowl-cut hairstyle. To this day, that story haunts me to my goddamned core. I can't seem to find any other options beside that I was in, well, indeed a spirit, or that was a spirit that had visited us. I sleep with the night mask on now. Ask Reddit During college, I experienced what I thought was a potential haunting due to certain events that made my room scary to hang out in. Everyone agrees it was a haunting, especially after we did a ghost hunt and got EVP. I'll post that at the end. The first event happened while my sister was in school, and parents were on a date. My grandmother was in her room on the other side of the house. I was napping before heading to school. As I'm lying there, I hear footsteps down the hallway. My door is wide open, so I look out to it and I see no one. I lay back down, and then the door slowly creaks closed. I roll over, and it slams shut. Panicking, I start yelling at my family, but no one says anything. I text everyone, and they're still where they were. I feel creeped out, but try ignoring it. That is until the door slowly creaks back open, and I once again see no one. I start yelling for my grandmother, and I hear her open her door and start making her way toward me. I'm staring at the hallway, but see nothing aside from her walking toward me, and I start freaking out, explaining to her what's going on, and right as she reaches my room door, it slams shut. She's shaken by this too, quickly opening my door and rushing me to her room. This type of event never happened again. The next thing to happen is in regard to the heater vent. Now everyone would think an animal would be responsible. 
But how do you explain it being pushed out and hearing constant scratches when there's no animals to be seen, both in the vent or under the house during said events? To explain what exactly happened, I'll talk about the event and the vent itself. You can find it at the foot of my bed, which is where my sister's bed now is. It was positioned between my bed and the television, and then my computer was to the right and the wall was to the left. Not long after the door event, I was playing my computer and started hearing faint scratches. Living in the woods, you would get used to animals under your manufactured home. Well, it was weird, but I ignored it. Until there was a banging against the vent. It looked like something was pushing up on it. I picked up my feet just in case and I just watched it. But nothing else happened. A few nights of this happened and my dad decided to check it out. Putting on gloves, he lifted off the vent but nothing happened. The scratches continued without the vent being in place. My dad lowered in a camera but nothing was in the vent. He then went outside to look under the house, and the sliding came off very easy. Still saw nothing but heard the scratches. He kept an eye on it, even having an exterminator check it out, but, well, nothing came up. I started freaking out over the idea of something grabbed my feet and began putting my huge textbooks on top of the vent. I'd hear the scratches go on all night, fall asleep, then wake up to the books toppled over and the vent popped out. Nothing ever showed itself in my room. I had the door locked because my boyfriend lived in the room with me, so no one was coming in to mess with the books. This went on for a couple of months before just stopping abruptly. The night it stopped, we had another event. This was just a simple, but scary as hell. My boyfriend and I were sleeping. We noticed that the scratches were gone, and were in thought just wondering what the hell was going on. As we lay there in the dark, we feel pressure on our legs. Next thing we know, our blanket is literally being ripped off of us downward as if being pulled toward the vent. We panic and scream and turn on the light, only to find that the vent is in the place along with the books. This also never happened again. The last event that happened and sparked my sister to have us try ghost hunting with a few days during the beginning of summer term. My dog. Sorry. My boyfriend was at his laptop at the bed and I was at my computer. Our door was open and we were playing Aeon. A-I-O-N. Aeon? Aeon. Whatever. All of a sudden, my beaded curtain starts swaying in the door like someone just walked in. I look down and literally see a dark, childlike figure crawling on the floor right in my doorway. The curtains are scrunched around it and it had holes where the eyes would have been. I freak out and it's just gone in a flash. But my sister in the other room along with my boyfriend and I hear what sounds like quick crawling down the hallway. This freaked us out and we decided to go gust- <laughs> My dog's going crazy. This freaked us out, and we decided to go ghost. Said it again. Ghost hunting that weekend. I put up a cheap camera. My mom had gifted it to me. Set it on my computer desk. Aimed it at the vent. It had no night function, so it captures sound mostly. We take our three phones, all the same kind, using one each to either film, take a picture, or record voice. We assured everyone's hanging outside and turn off the electricity. We then went around looking through the rooms. Nothing is found at first until we listen to the recording on a cheap camera. During the time we were getting ready while we were in the hallway and about to close the door, we picked up what sounded like a dog breathing into the mic. It breathes normally as we're speaking, but then stops, like sucking in breath like it's been caught when my boyfriend thinks he hears something weird in the room. It then begins breathing for a few seconds before stopping again when I respond with, What? In a panicked way before the, 
you know, breathing a moment and then stopping again. The breaths happen between all of us talking, as if it wants to not be noticed, but then stops right as we're talking. It's almost as if something or someone was hiding in my room. Obviously, there wasn't since my room was so small that my bed was in the closet that didn't have doors and there was no space under my bed for anyone to hide. This EVP was the only thing found, and it was in the beginning of my room. We had shut the doors after leaving, and nothing abnormal happened when we opened it. The vent was intact, and the camera was in the same place. It creeped us out enough that I slept with the TV on, just in case. After that was discovered, we uploaded it to YouTube, and just went on with life. Nothing scary happened again. Luckily... I even had someone clean up the clip for me, and they confirmed that there would be a total of four different voices. Just breathing, there was no matter how much we were edited, just couldn't explain exactly what it was. But they thought maybe it was an animal. We did have a cat, but she was in her purr carrier outside during the hunt. Whatever it was, made for an odd experience we'll never forget. I need help. To begin, you must understand the background to this event. I'm from England in the UK, and I live in a city called Bristol. If you're in UK primary school, you often go on a camping trip in your final year. Year 6, which makes you like age 10 or 11. Now this camping trip is usually to a safe and secure location which is often used by many other primary schools. In my school's case, we went to PGL, Parents Get Lost, Swindon, which is around an hour or so coach journey away from my primary school at that time. Now this is a very secure and safe location used by hundreds of schools, and my school as well, plenty of times. It's full of various activities such as abseiling, giant swings, den building, etc. It's a great experience to stay in a room with all your mates from primary school and away from your parents, despite teacher supervision at all times. Now one thing to note about Swindon PGL site is that there is a main complex which is brand new, which is home to the canteen and hundreds of school quote-unquote hotel rooms. However, our school was given a building to the side which was an old converted farmhouse. The teachers loved this. However, as it could only fit one school inside, which was ours, so there was no noise from all the other noisy schools if you were staying in the main new area. Boys' rooms are on the ground floor with girls' rooms above it on the first. The farmhouse seemed slightly daunting to our ten-year-old selves, but we didn't care as we were happy to be on holiday and in our rooms with our friends. Each day you'd be given a camp leader, essentially a PGL staff member, and they would take you to these cool and exciting activities during the day, such as den building or kayaking. So on this day, we'd get into our groups that we were put in beforehand, and I was with a few of my mates and a few people in my class with two of my teachers, of course, the PGL staff member. We were then told what task that we'd be given today. And out of all the fun activities, we were given the nature trail. What a load of rubbish. Anyway, as the site is fairly small, all of the activities are all within kind of relatively close location to one another. For example... There's a thin stretch of woodland area surrounding the inner center of the main field in a square shape. In the center of this field are various activities as well as the Swindon Town Football Club training facilities. They seem to share land with the PGL camp, presumably due to its secure and low-key nature that was constantly monitored too. Anyhow, we made our way to the nature trail, which was going to be completed around the square field through the woodland area. I remember all of us being really bored as we just wanted to do the fun activities that my mates were doing. Yet, 
We were stuck on the nature trail. We headed down this fairly wooded area, but with a very large path down the middle which easily fit the whole group of us on. And of course, to our right through the trees, we could see the glimpses of fun activities in the center of that square field. Yet, as we stared down this large wooded path, it was empty with only a glimpse at the very far end of a large metal fence with barbed wire on top to ensure boundaries were secure and no visitors could get into the PGL camp or the Swindon Town FC training facilities. We carry on down the path, stopping every so often for our PGL staff member to tell us some stupid fact, when suddenly a dog appears at the very far end of the trail. The dog begins to run around the trees surrounding us on either side, and even coming very close to the group but not touching us. All the girls go, aww, in delight of this dog. Yet it seemed strange, despite being a normal-sized dog, it seemed to be able to go through the trees as if it was invisible. Furthermore, although the lighting was darker due to it being a wooded area, visibility was still very good, but the dog seemed to be as if it was dark like a shadow. As the dog is still running around the group and everyone's in awe at this dog, the PGL staff member seemed confused as if the dog shouldn't be here. Remember, this is a secure location for a children's camp and training facilities for Swindon Town FC only. That is when at the very bottom of the path, a figure of a man appeared maybe 50 meters from the group. And I still remember this in great detail. This man, just like the dog, was a dark black shadow. The man was dressed in full farmer's gear as if he was from the 1900s. Although... He was a shadow that you could make the outline of a farmer's cap, large boots and wellies, and a large trench coat. The whole group was fixated on him, and even the PGL staff member said, What's he doing here? He shouldn't be here. Then just like that, he puts on his hands to his mouth and as he was whistling, but no sound was coming out. Then just like that, both him and the dog vanished in plain sight, right in front of all of our eyes. I still remember all me and my two mates sprinting down the path to look for the man, thinking that he may have just turned the corner. Maybe it was all our imaginations. Just to reiterate, this is an enclosed and secure space, and the forest is very small with the large field being in plain sight to our right, and the other side being fenced off as there's a road outside the campsite. Anyhow, we turn the corner, we find the den building activity with a few of my other schoolmates who are on this activity. And I remember asking my friend, Do you see a man and his dog? They replied, No one's come this way. This experience was very strange and was witnessed by everyone in my nature trail group. I have no idea what it was, but I presume it was an old farmer of the land. In a ghost form, but I have no idea how the dog was also a ghost and disappeared on his whistle in front of all of our eyes. All I can guess is that it was a ghost sighting. Yet, I have never heard of any shadow sort of ghost sightings. And it was my only paranormal sort of experience. My dad has also seen a ghost and I've heard one or two other people who have also believed to see one. Yet none to what was compared to me and my mate's sighting at least. This happened around 2012 when we were all like 10 or 11. Yet, the PGL staff members saw it as well as my two teachers. They were all confused as to what we saw. I just came to this Reddit to try to get some sort of answers on what it may have been, as I know for a fact that what we all saw, it'll just live with me forever. It was really unexplainable was not a scary experience, but rather a weird one which has led me to more questions than anything. I have lived my life as an atheist, but just had my first paranormal experience. She pulled up near where the incident happened waited in the car while I got out to get what I needed. 
The first thing I notice as I'm stepping out of the car is a huge gust of wind, and leaves begin falling rapidly from nearby trees. Not uncommon, but slightly weird because it's well, still been very hot and humid where I live. Fall has not yet begun yet. The only time it gets windy, like if there's a big storm coming, and there wasn't. And I try to ignore it, but the strong gusts of wind are rampant. The entire several minutes I'm walking around getting a video of the names and dates. I finish up quickly, get back to the car. The moment I get in my mom's, just says, Ashley, I don't know if you even noticed, but I was watching and the entire time you were out there. It was so windy with leaves falling everywhere. Now that you're back in here, everything's completely stopped. She was right. I looked around and it looked like a completely different setting. Not a single leaf falling. No signs of wind. Just eerily still and completely silent. We sat and watched for several minutes to see if it would pick up again. But it didn't. Everything was completely still and... We just drove out of the cemetery. So we're both kind of weirded out, but again, I can't say that's a paranormal sign of something paranormal. Excuse me, prominent sign of something paranormal. I decide to watch the video I took so I can start looking up names. The first tombstone I happen to capture is of Mame Malden. M-A-Y-M-E. Never heard of that name. Mamie or Mame? I'm going to say Mame. I happen to capture is of May Malden. I'll later find out that she is the monarch of the entire family buried in that section where the initial incident happened. But as I'm watching, it hits me that the date of her death is 91369, as in the day that we decide to visit the cemetery to get those names is her death date. I will say that that freaked me out because what are the chances? I'd been putting it off and we just so happened to go on the day she died. What the fuck? Anyways, that's my update for you guys. I'm doing research in my spare time. feel like this is going to be an ongoing saga. And will of course let you know all the more as anything unravels. Hey, world of Reddit. This is my first post here because I don't know where else to turn to. I guess this post is... In two things without titles. Sorry and bear with me. Hello, world of Reddit. This is my first post here, because I don't know where else to turn to. I'm a 25-year-old and I've lived my entire life into this point as an atheist. I didn't believe in God and still don't, to be honest, and absolutely nothing paranormal. I was always skeptical of believers and was certain that they are just exaggerating simple stories or maybe even fabricating them entirely. I could never sit through a single episode of ghost hunting shows because I just knew they were lying and faking evidence for the TV. Fast forward to the present time. Not long ago my mother came up to visit and for a while has wanted to photograph a very old cemetery in my town. She's a professional photographer. Thought it'd be cool. We finally decided to do so, because I had free time and the weather was nice out. We loaded up all the equipment and rode over to the cemetery. We took several photos all over the cemetery, and did a lot of sightseeing of the old headstones. A lot of them are from the late 1800s. We came across an incredibly unique tombstone, an extremely tall and aged marble in color, and had like a huge oval-like opening in the middle of it. We decided to take some pictures behind the opening of that tombstone. We set up the tripod and both got behind it, took a few what ended up being silly, silly pictures. This was via the remote and had a couple laughs. She's my best friend and we stay laughing. I told her it was getting late so we should probably stop and get loaded back up head back to the house. She agreed and we walked away from the marble tombstone to grab the equipment just a few feet away. As we begin walking away, my mom is a few feet ahead of me, and I'm following directly behind her. 
I suddenly feel a heavy and abrupt weight hit my back. I can only compare it to perhaps somebody slapping your upper back with a surfboard or a huge plank of wood. It knocked the wind out of me, and I whelped, quickly freaking out trying to process what the hell was happening. I immediately noticed my mom was freaking out too, majorly. I assume that she saw or sees whatever hit my upper back, but then I noticed that she's yelling words. Get it off! What's on my back? Oh my god, something's on me! It dawns on me that she is feeling exactly what I felt. I start yelling back trying to tell her that nothing's on her and to calm down. I start frantically explaining the physical attack I just felt myself. And we both apparently felt this. We were both very visibly shocked and confused. There were no trees above us in the area where we were standing, and there was nothing on the ground around us that would indicate something being thrown. We were also the only ones at the cemetery at that time. My mom had a mark on her left shoulder a couple of days later. I'm still trying to find ways to process this as I've never been a believer. But I now do without question. And I, however, have tons of different questions. Why did this happen to us? And what was so powerful to launch such a physical attack on two human beings at the same time? Again, just why? How? This has opened a whole new world to me, honestly. It brings up curiosity for the afterlife and death in general. I dug and did some research to see if anybody's ever investigated Laurelwood Cemetery and where this happened to us. Much to my surprise, a family paranormal team that has a show on Icon Paranormal actually did an investigation there back in 2012. I tracked down their page on Facebook and reached out via Messenger. I told them about her incident and asked for more information on their investigation. The dad answered and he told me that he wasn't surprised as it was one of the most active cemeteries he'd ever been to. He also sent me to the links of all the footage that they got there and all the amazing evidence that they got. My first and last time in Lay Woods. My name is Luke, and I'm now 20 years old. This story happened to me when I was 17. This experience still gives me chills to this day. In May of 2017, I found myself going a lot more on mountain bike, and I was getting bored of cruising around the streets. So I wanted to go for a trail and a woodland bike ride. I've never been to Lay Woods before then. Personally, I don't think I'll be going alone again. After some research into a few different areas, Lay Woods seemed to be my best bed. Living only a couple of miles away, it was a nice bike ride. On arriving, it looked very peaceful and was almost like in a dream, like... at least by the first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colors at the start of each trail, signifying difficulty for bikers and lengths for walkers. Don't take my word on that bit. I still have no clue what they mean. So I decided to go down a colored... I can't remember very well, I think it was blue. A colored trail. To see how it was there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail... And now here's where it starts to get weird. I began having this weird sort of vision looking around as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and farther away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I actually lost track of time. I got lost on the trail. Now bear in mind, I'm being very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. I then come to a strange opening. I could go left in the rough direction of the way, out or right, deeper into the woods. Me being me, I decided to go deeper into the woods. I came to a weird little trail that 
just had like dodgy written all over it, metaphorically speaking. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was getting dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I then turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, but I just stood still, staring down at that trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be near impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me. I got nervous and began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind, my bike tires are completely solid. No punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. Wish I still had pictures of the bike. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing happened. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by half a mile, as if the woodland was moving. I began walking up the path feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time it felt like a bit more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind again that I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time. I'll explain the scenery before continuing. It's a long path, a slight steep hill to my left, a very narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep and maybe four feet wide. Bushes are on the other side of the river with the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting about a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if the person is okay. Also because many people go to lay woods to commit suicide. I was hoping to maybe help this person, but you guessed it, there's no one there and the crying stopped. A bit weirded out, I slowly turn away and start walking again, a bit quicker as I was unnerved this time. I've had paranormal experiences before, but not usually in a place like the woods, usually in a house or some sort of building, so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking and maybe a minute or so later, only a couple of meters away from where I'd heard the crying, it started again. But this time it was kind of right opposite me across the river. I didn't bother looking, I started to go into a bit of a jog and as I got faster I heard the bushes, just bushes, rustling as if they or it was following me. Upon hearing this I sped up and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I thought to myself, fuck this, I'm gone. I went to hop on my bike, and with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, I came to an almost sudden stop. My back tyke, tyke? My back tire on my bike had become completely flat so I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip or end up having to throw it to run faster. With the crying person still close to me, and keeping me up, I'm running faster and faster, praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling if I wanted to cry because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster. And after what felt like an hour, but in reality it was probably only five or ten minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer and started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out of that car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing as multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and I ran toward it. Whilst doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother on approaching the car park exit. I couldn't believe that my bike tire had suddenly regained all of its air. It was solid again, as at least as it was before. I jumped on my bike, got away from Lay Woods as fast as I could. I've never gone back since. Every person that tells this story becomes reluctant to go there with me 
or any extra people. Appalachian Horror I figure the best way to start this is by stating that this is a series of events that I've experienced throughout my 27 years of living in the Appalachian region of rural southwest Virginia. Some have just been feelings, while others have left me unable to be outside after dark. Which, as many of you may know, is something that you never do when you live as deep in the mountains as I do. Firstly, I will go back as far as I can remember to when we had just started living in the house that we still currently live in. In the grand scheme of things, our house really isn't all that old. If I remember, it was built somewhere around the 60s or 70s. So really not that old. When my grandparents bought the house and we moved in, that was when experiences were starting to happen. They weren't bad experiences, don't get me wrong. Mainly, things are being moved, shadows out of the corner of my eye, strange smells and sounds, but nothing I would call bad, just strange. My mother and father had moved a trailer onto my grandparents' property at that time as well, and my mother, unlike my granny and myself, is very much a skeptic. I vaguely remember her always brushing off Granny telling me about strange smells and other things happening around the house. Until one day she was by herself at the trailer. My brother and I were at school, Granny was at work, and my pawpaw was most likely in his recliner at the house. Something to know about where the trailer sat at the time and the land that we own. We own a small few acres of land with a creek running about halfway through it splitting the land that we lived and worked on from the land that was almost entirely mountainside. The trailer was sat at the very edge of the property by the creek. There was about half an acre of land between the house and the trailer, and my mother, who was home alone, started smelling a man's aftershave. Could potentially mark that up to my father, except my father didn't wear anything like that when he was alive. Not that he didn't like it, that stuff just never smelled good on him. Granny always said that smell good always rotted on your daddy, even as a baby. So it wasn't my father, my papa was in the house at the end, and that was at the end of the property. She couldn't figure out where this clove-like smell was coming from. Things went on like that for a long time. Objects being moved, the smell of a man's aftershave, all of it. Finally, I don't know what prompted it, my grandparents decided to get the house wiring checked out. Turns out that house had been wired with the same kind of wires that were used in coal mines on the lot, if not most of the wires were bad. Strangely, once the wiring was fixed, all the strange happenings in the house and property stopped. Granny still says to this day that the previous owner was looking out for us. Now, we're going to skip forward a few years now. By this time, my mother's divorced my father, given up custody of me and my brother to her grandparents. I'm still at the age where playing outside in the dirt and creek is the most fun a southern child can have. And I've made myself a little place across the creek and a little thicket to play in. It was a good, quiet place for a child to play. And it was good for a while. There's always a feeling that comes with being watched. Different feelings to being watched, and this feeling I got, even as a child, was not a welcoming nor friendly sort of watching. I never found out what it was, nor have I gotten back to that little spot I used to play in. Even approaching the area I used to play in gives me such a sense of dread and apprehension that I've never been able to shake it. A few years later, and my younger brother and I are living with my mother. We live there with her new husband. A mistake, now that I look back on it, but that's not a post for here. 
I wanted to decorate my new room, so we went to the local flea market where I bought a clock and a painting to hang up in my room. Now, before these items entered the house, it was just a normal house. Afterwards, doors opening on their own, items being moved, my cat refusing to leave my side, my things gone missing only to show up in other rooms, sleep paralysis, a tall, dark shadow moving in the corner of my eye, and voices. It was awful, and a time in my life I never want to revisit. I distinctly remember laying in my bed with my cat. My light was on and I had my CD player blaring music. The usual teen things. When out of nowhere it felt like something kicked the edge of my bed. And I'm not talking a light kick like somebody trying to get my attention. I'm talking hard enough to scoot my bed several inches to the side. There were nights where I'd be laying in bed and my door cracked because, of course, I had the room with no windows. And I've always had a slight fear of pitch black. I'd be laying there on my side, so my face was facing the door. Now, something to know about me is that I have awful vision. Without my glasses, I can only see clearly a few inches in front of my own face. This doesn't mean, however, that I can't see movement. I believe that it's far more terrifying to only be able to see a dark blur moving towards you than to clearly see what that blur is. We didn't stay long in that house, was forced to move not long after, and during the move I was forced to leave the clock behind, and oddly enough the strange happening stopped. Now we skip a bit forward in time. I'm an adult now and have had more experiences now that I'm back in my hometown in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. Everything from hearing a woman outside in the middle of the night in January saying, Hello! Over and over being outside at night smoking and getting the overwhelming feeling that if I didn't get inside immediately that something would attack me. All the way to the crickets outside going quiet and the fear of turning around to look out the window for fear of what may be looking in. What do you see? Discussion My husband and I had some very disturbing things that happened to us this summer. After we let a quote-unquote friend stay with us for about two weeks, we began to have strange things happen at our house. As crazy as it sounds, the guy we let stay with us claimed he needed somewhere to go because of, well, quote-unquote demonic shit. It was apparently happening wherever he was staying at the time. He was never more specific than that. Red flag much. We're pretty sure this guy was drugging us, poisoned my nine-year-old dog, Sonny, with rat poison, to the point that I had to put him to sleep. Damn. When I found out it was rat poison that caused his illness, it was too late. Sonny died while this guy was staying with us. After he died, we found rat poison behind the fridge that neither us nor our landlord put there. Sonny's food and water bowls were always up against the fridge near where the poison was hiding. Next to the poison, we found where somebody had made some sort of effigy out of a Q-tip and some of Sonny's dog hairs that was clearly made to look like our dog. So freaking weird. At this time, we were already hearing someone or something knock at our walls and windows at night. Always in threes. We are, well... We were and are pretty sure the guy we let stay with us was breaking in and out of our house when we were gone. We discovered that he had made a makeshift altar out of random shelving that we had. We never noticed it while he was here. We're pretty hazy on some of the times, at least when we were there with him, which we've since figured out he was probably drugging us and possibly, well hypnotizing us. We really aren't sure what we all went through, but he was there and then after he left. 
I began questioning both mine and my husband's sanity. Every single night we would stay up, and without fail, something came knocking on our walls, on the ceiling from the attic. I thought we were going nuts, until one night one of our windows opened and we heard pigs squealing. Or to be more clear, someone or something making that noise. We've yet to put this whole thing together, and there's so much to everything that happened that I really truly don't know where to begin. I know that I'm done talking with any friend or family member about it, because everyone seems very skeptical of it. I'm so tired of people making me and us feel crazy for like that horror movie nightmare that we lived in for three months. I just don't talk about it anymore at all. I'm reaching out to you guys in desperation to find out what the hell was happening at my house. What was happening to my husband and I? Do you see anything in this photo? This photo may be nothing, or it may be something. This is one of those nights when I was up working on my laptop. We believe we were very guarded because we believed someone had been breaking into our house. We found a glass bowl of pennies with two bullets lying on top of it. It was on our nightstand by the bed. And all sorts of other strange things, plus the knocking sounds. I started to feel like it may be more than someone fucking with us, and felt like there was this bad energy. Sometimes, I'd knock back on the wall, and then someone or something would knock three times again in return. Weird shit. Anyway, I was on the floor of my laptop near this window when we started hearing noises outside again, squealing and knocking. After a couple of minutes, I had decided to start taking photos outside the window to see if I could catch anything quickly. This photo was taken as I hurried to raise the blinds. I knocked them off altogether. It made a loud crash when I did so, but I still snapped the photo quickly. If that's a person's face I'm seeing, and I'm really not certain what it is that I'm seeing, at the time I thought it looked like a jester or something, but with an unsmiling face, I feel like a person would have looked shocked or caught by surprise, but the image I saw and still see today seems unmoved. Maybe I was exhausted and seeing too much into it. Maybe it's pareidolia, nothing more. Maybe there's more there that I cannot see. One of you guys can enhance the photo and see if there's anything else. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a demon. Maybe it's nothing. The only thing I'm sure of is that some weird shit was happening at the time and things felt not right. I lurk Reddit, and I don't post a lot. I thought about posting this with a throwaway, but decided against it because I wanted you guys to know I'm serious and not some person trying to get attention or shit posting. Regardless of what's in the photo, weird shit happened to us. Bad shit even. I've been, well, left very depressed over things that happened to us over the summer. I'm nearly four months pregnant now with my first baby, but I had three previous miscarriages. This is the farthest along I've ever been, and I should be, well, really, really happy. This is something I wanted badly, but I can't shake this, well, call it PTSD or whatever it is. I know I didn't go into the whole entire story, but I'd be happy to answer any and all questions, and possibly expound, expand, on anything you guys want me to. Without sounding silly, I have to admit that a lot of the things I found around the house I googled with witchcraft as a search and just kept it being directed to sites about hoodoo. Voodoo? I was living in northeast Texas near Arkansas and Louisiana borders. We've not stayed in this house since August, but we are in the same town. The intern messed up, but I'm back at school. 
I did a lot of nighttime shifts back because it was good money. I had shift lead once again and was working with three newbies. Totally fine and, to be honest, pretty great guys. The night starts off calm until around 2.30 a.m. we start getting more alarm triggers. We split the alarms evenly and worked through them pretty fast. Needless to say, I was impressed by them. They worked max two months for us, but worked like experienced people. Now, after they tried so hard, I told them that I would fix one more alarm a bit further away while they could head back to the office. Customers were done, and alarms were mostly done. Then the call comes in. My absolutely favorite school. You know the one. The alarm triggers one single zone. It was close to the entry. Now, I am at some serious distance while they could, you know, be there in about ten minutes. I decided to phone one of them and let them figure out who was going to do it. There was one of them with an extra large desire to prove himself all the time. So he reports back to me that he's on his way. In a calm manner, he tells me he's going to fix it and isn't worried about the ghost stories that leak through from the other colleagues. He would phone me once he was done. Half an hour goes by. My phone rings. The first thing he tells me is that he's so sorry, but he messed up big time. We work with instructions about the building. And here it's clearly written, never leave the keys in the janitor's room. If that door closes while the keys are inside, you can't enter again. This is a separate set of keys from the ones that we have in our cars. And guess what? He left the keys inside. It wouldn't be much of a problem except for the fact that the janitor needs these keys in the morning to open certain parts of the school. So here we are. I send an intern and, yeah, I have to go back and try to fix it. Now I'm talking with him on the phone, also explaining that I understand he did it by accident, but that it's not the end of the world. He's on the other hand freaking out. And, well, I was teaching him about the keys, but that really wasn't what was going on. He kept telling me to hurry up because he really didn't like it in there. I pull up and he's standing near the main entrance. I knew why, but didn't bother asking anything myself this time. I remembered from the start of the night shift that he was drinking from a plastic soda bottle. Now, we're in a school, so we have access to scissors. I'll not go into details, but a little trick I learned in security is that a plastic bottle and a scissor work magic for opening doors. I told him we got to look for a pair of scissors. We started wandering around, which is why I ended up here again. We checked some classrooms when suddenly we notice a window slightly opened. You can't open or enter from the outside, but still, something was close. We were considering wind or insects or other stuff from outside. It's kind of a nightmare for alarm systems. While I close the window, the intern is digging through the teacher's desk, ultimately finding a pair of scissors. We head toward the door, and that thing slams shut instantly. Our first response feeling backed up because, well, we're with just the two of us rushing to the door and slamming it wide open, only to startle ourselves again when the door slammed the wall. Nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, was hearable, seeable, or noticeable on the hallway. The intern, obviously shaken now, fully admits it's time to get out of there. That was my dog. He's got big ears. They flap very loudly. I tell him, and we head back to the entrance and jam open that janitor's door. We're with the two of us, and while I was open, he's on the lookout. I mean, I felt watched from behind there, so... It was a logical step to make him have my back. Luckily, this time, I managed to open the front door rather quick. Yeah, he's not the first intern to do this, and I bolted inside and the keys are nowhere to be found. I turn around and this dumbass fishes the damn keys out of his pocket. I wanted to kill him. He, on the other hand, is now absolutely terrified. 
He's 100% convinced that he left the keys on the table and looked through the window before even calling me. He was certain that they were in there. I'm annoyed, but I decide to let it go. While we stand there, he says he heard something. I didn't this time. I was mid-sentence when he stopped me. At this point, a usual eerie feeling creeps up on us there, and we realize it's time to go. A loud screeching sound echoes throughout the school, and we can see on the cameras the lights in the basement turn on, bright as hell. We rush toward the exit while hearing very close by a door slam shut again somewhere. We start rushing like crazy when suddenly we both get the horrible feeling that something is racing toward us. We both hear some freakishly loud and weird grunt. This is where we decided to screw the alarm system. Didn't turn it on, we just rushed outside. For about 10 minutes we tried to gather our courage to head back inside for like 10 seconds just to turn on this damn alarm. But every time we wanted, we heard some loud stuff inside, weird shouts or grunts or bangs, even knocks. We eventually muster up the courage and bolt inside. We turn on the system and, in record time, go back outside. Just before we shut the door, we hear the loudest bang of the night. We made it and we're done. We stand outside. The intern is done with this. He is swearing and making it clear that he'll never go inside here again. Well, that made the two of us. We were sent off by something. Three loud knocks seemed to come from above us, and we're outside. We both looked up and see a freakishly tall figure standing top floor. We rushed to the cars, and that was, seriously, the last time I've been there. My experience with the supernatural and a luxurious home. I just met my wife a few years ago. She was living in her late mother's lavish home in a very old and upscale neighborhood in the Northeast. The home was a hoarding situation, and her mother passed in a very sad state by herself. I told my wife at the time, let me take care of getting this all cleaned up and the home repaired until you decide to keep it or sell it. On my first day by myself there, it was a very hot day and I was working in the basement. I felt this cold breeze. All of a sudden the lights started flickering continuously. I'm a contractor and I have experience with electrical. It wasn't flickering like there was a problem. Also, the lights on the same circuit were individually flickering, which is my first interaction with whatever was in that house. I was genuinely creeped out, but continued to work, but in a different part of the house. It was almost as if something was telling me to get out of that area. This happened a few times and caught one flickering on video, actually. There were also a lot of mirrors in the home. Picture an unnecessary amount of mirrors. Sometimes I would walk past them, and just the corner of my eye I would almost see a dark figure in the background of the mirror, and as soon as I looked, it was gone. This was a few weeks into my relationship with my now wife, and I asked her about it. She went on to tell me, well what's been going on her entire life living in that house. Even as a kid, I refused to go into the basement because it was too scary, and I was too scared of what would happen down there. She was glad I was with her, because there were other things she told me about until the one night that creeped us both out. We were in bed watching TV, and all of a sudden we hear kitchen pots making a lot of noise as if someone was in our kitchen cooking. Then we smelled a rotten egg type of smell. It wasn't like a pot fell from a cabinet. It was continuous and for a good three minutes. As I went to inspect, I could see this one light getting brighter and brighter. And the second I turned the corner, it blew the light bulb out. My wife also had two dogs. There would be times when we would be lying in bed and the dogs would start barking and running around as if there were something chasing something above them. 
This happened at least a few times a week. We would be asleep at night, and out of nowhere, there would be barking at something, and it was always up, as if something were floating around the room. Her mother was also into Buddhism right before she died. One day out of nowhere, I felt this pinch on my shoulder and neck. It was so painful, and it just kept getting worse and worse. I told my wife, literally feels like someone who has a voodoo doll is placing a pin inside those areas. This went on for about three months. It was so bad that I had to visit the emergency room one day. A few days later, I was cleaning out the attic space, and I found two voodoo dolls of a man and a woman in an old trunk. After I found those voodoo dolls, my arm and neck significantly got better. I would joke with my mother about this house and how it was haunted, and she would just laugh and pretend it was a joke, until she came to help one day. Well, she became a believer. The second we walked in, we felt that cold draft again, and the lights started to dim slowly, shut off, then come right back on. She stayed for a little bit, but decided it was way too cold to be there, and after that, she refused to go into the home. As I was getting completed with work at the home, we decided to have an estate sale in the basement. As we were getting thousands of items ready to sell, this was when there was a lot of activity was coming out. Everything that I stated above was getting worse, and now we were hearing footsteps and laughing. It was as if there was a joke to whatever was haunting the place. Thoughts would enter my mind and spirits wanted to be known that they were there. My wife's dreams were becoming extremely vivid. A few times she would dream about her mother and how she had to explain that she was dead. She started talking in her sleep almost as if she were possessed or something. There was one time she was speaking Italian in the dream, yet my wife does not speak Italian. The two spots that had the most activity were the long hallway into the bedroom and great room, but mainly the basement. The basement was like the heart of the spirit. Whenever you would look down the hallway, it was almost as if you'd see a person just walking across the hallway in the corner of your eye. Someone was wearing red. Wouldn't you know, getting ready for the real estate sale, I came across a red shawl. That was exactly what I saw a few times. Doors were starting to slam out of nowhere. Pictures were falling off the walls, always extremely cold. We spent a little over a year together in that house, and we moved out of it. It was almost like a vacation to be in the house that we're in now because everything's calmer and way more quiet, too. We found out a few people died inside her mother's home from her father. One was an overdose of drugs. The others were accidents. Also, the road to the house was used by Indians to travel long before settlers came. We sold it, but I sometimes have to go back there to get light fixtures and appliances, and I can tell you that I do not miss it one bit. Everyone's dreams of having a luxurious house, but to me... We're both happier with our little 1,400-square-foot ranch. As soon as I step into the home, I almost feel as if someone is watching me. I get what I have to get. I leave as soon as possible, never longer than an hour. I stated before I had some pictures and videos, and wouldn't you know I'd have the 10,000s of videos and media content on my phone. Those were the only ones that became data-corrupted. Twelve Jinns, demonic, in one body, true story. We were a joint family. My parents, younger sister, paternal uncle and aunt, four children, two girls and two boys. My cousins were older than my sisters, and me. We had an age gap of over eight to ten years. My father and uncle were pretty close, so we stayed together in a building where the ground floor belonged to us, and the first floor belonged to my uncle. My aunt and my mom were just cordial. However, my aunt loved us 
my mom was very affectionate to her children too. One day my cousin, let's call her Sue, she came home from college and started acting very strange. Sue didn't do the usual stuff, like washing her face or eating something. Instead, she went straight into the bedroom and slept the entire day. Since my aunt and uncle were full-time working parents, my cousins would mostly stay at our place until my aunt came back from work. My mom was pregnant with my third sister during that time, and she was probably in her third trimester. My aunt came back and called Sue upstairs, but she refused to go for some bizarre reason. My mom, being her usual self, just put it off as some strain, and Sue stayed with us the entire night. Things started right away. I was about 14 or 15 years old, so I remember everything distinctly. The younger sister was about four then. I woke up to go to the washroom, and as a child, I was always afraid of the dark. I woke my dad up and he stood outside the bathroom. Now, Sue, Mom, and my younger sister were in one bedroom. My dad and I were sleeping in another one. So we didn't really know what was happening in the other bedroom. My dad just felt something was not right and checked on them. And to his fright, both Sue and the younger sis were missing. He woke my mom up, but my mom's state was almost like she was drugged to sleep. She could barely open her eyes. My dad started waking everyone up, and everyone started looking for them with my uncle, aunt, and cousins. My uncle found Sue and my younger sister crying profusely at the terrace. Sue was standing on the edge of the fence wall, and my younger sister was standing, looking at her, crying irrefutably. They were brought down and my aunt, uncle, and dad immediately understood that something wasn't right. While all this was happening, my mom woke up and suddenly started screaming from downstairs that Sue was trying to kill her, the baby. But Sue was with us. My aunt looked visually disturbed. She was staring at different points as if she was looking at someone. All the kids were sent downstairs the following day, while Sue was up with my dad, uncle, and aunt. Since my mom was pregnant, she wasn't allowed to be. My cousins were all grown-ups, but they knew something was wrong because my younger sister had been crying non-stop since last night. Nothing could calm her down. They all were trying to get her to sleep, but in vain. She, too, looked at different points and continued crying. Around noontime, a priest came, and Sue tricked all of them and came downstairs, which scared us. She looked at my mom and gave an evil scowl. She carried my sister away. She was jumping in weird postures when just everyone stopped her. And then we could see that she was possessed she hurled abuses in Hebrew. The priest told us that it was Hebrew. And also in Arabic and Urdu. She spoke in about 12 different voices which everybody heard. They were voices of women and men and it still sends chills down my spine to even think of it. They sent us all upstairs again. And meanwhile, my mother started sensing the anxiety of something. And unfortunately, her water broke. She was taken to the hospital by my cousins while my aunt and uncle and dad stayed at home with Sue. To this day, I don't know what happened, because my dad never spoke of it. But we came back from the hospital the next day and Sue was gone. She wasn't there. Nobody said of her, and the priest did some recitations on all of us. We shifted from that house because... Know, all the negative energy there. About two years later, Sue was brought back home. She looked like she had bones left, nothing else. She didn't remember anything also. My uncle and aunt tried to normalize her life, but truly in vain. In 
two or three weeks, her health deteriorated and she passed away. Except for my uncle, aunt, and dad, nobody knows what happened or where she was taken. My uncle and dad both passed away, so the only person who knows now is my aunt, and she will never speak of it. It's an unspoken rule not to talk or mention those two nightmare days in the house. That night the priest there died on an accident, precisely three days after Sue was taken away from home. That house was sold right after Sue passed away. To this day, I never experienced something even remotely as chilling as this. From the day my younger sister was born, my cousins, me, and my sisters never go a day without doing the recitations that we were told to do by that priest. It's like a routine for us now. They were just trying to help. This particular story occurred when I was only around four or five years old. I was home alone with one of my older siblings and his friend. They were like 13 and 14. Around this time, my Nana had recently got me into making little sculptures with clay that you could bake. At the time, I didn't understand the difference between the clay and my Play-Doh. This particular day, I was at home with one of my brothers and his friend. I'm not sure whether my other two siblings were at the time, like 12 and 16, but I do remember my parents were at work. Both had to work night shifts at the time. Though my mom would be home by like 10 or 11 p.m., my dad worked overnight and he had just left the house. I wanted to play alone in my room. It was upstairs in the loft and attic area. The closet was super cool. It was like a walk-in, but sort of sloped due to the building of the roof. The closet was also the most scariest place in the house. I grew to hate that room and eventually refused to sleep in it. Anyway, I'm playing in my room alone making Play-Doh food and engaging in a make-believe scenario where I have the bright idea to ask my brother to help me bake the Play-Doh. This is so my beautiful entrees can last forever. I go downstairs and I ask him to bake the Play-Doh for me. At this time, I still don't really know how to operate the oven and wasn't even really tall enough to reach the controls, even if I could preheat it myself, which again, I didn't really know how to do. I was also really scared of burning myself, so even when I had help, I usually just let them put the clay in the oven and watch from a safe distance. My brother told me no, tried to explain that my Play-Doh couldn't be baked. I, of course, knew better because my Nana baked it for me before. She didn't, it wasn't the same, obviously. I went back to begging and whining for him to do it and eventually yelled at me to stop and told me to go back to my room to play quietly. I stomped off, upset, went to my room and cried about how unfair my brother was being, and how he just didn't want to help me and he was so mean. I can still remember to this day, while I was crying in my room, this overwhelming sensation that someone was watching me. The hairs on my arms stood up, and I just had the uncomfortable, you are not alone, sensation wash over me. This wasn't new, I had already given the talk by my mom, but I quickly tried to ignore it and busy myself with playing again. When it got too overwhelming, I loudly asked it to stop and to leave me alone. Almost immediately, the sensation subsided, and I remember feeling relieved. I continued on with my play for a few more minutes before my brother busted into my room yelling about how I need to listen to him and how he had told me no. Confused and a little bit upset, he was yelling at me, and 
and I said I didn't know what he meant, and that I had just come back to the room and was playing quietly like he said to. He called me a liar, asked me when I did it. I yelled back I wasn't lying, and what in the world was he talking about? Then he demanded. I followed him downstairs, which I did, and he led me into the kitchen. He pointed to the stove and then said, Are you still going to lie now? Still confused, I said I didn't understand. He explained that the oven was turned on and set to preheat. My gut dropped and I got goosebumps. I said I didn't do it. I couldn't even reach it. He said I must have gotten a chair. Then I said I didn't even know how to do it even if I did stand on a chair. I began tearing up and swearing it wasn't me. His friend was sitting in our living room at the time, which you could see into from the kitchen. He could hear everything. He immediately jumped off the couch, flew into the kitchen, and asked me again if I really didn't do it. And I, of course, said, I absolutely did not do it. All of the color of this kid's face drained. And he looked at my brother and said we needed to get the out of the house. My brother turned the oven off, picked me up, and we ran out of the house. After sitting in the center aisle of our cul-de-sac, and then talking about how it could have happened, I said I thought it was the ghost. His friend whipped his head at me and asked, what ghost? I shrugged because I didn't really know the names or really what. Just that there was always something weird going on. My brother tried to downplay it, but both decided if none of us turned it on, then someone else must be in the house. We asked to use our neighbor's phone to call our mom at work. She said to call the cops or to ask the neighbor to walk through the house with us. We asked the neighbor and, well, nothing and no one was found. So we eventually just went back into the house. Nothing else happened that night, but this particular situation scared my brother. And to this day, he refuses to even entertain ghost stories. And every weird incident that's happened after he pretends didn't happen, despite myself, my mom, and other siblings remembering those encounters vividly. While nothing really scary happened, and I genuinely think whatever energy or spirit it was was trying to help me, it was really a freaky moment. Two experiences with apparent doppelgangers. The other night I was just talking with friends. I was reminded of two stories that happened to me. They involve apparent doubles of people that I knew. Probably about ten years ago, my friends and I were playing a game I made up in a large local cemetery. The game involved one team with flashlights guarding a MacGuffin object. Usually it was a dim red blinking light that I had, like something you'd wear at night jogging or cycling. The other team would try to sneak past the guards and retrieve the light. Basically, hide and seek meets catch the flag meets flash tag. We had just finished a round and we were gathering around large tombstones where the light was sitting when the game ended. We were calling out for the hiding team to come out and the game was over. Most of the seven or eight of us playing were there and, well, we were just waiting on Dan. I was looking around and spotted a silhouette in the near distance. The cemetery's on a hill and the backside of it is mostly set against a steep drop-off, with one of the paths running along the edge. This night was pretty bright with moonlight and light pollution from the town, so it was pretty easy to pick him out against the sky as he walked down the path. Oh, there's Dan, I said to the group, pointing. Right after I said that, Dan came walking up from my right. I was so taken aback at his sudden appearance, 
took me a second to look back up where I saw the person walking. Obviously, the figure was now gone. This admittedly may not be a paranormal experience, but a creepy encounter with the person. But here's a few reasons it may very well be paranormal. I was completely sure that it was Dan, for one. When you're good friends with somebody, you can recognize their gait and posture as they walk. This, combined with the figure's body type and hair matching Dan perfectly, made me totally sure that I'd spotted him. The other reason I don't think it was a person is that they would have had to walk back the way they came, clearly visible against the sky, or pass us under the cemetery office lights to get out of the cemetery if they were walking to the back corner. It is possible that they just walked off into the woods, but I doubt they could have walked down the steep, densely wooded hillside quietly. Our investigation over to that part of the cemetery, of course, didn't turn up with an explanation. But now for the second story, which I'm confident in claiming is paranormal. I worked at a Sears in my hometown in 2013 as a warehouse worker. One of my jobs was to stock items, clothes, and tools, all that. That was in the main warehouse in the back, or any of the smaller stock rooms around the store in different departments. One stock room in particular always gave me and my buddies the creeps. I was never sure why. It was pretty big, more like, just like dividing the clothes and soft line departments from the tools and appliances. The inside of the stock room was divided in two. One was the storage for the shoe department, with sliding ladders like a library to get to all the shelves. You could walk through from the shoe's entrance and exit a door in the appliances. The other side was sort of sectioned off by a chain link fence with shelving attached. And this part, for children's clothing, only had one door in and one door out, even though you could see through the fence to the other side. When you walked into this room, the wall was on your right, and to the left was a long line of shelves with some folded clothes and some shirts on hangers. You would have to walk nearly the full length of the room before the shelf ended, and you could turn to the left and access the rest of the stock room. I was by myself unboxing clothes. This is when I heard the door open. I was next to the door, but on the other side of the shelf. I looked up and saw the top of my coworker Jake's head above the hanging shirts. Since he was one of my friends that I, well, that thought that this room was creepy in particular, I tiptoed quietly next to him on the other side of the shelves as he walked down the corridor. When he almost was at the end of the shelf, I jumped forward and yelled, and there was nothing in front of me. Although I was very positive I'd seen Jake's head above the clothes as we both walked to the end of the aisle, he wasn't in the room with me. I'm getting so wigged out just remembering turning the corner to empty space. After a few seconds, the door opened, and this time for real, and Jake actually walked in. He asked if I was all right because he heard me yelling to try to scare him. And now I looked pale and freaked out. I lied to my manager and said I'd finished stocking the clothes so I didn't have to be in there the rest of my shift. I only later found out from the assistant store manager, Irene, that she had once found a man who had a heart attack and died in the hallway of the restrooms. This hallway, of course, was where the door to the creepy stock room was. When she was the manager of the shoe department, whose stockroom is adjacent to the creepy one, she came in early one morning when the store was extending its hours for the holidays. It was still dark out before they opened and she was sitting by herself. She was about to eat a quick breakfast. She heard one of the sliding ladders squeak, and when she turned to see who it was, two or three of the ladders were sliding back and forth down the shelves, all on their own.
a little girl is, was, or has been haunting my house. The first time something weird happened, I was daughter sitting my girl, two at night. I'm a single father and she slept in my bed. Usually, as kids do, they didn't sleep unless I went to bed with her. So it was like 1 or 2 a.m. We were lying in bed and I was pretending to be asleep. I had been quiet and still for at least 15 or 25 minutes, but I knew she was awake. She kept moving, and suddenly she started talking, or replying more likely. No, you're crazy. No, you're crazy. No, you're crazy. In Spanish, the sex of the addressee is implied. She was saying, no tu estas loca. So she said this like 10 to 12 times before I started shaking and trembling trying to suppress my laughter. So she felt this and put a hand on my back and said, Don't cry, Daddy. This moment I opened my eyes, looked at her and said, I'm not crying, I'm laughing. Who are you talking to? She pointed to the middle of the empty dark room and said, The little girl, la niña. The room was empty and almost pitch black. You could barely see the outlines of the stuff. It's very small for a room, like a prison cell. So obviously I got scared shitless, got up, lit the room, and went to play at the PC while the baby's sitting on my lap, eventually asleep until morning. Eventually we moved out and came back some years later. At this point she's 12 or 13. She's shy and quiet and smart and didn't really live through her phone. She was and is an archaic kid, bless the heavens. We built a room in the living room, just the one wall we needed so that way she could have some privacy. She never wanted to sleep there and sometimes she didn't even play there. I didn't mind much until one day I got pissed and sent her to play in her room and the answer I got was, I don't like playing in that room. I feel like someone's watching me. And sometimes I even think I see a little girl in the corner of my eye. I didn't pay much attention to him, just laughed and told her you should be afraid of the living, or something like that. This other time, we had a fridge box on the balcony. This was very near the quote-unquote room. Sometimes she used to play in it and even had it arranged like a clubhouse or something like that. So I get home and shout to see where she is because she didn't come to the door to say hi. She shouted from the balcony, Dad, come. When I got there, she got out of the box, and all of this was during the day, by the way, and she told me that she had been trapped in the box for some time, afraid to get out, because she felt a presence outside. She didn't even peek, and she told me straight up that she thought it was the little girl. People have seen it standing there in the middle of the room like washed up Samara, the girl in the ring, <laughs> this one with the white dress, the long black hair over her face, and is always looking down at her feet. She doesn't make eye contact, opposite of another thing I saw, another story, but she's usually facing the door, although I'm pretty sure I've seen her from another angle, almost like her full back. She didn't disappear unless you tried to focus her. She was not a glimpse if you just stood there watching from the corner of your eye. She was there. Nor she was a trick of the light. She showed up in the dark and you could clearly see her. And when the light was on also, I rearranged the stuff in the room. Small room, very little stuff. Nothing of that height. When I got tired of seeing her, even though I got rid of her. My daughter, 14, had to migrate to Berlin with her mother. Crying face. Fuck communism. And I dismantled that room. I'm actually halfway there, but not advancing. But I have a friend come over for Wild Rift. It's a game. Sleepovers, ugh, excuse me, sleepovers. And one of the first times he came when he went to the bathroom, that part of the house, he told me he felt like a bad vibe or presence was coming from that area, specifically where the room used to be. My sister-in-law also dropped this on a normal conversation like a bad vibe or presence coming from that area, specifically where the room used to be. To be honest, I don't feel her there anymore. There is something alright, nor have I seen her in a long time, 
The part of the house doesn't have much lighting, and I am a little scared when going there, which I do normally. But truth be told, I try not to pay attention or look too much. I'm open to questions, and if you like that story, I have a couple more. Different, not involving children, except the one I mentioned in the story. Oh, 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 and unrelated to La Nina, but still interesting. My daughter, 12, used to love sleeping with my mom. This one time my mom told me that she had a nightmare, and when I asked her, she refused to tell me, but she did say it wasn't a nightmare. I don't want to talk about it, and I never, emphasis on never, want to sleep in that room again. Fast forward a few months, and one time I wanted to be alone in her room, probably fighting over the phone because I was mad, and I told her, in a bad manner, to go to sleep with her grandma because I wanted to be alone yelled at me. On the verge of tears, she said, I'm not gonna cap all of this, but she was yelling. Sorry, the guy who's writing this story has so many parentheses, it's mind-boggling. I told you I never wanted to sleep there again. The last time, something grabbed my ankle and tried to pull me under the bed. I wasn't asleep, nor did I dream it, and I got dragged, and she's skinny and little across the bed and my legs were dangling, rather, crescendo. Smiley face, lol. Not sleep, exclamation mark. I'm going to the PC. And I swear the sun caught her playing Roblox. A game, in parentheses. <laughs> See ya. The Shadow Man Growing up, me, a 25-year-old female, lived with my mom, dad, and two older brothers. We lived in a house that was built in the mid-70s, maybe early 80s. We always felt there was something more to that house. I would always talk about someone. I would call it the Shadow Man. My first experience with this entity was when I was about five or six. I'd woken up at night to use the bathroom which was located in the exact center of a long hallway, and that led to the living room and kitchen and stuff. I opened my door and stepped out. I remember feeling terrified staring at the darkened hallway. Everyone was asleep and the house was dark. It was probably close to 3 a.m. I could see this tall, dark figure standing at the end of the hallway watching me. I was frozen with fear. My dad was pretty tall himself, like 6'4", but was pretty heavy too. This thing was as tall as the ceiling and skinny with long arms. The thing crouched down to my level and charged at me. I screamed, woke everyone up. I was so scared I refused to sleep alone for nearly a year. So one night when I was about seven, I was sleeping on a love seat that my parents had in their bedroom. It was located by the door to the hallway and parallel to the master bathroom. I woke up, my body was numb, and I couldn't move. Couldn't talk. I could only stare. This was my very first experience with sleep paralysis. I laid on the couch staring at the tall, skinny, dark figure that stood in front of the bedroom door by my feet. I tried to call for my dad, but I couldn't. I was stuck. I felt like I was suffocating. Suddenly... My dad yells out, and he sleep-talked a lot. Leave her alone. Get out. I quickly sit up and jump from the couch to my parents' bed. Waking both of them up, I laid between my parents trying to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I could see the shadow man walk from the door to the bathroom and then to the closet located next to my dad. My dad started mumbling like he was having a nightmare and suddenly woke up got up to use the bathroom, but before he did, he opened and turned on the closet light. He thought I was sleeping, but really I was wide awake. So, through the course of about 11 years, I would wake up about a few minutes before 3 a.m. in sleep paralysis, and he would always be there, hanging out in the corner of the dark room that I was in. It didn't happen all the time, but enough to have me scared of the dark until my teen years. So fast forward to my sophomore year of high school. We had since moved out of that house, hadn't seen or dreamt about the shadow man in years. 
So one night I sneak out with some friends, went to this abandoned house on my friend's street. We take acid, and my friend starts spray painting on the walls. I was feeling my trip. We were jamming out, smoking a joint. Suddenly got that chill. The one that told me that he was there. I don't remember most of my trip, so I'm well, sorry about that, but I do remember seeing the shadow man poking his head out from around the corner, and I screamed. My friends made fun of me the next day, telling me that I was freaking out because the shadow man was watching. After that, I hadn't seen or felt him. I met my fiancé. We moved in together and all was happy. It had been years since that night and I thought to myself, finally, he fucked off. So one night this happened last year. My fiancé and I moved her bed to the living room. We did this a lot because we would always sort of pass out in the living room watching TV or movies. We were sleeping and I had this dream that I was sleeping in my old room. I turned to look at my fiancé and he was in my bed, sound asleep, trying to get up and was hit with sleep paralysis. I tried to stay calm as I knew I was dreaming and I would wake up soon, until I glanced at the corner. There he was, standing, watching. I felt so scared I couldn't breathe. I looked back at the ceiling, telling myself to wake up. I could see the ceiling of my apartment, but the walls of my bedroom were just, well... I was trying desperately to nudge my fiancé to wake him up, but I was frozen and felt intense pressure all over. Finally, after what felt like hours, I was able to move my hand, just a smudge, touch his back. The second my hand made contact with him, I was snapped back into reality and sat up gasping and whimpering. The last instant to happen was about two months ago. I was sleeping, started dreaming that I was in a taxi going somewhere. I couldn't see the taxi driver. He was just a mass of pitch black. The taxi suddenly went off the road and headed toward the woods. I tried to get out, but the driver reached back and placed his hand in the center of my chest. I opened my eyes and I could still see the taxi in the trees, but behind that was my bedroom. The figure was turned and staring at me with his hand still on my chest, pinning me in place. I was freaking out. Now my bedroom was more visible, but I was still stuck. I couldn't move, I couldn't talk, my whole body still asleep. But my mind and eyes were wide awake. I started to whisper and whimper. My fiancé turned and threw his arm over me. I started crying when he did because the pressure intensified. The dark figure was leaning closer and closer until we hit a tree. When we did, I shot up, gasping and crying. He woke up instantly and was trying to calm me down. I was terrified. I was able to go back to sleep after an hour or so. And after that, to this day, I still see a smudge of darkness pass by out of the corner of my eye. Ghost in the House When I was little... My family and I lived in this small house on the outskirts of Houston. The way the house was laid out was you would have to walk in from the front door and to the left was the kitchen and breakfast nook. Forward was the living room with the dining area behind it, and to your right was a long hallway that led to my two brothers' rooms. My parents' room and then my room. My mom raised us Catholic and blessed her house regularly. My dad as well was very superstitious. The house itself was somewhat old, being built in like the 60s or 70s. Anyways, my first experience in this house happened when I was around five, maybe six. Since I was born, I always had my own room, and my two brothers shared a room, which was right next to mine. One night I woke up to needing to pee really bad. The bathroom was located right in the center of the long-ass hallway. In the middle of the night, so the hallway was pitch black, the only light source was my series of nightlights. I stood at the end of the hallway, staring toward the living room. I remembered a feeling of intense fear and in seeing a tall, dark figure crouch down and move toward me. I screamed, waking literally every person in the house. 
That night and about a year after, I always slept in my parents' room. As the years went by, my older brother and I started to experience things that nobody else except our family dog seemed to notice. It was always little things. Doors would open and slam shut. TV would turn off and on and you could hear walking in the attic. My dad would try to explain to us that the footsteps in the attic were just from raccoons. Being kids, we believed it was raccoons. Because why would dad lie about it? Found out years later he only told us that to keep us and himself from getting scared. So one day my mom and dad were at work. They were leaving for my two big brothers and myself alone in the house. My brothers were outside playing basketball. I was inside watching TV. I was about eight or nine at the time. The TV randomly switched to the static channel. I flipped the channel back to what I was watching, ignoring the sudden creep of fear crawling up my spine. The TV switched back again and I turned it off. From where I was sitting, I could almost see the end of the hallway and felt that something was there. In my brother's room, I got up and walked down the hallway and stared down at my brother's door. The doorknob turned and I froze. I was the only one inside the house, yet I felt I wasn't alone. The door cracked open, and when it did, I felt like the hallway darkened. I bolted outside to get my brothers. I told them what happened, and when they went inside to check it out, I remembered both of them running out and telling me that we're going to go play basketball until our parents got home. About a year later was the scariest moment shared by my brother and I. We had a sudden falling out with my dad's side of the family. My grandma was sick and dying at the time, which was causing a lot of animosity in my family. One night I couldn't sleep. I kept seeing a creepy face in my closet which was keeping me from being able to turn the light off and go to sleep. I had this sudden feeling that I needed to look outside. I slept underneath the window that overlooked the backyard. My brother had the same window in their room. I sum up all my courage and I glance out the window. It was in the middle of the night and the backyard was lit only by moonlight. However, we had a yellow slide that stuck out even in the darkness. I stared out for a little bit until I noticed something sitting on the slide. The figure on the slide had its knees drawn up with its arms wrapped around its legs. Long, bird-like wings with a long beak. The figure was so dark, so pitch black, it stood out even in the darkness of the backyard. The thing opened its eyes, which were blood red, and lifted its head quickly to stare at the window next to mine, where my brother was. And after about a minute, it slowly turned to stare at my window. When it did, I felt a sharp icicle going through my soul. I screamed for my dad. He went outside to look and nothing was there. That morning my dad got the call that my grandma had passed away in the night. After that day, Things on my dad's side went from bad to ugly. Old, horrible secrets came out. My brother started to act out while I became more timid and sleep-deprived. It wasn't until years later when we had moved to another house and were practically grown that we spoke about that night. We were smoking a blunt talking about scary things that happened in our old house. Like my dad would wake up to something standing over him a lot and he would hear things in the attic. Spooky shit. I told him about the demon bird thing, and he turned super pale. He explained in detail what the creature looked like. Things that I never told my parents. It clicked to me that whatever that thing was made direct eye contact with my brother. When it turned to stare at me, I screamed. My other brother tried to tell us that we were just fucked up and watched too many scary stories. But I know what I saw, and what he saw too. I haven't had too many paranormal encounters after that, just a few here and there. But I'll always think back to that one night. That one scary ass night. I still wonder, nearly 20 years have passed since I saw that creature, what it was and why it was in her backyard.
pre-birth memory slash pre-birth existence near birth experience. All right, I've been having this memory for a long time now. Since I started remembering only small parts since seven and kept remembering bits and pieces throughout my life, I'm going to go out and say that it's a memory that I have and it's from the other side. There I was in a void. I couldn't see anything, and I didn't have a sense of cold or heat, or even emotions like anger because I didn't have a body. I was there, floating at great speed, toying and playing around since I realized that I was an orb of light. So I was floating there happy, which is an emotion, I guess, in every direction, just messing around like a child. The other glimpse of my memory is that of me waiting in line like in a queue, like at an airport waiting for check-in type queue. And it was a, it was a while, I guess. Everything was white and there were other orbs like me. The other memory I have is choosing my life. I don't know, it led me to want to experience life, but I really did not want to miss out since everybody else was doing it. It was kind of like FOMO. Fear of missing out. So anyway, choosing phase there begins with my male energy and female energy. Male to my right, female to my left. I was presented with thousands of different planets and worlds to live in, like literally there are so many to choose from. It was like I was presented, like on a screen. In those, I saw futuristic cities like Metropolis type and feeling I was getting that world was that it was very advanced. In the other screen, I saw a reptilian humanoid being in a cave, or rather he just got out of the cave to view the landscape, I guess. It was night and dark blue and rocky. It was overwhelming to choose just one life, and I did sense that there was a presence to hurry up. So I was kind of recommended by beings and guides or entities to go to planet Earth. So then I was to decide which of the family and the year I wanted to incarnate to, and what life I was going to have. There were maybe three or four options to choose from, so anyway, I was kind of interested, or rather considering to choose options, but I was again recommended to choose one family over the other. Or rather, I guess, I wanted to at least incarnate into a country or city that was the most advanced. I saw glimpses of what that life would be like, and I saw that I would get to experience life in other countries. I saw what my body would look like. So anyway, the advantages of this life would be to get to experience life in other countries, and this life would be much more relaxed in comparison to other options I was considering. But there was going to be a suffering internally. Life after 20s, I guess, was going to be a struggle, and I saw that I'd get to live to my 80s or 90s. I only saw like moments or glimpses of the life that I'm living now. From the point of my orb self, I was excited for this life, I would s sort of say naive. And I knew that this was not going to be easy, but it was the easiest from the other options. I also remembered telling them that I want to remember, and that there were now three beings discussing this, and I couldn't perceive them or didn't know what they were saying. Were there always three, or is it because I didn't notice the third one? I don't know. The male one to my right didn't communicate much. It was like professional, like he was doing his job. But female one to my left was loving or caring. I also sensed other orbs, too. They were like me choosing, I guess. I should also mention that the choosing part was happening in a darkness and void area. The next memory after that is of me floating over planet Earth, and I felt like there was a pressure behind me to hurry up and, through some device or pool or tube thing, I entered or rather was sucked magnetically like sucked and instantly. The first feeling I got was fear. I was shot like a bullet to Earth at great speed. I said to myself to remember this memory. I willed it that I want to remember. 
and there was us being bulleted to earth like zooming at the speed of light. From my perspective, I wanted to stop and explore the earth as a floating orb, but I couldn't control the force. As I was approaching to the destination, I decided I was going to research everything about the planet and feel this freedom again. Then there was white light, or rather a flash, signifying that I already entered the womb and boom, darkness again. But now it was so warm and occasionally felt like I was being fed. That was strange as me, me, I don't need anything such as food, water, or air. And then after there was another memory of just everything being blue. Other memory begins of me slowly shifting from a third perspective of me perceiving my body to the first perspective. I was excited and ran to the mirror to see what I looked like, and I realized that it wasn't me and I was in a body. I was su surprised that I could move my hands for the first time. So there you go. This is my memory from the other side. I talk to my dead best friend. So a few years ago I lost my best friend to suicide. It was very sudden, and for a while we didn't really know why she did it. Eventually her boyfriend and I hacked into her phone and computer. We think we figured out why, although we weren't totally sure. I really struggled with losing her. She was really my only friend for a long time. About two years after her passing, another friend was visiting and we got to talking about her. We decided to do a Ouija board to try to talk to her. I had never done a Ouija board before. I had heard some pretty bad stories about them, but decided to give it a shot. My friend and I made a board, set up a recorder and sat down to start. The first few minutes nothing happened, and then things got weird. The planchette started moving. Thought it was my buddy moving it, but he said he wasn't. He asked a question about, where did we meet? And the board spelled out, Stoner Pond, which is where they met. Then I asked, what did we do the first time we hung out? And it spelled out burgers, which is what we ate the first time we hung out. My buddy and I tried to keep the question to only things and others, you know, excuse me. My buddy and I tried to keep questions to only things the others wouldn't know, as to rule out one of us moving the piece. At this point, we were pretty sure neither one of us were moving it. I decided to ask if she was happy. The board said yes, and then spelled out mom. And I knew that she had found her mom wherever she ended up. We had to stop shortly after as we had started to get, you know, other more negative spirits coming through. After we ended, my buddy and I decided to listen to the recording that we took during the Ouija board session. Right before we started getting responses on the board, there was a voice saying hello but turned up the volume and realized it was our friend. I definitely got some closure doing it, but honestly, probably won't do it again. Second part. This is where things get crazy. So I had quite a few requests to post the last, well, the last half of my Ouija board story. In part one, I contracted, excuse me, contacted my dead best friend got some closure but we only talked for a few minutes before things got dark my buddy and i were sitting down and talking with our friend and soon after we started talking to her the board started doing weird things i was kind of unexperienced with ouija boards so i didn't quite understand when the planchette started going in circles and figure eights my buddy started to get visually nervous and said that we had to close the session immediately. 
We said goodbye, moved the piece, but the piece moved to hello, and then to goodbye and back and forth. My friend was now freaking out but wasn't telling me what was going on, but I made the assumption that it was something very dark. We started asking questions like, what's your name, what do you want, basic stuff. The spirit said that his name was no, 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 no. And when we asked what he wanted, it spelled out my nickname, then went back and forth between the two letters. Then it said die and went. <laughs> I was now the one to start freaking out. I quickly said goodbye, and this time the planchette didn't move away from it. We thought it was over. I can feel spirits, so we saged and salted the house, and I didn't feel anything negative. We went about her day, and I never felt anything. But when I woke up in the morning, I had a set of three scratches down my leg. I knew what it meant, so I called my buddy back over, and we burned the board. We salted and saged again and again. We thought... It was over. The next morning I woke up to three scratches down my back and bruises on my arms and legs. I felt something watching me and I started to get very paranoid about being home alone. I'm not new to the paranormal. I've lived in, or excuse me, I've lived with spirits pretty much my whole life. But this was something totally different. And I couldn't control my anxiety. This went on for about a week and then it just kind of faded away. I was still paranoid about going to the bedroom, which is where we did the Ouija session, and where most activity took place. Then it came to a head. I woke up sobbing about a very realistic nightmare. It was about my husband getting possessed and coming after me and killing me. It was horrible. I couldn't tell if it was a dream. I went to a meeting where had some guys come over and do something. I'm not sure what, but the haunting stopped. I still had my friendly spirits that would hang around, but the mean one was gone. Finally. When I stayed in the oldest building in Zurich, Switzerland, on tour with my band... Back in October of 2017, my band and I were in the middle of our two-week-long European tour. It was a great experience. However, what experience there will probably be with me is the rest of my life. In fact, it's something I can't rationalize or explain to myself. Anyway, here's some backstory. There were five of us driving around Europe in a Honda Jazz all the way from Scotland plus musical equipment and clothes. Some venues, including this one, would offer accommodations and food on top of our fee, which was amazing. And you can imagine, after being in a cramped condition on the road for nine hours at a time, we weren't really wanting to turn anything like that down. After our gig, some of the band wanted to go out and see the local nightlife, whereas myself, I just wanted to lie down, relax, and just browse the internet. As we were coming to the end of the tour, and I was in need of some downtime. We were led up to our room, which was above the bar, which we assumed would be a very basic room with a bed and a bathroom, and that led us into one of the most modern Airbnbs I've ever stayed in. It was super clean, super high tech, two big massive bedrooms with a king-sized bed and a shower and a jacuzzi bath, massive kitchen, beautiful wooden floors. I decided to sleep on the floor of the living room and kitchen. That was on my blow-up mattress, which was pretty open-planned, and the Lincoln communal room. Excuse me, the Lincoln communal room to the bedrooms and bathrooms. As my bandmates were getting ready to go out in town, I saw a leaflet in the kitchen table that said this building had been around since 1260, which wasn't. Pretty incredible thing as you'll never know the building and bar had been renovated to the point that you didn't really see any of the old designs anymore. So, I said goodbye to my bandmates as one of them mentioned they were going to have a bath when they got back. I shrugged it off and asked them to be quiet and try not to wake me as my bed was real close to all the doors as it was in the middle of the communal room. 
After they had left, I turned over and went to sleep pretty quickly. I woke to the sound of a dripping tap. It was pretty dark, but my eyes adjusted fast. The lights of the city were coming through the cracks in the blinds. My first reaction was being mad at my bandmate for not turning the taps off properly after he had a bath. It turns out later that he never ended up having one, by the way. I turned over and saw it was 3.30 a.m. on the wall clock. I threw the blankets over my head and closed my eyes again. Then it happened. What almost felt like a large weight come down on the bottom left corner of my bed. If you've ever been in a bouncy castle, and when weights distributed from one side and inflates the opposite side, except this launched me about an inch into the air. This was the first time I had felt real sobering fear, like an ice shock down my spine, probably the adrenaline in hindsight. I remember I stopped breathing. My heart was racing and it was silent in the room. I felt it again, this time less abrupt, more like a kid nudging you for attention. I remember thinking, this isn't your mind, this is actually happening. Terrified, I threw the blankets off of me and looked down toward the foot of my bed. Didn't see anything at first, until I looked further back beyond the dining room table. Which, maybe two feet from the foot of my bed, I noticed a shape. I blinked several times to be sure, but I swear I saw a girl with no face and long hair down to her feet. She was about five foot six, pale as anybody could be. She almost looked sodden, as if she had been in the rain. I tried to scream, but I couldn't, and I threw the blanket over myself and told myself to go to sleep. I don't remember falling asleep, but when I woke up, I saw one of my bandmates sitting at the dining room table with some work on his laptop. I was so relieved that it was daytime. I sprang up immediately and told him what happened. Of course, half asleep and ranting of a ghost, he told me that it was a dream and to calm down. My other bandmate, Gary, who had slept in one of the bedrooms, woke up and joined us. He looked pale as a sheet. I asked him if he was okay, but assumed he was just hung over from last night's antics. When we had pa packed all of our things, two of the boys went and got the car, while Gary and I minded our belongings in the lobby over a cigarette and coffee. I asked Gary how he slept. Before I could say anything, he replied, Mate, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. I stared at him for a couple seconds and asked what had happened, thinking it was a bar story or a funny story, perhaps. I couldn't have been more wrong. Let's also state that Gary and I are skeptics, which doesn't mean that we don't believe in ghosts, just that we are the type of people that need proof before blindly believing anything. He began to tell me in the middle of the night someone had gotten into bed with him. He had awoken to the feeling of a blanket lifting up and somebody sliding in next to him. He told me that while he was too petrified to move or call out and he just tried to make himself fall asleep like I did, he never had the bath he intended to take. So that explained why he looked pale white when he woke up. He wasn't intending to tell anyone because it sounded so unbelievable. We stared at each other for a while and said that he'd never sleep another night in Zurich. The Disappearance of a Marine Sergeant on Marambaya Island I'm a former Brazilian Marine, eight years of active duty and I'd like to report a well-known story among the Marines about the disappearance of a sergeant on an island where we usually conduct military training. This island is known as Ilha da Marambaia. This island that during the time when Brazil was still an empire was a refuge of slaves who fled the farms, and they would gather in communities in the most isolated parts of the island. These people are known as Quilombolas, and to this day, they still survive on the island through hunting and fishing. At one of these military trainings that takes place every year, a newly graduated sergeant, I don't know his name, but let's call him Ricardo to make it easier to tell the story. Thanks. They made friends with one of the Quilombolas who lived there in the region 
which is very rare to happen, as we're advised to avoid any contact with them, as they are known to be hostile to military men. During some conversations with the Quilombola, he told Sergeant Ricardo about an ancient story of an old treasure hidden inside a cave in one of the isolated areas of the island. This old treasure that was hidden there by a group of thieves who was shipwrecked on the island many years ago during the time when Brazil was still an empire. However, he told Sergeant Ricardo that he should not enter the cave because any Quilombola that had already entered into it never returned again. So it was known to be inhabited by a spirit who protected the treasure from outsiders. Ricardo was skeptical, didn't believe much in spirits, so he asked for the Quilombola to show him where the cave was. The same refused to show the cave entrance because he said that it was very dangerous. Ricardo then did not insist and decided to forget that story and just focus on the military training. Years passed and Ricardo didn't forget the story of the treasure on the island. He was thinking about how his life would change if he managed to find that treasure. The life of a marine in Brazil was very rough and the salary was very low. So he dreamed of getting out of the Marine Corps one day and starting his own business, and that treasure could help him with that. Knowing this, he decided that the next time he went to attend a military training on the Murambaya Island, he would insist that the Quilombola show him where the cave entrance is. Even if for that he had to offer money to show him the way. So after a few months, Sergeant Ricardo became aware that he would be chosen to be part of the next training on the island. So that would be his chance to change his life, and he would not let that escape. Arriving on the island, he attended the usual training drills and waited until the day off, which was one of the days when there would be no training, and he would have more time to explore the cave. He waited for Dawn to go to the Quilombola's place without anyone from his squad seeing him, since the expiration of the island by military was prohibited by the officers. As there have been cases of military disappearing in previous training, and then he asked one of the Quilombolas to show him the way to the cave. Before he went to the Quilombola, Ricardo invited a close friend to go with him to help him find the treasure. This close friend is the person who spread the story that you're reading now, and said that if they found the treasure, he would share the treasure with him. The sergeant's friend refused to go because he said it was very dangerous and advised him not to go there either. He ignored his friend's advice and decided to go, well, just go like there's no other way but there. After finding one of the Quilombolas and insisting that it showed him the way, he agreed, took Ricardo to the entrance of the cave. This is where the sergeant entered in search of the treasure that could change his life. The next day, the sergeant's friend noticed that he had not returned from his search in the cave, told the officers what had happened. The search teams were requested, and it took about a week to find the entrance to the cave where the sergeant entered. After conducting searches inside the cave, they found the sergeant dead. Just his body. Probably he was lost inside and couldn't find the exit, or perhaps was even bitten by a snake. Heavy rain on that island is very common, and normally snakes take refuge inside the caves. It is said that the Marine Corps just compensated the sergeant's family and hid the case from the public so that it didn't appear in the newspapers. I don't know if that really happened or not, but it's a very common story in the Marine Corps that's often told by older Marines. It's said that this story happened in the early 1990s, so I think at the time it wasn't very difficult to hide this kind of story from the media.
I think I've become a null since the loss of attached entity. About 30 years ago, an event led me to discovering I had an entity attached to me. I called him the Faceless. Everyone else referred to him as my friend. He was always protective of me. Towards others, he was sometimes protective and sometimes antagonistic. But usually, he was just neutral. I could always feel him if I tried to. At one point, he became so antagonistic toward a roommate that I reached out to a local group of paranormal investigators. At the most extreme, he chased her through the house to her room and audibly laughed in my voice on the other side of her door after she slammed it. He shoved another person's shoulder, poked another person's back, and would occasionally cause things in a closed closet to fall off the shelves. I met with a husband and wife, a woman who designed spirit boards, and another woman I can't quite remember. I told them the whole story about the faceless, and how we came into my life and what the current events were. After the meeting, the husband followed me to my bike, shared his personal insight with me, which I really thought was pretty cool of him. They were supposed to meet up with my roommate to get her perspective but I think either she or they never followed through, and I never heard back from them. I can't say for sure exactly when this happened, but I've lost that sense of connection. I can't feel him anymore. I can say that once I noticed the loss of his presence is when the null began. I've never felt like I had any particular personal affinity towards anything spiritual or paranormal, and to be honest, I feel silly even saying that. I've always been like a, well, a hopeful skeptic. However, spiritual and paranormal things seemed enhanced, especially whenever I was around a Ouija board or spirit board. They would work better if I was in the room. Tarot cards did things I don't understand. People with the sight saw things more clearly or things they hadn't seen before. Just stuff that seemed weird to me. But I eventually just started sort of taking it for granted. Ever since I stopped feeling the faceless, it's the exact opposite. I think the event that really made it sink in for me was when I went on a popular and successful guided ghost tour. And because of me, I feel like 12 people wasted their money. There was zero activity, for which this tour was extremely unusual. I could tell the guide was completely baffled, and even offered everyone on the tour a rain check. He tried one last spot, a location that isn't usually on the tour, but he was obviously pretty desperate. As my own experiment... I hung out at a spot on the road back to the tour's guide's office, and sure enough, they all said that they had various levels of activity and experiences at the spot where I wasn't present. I spoke to the guide afterwards, asked, you know, if he had any insight or, or any thoughts on the conclusion, but he hadn't heard of anything like it before. I've tried a couple of other minor experiments, and they've shown pretty much the same results. One other weird thing I've noticed is I can't go into shops that sell crystals, at least not the ones around the Sedona area. My daughter is pretty witchy, or at least likes to think she is. And so we went to a couple of shops up there, and I almost immediately get dizzy and nauseous. I asked one of the shop owners about it, she suggested I hold something raw and ferrous, like raw iron ore or a similar mineral. I've tried it, and it helps a bit, but I'm still very uncomfortable. Like I can feel the dizziness and nausea just surrounding me without actually touching me. To be honest, 
I feel kind of dumb even opening up on the topic. But I miss my friend, and I don't know enough about the paranormal or spiritual stuff or whatever to do about it. I guess I'm hoping somebody can help me figure it out if, well, if I'm right. If I'm right in the fact that maybe I create the spiritual void around me. Or maybe it's something else. I'd love it if somebody could tell me how to reconnect with the faceless. But my heart tells me that's not a real option for some reason. I don't know. Maybe that's just my fear. And if I am correct, and I do create this null zone, maybe someone can give me some advice on how to make it useful. If I'm right and the faceless is just gone, maybe I can at least find purpose in what's left after his absence. Lucifer said, It'll be fine. They might have meant fine, but they wrote fine. So around February time of 2019, I had a few weird things going on at home. This is when I was sleeping on my sofa in my living room. If you read my last experience, you'll understand. I know the whole 3 a.m. superstitions are a little bit exaggerated nowadays, but I feel there's some truth to them. This song that I wrote, the title of this story, tells me that there's some truth to the whole 3 a.m. thing. I remember exactly the time. It was 3.23 a.m. I had no intentions of writing any music. I had an odd feeling for a good hour or so beforehand as if I wasn't alone. My old house was kind of scary no matter what time of day it was, when I, at least when I was alone. So this was not a new feeling, but it was an intense one, and definitely my most unnerving one. Anyway, I had no intentions of writing any music, and suddenly, bars, a term in music who, you know, if you're not familiar, some bars of the start of the song began popping into my head. So I started writing them down. I completely blanked out, and for the next ten minutes or so, it was like I had no control whatsoever of myself or my actions. I felt like an empty vessel of some sort. At 3.33 a.m., I came back round. Every few seconds, I had some kind of flash image popping into my head of some sort of entity that I would later become familiar with. Looking at my phone, I can see I have a full song written out, structured, perfectly written, as if something put the song into my head for me to write out on my phone. A little extra info before moving on. I went to music college at the time, studying production, but I used their recording studio to record my songs in my free time. I had to wake up around 7.30 the same night and morning that I wrote the song. That way I would have four hours of sleep. With the song written, me being slightly confused and deciding to go to sleep, in which I had a dream that I was floating up in what seemed to be an infinite spiral staircase. Upon reaching the top of the stairs, there was a doorway with a long hallway. I went to take a step toward, and a pale, chalky-skinned, demonic-looking woman darted down the hallway at me. Just shrieked in my face. There wasn't a thing I could do about it. I couldn't snap out of the dream. I couldn't wake up or move within the dream. I had to deal with it for as long as it lasted. It felt like forever until I eventually woke up. And here's where it gets even more odd than it's already been. So when I fell asleep, I was facing the TV with the doorway of the living room behind me. But when I woke up, I was in the exact same laying position but instead facing the doorway which for some reason was a lot wider than usual. This way I could see down the hallway. I couldn't move. I believe I was experiencing sleep paralysis. After a couple of odd footsteps like sounds, I see a dark furry looking hand reach over the banister of the stairs in my hallway. Slowly walking down the stairs was a dark black fur covered human body thing with a bull's head, two horns, three yellow glowing eyes with a dark denim jacket. 
It was walking in a menacing yet sarcastic way as if it was mocking my lack of ability to move. It's like it knew I was scared. When it got closer to the bottom of the stairs, it's like it started laughing under its breath. And as it reached the bottom of the stairs, I managed to somehow snap out of the sleep paralysis I was experiencing. Oddly, I was still, like, laying down facing the doorway of my living room. Everything had went back to normal, but with a very dark atmosphere all around me. It felt as though there was a dark cloud around me that I couldn't see, as if a parallel dimension was following my every move. I had so much adrenaline that morning, I didn't even struggle getting ready for college. That whole day, I had the feeling of something over my shoulder. It felt like there was always something that I just couldn't see following me. Maybe it was my paranoia, maybe it was really something, but when I went into the studio to record, something kept telling me to redo the recording. Something was putting words into my head. I had something guiding me to make the song as perfect as possible. Something that I wish I could say was a good thing, but while recording I had a sudden rush of energy. It wasn't a physical energy, more of a mental energy. It's as if the thing over my shoulders was judging me constantly, making me redo or keep the recordings of the song. I can relate to that. Anyway, my friend who was helping me record the song kept making little twitches and movements when the song got to its most crucial moment. The part in the song where I repeat, Lucifer lied, Lucifer lied. I feel like that's the kind of demon that was watching over my shoulder for all the wrong reasons that day. But all of the right reasons to watch Paranormal M. See ya. I think there may be something in my new apartment. My boyfriend and I moved into our apartment in the last nine months or so. There have been plenty of things that have really put me off. One of the big ones. Our bedroom connects straight to the bathroom, and due to connection issues with the router for some reason in the bathroom closet, we usually have the doors open or cracked. I was sitting in our bed with a show on and couldn't shake off this feeling. I felt like something was watching me, and I looked over to the bathroom door, which was ajar slightly. The bathroom pitch black since it has no windows and the light was off. In the space between the door and the door jam, where the hinges are, I saw something move. Thinking it was maybe an experience and I was just being crazy, I kept staring. There was a lighter colored shape in the crack of the door that seemed like skin in the dark. I was staring and trying to make out what I was seeing, and the shape in the door crack moved back and forth slightly, and then faded like it was moving back into the dark. Once I could move again, I jumped off the bed and booked it to the living room where my boyfriend was and told him. He checked the bathroom and lightly teased me and told me it must have just been a trick of the light. I tried to believe him, but it lasted so long. I've seen things out of the corner of my eye before, and other light tricks, and this wasn't like that. It was like I was seeing something real and physical and trying to make out details in the dark. This was a month or two ago, and I genuinely couldn't shower with the door shut for a month. What happened tonight just adds to it. Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas to those that celebrate. We have to be up early tomorrow to make sure we fit all of our family time in before both of our extended families, and after last-minute shopping today, I was exhausted. I was watching Elf in bed and trying to stay awake until the end, but I was so happy and thinking about Christmas time and watching my favorite Christmas movie that I fell asleep super hard. What happened next is a series of inception-like dreams. I quote-unquote woke up to my boyfriend in bed next to me, and I could feel his heat to my left, 
toward the bathroom in real life. He was way more on my side of the bed than usual, and I remember thinking something sweet and sappy until I heard the sound of my boyfriend in the living room talking on his headset. It was just a fuzzy dream thought of, weird, I can feel him next to me, but I can't hear him out there. I was half awake in my dream until a much louder thought interrupted. It felt like it wasn't my thought, like somebody yelled in my head, that's not him next to you. Suddenly there was a piercing ringing in my ears, especially my right one. I felt completely awake and panicked, with the ringing still in my ear, and lunged toward the end of the bed, but as soon as my feet touched the floor, I was w like waking up again, in my original spot, and I could feel something next to me. I sat up this time, but felt like I couldn't move my body. I was fighting something invisible that was holding me down. I screamed his name and heard my voice in this dream, but he didn't hear me. Then I woke up again. Same thing, but I couldn't move at all, and my voice was harder to push out when I screamed. I woke up again, paralyzed. Couldn't even scream. Then I was standing on a loft I've never been in, and an apartment doesn't have one. And there were some plants on a coffee table in front of me. I was talking to someone, and they said, Something's still not right. This isn't real. And the plant started bowing toward me with a dark gust of wind, and the person sort of faded into shadows. There was a loud wind sound, and everything got darker and darker until it was black. I could only hear the wind. I woke up again, breathing hard, and alone in bed, still paralyzed and knew that I wasn't awake yet. I knew I had to break out of this loop, so I just started trying to scream and scream and focus on my breathing, but I couldn't get sound out. And when it didn't work, I was trying hard to close and open my eyes and override the thought dream body. I was trying to reach my real body. I think it worked because I finally opened my eyes and sat up in real life and in my real bed. I didn't feel any presence anymore, but I was shaking hard and even checked my phone to make sure it was real and I saw the time. I was still shaken up, even after sitting with my boyfriend in the living room for a while. I don't know if this is paranormal or if the bathroom thing can be explained. Our apartments are very new, so I'm sure if someone died here, they would have disclosed it. Washington State. I was in a great mood falling asleep, haven't watched or read anything creepy. I'm not sure what to make of this and would love any input. I think I date a girl who was possessed by a spirit. A few years ago, I got home from work. I decided to look for some girl on Tinder to go out in the night with. It was 7 p.m. on Friday. So I matched with the girl who was mentioning things related to smoking weed in the profile description. So I decided to start a conversation with her about that. After a few minutes talking, she told me that she really liked to smoke weed that day. And that she was pretty much without any of it. As she lived near to my neighborhood, I decided to call her out that night to eat something, drink some beers, and later smoke some weed in my car. She accepted, and sent me her WhatsApp number and the location where she was. It was like three kilometers away from my home. So I took a shower, changed my clothes, got in the car, put her location on the GPS, and went toward her. I took a while to find her on the streets, but after a few attempts, I found her talking to a friend on the sidewalk. I honked. She recognized me and then entered the car. After she got in the car, I tried to start a conversation with her. Strangely, she didn't say anything at all. I was basically talking alone all the time. She rarely said, okay, and sometimes agreed shaking her head and that was it. At the moment, I thought, well, she must be shy. No problem. I took her to a snack bar. 
I tried to talk with her and while we were eating, and she didn't say anything. She just ate and nothing more. Then I finally gave up and stopped talking also. So after eating some snacks and drinking some beers, in absolute silence, mind you, I invited her to smoke a joint in my car. She said, okay, and went to a deserted street where I parked my car. After that, I sat with her in the back seat and we smoked together, and I thought, I hope this will make her get more relaxed and maybe she'll start talking a bit. After some puffs, she looked more relaxed, but still quiet. We eventually kissed each other, and we had sex in the car. The weird part is, while we were having sex, she started behaving really weird and started scaring me a bit. Like looking me directly in the eyes with a weird, angry expression, as if she was not the same person anymore. When that happened, I just thought she was high or something and didn't care much because I guess I was also high. Then after that, I just left her at the same point where I found her. I think her house was on that street, and after that, I'd gone home to my house. The next day when I was sober, I was thinking about her facial expression while we were in the car and found it all that very strange. She grabbed my head with both hands and was staring me in the eyes with a bizarre expression of anger. Her eyes were really wide open and her mouth was like she was kind of smiling. Anyway, I decided to follow her on social media, Instagram and Facebook, to know more about her. And most of her posts were really random and weird stuff. Like, for example, a lot of pictures of cardboard sheets with random phrases written in really bad English. We're from Brazil and here we only speak Portuguese. Like, for example... I love, where are you? Heart our God, us kill him. Where will us? We continue. Each sheet full of random stuff like that. Then one day she started talking a lot about stuff in her personal life on Instagram stories. That she had a baby that she loved, that she was enjoying to again be an Umbanda. This is an African religion that is quite common here in Brazil. She was happy to be talking again with her grandmother who was already dead. And then she talked something that made me understand everything that happened that night in my car. She said that whatever she, or whenever, I think they mean, whenever she was high, she got possessed by a spirit of her grandma. And that she really enjoys that. So I connected the dots and I realized that she probably was under the influence of her grandma that night when I met her. After that, she started posting pictures of her face on Instagram that looked really scary, like if she was possessed by a spirit or something. In one of the pictures, her jaw was really wide open as if it was broken and her eyes were all white. It sent chills down my spine when I saw that. Well, after seeing all that stuff, I just decided to unfollow her on all social media and blocked her number so she can't contact me anymore. I'm not sure if she's just inventing all that stuff, but to be honest, I'm not really interested to contact her again and find out the truth. Well, that story was bizarre, and, well, it was bizarre on too many levels for me. On to the next one. Ghost at the Guard Shack So for those of you who didn't read my other thread, I was a security contractor for four and a half years. Worked both stateside and overseas. Most of our stateside contracts has us doing what some would describe as military police duties, just on a private level. So we do have an access control patrolling respond like 911 calls on the facility grounds. Most of these locations are pretty rural, located in the western half of the United States. The kind of places you see on stars at night. Or the kind of places you can still see the stars at night. This event happened in 2015, around May. 
probably one of the most what-the-fuck moments of my career at that point. Myself and another contractor who I mentioned in the previous post, who I then called Tim, but we'll now refer to as T. We were manning to... We were manning an entry point, rather, to a facility located approximately four miles away behind us. In front of us was approximately two miles of semi-flat barren ground ended only by some hills. Behind us was the perimeter fence, approximately nine feet high, topped with barbed wire, with the earth behind that matched the earth in front of us. So, on a sunny day or night, with a bright enough light, you could easily see 1500 in any direction with little to no concealment to anything larger than an extremely small animal. We sheltered in a small 12 by 8 foot shack. It was powered with electricity and it had running water. The front and side windows could be popped out, kind of upwards allowing fresh air in. So it's about 0220 in the morning, sitting at around 60 degrees. T and I decided to turn the lights off both inside and outside of the shack so we could see the landscape better. It was a moonless night, slightly cloudy. The kind of night perfect for camping, but it was dark, and I mean like beyond 75 feet, you couldn't really see anything beside lights off in the extremely far distance. As we sat there waiting for nothing, liking posts on social media, we both distinctly heard what sounded like a large quadrupedal animal approaching the shack. Found this pretty odd. Well, neither of us had been briefed on anything like this occurring at this specific facility we were guarding. As we both turned around and began to look out the windows, neither of us could see anything. But it got louder, almost like it was getting closer. At this point, you'd expect to see at least an outline of something because it sounded like it was easily within 50 feet of us. But nothing. I should get We both were confused and justifiably concerned. Neither of us talked, we just listened and communicated with our concerned looks. This is what really fucks with my head, and his, to this day. The closer it got, the slower the steps got, and eventually it sounded like it went from being quadrupedal to bipedal. I'm talking it sounded like someone was now within 10 feet of our shack, casually walking around it. Believing our eyes to be deceiving us, we used the lights on our rifles to begin illuminating the area, searching our respective sectors looking for anything. These lights were bright. The beams easily reached out 250 feet, not leaving much to the imagination, and yet, nothing. Not a single thing or a person. But yet, once we turned the lights off, the footsteps continued. I would have bet money I was dreaming if I was alone, but I wasn't. I had someone with me confirming that what I was experiencing was real. We began to talk amongst ourselves. Night vision. Since we're working at a night post, we're directed to bring our issued night vision goggles with us. So we use those. Start scanning. We literally can't see a damn thing, but we can still hear the footsteps. At this point, we actually are so concerned for our safety that we request help. In the meantime, we leave the shack, helmets on, night vision on, and search the immediate area. It's important to note that the night vision provided less long-distance vision than the flashlights. We disengaged the ENVGs and went back to flashlights. I mean, we searched, kicked over rocks, tapped our feet on divots, seeing if there was maybe a secret hatch. Nothing. It took our backup 20 minutes to arrive in the form of two and a half asleep supervisors on an ATV. We kind of agreed to make something up, anything reasonable. We heard those footsteps for roughly 15 minutes in total, and I honestly don't know what it could have been. I worked that shack like four times before then, and a handful of times after. Nothing similar ever happened. There's something following you. While 
start off by saying that the person that told me this story, somebody that I worked with, though I cannot say in what capacity due to strict confidentiality, suffice to say that this person was an older gentleman in his 70s and had absolutely no reason to make this up, especially not at the time of our conversation. With that said, I will tell this story from his perspective, exactly as he told it to me. I used to work for a company many years ago. The workforce consisted of mostly men, all of whom were the epitome of down-to-earth straight-talking northerners. We had a laugh, bantered back and forth and whatnot, but we worked our asses off, and sometimes the pressure got too much. One of the men, David, he had been experiencing a headache all day that was getting worse. He managed to make it through the day until lunchtime when he suddenly went missing. I looked for him for ages, worried about what might have happened to him, until I found him sitting on the ground in an unused room, clutching his head in agony. He'd gone to find somewhere quiet, hoping it would ease the pain in his head, but it was only getting worse. No amount of painkiller took the pain away, and it was clear he was in it in a bad way. At that point, one of the others, Carl, had caught up with us. Now, the thing about Carl was that he claimed to be what he called a faith healer. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I do know that whatever he did to people, it worked. That day, I stood there and watched as Carl put his hands on Dad's head and slowly, gradually, the pain in his face went away. I watched that man go from agony to pain-free in front of my eyes, and I honestly can't explain it. It was incredible to watch. After that, David went back to work, amazed at how good he felt, though confused at what had actually happened. As for Carl, he never spoke about it, and no one dared ask him. So we left it at that. A year or two later, I was working with Carl at another site. It was some kind of maintenance job. We were being shown around by a guy who worked for the company but traveled a lot, so it wasn't too close with most of us. I'll call him Mark so it doesn't get confusing. He was probably in his late 50s. He was a good guy. and was also aware of Carl's quote-unquote abilities, as most people in the company were. Anyway, we were all chatting away and catching up, getting the work done, and discussing various things. All was normal. It wasn't until all three of us were back at Carl's house where he'd offered us a drink, and that's when Carl turned to Mark and said, Listen, I don't want to scare you, but there's something following you that's been standing over your shoulder all day. Now me and Mark looked at each other. In any other situation, I'd have laughed at whoever said something as daft as that. But we all knew Carl very well, and the man never spoke about stuff like that unless he had to. Mark gave a kind of worried laugh and asked, What are you talking about? To which Carl said, I've seen a black figure standing behind you all day. I saw it as soon as we all met up. But I didn't want to say anything as we weren't in a safe place. It's very evil, probably demonic, so I had to find a way to tell you. Mark looked pretty scared at this point and asked if it was still there, at which point Carl shook his head and said, No, it's outside for now. It can't cross the threshold of my house as it's protected from things like that. That's why I wanted you to come over. You need to get cleansed or it'll try to hurt you. After that, Carl gave a few things to help protect him, gave him a number to call to help him get rid of whatever was following him, but Mark was pretty shaken up. Carl had said that as soon as he left the house, it would follow him again, but it wouldn't be able to hurt him while he kept those tokens of protection with him. After we left that day, I only ever saw Mark once or twice. He never mentioned if he got cleansed or if anything else happened. But the dead seriousness in Carl's voice when he talked about the black figure will always stick in my mind. It's been a few years now since I saw this gentleman that told me this story. 
but it pops in my head from time to time, and I often scare myself thinking about it. I have no idea what a faith healer is, as I've never actually looked into it. I'm not at all religious either, neither was the gentleman who told me about it. So if anybody has any similar stories or personal experiences with something like this, please let me know. The Porcelain Mask When I was 12 or 13, I lived with my aunt for a few years with my younger cousin. We lived in a little house on a dead-end road in a small town of about 500 people. We're technically considered a village. My aunt was an odd soul. Everyone had their own rhythm, and hers was a different rhythm for sure. She had a fascination with the odd and the strange. From a musical dancing miniature jester figurine to old newspapers from the 20s. Then enter her collection of porcelain masks of which she had more than 30 of. All different sizes and styles and she had them all over her bedroom walls. The house we lived in was small but cozy. But this house had other paranormal events happen in it before and after the events of this story take place. So it was no big deal when small stuff would happen, because we were odd, so some stuff being harmless by pretty much fine by us, you could say. None of what happened before or after was harmful. This was the only event that I was actually stricken with pure fear. It was my 13th birthday, and for my birthday, I wanted all of us to watch a horror movie together, because those are my favorite kind. Still is to this day. We watched A Haunting in Connecticut. That was my chosen movie. It was my aunt and my uncle, their kids, my two friends, and myself there to watch it. After the movie, we all just kind of crashed. So I went to my aunt's room to sleep, because it was the only room with the TV. One of those old box TVs that would go full static every now and again. I get in there and I put something on quietly and I go to sleep. But I wake up a couple of hours later and the room is pitch black other than the light from the static on the TV. Which, if you know, it's not very much. It's basically a straight low beam. Kind of makes some stuff visible, but anything outside that vicinity gets harder and harder to see. But I can see all our masks clearly. I went to get up to change the channel, and I noticed I couldn't move. It was like some sort of sleep paralysis. My eyes could move, but my body couldn't. So I just laid there briefly trying to wait for my body to realize when I heard a sound like somebody tapping their nails on the closet door. Just like a little four-tap. I'm sure we all do when we're bored, but it caught my attention. And I fixed my eyes on the closet door, waiting to hear it again. Within about a minute, I had to glance to the wall, and then that closet. My aunt's masks... That's when I noticed one is missing. And I knew it because it was the one I had gotten her for Mother's Day. I did a double take because I knew where it was always hung and wasn't there. I didn't pay too much mind to it till I had to look back at the TV and I could barely see the missing mask that was missing off the wall now, barely out of light behind the TV. I knew it was the mask by the little pink flower pattern on the left cheek. At first, I thought my aunt had moved it, but no longer than I had that thought, the mask started to raise very, very slowly, raising to the ceiling and slowly making its way to directly over my face in the bed where I stayed for a couple of seconds before slowly descending to what felt like right over my face. I tried to close my eyes. Didn't help. Couldn't scream. It was like the enormous pressure being pushed at me. 
I could feel it looking at me, and I could oh, practically see it doing it with my eyes closed. Then out of nowhere, the pressure lifted, and I heard the mask break from falling. It fell directly about where it originally hung by the closet. I lay there practically in tears, not able to do anything about it. Then it sounded like someone shaking the bedroom door as hard as possible trying to get in, but it wasn't locked. My aunt and uncle woke up to the sound of the door shaking, came to see what they thought I was doing till they got in front of the door and it swung open on its own. As soon as the door opened, it was like my body woke up and I sat up and screamed as loud as possible and pushed to the corner of the bed crying. That's when I told them what happened. They knew, by the way, and I was acting that I wasn't kidding. And, well, they would have probably doubted it a bit had it not been for the door opening on its own. Accidental Haunting So I used to be really into the paranormal and ghost hunting and all that. I worked in a haunted ice arena, and I used to host scary movie parties and such. Some of the regulars decided to go ghost hunting one night, and are begging me to go with them. I kept telling them how dangerous it can be, having things attached to you, how you shouldn't just go in and be disrespectful. But they persisted. So finally I gave in and told them a perfect spot to take them. I wanted to take them somewhere that wasn't necessarily haunted, but that they could still get spooked and have their fun. I confess that I don't believe much in the whole crybaby bridge stuff. Here in Oklahoma, we have 27 of them. So I tell them of this old creepy one-lane bridge that's quote-unquote haunted, and we drive out there. We had a camcorder and a voice recorder and a temperature gauge and all the like. We get there, and you could hear me, just not really taking it seriously at all, but playing along so that, well, you know, they could have their own fun. Suddenly, one of them yells out that they found a pile of bones under the bridge. I told them to leave it and to not touch them, and I made my way down. Sure enough, there were bones, lots of bones. Most of them looked like cattle bones in nature but we did find a skull that resembled a very large dog with weird-looking canines. We also had found a cat that had been skinned with its fur piled down like you had taken a sock off. Now, the creepiest part of ghost hunting to me has always been the creeps that hang out in those places. The types that hail Satan and spray-paint pentagrams everywhere. Well, that's exactly what we found under this bridge. It was unnerving, to say the least, so I suggested that we leave. At about that time, one of my friends started saying, Uh, there's something coming up the riverbank. Sure enough, moving towards us was darkness. Like, you know, when it's dark, but if you stare long enough at one spot, it gets darker? That. Like you could see the oak vines disappear behind this thing as it was moving closer. So, we got to Getton. We made it back home at base and the haunted ice arena and started going over our evidence. Now, here's where I started to shit my pants. As I'm listening to the recording, you can hear me clearly not caring and joking and mocking at the crybaby bridges with my friend. We were at the back of the pack. Just she and I are about to cross over the halfway point of the bridge when the recorder picked up static and white noise. It wasn't wind, because you could clearly hear the difference of wind hitting the recorder, and this was different. Shortly after that burst of static, in a low, hushed whisper, we caught a male saying, Leave me alone, I'm dying here. Freaky, right? It gets better. The camcorder that we recorded everything on was suddenly wiped clean. Video of before that we got there and after were untouched. It was just the filming under the bridge that was gone. 
Now I'll concede that it could have been used her error, but it gets even better. My friend that encountered the darkness on the creek bank was studying engineering or architecture. I can't remember which one. But he had asked his professor if he knew of this bridge. His professor told him that it's called the Coeta Salt Crossing Bridge, and it was built around 1912. But the most interesting thing he told him about the bridge is that before they built the dam out there, Bonnie and Clyde types would way, well, waylay people there, murder them, dump them in their cars into the river. Creepy. Not done yet. Gets better still. I had asked a deputy sheriff buddy of mine from that county if he knew about that bridge. The next time he came to play hockey, you know? And he told me, Yeah, when I was in high school they found one of our classmates shot in the stomach under that bridge. They thought it was a murderer at first, but all this fishing gear was still there and nothing was taken. Fishing. They finally realized it was suicide when they thought the pistol that he shot himself with was there. He shot himself in the gut and threw it in the creek. And he didn't even leave a note. I got pale white because I immediately remembered the message we got on our recorder. Leave me alone, I'm dying here. So we may not have found a grieving mother or her crying baby, but we accidentally stumbled on something a bit darker, and I was humbled. Horrible smell. Background on the house. Old Victorian house, about 115, 120 years old, in an old city in Pennsylvania. One death to note in the house that we know of. Natural causes. My whole family and some friends have had some experiences in the house. We're currently working on the nursery for my son, who's due in February. Small connection to activity with my pregnancy. This isn't my first. I've had about five miscarriages while living in this house. My last one being last December. Naturally, I've experienced a good amount of depression after my losses. But December really messed me up. I noticed that I was abnormally depressed around January. I had felt an increase in activity in the house around that time. Like I was being followed. I could hear footsteps pacing around my bed, banging on the walls, concrete wall at that. My cat literally watching something move around my bedroom. Horrid lucid dreams. Things of that nature. My mom and I started talking about it and figured out that whatever's in our home, which I think it's multiple entities, has latched onto my depression and was feeding off of my own negative energy and becoming stronger. My mom and I blessed the house, something we've done many times before. Crystals, sage, holy water, prayer, Bibles open in every room, windows and doors all open. I stepped into my bedroom and firmly told the entity that I was trying to heal, that my sadness was not its own, and that it was not welcome to feed off my energy any longer. That pretty much ended that increase in activity and all was quiet. Back to working on the nursery. We ended up having to tear out half of a wall to fix some wiring that a squirrel had completely chewed up. So our original plan to paint and get that new carpet went far out the window. A few nights ago, my husband and I were woken up by an absolutely horrible smell. Now, my husband is a very heavy sleeper and takes a lot to wake him. So the fact that this smell woke me up, and by the time I sat up in bed, my husband was also awake, just terrified. The smell was strong, pungent, and just plain smelled like rotting meat. I got up and walked through the rest of the house, and it smelled perfectly fine. We tried to ignore it and went back to sleep. Husband woke me up again about maybe an hour later and said, It's back. 
same smell, only in our bedroom, now slightly in the nursery. We opened a window and put a fan on it to blow it out. I threw some holy water around the room and told it to leave us alone. We went back to sleep. I had the most vivid dream of waking up to the smell and seeing something dark standing in the corner of my room. I walked downstairs to wake my mother up. As my mother and I were walking through the hallway to get back to the third floor stairs, I could hear a woman crying in the living room downstairs. In my dream, I leaned over the railing and called out, Who's there? Did this a few times. I got no response except for more crying. My mother had continued to walk down the hall to go up the stairs to the third floor. She stopped at the bottom of the stairs, and I was looking up them and called for me. She said, there's something standing at the top. I walked down the hall to look and woke up when I looked at the top of the stairs. Once I woke up that day and I was alone in the house, I realized that I had not explained to the entities in the house what was happening in the nursery. I sat in my bedroom and politely explained that we had to tear down the wall and fix the wiring so the house didn't burn down, that we were just planning on painting and putting in new carpet. But that was it as far as renovations were concerned, and that I was sorry for not letting them know before we began. We had done massive renovations before had an increase in activity. We figured out it was best to let them know what was going on and that we weren't changing much in the house. The only confusing part is the rancid smell. I've always associated rancid smells with demonic entities, but throughout that whole debacle I didn't feel a negative energy like I have before. It felt like an older gentleman who died in the house being upset about renovations. The smell and my dream would say otherwise. The Girl in the Basement So I grew up in a house that had a few spirits in it. A family are all skeptics and would find some way to explain things away. A few experiences, and then I'll get into the main story. Our house was three stories, with technically three master bedrooms, one on each floor. The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear someone walking around in the office at night, sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally talking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and the toilet and the water running was just faulty pipes. There would be a shadow figure that would place itself, sort of on the tip floor. There was like a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I was presuming to be a lady in a dress pacing. My parents just said it was a shadow of someone outside. We were on a hill overlooking all of our neighbors, so I don't know how they thought that this was possible. 3. I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from the bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music and I heard the banging really loud so loud that it seemed to shake the room. Then the locked door swung open and then I heard a scream. My parents said that my brother was pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyways, on to the main event. My brother's about 10 years older than me. He was the only living sibling at the home with me and my parents. He had the master bedroom in the basement I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was, oh, the garage was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remembered feeling uneasy down there, but I wanted a big room, so when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room. And eventually, they caved, 
and let me have it. I moved all my stuff downstairs, painted and everything. I loved my new room. I was talking to my brother about it one day, and he told me, Watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked as obviously he was kidding. My whole family beside me, they never talked about stuff like that. I just laughed and shrugged it off and he was probably just trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over. We were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom laughing. That's when she had to go use the bathroom. She closed the door and just zoning out when all of a sudden she goes, That's not funny. I asked her what she meant. I didn't do anything. She said that she heard someone laughing right outside the door. I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out and assumed my brother put her up to it since she liked my brother. A few days later, I heard someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking that it's my mom, but I don't hear anything. I get out and as I'm putting my robe on, I hear a little girl's giggle. And then, are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but no one's there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm. So no one could have come and gone through the doors without everybody knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed. She's pissed that I set off the alarm and I tell her what just happened. She told me my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but it was nothing. Called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He was kidding because, you know, he would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. Well, I never did anything like that. And I told him that, and he got a little bit creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl, never saw her, but she didn't like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors, and I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today, asked me about this. He asked me if I was sure I've never, you know, tried to scare him by laughing. I told him again, no. Got uncomfortable, I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house was mildly haunted. I don't think it's Bill after all. Only a handful of people I know about what I'm about to tell you. Everything is real, and it happened in my childhood home. I grew up with my mom and my two older brothers. Our house was like any other normal house, except we were aware of a spirit, or a ghost, whatever you want to call it. And that remained in the house when he died, and his wife ended up selling it to my mom. His name was Bill. The first time I remember feeling his presence was one night when I got up to go to the bathroom and felt footsteps on the roof. They were very audible and sounded almost like drums. I actually thought that maybe there'd been more than a few people up on the roof. I woke my mom up, but she swore she didn't hear anything. Also, I clearly, well, I clearly recall many times when doors would open or shut on their own without any wind. Shampoo bottles getting knocked to the floor. Picture frames falling off the walls for no reason. We joke and say that Bill was acting up again. Other times we would hear names being called from another room, only to find out nobody was in fact calling us. The calling sounded so real, and it was usually my mom's voice calling for me. Every time she always swore that it wasn't her. At some point my mom got somebody to quote unquote sweep the house. I was still young. I remember a lady came and using something with a smoke thing, probably sage, said some words in each room, used a straw broom to sweep the spirits away. Things went quiet for a year or two. However, every member of our household seemed to always have bad luck after that. Eventually, we all began to see shadow people in the house. 
usually in corners. Sometimes people who would come to visit us mentioned that they could also see shadows in the corner, or they'd feel weird in our house in general, like being watched. Shortly after that started, things began to get intense in the house. Things moved right in front of us. Power would go out in the whole house. Once as I was about to leave the house, the front door slammed shut right in front of me. I got so scared I ran to my room crying. During the days, there weren't much malevolence. Sometimes creepy, but nothing that made me feel unsafe. Once I was hiding from my mom, and this was as a joke, I used to creep in a room where she was and scare her by yelling, Boo! This time, as I was hiding from my mom, I was behind the bathroom door, waiting for her to walk by the hallway. This is when suddenly I heard a very clear whisper in my ear. Boo! My heart stopped. I looked around and ran out. I always had nightmares growing up, so my mom let me sleep in her room. My nightmares started to get much worse. I'd wake up screaming in the middle of the night. My mom, scared half to death, would have to calm me down. Sometimes I'd wake up in the middle of the night and couldn't get back to sleep. One of those nights I swore I could see a dark shadow of a person walking toward me. I closed my eyes, opened them again still coming for me. I cowered under the blankets and started crying, trying to listen carefully. After a few minutes of silence, I heard a little girl's giggle. I screamed and tried to wake my mom up. When she woke, she turned the light on and was so upset, told me I was just having nightmares. But I know I was awake. Another night I woke up in the middle of the night. I didn't want to open my eyes this time felt very uneasy, so I pulled the covers up. A few minutes later, I felt someone or something touching my forehead. I didn't dare scream this time. I just kept saying to myself, it's not real, it's not real, it's not real. Crazy stuff kept happening at night when I'd wake up in the middle. I hated sleeping. I many times tried to do things to get myself tired before going to bed so I wouldn't wake up before daytime. It worked sometimes, but not always. As soon as I was older, I started staying at friends' houses as much as I could. Later on, I'd stay with my boyfriend, and when I got into college, I roomed with a friend, even though the university was like 20 minutes away. I eventually moved out at 20 for good. Now, as an adult, whenever I visit home, I feel the presence as soon as I walk into the house. I try not to sleep there if I can help it. I know my mom and my brothers have their own stories to tell. We've never gotten together to tell each other of our experiences. Maybe we should. Maybe we could make a book together. Was I being haunted? This happened to me over the course of probably eight to ten years. To my knowledge, nobody ever died in or around my house, but my parents did have grandfather's ashes in their closet. If that maybe has anything to do with this, I'm not sure. Sorry, this is going to be a long one. The first account I can clearly remember was when I was about six. Super young, but I can still remember the night vividly. I woke up in the middle of the night and wanted a little snacky snack. So I walked to the kitchen in the dark and grabbed a banana off the counter. I noticed the light in the backyard was on, so I looked out the sliding glass doors and I saw a man standing out there facing the doors. He looked kind of like a pirate. And like I said, I was super young, so I'm not 100% sure, but I know he was wearing a giant black hat. That's what I focused on the most. I wasn't necessarily scared but more shocked that someone was out there so late and I didn't recognize him. I looked down to open my banana. When I looked back up, the strange man was gone. I didn't think too much about it and I just went back to my room to eat my snack. But thinking back at it now, it definitely was creepy, but if it was not a ghost of some kind, 
than there was some kind of strange man wandering around our backyard at night. We did have a dog, and she was very protective and did not like men at all. But she didn't bark or react to anything. I think that she was sleeping in the living room or my parents' room. The second creepy thing I remember, I'm not even sure, was paranormal. But who knows? I was seven or eight, and my brother would have been ten or eleven. Our mom left us home alone for a few hours while she took our little sister to the grocery store. It was a super rainy, stormy day, so I figured it would probably be easier for her to just look after one kid in the store. We were old enough to watch TV and not get into any trouble while she was gone for a bit. So anyways, our dog started going insane at the window in the living room that faced the front yard and street. We live in the suburbs, lots of houses around us. My brother and I, curious, just kind of obviously what the dog was freaking out over, went to the window through the blinds, we saw someone dressed in all black. Literally looked like somebody wearing a black gimp suit or something. They were crouching in the trees and branches outside the window. We watched for a few seconds. Then whoever it was must have been scared off and jumped off the tree and ran to my neighbor's house. Jumped their fence. My brother and I called my mom and told about what we saw. She came home as soon as she could to make sure that we were safe. And we never found out what or who it was. The reason I think this might be paranormal is that nobody's house was ever broken into, and that person or thing moved with almost superhuman speed. They sort of jumped from the tree and over the fence in like five seconds. Plus, it was insanely rainy and windy, and who cases a joint in those conditions? The last few things that happened to me when I was a bit older, 14. I forced my brother, who was 17, to live in the garage so I could finally have my own room. My sister, who was 11, and we shared while she was born, and she was a slob, and I would constantly be blamed for her messes, and I was fed up. So anyways, I started mini-construction on my new room, painted the walls, ripped out the carpet, etc., this is when I would wake up covered in scratches and bruises that I couldn't explain. I don't sleepwalk. I do sleep on my side and sometimes turn over, but I don't do any crazy flailing. And I never had long nails, so I didn't scratch myself. The nights that I would stay up late, I would hear weird scratching in the walls and sometimes banging. Nobody else have ever heard anything. I also would sometimes feel a weird sensation like I was being watched or being listened to when I was all alone. I would also hear my mom call my name. Not much past that, though, except, well, I really wanted to try a Ouija board, and my dad wouldn't allow it. He grew up in a haunted house, and his sisters would do seances and make things worse. I can post about that later if anybody's interested in hearing his stories. They're much more eventful. I'm now 21 and haven't had any more notable experiences, and I'm still in the same house and the same room. I really just tried to not acknowledge whatever it was in hopes it would stop, and it did, for now. And so did tonight's stories. See ya. The Night I Believed in Ghosts The night I changed, that I changed my mind about ghosts. Hello all, I've had a paranormal experience in the past that I've mostly kept to myself and only shared briefly a couple of times with friends. I could never forget what happened that night, so I decided rather than keeping this to myself, that I'd share my experiences. It was the summer of second grade. I was about seven years old and I played baseball with my cousin. Although this experience was 15 years ago, I remember it all so clearly. Almost every weekend I would stay over at his house so we could go to practice early in the morning. However, Every once in a while, our weekend practices would get canceled because of weather or our coach just not being able to make it out to practice. 
On this night, our practice was canceled the next morning. My cousin had always told me wild stories about their house being haunted and them being okay with it, although sometimes they'd get a little freaked out. Mosquito in my face. I never bought into any of their claims because I didn't think anything like this could be real. I stood up pretty late playing video games with my cousin on his PlayStation. We were playing some bass fishing game. Around midnight, my cousin had fallen asleep. I stood up to play more games. I had finally decided to go to sleep at around 1.30 a.m. About an hour or two after I had went to sleep, I woke up to the sound of my younger cousin, two years old, crying. I decided that I didn't want to deal with it, so I grabbed my pillow, threw it at my cousin. Nathan, your brother's crying in the living room. My cousin is a heavy sleeper so he didn't even budge. I attempted to get his attention one more time by calling out to him from across the room, with still no answer. So after about a ten minute length of time of his crying, I went out to take, you know, take him back to his mom, got out of bed, retrieved my pillows, walked up three steps at the door, going into the living room. As soon as I walked through the door frame into the living room, my cousin's crying ceases. It doesn't just quiet down or slowly stop. His crying completely stops as soon as I step through that doorway. This took me back a second. I thought it was weird, but then I continued to look for my cousin. I searched the living room, the hallway, the kitchen, and the bathroom. But I couldn't find him. I figured he stopped crying and went back to bed, so I decided to do the same. After laying in bed for ten or so minutes, I couldn't fall asleep. I hear my cousin start crying again, louder than last time. I follow my same routine and try to get my older cousin's attention, but same as before, he didn't wake up. So I get to check on my younger cousin. I don't even bother to grab my pillow this time. I walked up to three steps and step into the living room. As soon as I pass through the door frame, his crying stopped, same as before. But at this moment, I started to remember all the things that my cousin would tell me about their house being haunted. I'm a little freaked out now, so this time I turn out all the lights. On. <laughs> I searched everywhere for my younger cousin, but just like the first time, I couldn't find him. I'm frightened because it doesn't make much sense to me what's going on, so I turn off all the lights and quickly walk back to my cousin's room and lay down try to go to sleep, but only a few minutes later I hear the sound of a grown man yelling from down the street. I try to blow this off because my cousin doesn't live too far from a park that a few homeless people stay at. I figure it's just a man on drugs or something. However, his screaming is constant. The scream is just constant. It's getting louder and getting closer. Now the sound appears to be only a few houses down and the yelling feels like it's right outside the window. I covered my head under the blankets as if to keep me safe, until the crescendo sounded. It was sounding like it was right next to me, shrieking in my ear. Then it suddenly stops. It didn't slow down or quiet down. It just completely stopped. It was just like my cousin's crying, couldn't sleep the rest of the night. I just laid there, shaking under my blanket. The next morning, I told my cousin Nathan about everything that happened that night. After telling him everything that happened, I remember his saying, That's crazy. See, I told you my house is haunted. I thought I was going to lose my mind, but I was being haunted. This happened when I was about 18. I was still living with my mother and brother. I had enough trouble in my life that it would actually justify being mentally unwell. But this was beyond that, and weird timing because things were fine. I was doing relatively good. But a few months' time, I had become increasingly suicidal and lost, just absolutely confused. 
I'd have spells of walking into rooms and not knowing how I got there. This was beyond the normal forgetfulness. In the middle of this, I had to be hospitalized for a sudden infection. This was followed by an accident, and it was the first and last time in my life that I ever fainted. I started having weird nightmares that I don't want to describe here for brevity. I prayed this confusion would go away. I did some cleansing rituals and the confirmation came not from me, but what my family saw. They didn't know about me being distressed yet. Keep that in mind. First event. My brothers in my room were door to door, 1.5 meters apart. We were at a dead end T junction. To the right side of my room was a bathroom. I was in the bathroom. My brother enters my room and starts chatting. Long enough that me in the bathroom doing my hair asked him in a curious way. Who are you talking to? He yells and I exit the bathroom. All doors to these three rooms were wide open. I enter my room to find my brother inside my room looking white as ash in the face. He said he saw a girl sitting on my bed facing the wall. Long black hair like mine and looked like me, but in a dress. And for quite a while thought that she was me and was attempting to talk to her, but with no reply. My brother is really afraid of these things, and he would not touch anything supernatural. Me and my brother talked about it, and I say, Don't tell mom. Just... Don't. I want to deal with this. We both go to bed. Next day, I'm frantically thinking how to get rid of this spirit because now I know I'm kind of screwed. Second event. After dinner, we're all sitting at the table. We'd all just come home and my dog is happily sitting by us, just waiting for some yummy food from the table as usual. That's when he gets up, faces away from us, and starts wildly barking and growling at the front door. This makes my mother look to the door, and with the door to my back, she then gets up and says something like, Who are you? Get out! By now we're all standing. The dog has an aggressive posture, growling, and has all the hairs in his back standing. Our front door had metal bars in front, and a huge sliding iron gate. We never heard that opening. We're all like, who was that? How did they get here? My mom just goes, calm down. Never mind, it's not real. She does the sign of a cross and says a little prayer. We then told my mom about event number one. and She said, well, then that's that. We were so scared we didn't want to talk about it anymore and just told us to ignore it. Later, when I asked my mom, mom says that she saw a woman with long curly black hair and a simple cotton dress. She thought it was a beggar or a crazy person that had somehow entered the house. She had her hands grabbing the bars and face pressed between, like, imagine it, like a prisoner. She looked at the dog, looked at my mom, turned quote-unquote foggy, disappeared. Front door was very well lit. The next day was a Saturday. We were free and my mom was like a drill sergeant. We must have spent like half a kilo of rock salt and loads of incense, sage, and herbal and salt bath for all the family. We went full exorcism on the house. The dreams faded away in about a week. I started recovering. I was having an appetite again. My mind was also clearing up. The forgetfulness was gone. I was doing good again, like I was never even unwell in the first place. But I was quite disturbed and a bit scared. I wonder if I picked up this companion at the hospital. Mediation Miracle The first time that I ever meditated was a few years back now. To preface this, 
I'd been a long-time drug addict, meth and Adderall, as well as an alcoholic. I knew nothing about meditation, or anything metaphysical or paranormal. This was nothing more than a latch-ditch desperate attempt to feel something. Anyway, after taking upwards of 200 milligram of Adderall every single day, among other things, for over seven years, and watching my entire life fall apart, I decided enough was enough. I decided that I was going to lock myself in my apartment until I had kicked my habits enough to function. A couple of months in, in my absolutely trashed apartment, lying on a futon I took from the trash heap outside, at the absolute end of my rope wishing that I could just curl up and die to escape the absolute torment of withdrawal and severe depression, I decided to give meditation a try. If it hadn't worked, I'd just kind of give up entirely. If you know what I mean. I sat there on the floor listening to the hum of the vent fan on the microwave. And I just focused. I focused with every ounce of my being on nothing more than myself. I focused on my breathing, my heartbeat, etc. I let all of my anxiety and worries escape to the furthest reaches of the back of my mind, and I just focused. After a few minutes, each breath I took felt like it was, well, for lack of better phrasing, powering me up. I could feel this intense vibration coming up through my feet, through my legs, into my midsection and chest, and up into my head. Everything, and I mean everything, faded away. And all that was left was me and my breath, and the hum of the vent. Suddenly it felt like this huge burst of energy shot out through the top of my head. Before I knew it, I was floating in the air above my still-sitting body. Everything went black then, and I found myself floating through nothingness for what felt like hours. It almost looked like space. Then suddenly this bright light overtook everything. And I was immediately aware that I was in the presence of something much larger than myself. As soon as I finally saw it, I froze and fear took over. It was enormous. By enormous, I mean it was literally the size of a mountain, floating and flying right in front of me in the black abyss. This thing was covered in wings and eyes. It never directly spoke to me but I could hear it in my head, if that makes sense. It told me to not be afraid and that it was only there to help me. It told me to stop worrying about the state of my life and my mistakes and my failures and everything. It told me that life is infinite and every living thing is connected. It showed me the world through the eyes of everyone and everything at once. It told me that I wasn't me, well, but that was something else entirely, and I've been around far longer than the life I was currently living, and would be around for even longer still. I'm paraphrasing here entirely, but again, it never spoke any words. It communicated with me in thoughts, images, and experiences. Suddenly, I was back in my body sitting on the floor of my disgusting, dirty apartment with my arms outstretched toward the ceiling. I don't know what this thing was, but I've never had any experience that felt as real and authentic as this did. Not once in my life. Nothing. I know none of this makes a whole lot of sense, but what it did do for me is completely remove my desire for drugs. I've been sober ever since. My depression is gone now as well. I went from an utter failure at the end of his rope to the district manager for my current company in a span of just a couple of years. I have a fiancé now, a wonderful home, tons of friends, and I'm completely healthy. I have no idea what that entity was or how it did what it did, but I figured I would share this with you all in hopes that maybe, well, someone might know. I've tried to get back to that place through meditation since then many times never worked. The experience itself was incredibly intense and overwhelming and sometimes 
I'm not even sure that I want it to happen again. Childhood Experience I feel like I need to share this. When I was a wee lad, say about 5-ish to 12, we lived in this big house with three floors and a basement. My grandparents' bedroom as well as one guest bedroom was on the third floor. I would hang out there by myself sometimes since there was a computer I could play on, a TV I could watch, and I could just kind of hang out by myself. Everyone would be downstairs where the living room and kitchen were. The computers had across the door that you would sit with your back directly facing the doorway. The TV was also positioned in such a way that your back would be to the door when watching the telly. Another important fact was that her house was split into two, and her neighbors lived on the other side. So on the other side of one of the walls were their neighbors. When I'm on the computer watching TV, I would hear footsteps coming down the hall toward the bedroom. Expecting someone to come in, I played no mind and just kept on gaming or doing whatever I was doing. The footsteps wouldn't stop and kept approaching. After some time thinking that it's taken so long and the hallway isn't that long, I'd turn around to see that no one's there. At the same time, the footsteps would stop. This didn't happen once or twice. This happened constantly. Any time I was up there with my back facing the door, the footsteps would begin after a certain period of time. And each and every time I turned to see no one and the footsteps to stop. It was spooky at first, and then got annoying. I eventually told my family, but they brushed it off saying it must be the neighbors. It can't have been. The footsteps sounded like someone was walking down the hall and would only happen when I'm not paying attention to the door. Then they would stop when I turned around to see. I emphasize this because it's such a clear and vivid memory of this thing happening, and it was consistent and replicable. I was little and obviously no one took me seriously, so I just kind of accepted this was happening, not really thinking much of it. When I was probably around 10, while playing the PC, the monitor began to violently vibrate. This was probably the most paranormal and freakish thing that's happened to me. The footsteps never sent me running, but this made me turn my afterburners on. I fucking booked it out of there. Ran down to my family in the kitchen and explained what happened. They told me it must have been a truck that passed by. Nah, man. This was like something grabbed and just started shaking it like mad. Fuck that. Another time I was sleeping in the guest bedroom. I think my parents were away and, well, didn't want to sleep by myself. So I went to that spare bedroom next to my grandparents' bedroom on the third floor to sleep for the night. I remember hearing space music. Kind of like what I imagine Apollo 11 crew purportedly heard in space. Stereotypical spacey alien tones being played in the air. When I was little, and still today, I would often have very vivid and often nightmarish dreams. Nowadays, I enjoy them much more and can sometimes lucid dream and rarely can come out of my body. Anyway... I remember one specific dream where I was sitting alone in my grandparents' bed in their bedroom. It was nearly pitch black. I can't remember if in the dream I was watching TV or just sitting there. I do remember seeing a point of light in the middle of the room, just kind of there. I looked at it, and that's all I remember. Today, I still often dream about that house. Despite the anomalous activity, I miss that house and want to visit it again. That being said, I don't believe in ghosts, the afterlife, or, well, anything like that. Even though I'm greatly interested in the phenomenon, I try to be straight-edge about it and reject any wacky claims like humans are containers of souls, a la Bob Lazar. Very intriguing idea, but it's, you know, it's probably not real. 
I'm skeptical but open-minded. I don't know what that was that I experienced, but perhaps a false memory. Perhaps I was too young and dumb to really get up with a rational explanation. This kind of is winding up and being a kind of a ramble, but I needed to share it, mostly for myself, so don't forget that this happened. My Childhood Ghost Encounters I'll also say that I've never had a paranormal encounter or an experience, well, since this, and I'm very thankful for that. The fear and confusion that comes from seeing certain things has a lasting effect on the mind, and it's not something that I've forgotten. I get very emotional speaking about these nights in particular. I'd appreciate any insight that you all may have, and I thank you for taking your time to hear this. My first encounter was when I was very young. I believe I was five or six when it occurred. My household growing up was a very dark environment. My dad was an abusive alcoholic who would do emotional and physical harm to my two siblings, myself and my mom. We never really had much, really, but aside from the abuse, we stayed together and we loved one another. I'm not sure if it was the energy of that place or something that had happened there before that caused what I saw either. My sister had been kicked out by my dad, and at the time I was sleeping with her regularly. I was young and scared of the dark and generally just didn't want to sleep alone. One night I woke up suddenly facing the window of my room. It being a small single wide trailer, the rooms weren't big at all. My dad being the way he had taken the door off because he didn't trust me for one reason or another. I just remember waking up, rolling over, and seeing this girl in a white dress in my open doorway. Her hair was black and she had no shoes on. Her hair covered her face and I couldn't see of any features. None at all. I felt a foreboding feeling coming from her. And I just knew I shouldn't blink my eyes. I was afraid she would rush up and be in my face when I opened them. So I stared as long as I could. And as I did, I just felt this pulling sensation as if she wanted me to come to her. I knew that wasn't a good idea. And to be honest, I was so scared that I was basically a statue. I stared as long as I could and eventually had to blink and when I did, she was gone. I'm not sure what would have happened had I, you know, went to her, but I'm glad I didn't. Keep in mind that during this time I was too scared to watch horror movies or anything like that, so images like this were not normal to me. I've never seen her before and definitely not after. My second and last encounter came about one to two years after that. I'd just come home from a Valentine's dance and was getting ready for bed. I tended to sleep near my parents' room. If I could get on the couch, I'd do it, because, well, it felt safer. I'd had a great night with no neg- well, no negativity at all, which is what I can't explain about the situation even more. While trying to sleep, I started to hear a smacking noise, kind of like what people who eat with their mouth open sound like. I was very confused, so I looked down the side of the couch at the floor and I saw what looked like a head. I stared at it for a bit because it was making noise. Eventually it slowly started looking up at me, and I could see that it had the features of an old man. It was smacking its mouth and it looked like a lot of blood was coming out. I got so scared that I jumped up, stamped on the head. I don't remember feeling anything solid other than the floor, and I did so. Ran into my parents' room, crawled in the bed beside my mom, and I tried to sleep. Wanted to check my surroundings because I was still feeling unsafe. I saw the head everywhere now, like it had duplicated itself. It was all over the sheets and on the floor beside the bed. All of them were staring at me and smacking their lips. All I could do was put my head under the covers and pray. I eventually fell asleep. 
I'm not sure if it was the toxic environment I grew up in or what that caused this to happen. I've never forgotten these experiences. I've never even wrote this long of a post on Reddit, period. I just felt like I needed to get it off my chest and see what some others believe might think. That's the end of tonight's stories. I'm going to record my own stories for you guys. Probably put it up on the first next month. Or maybe the 13th. Yeah, let's make it the 13th. Look forward to that. See ya. I had to break the news to his spirit that they were dead. And I cried for him. I ghost hunt at the Mansfield Reformatory in Mansfield, Ohio a lot. In fall of 2019, I discovered someone lingering in the East Showers. No one had known about him, so I kept him a secret for a bit. We got really close and I learned some things about him. And he's visited me at home, which isn't a problem for me, but mind you, I use my pendulum to speak to him. Months later on another hunt, we discovered that he was being abused and was very badly hurt. He was hiding in a corner, scared for his life. So my father helped him out and escorted him to the hospital to get checked out. We went up a couple of hours later and he felt safe there, so we encouraged him to stay. After this happened, that's when I started to tell people of his existence and inform them of what had happened to him. When I first met him, I had found out that he didn't know that he was dead. I felt like it wasn't my place to tell him, and if it ever did become my place to tell, I knew that it was too soon. June 2020 rolls around. I invite some friends along with my dad to help me speak to him, because I knew there was something that had to be talked about. Up in the hospital, another spirit had been harassing him and telling him what to do, and he couldn't escape it. My dad was helping him understand that, and understand that he doesn't have to listen to this guy, especially because he has no superiority over him. He was basically just a guy who was trolling him. My dad started slowly easing into it, asking him how it's possible that he hasn't eaten in a while, explaining to him that he's able to go through walls and leave rooms whenever he wants, telling him that he can leave whenever this troll is harassing him. My anxiety and intuition started to raise, but the anxiety wasn't my own. I knew that straight away. Something was telling me that he was nervous about what my dad was saying to him. I ended up taking over and explaining how we're all dressed differently, how we're all wearing masks because of a pandemic, because it's 2020, not the 1890s. I said, Do you know where I'm getting at? And my pendulum responded with a yes. And right after that, I could feel tears coming. And I said, I can't do it. I couldn't tell him that he was dead. But he already knew. I started crying really hard and I felt a huge pain in my chest. The kind of pain you feel when you've just been told that a loved one's died. And I knew I wasn't crying and it was him crying. Never felt another's emotions before. And the pain I felt, I knew it was his. And so did everybody else who witnessed that. A friend who took an audio recording of the session told me that she heard a male's voice say, dead, after I asked if he knew where I was getting at. When she played it for me, I heard it too, and we knew it was him. I cried for a good couple of minutes and was telling my dad how heartbroken he was to hear that. It was very hard for both of us but eventually he grew to accept it. Ever since then I've become sensitive and can sometimes feel the emotions of the spirits I speak to. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's not there. It was one hell of an experience, but I love him to death and hope I never lose him. That's how close we became. I was told that we have a special connection and I don't doubt it because I feel it. 
Anyways, thanks for listening to my experience. Been wanting to share it somewhere. Edit. There's a hospital wing on the second floor, which is where we sent him to. Sorry for not explaining that better. Edit 2. Thank you for sharing your similar experiences and just commenting overall. If you're here to basically shit on me and tell me what I said is fake, then I feel sorry for you. Because you don't have to be so bored to be on the subreddit in the first place to invalidate another's experience. I know the truth. and This is it. I shared it because I want to meet like-minded people, and I did. But there are always bad apples and skeptics who want to put others down for believing in something as interesting as the paranormal. The crossing over is in November. He'll be in a happier and safer state. I was warned, but I forgot. My work as a security guard. I worked a while in security and always heard my colleagues talk about a haunted school. This was the one school that literally everybody hated to go to because of the creepy stuff happening there. So I started asking questions, but people just answered in short phrases like, Dude, it's just really fucking haunted in there. And you'll see. So actually, a year goes by and I kind of forgot what school they meant. Around 1am the fire alarm triggers falsely in the school, which is pretty common. I head over there, turn off the alarm system, and go check the fire system. It was indeed a mechanical error, so usual protocol is where I just call a mechanic. And yeah, we have the night shift emergency kind because fire alarm is kind of high risk. I call dispatch to summon the mechanic, and I sit down in this mega bonker size of a building in the janitor's hall. The one that had all the cameras throughout the school, and this is also where the fire panel was located. I take out my phone and decided to watch a movie while waiting for the guy. So I'm sitting in this little room, but right next to it is the common student room, which is huge. It's a massive open space. It's square, but also kind of goes up multiple floors. Needless to say, it echoes like crazy. I was watching the movie, but my eyes dragged all the time to the cameras, swearing I've seen something change in there all the time when I wasn't looking. I suddenly noticed that on one of the camera screens in the basement, a light is on. Creepy as hell, because in such of an old building they surely don't have automatic sensors. So, I decided to walk out in the common room and keep an eye on things and listen if I hear something strange. It's absolutely deafening silence. Not even a sound from outside can be heard at this point. Which is one of the more odd things considering the school is in the dead center of a city. The moment I walked and walked back to the janitor's room, I hear a sound so loud that I jump up and froze. It sounded like a table thrown through the school. Imagine the echo it left in this crazy sized hall. Sometimes you can get a jump scare so bad that the veins in your body tighten so fast that it's actually painful. It was that sort of a moment. I listen in and the second after it becomes quiet for about 10 seconds. I slightly freeze again, but all my body sensors are going off. I'm 100% on, well, I'm just tense as hell. That's when I start hearing everything around me. Footsteps on upper halls, people talking, doors slamming, tables and chairs scratching the floors. The sounds were definitely inside the building and coming from the higher floors. That's it. Fuck it. Even my body tells me at this point it's time to go. Every physical feeling in my body tells me this is unsafe. I rushed to the alarm system and the alarm system was next to a little window that showed the janitor's room. I could see the camera screen and the lights in the basement went bonkers. 
from turning on and off to going brighter and more dimmed. I don't care at this point about the mechanic who just got called out of bed. I am saving my own ass. It feels like it at this point. I turn on the alarm and drive away. At that moment, the mechanic phones me and says, Hey bud, listen up. You're probably the new guy, but at night, I don't enter that school. And you shouldn't either. That place is haunted like crazy. Even your colleagues don't want to go there at night. That's when I realized that this was the damn school everyone was always talking about. The mechanic wished me a good shift and told me that he was going to go back to sleep. The rest of the night I was surely staying closer to my colleagues. Everyone knew I went there, but no one asked questions about me being all shaken up. I got just one comment. Well, now you know to stay away from there. Fortunately, this was not the last time I had to go there, and not the only thing that I experienced there. My two boys fought something I can't explain. Terrifying event. This happened about 25 years ago. I still think about it on a regular basis. At the time, my two boys were around six and eight years old. Happened in a small town about 20 miles from Skinwalker Ranch. This is in the Utah Basin. Having grown up there, I had more than a few personal experiences that still give me chills. But this event was beyond anything I've ever experienced before or even heard about. My two boys slept in a bunk bed, in a room just across the hall from my room. I was fast asleep when I was suddenly woken up by the most intense and terrifying scream from my boys, screaming and crying out for me. I jumped out of bed, grabbed my pistol from the top of my dresser, threw open my door. How do I say this? Huh? Running out of my son's bedroom was a two to three foot bright green creature. I have no idea what it was, but it looked to me as it was exiting their room and shot down the hallway. It made a quick turn and shot down my basement stairs. Keep in mind, all the lights were off, but this thing stood out, bright green in color with black patches on its face and body. I only got a quick look at it, but what my kids would tell me terrified me. I ran into their room and flipped on the light. Both of them, standing in the middle of the room, holding their pillows. They were crying and screaming so hard I couldn't understand what they were saying. My wife came in and began to calm them down when I was looking for whatever just ran down to my basement. I searched everywhere, every corner, but found nothing. I went back upstairs and asked my boys what happened. Without going into great detail here, what they told me was horrifying. My youngest son told me that he woke up and noticed something green hunched over standing in the doorway just looking at him. He wasn't sure what it was, so he sat up and when he did, this thing started grinning at him with big teeth, causing him to let out a scream waking my older son. While my younger son was telling me what he had seen, my older son spoke up and said, It looked like Darth Maul but green. If this sounds familiar, Darth Maul is a Star Wars character. Look him up and you'll get an idea of what this thing looked like. Imagine a short, hunched-over Darth Maul. Now I guess out of fear, my youngest son grabbed his pillow and started hitting this thing, which had now moved into the room closer to them. He then tells me it grabbed hold of his pillow and started growling at him. This caused my older brother, or sorry, my older son to start screaming as well. Within seconds, he joined with this pillow, hitting it over and over until it suddenly let go and turned and started back toward the bedroom door. I think it must have heard me open my door because this is when I saw it. And like I said, I didn't get the best look at it, but it was bright green with black patches and it moved extremely fast. 
this event had a profound impact on my youngest son. But this point forward, he would only sleep with his head covered, which always worried me. I had to sleep in their room for the next week or two before they would go to sleep without me, and only with the lamp on in the room. Sound hard to believe? I get it. Had I not seen it myself, I would have thought they were imagining things. Seeing is absolutely believing. Was it a demon, a ghost, or an alien? Or someone else entirely? I don't have a clue. But I know it was not human. And we never saw it again, though. Even today, they still kind of draw on, well, they, they draw pictures very similar to what they saw. And while they don't like to talk about it with me, their descriptions have never changed. I had an experience with something very similar when I was about eight years old, and I sometimes wonder if it was the same thing. What I can tell you is that this is real, 100% true event. And the first time I've shared it with anyone outside my family, I don't expect anyone to believe it. But I'm telling you, it's all true. My Scariest Paranormal Experience About two years ago, in the dead of winter, my power went out. This was a big problem for me, because I have a pet leopard gecko who requires heating elements to survive. It started getting very cold in my apartment very quickly. The point I became worried about my pet's safety did the only thing I could think of to do, which was to take my gecko to my car and crank the heater up. Normally we get a few power outages every winter in my area, and... They last maybe an hour or two. This time was different, because the power didn't come back on for six hours. After about an hour of sitting in my driveway, I got extremely bored. Started driving around my neighborhood, which had some more rural areas that butted up against a national forest. One of these areas is an absolutely beautiful overlook. This is a place where you can see miles of forest and also a few street lights, so I'd be able to see if the power came back on. So I drove there and sort of parked to enjoy the view. I'd had the heat running for a while, and the car had gotten a bit hot, so I rolled down the window to let some of the cool air and almost immediately started hearing something kind of far off at first. Kind of a weird, sad-sounding howl mixed with a squawk. I assumed this was an animal, but rolled up the window almost all the way, just in case. Over the next 20 minutes, the sound got progressively closer and closer to the car. It almost sounded like it was circling me. I can still hear this sound in my mind, clear as day, even though this happened several years ago. And I know what animals that we had locally, and what they sounded like. This didn't sound like any of them. I got nervous and decided to leave and go get some food and gas in a neighboring town, at least a town that still had power. About another hour passes and there's still no power. Having convinced myself the sound was just an animal and it had probably long since moved, I went back to the overlook to enjoy my meal. About another hour goes by without anything happening. No noise, no nothing, until eventually I see movement among the big rocks in front of me. It's starting to get dark, so I can't really make it out perfectly, but at one point it looked like the head of a disfigured animal peered at me and looked over a rock and then disappeared. I see this several more times, but I stay, because if this was an animal, there was probably something severely wrong with it be it an injury or a birth defect that would probably affect its quality of life. And I wanted to be able to let the animal control know that they could find it and help it or put it out of its misery if necessary. Especially since it was clearly staying in that exact area. After a while it starts making noise again. 
The same one as before, but now it's almost added this horrible gurgling and sounds almost human. At this point, it's gotten completely dark. And I can't see much of anything, but I can still hear it circling the car. Eventually, I hear what sounds like something messing around near the back tire, and I panic. I peel out of the parking spot. I look behind me and see what's now very clearly a person in the taillights. They attempted to chase the car for a few feet, but quickly gave up. Is it possible this was a person under the influence or suffering from mental health issue? Yeah, I guess it definitely is, but... It seems pretty unlikely since it was probably below 30 degrees outside and far enough out of everybody's way that I doubt anybody'd be hanging out there, let alone hanging out there for hours and wearing what appeared to be animal skin on their head. If it wasn't a person, based on the location and how the thing looked, probably a skinwalker. This experience still terrifies me to this day. I believe I may have a recording of the sound. I'll try to find it. But if I can't find it, I'll post it. But due to the power outage, I didn't film or record most of the experience to conserve my already dying phone. Something haunting a cafe in Prescott, Arizona. In 2013, I worked as a baker at a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It's still in business. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted among staff. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. So I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m. unable to turn or get the lights to work until 5 a.m. This is when the baristas would arrive. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience and felt energetically open to invite something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit, and that was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There were no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how the bottle managed to get on top of the tarp I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my co-workers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night I was scheduled and told everybody about my experience. Eventually it was just me and one other co-worker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room, I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy that we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice but a combination of a growl and spoken words, and it was textural. I'd never heard anything like it before. It was like someone was speaking from another dimension, almost staticky. I immediately froze and 
spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me, but after finding no other explanation, I turned around and faced her and said, What was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought that was you. We both froze in disbelief, and at the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on top of the espresso bar moving and kind of looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches into the air, wiggled a bit side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm that we had both just seen that, then ran to the bathroom on the other side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud something like, Okay, I get it. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day it remains the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I've ever witnessed. I would not mind being served espresso by a ghost, but that's just me. The scariest day of my life. When it happened, I was 15. I'm a girl and I'm now 20. I was sleeping at my friend's house. So later that day, around October, she said, let's do some urbex. There's an abandoned factory near my house. I accepted. So when we were there, I started feeling weird. But I thought that was probably because it was just new for me, exploring, blah, 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 blah. Everything went well, except the fact that I had the feeling of being spied on. After an hour exploring there, there was only one room left to visit. So I asked her, What's behind the door? She said, Oh, nothing, it's the attic. Nothing interesting. Also, there's a lot of wasps' nests. You shouldn't go there. I was young and stupid, so I replied, Don't worry, I'll go, and I'll see if there's nests and I'll quickly come back. The door was stuck. So I kicked it and opened it. First thing I saw was wooden stairs. While climbing, I started having this weird feeling even more. It was scaring me a bit, but I was brave. So I looked at what was upstairs, and I could see a room with a big round window. And at that moment, I saw two walls right beside that room. It was around a meter wide. And that's when I saw eyes. They were looking at me, and I was petrified. I couldn't look away, too scared, I couldn't move. After something like five minutes of that thing staring at me, I couldn't see his body, but my friend asked me, Is everything okay? But I couldn't reply. Then the thing moved in my direction. That's when I started running in the stairs as fast as I could. I was skipping the steps four to four, too afraid it could be faster than me. I screamed at my friend, run, just run. After being back home, I was shocked. We haven't talked about it much. I told her I saw something, but that's all. After months, we needed to walk past that factory to meet one of her friends. I was feeling spied again, but we could hear something following us in the forest. That wasn't fun at all. I could see a shadow here and there, but I chose to ignore it. Why? After leaving the forest, we were on a path in a field of tall grass. I stayed there near the forest waiting for my friend to come back, because the other girl didn't like me at the time. Then I saw a shadow between two big trees, and before I could realize it, that shadow was in front of me in the tall grass. I couldn't see it well, but I was able to see his eyes looking at me. It was approaching me slowly. I was so scared, and writing messages to my friend saying that the thing was there. 
My friend took something like two minutes to see my messages. Two minutes that looked like hours to me. From where she was, she could totally see what was behind the grass. So she started screaming my name, telling me to join her as fast as possible. But I couldn't run. I had a feeling if I was taking my eyes off of it, it could be dangerous, even more dangerous than now. So I walked backwards until I was with her, seeing the thing following me, and then it disappeared in a second. I was so scared, so once again we ran away to her house, locking all the doors. When I was in my room, I could hear weird sounds and see shadows. That was a nightmare. I wasn't able to sleep because the sounds were waking me up. I was feeling spied on in my own bedroom. So I tried to talk about it with my friend and she refused to tell me what she saw. She just said, It's not important to know what it was. Because we won't go there, ever. After a while, somebody told me to try to speak to that thing. Ask it to let me alone and that I was sorry if I did something wrong. And that's what I did, and since then I never saw it or heard it again. I was genuinely scared. Sometimes I still feel this weird feeling, but not as much as before. Portal to Paradise happened, I'd say, late summer, when the weather was becoming colder. I often went with my father whenever he was doing work on boats and ships. My father was a fisherman and was repairing a friend's large wooden fishing trawler, which was in sort of an alcove. He was doing a job which involved a technique called caulking. And while he was doing this, I became bored and looked around for something to do. I looked off the port side of the boat. I saw a buoy. It was up against the shoreline, and I decided I wanted to play with it. But I got off the boat and made my way over to it. It was a little bit taller than me. It was round and very rusted. I started pushing it out into the water, and it would travel for a bit before beaching itself again. This happened two or three more times before it started traveling by itself. I found this unusual. I watched it as it traveled along, but then went into the embankment. I was very confused by what just happened. As where it went, it was just like solid rock. I went over to where it had entered the embankment, and I found a stone archway. It was made from three large slabs of which seemed to be made of sandstone. When I peered in to see where the buoy went, it was floating across a tropical ocean toward a beach. The beach had palm trees and the ocean was sky blue. It would look like one of the islands from the Maldives. I was completely blown away and in the back of my mind I wanted to swim in the direction the buoy went toward the beach. I stood there for quite a while contemplating if I stepped through the door and swim toward the beach, but also concerned about what would happen if I did. I decided to call my father to come and see what I found. This was world changing for me, but things were about to get stranger. I called my father to come to me, but there was silence. I called again and heard him say, I'll be there in a minute, paraphrasing. So I waited, and he never came. I was close to stepping through, but had a weird conscious thought that my father would be responsible for my disappearance. And of course I didn't want that. So I decided against going in and heading back to the boat. When I got back to my father, he was still caulking the deck. The first thing I said was, Why didn't you come when I called you? He looked up at me, completely confused, and said something along the lines of, I never heard you call me. Now I was even more confused. After this, I never said anything more. We packed up and left for home. As we were heading back up the hill next to the boat, I looked in the direction of where the doorway and portal was. 
wondered what would have happened if I'd gone through. I bet you're thinking right now that this was something my child mind was making up. Or maybe I was hallucinating, right? Wrong. When I was in my early 20s, I asked about that to my father. And he remembered. He remembered the buoy. He remembered the question I asked him. I didn't ask any further, as this confirmation carved it into stone for me. I also did a little investigating into the timeline, and everything lines up. My father passed away many years ago, and so I couldn't ask him any more questions. I often think back to that day and wished I had just gone through. With all the shitty thing in this world and the way my life is now, I think my life would have been better off if I had. I contemplated the situation throughout my life and the mammoth implication of such a feat. Changing space and time in order for a being or entity to get to me through the portal. I could only come to three conclusions. A god, aliens, or that this world is in fact a simulation. And I saw an intentional glitch in the Matrix and that the operator spoke to me directly and had the ability to mimic my father's voice. This wasn't the only unusual situation to happen to me in my life, but I was definitely one of the most awesome memories I think I'll ever have and I'll treasure forever. Drinking with Ghosts I had a very scary experience a couple of years ago in Montana, and to this day, I can never quite figure out what happened. Summer of 2011, we just turned 21. One July weekend, my friend and I decided to go bar hopping. I was drinking and my friend wasn't, and she was driving, so she gambled a little bit. We left about 12 a.m. to go gas up and cruise around. At this point, I was pretty fucking wasted. So, while she went inside to pay for gas, I stayed in the van. As I'm sitting there listening to music, this Native American man and woman come up to me and ask me where I'm headed. I tell them nowhere and that we live here in town. They then ask for a ride to their house, told me that they live in the country. I'm usually very cautious about people and never give rides to strangers. But for some reason I told them to hop in. They say thank you and hop in the back seat. My friend comes back and gasses up and then gets back in the driver's seat. We blast the music and head to the back roads where we usually cruise around when we don't want to run into cops. As we're driving, I kept telling my friend which way to go and get to the couple's house. She keeps asking me who the hell I'm talking about. I ignore her and send her the bottle that, you know, send her the bottle that the couple was sharing with me. I'm just talking away to them and about 30 minutes later they tell me to pull into this dirt road. I tell my friend to stop and pull in. And that's all I remember. I wake up at 3.30 a.m. in a cold pitch black darkness. Our windows are down and our doors are open for some reason. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs for my friend to wake up. I scream at her to start the car and turn the lights on. When she turns the lights on, we're surrounded by nothing but trees and darkness. I look in the back seat and look around outside, but those people are nowhere to be found. There's also no houses where we stopped. I tell her, let's get the fuck out of here. The next day, I was still very terrified. I kept thinking about last night, wondering how she only took two shots that the bottle had and how that would make her pass out with me like that for three hours. My friend was pretty scared too. I told her what I remembered, asked her what happened or if she remembers anything. She said there was nobody in the car with us and was wondering who I kept talking to. But she does remember taking a few shots from that bottle and then mysteriously popped up out of nowhere. And she doesn't remember anything after she pulled that car onto that dirt road. 
So the next day we go cruise the back roads and try to find the place where we drop those people off. After driving a while, we hit this dead end and I start getting a little bit of a flashback. I remembered the sign that said no trespassing, the road and the way the trees were looking, all very familiar. Then all of a sudden I get this very eerie feeling and start feeling sick to my stomach, so we leave. Fast forward a couple of weeks later, the same friend and I decided to get a bottle. We start cruising and decide to hit the back roads again, so we don't get pulled over. My friend is driving and I start drinking. An hour or two have gone by and we're both totally drunk. I tell her to pull over because I need to pee. She stops and I go behind the van to pee and I look over into the field and I see these red eyes staring at me. I pull my pants quickly, see the brake lights from the van and the van starting to drive away. I start chasing her and I slap the back window and she stops. When I get to the driver door, I opened it and asked my friend, what the fuck are you doing? She starts laughing and says, you told me to go, so I did. I push her out of the driver's seat and climb in to drive. At this point, I'm scared sober, so we head home. The next day, she was acting weird and barely talking to me, so I decided to ask her why she was trying to drive off and leave me in the country last night. She told me that I was sitting in the passenger seat the whole time, and that I told her to go ahead and leave. Then all of a sudden, I was pounding on the back window of the van. She said when I looked at you in the passenger seat, your eyes were red. Was something warning me of flooding in my garage twice? A bit of background. I have a cheap white noise maker from a retail store. I prefer the ocean setting. But if you unplug it and power it back on, it defaults to a water dripping or stream sound. I'm pretty sensitive to a sudden change in white noise, so it usually wakes me up, especially if our house loses power for a second. So there's been a string of cold days lately in the PNW. Multiple days below 30 in a row. Our washer and dryer out in the garage. We've never had a problem before, but this year our washing machine supply lines froze. I unhooked everything, routing the lines to a bucket, so when they thawed, I could catch the water. Onto the taps themselves. The hot water wasn't frozen, so I left it dripping. The cold water was frozen, though. I did what I could with my heat gun before putting it nearly closed. The idea was is that if it thaws, any excessive pressure will be relieved as long as the tap is somewhat open. It was supposed to rise above freezing the following afternoon for the first time in a few days. My cat's auto feeder goes off at noon, but she likes to wake me up an hour before it goes off. I wanted some sleep so I got up around 11.40 to press the food button to get some peace and quiet. While I was up, I poked my head into the garage. The hot water tap was still dripping, but the cold water was frozen shut. I headed back to bed. At around 12.20, I'm half awoken by my white noise machine switching to a running stream instead of, well, an ocean setting. I'm still pretty asleep, but I roll out of bed to switch the setting back. My cat is really excited to see me out of bed, so I humor her and follow her to the kitchen where I hear water trickling noises. I look into the garage to find the cold water tap is thawed, and I hadn't closed the tap enough as water was spraying everywhere. I managed to get the tap closed to a drip and most of the water and mopped it up. There really wasn't much water, like I had caught it just after it started. I actually really needed some laundry done, so I threw a load in and hooked the thawed supply lines back up. I start the machine and get back into bed. 
I have a bad habit of scrolling on my phone instead of trying to sleep, especially after being woken up too many times. I'm scrolling on my phone, snuggling with my girlfriend who sleeps in a way later way than I do. She's starting to wake up and chat with me. Then the white noise machine switches to the running stream setting for the second time that morning. I ignored it this time, as it was nice and warm in bed. Five minutes later, my girlfriend wakes up fully and wonders why the white noise is different. I tell her it happened earlier this morning too, but I'm not sure why. Nothing else loses power. I eventually get out of bed to start breakfast, switched off the white noise altogether. I heard water running in the garage for a second time that morning. Through the garage door open to find water gushing everywhere. This time the drainage pipe must have been frozen because the washer was ejecting soapy water everywhere and it was spraying back into the garage. This time it had been going for a lot longer than the first time I caught it. There was a ton of soapy water everywhere. The first time my white noise changed, I checked the garage almost immediately caught the tap. The second time I ignored it for a few minutes, which lined up with there being significantly more water on the floor before I caught it. Is a friendly house sprite watching over me? Did a ghost mess with the machine to alert me of the potential flooding? I'm not sure what to think. My old creepy bedroom. In like 2010 or 2011, I had a bottom bunk bed, my older brother having the top. We were watching late night TV way past our bedtime. I was 10 or 11 at the time and he was 15 or 16. We both swear to this day that we both saw the exact same thing. As mentioned, it was way past her bedtime. Our mom would be in her room, which was on the other side of the wall. My dad would be downstairs on the sofa, like the strange man he was. We had three cats and two dogs at this time. While watching TV, our bedroom door flew open. We both thought it was our big dog, who was quite the hefty golden retriever. It wasn't. Seconds later, we seen something straight out of a horror movie. A golden clawed hand. I've never even heard of anything like that. For a few seconds it reached around the door and grasped at the air, then pulled away very quickly. As we were shitting bricks at this point, our storage closet door flew open, also with some old junk falling out of it. To this day, we are still confused. Like nine or ten years later, we have no idea what went on that night. Between then, maybe 2016, it was just odd knocks, scrapes and scratches and shuffling noises, with the occasional breathy type sound. I can't remember many significant events in this period, though it might come to me soon. Roughly 2016 and 2017, I was 16 or 17 years old. I wanted to capture some of the noises and weird things happening at night and downloaded a sleep recorder app. I still have the recordings to this day, and I'll be adding that to the comments of this post. A little background as to why both these recordings are creepy as shit. Around this time, we had builders fitting new roof tiles or something like that. One of them dropped a hammer, and it went straight through the roof, through the attic, and into my bedroom. They patched the outer roof, but my bedroom ceiling had a hole in it for a while. My attic was a scary place, daytime or nighttime. Even at the age of 20, I'll never go up there. Well, one night I would be trying to sleep, but feel as though I'm being watched. I keep looking around trying to find some comfort to brush off my paranoia, and out of the corner of my eye I see the hole in my ceiling and these red eyes staring right at me even with a pupil. I believe they had pupils. When I made eye contact, the thing blinked, and a couple seconds later, they disappeared. The 
first recording I got was around 1.19 a.m., and I was 100% asleep, as I remember this too clearly to ever forget. So at 1.19 a.m., I caught a recording with a weird electronic-type voice that says, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, is watching. The voice was deep, and when it said the word watching, it turned into a deep, light growl. Of course, as mentioned since 2011, there was always weird knocks in my bedroom. Even me being alone there would be knocks. On the wall behind my head, my window, my bedroom door, the closet door, everywhere in that room I experienced knocking sounds. I liked to think that it was my house settling, until I found the second recording. The second recording, I think, was also when I was asleep. I'll have to fact check that via the recording names, but the second recording says, knock, 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 who's there? The voice is a bit more quick, and after these two recordings, I stopped sleeping in my room and moved to my living room sofa. For the last three years until moving out, I've never slept in my room, ever. I'll post unlisted YouTube videos of the recordings below. Bear in mind that while trying to enhance the second one, the audio file kept becoming ear-piercingly harsh. It was either too fuzzy or whenever the voice said knock, 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 it would be too rumbly. The voice was literally all across the frequency spectrum frequency spectrum from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. A dreadful gurgle. Well, it happened to me when I was at a boarding school in Shimla. This was many years ago. I was sleeping in the senior dormitory along with some 20 other boys. My bed was positioned in the corner of a long room at some distance from the others. There was no shortage of pranksters in our dormitory, and one had to look out for introduction of stinging nettles or maybe peebles or possibly even a small lizard under the bed sheets. But I wasn't in prepare for my body in my bed. I think they meant that they weren't prepared for a body to show up in their bed. First, I thought a sleepwalker had mistakenly gotten into my bed. I tried to push him out, muttering, Devinder, get back into your own bed. There isn't room for two of us. Devinder was a notorious sleepwalker who had pretty much ever ended up on the roof on one occasion. But it wasn't Devinder. Devinder was a short boy and was a fellow, and was a tall, lanky person. His feet stuck out of the blankets at the floor of the bed. It must be Ranjit, I thought. Ranjit had huge feet. Ranjit, I hissed. Stop playing the fool and get back into your bed. No response. I pushed him, but without success. Body was heavy and inert. It was also very cold. I lay there wondering who it could be. Then it began to dawn on me that the person beside me wasn't breathing. I have this horrible realization that there is a corpse in my bed. How did it get there, and what do I do about it? Vishal, I called out to a boy who was sleeping a short distance away. There's a corpse in my bed. Vishal, did you wake up? You're dreaming, Ray. Go to sleep and stop disturbing everyone. Just then, there was a groan, followed by a dreadful gurgle from the body beside me. I shout out of the bed that something's at the top of my voice, waking up the entire dormitory, and lights came on. There was a total confusion. The housemaster came running. I told him and everyone else what happened. They came to my bed, had a good look at it. There was no one there. In my instance, I was moved to the other end of the dormitory. The house perfect. Johnson took over my former bed. Two nights passed without further excitement and a couple of boys started calling me Funk and Scared Cat. My response was to punch one of them in the nose. Then on the third night when we were all woken by several ear-splitting shrieks, 
Johnson came charging across the dormitory, screaming that two icy hands had just taken him by the throat and tried to squeeze the life out of him. Lights came on. The poor old housemaster came dashing in again. We called Johnson down and put him in a spare bed. The housemaster shone his torch on the boy's face and neck, and sure enough, we saw several bruises on his flesh. The outline of a large hand. Next day, the offending bed was removed from the dormitory. It was a few days before Johnson recovered from the shock. He was kept in the infirmary until the bruises disappeared. But for the rest of the year, he was a nervous wreck. Our nursing sister, who was looking after the infirmary for many years, recalls that some twenty years earlier, a boy called Tompkins had suddenly died in the dormitory. He was very tall for his age and apparently suffered from a heart problem. That day he had taken part in football, had gone to bed looking pale and exhausted. Early next morning when the bell rang for gym class, he was found stiff and cold, having apparently died during the night. He died peacefully, poor boy, recalled her nursing sister, but I'm not so sure. I can still remember the dreadful gurgle from the creature in my bed and there was the struggle with Johnson. No, there was nothing peaceful about that death. Tompkins had gone most unwillingly. This city is full of ghosts. It all began when we went to explore the back of a friend's house who owned a restaurant. In the center of the city, all the houses are old, and this house was no exception. My friend, two other friends, and I went there. Suddenly, my friend and one of the friends stayed at the threshold of one of the doors. I asked them what was wrong. They both claimed with the weird look on their face that there were ghosts there. I scoffed at them, telling them that they were crazy, and I continued on. I didn't see or feel anything. They both insisted that they felt something. I guess because they're empathetic to the paranormal, which I recently learned. Every time I wanted to go to that place for dinner, my friend refused. She said there was very negative energy there. I went back many times and nothing happened. The only thing I could witness with my own eyes was doing, well, during a New Year's Eve party that we celebrated there. Three of my friends were surprised by something. I saw how a strand of one of their curly hair inexplicably remained horizontal. I didn't think anything of it. In fact, I found it funny. They just laughed nervously, and maybe I was the only thing that, or maybe that was the only thing that happened that day. Now that I remember, it was surprising, but I remained in denial. Some time later, when I had the chance, I asked the owners of that house if they had also seen or felt anything strange. They replied that they personally hadn't. The only incident was when they were renovating the bottom floor of the house, and they unearthed a tombstone with more than a hundred years of history beneath what they saw was being like a printing press of the convent of La Cruz. They also told me that many customers and employees of the restaurant had made comments about something or someone lurking in that part of the house. The only concrete story came from a kitchen assistant who told me that she had seen a little girl. He was really scared to the point of quitting that job. A few years passed, and I liked to visit a downtown craft beer bar at night. I chatted with the bartender at the bar while talking about craft beer most of the time. One time the topic came up, and he told me that almost when it was closing time, around 2.30 a.m., he saw a man leaning against the wall next to one of the refrigerators at the entrance. There, as if he were drunk but he wasn't a real person. He said that the apparition didn't speak or do anything. It just appeared there. Obviously, I didn't believe him. 
Six years after moving to this city, my friend accompanied me to another craft beer place, also located in the downtown area of the city. We had an event, and after it ended, she sat alone at one of the tables while I went to greet and chat with the other attendees and friends. Suddenly she called me and asked me to please leave. She was very insistent. I asked her why. She replied that she felt a ghost and that it had actually pushed her and moved the bench. I reluctantly agreed, not without telling her she was overreacting. Some time passed, I went back to that beer bar. Sometimes I chatted with the owner and sometimes with the waiter. One time I asked the waiter if there was a ghost story or anything like that there. He said yeah. I let him tell me whatever he wanted without specific questioning. He didn't give me many details, but he said that it used to be an old-style tavern, cantina in Spanish. And in the back room where my friend said she was pushed, there was a ghost of a woman, most likely a prostitute. She probably was there because she'd been murdered there. It was that day and that moment when I started to believe people who claimed to see or feel ghosts. The Hotel Housekeeper of Room 45 A few months ago I went on a trip with two friends. Both of them are very sensitive to the supernatural. One can only sense or perceive it, while the other has told me about seeing full apparitions with all their details. We arrived at a hotel in the late afternoon, a hotel that was just over 30 years old, a beautiful hotel with hundreds of guests that day. We took the elevator and realized that our room was quite far away. We had to walk down the hallway and make two left turns. As we began to walk down the hallway, still decorated with a somewhat old carpet, one of my friends said, the good thing is that this hotel isn't haunted. All three of us laughed and continued to our room. The next morning we headed to breakfast. We ran into the housekeeper in the hallway. He greeted her with good morning and one of my friends asked her, there's no ghosts here, right? The housekeeper just stared at us, and with nervous laughter we insisted. Or are there? She also laughed nervously and quickly told us that there are. She told us that on the upper floor there's the ghost of a night guard who died of a heart attack. Several people have seen him making his rounds on that floor. Of course, only at night. And then she told us about the maid who died in room 45. The one that's practically in front of the two elevators. People say that she frequently knocks on the door of that room at different times. Like when they knock to see if the guests want their room cleaned. Well, we said. Thank you very much. We hurried off to go have breakfast. We went up to the elevator and one of my friends said, I said there were no ghosts only to deny that I had felt something. The next evening we returned to our city activities a bit tired, but I still wanted to spend some time in the hotel lobby. We walked down the long hallway to the elevators, and when we arrived, I pressed the down button. Shortly after the bell rang to signal that the elevator had arrived, and the left-hand elevator door opened, the elevator was empty and the light was off. I had never felt anything like this, and it scared me, so I hesitated to get in. The friend who was with me said, Oh, that's really strange. The elevator closed its door, and we heard it go up to the floor and then down again. I was waiting for the other elevator to arrive, but it didn't. Instead, the left elevator returned and opened its door again, but this time the light was on. I truly felt goosebumps, something that had never happened to me in such a situation. And more so because I don't even believe in ghosts. I said, how scary. 
Could it be that the maid from the room in front of room 45 is playing a prank on us? I told my friend. We waited for that elevator to leave and for the right hand elevator to arrive so we could go down without fear. I really felt that something strange had happened. How could the light in the elevator go off? There was a small switch located next to the floor buttons, and then, when it went up and down, who turned the light on? If it was empty, the ghost night guard? Well, we returned to our room after spending some time in the lobby and shaking off the scare. We told our other friend, the one who sees ghosts, we told him what had happened to us. And she said, Oh, yes. It was definitely the ghost of the maid. She never used the elevators or went near that area again. And in the last few days we were there, she used the stairs on the side of her room, even though it was several floors up. My father met a dead man. Trigger warning. Murder. My father woke up from his first liver transplant surgery, and his first words after the breathing tube was removed were quite insistent and about somebody named Brent. My aunt and grandfather were in the room with him, and upon hearing this, my aunt assumed my father was dreaming about somebody that had gone to high school with, and who had the same name, perhaps. She calmed him down and told him to rest. He could talk about it later. The morphine had been making him and, well, maybe have some strange dreams and hallucinations. So it was easily dismissed as another one of those instances. That was until two days later when my aunt was reading the newspaper and came across the obituary of a stranger with the same first and last name my father had mentioned. She asked my father, who was much more lucid at this point, if he remembered mentioning the name. He went on to state very matter-of-factly that yes, like he'd tried to tell them, and he'd met the Brent from the obituary while having his transplant. Brent had been there when he went under, and taken my father to see a trailer where he had been shot and killed by his girlfriend's estranged husband. The girlfriend was also injured, but survived. He stood next to my father and sort of narrated the events as they both watched. Brent asked my father to tell his mother and family that he was okay. This occurred back in 1995, so newspapers and phone books were the best available tools. My aunt looked in the paper again and found the news story about the homicide, paying attention to the details. Brent was killed the day of my father's surgery at the time that it was occurring. Was too strange to not be true. But the question was, what do you do with this information? My father obviously wanted to pass the message along, but finding this man's mother and contacting her out of the blue was out of the question. He hadn't believed in anything like this prior to it happening to him. Why would anyone else? So he sat with it. That was until he was released from the hospital. He decided to try contacting a detective that had been listed in the news story to just see what happened. My father recounted the information to this detective over the phone. The detective listened pretty intently, which included several details that were not included in the news releases. Surprisingly, the cop actually believed my father, but was still somewhat reluctant about putting him in contact with Brent's mother. He said he'd call back. When he called back, he asked my father where the suspect had put the murder weapon, because this was the detail that wasn't reported, and I suppose couldn't easily be guessed. My father went on to describe the location, the specific bush it was put in, and its direction from the trailer. The detective said he would speak to Brent's mother and give him her number. It was up to her if she wanted to call. That's how he put it. I guess it was a test, and my father passed. She did call shortly after my father was able to give her Brent's message. I was 15 when all this transpired. The man responsible for Brent's death 
had been apprehended almost immediately and was convicted. He recently had a parole hearing, but still in prison. This has definitely stuck with me throughout my life, and I'm a rational and skeptical person by nature, but having witnessed this series of events firsthand, I'm reminded that not everything that happens in this life can be explained. My family and I used to talk about it from time to time, but over time I've lost them starting with my father, my aunt being the most recent, and many others in between. I don't know what comes next or what this means as far as ghosts or spirits, but I know there's something beyond this life, and if Brent's okay, I imagine the rest of them are too. Hotel Ghost Experience Turned Skeptic to believer. So this is an experience I had in 2018 when I was management trainee with an organization, and it entailed a short one or two week stint across their major offices in different cities. Our office organized for accommodation for us too. For my second stint, I was put in a city where I had never been before and had no friends or acquaintances. So the company booked a hotel close to the office premises. The room was rather big and seemed very luxurious, albeit a bit old and shabby. What stumped me the most was how economical it was. The first night was uneventful and for a woman traveling alone for the first time, it felt secure and comfortable. The second night, at about 9.30 p.m., I ordered in. And after finishing my dinner, I went out to my door to place the food trolley for collection by the staff. Just when I turned around to close my door, I saw someone staring at me from the corner of my eye. The person was at the end of the corridor, and it was very dimly lit. And let me add here that only two out of the twenty rooms on the floor were occupied, and ten were being renovated, hence the dim lighting at night. When I turned to look, the person ran out of view toward the elevator. I was creeped out and, well, I just locked the room and reported this to the reception. Third night. I was talking to my mom on a video call. I heard heavy pacing and running at about 10 or 10.30 p.m. My mom heard it too. I sneaked to the peephole and I saw no one, but I heard the footsteps right outside my door. I called the reception and they sent someone to check, who reported that there was no one and I checked their CCTV footage. No one was there. Fourth night. I got a call on the hotel intercom, and when I answered, I heard only heavy breathing and low growling noises. This continued another two times before I called the reception again to raise a complaint. They checked their call panel records and said I had not received any from any current hotel guests or staff lines. I checked again next morning just to be sure and they showed me how the system is automated and no one can tamper with it. It showed no incoming or outgoing calls from my room. Fifth night. Heard a constant knocking on the wall behind the bed. Moved across the room. Basis where I was standing and... This creeped me out much more, and as someone diagnosed with hyper-anxiety and depression, it felt like I was losing my mind, and I got an anxiety attack. I ran out of my room to the reception two floors below, and the manager on duty just calmed me down, and I was extremely upset. I questioned everyone around, and none of the staff said anything, and said it was strange as such things were happening. Later... A woman from my hometown, who was currently employed there, accompanied me to a new room that they assigned me to. She told me in private that the floor I was on was sealed for five years and had recently been opened. Rumor has it that some old hotel staff had molested a woman and she was killed in the struggle. The administration covered it up and paid off the perpetrator and the family of the victim and sold the property to the current owners. Since then, people have reported multiple occurrences on that floor. Also, these were major events. Some other small things happened, like the feeling of being watched constantly, 
cold spots and feelings of nausea and panic. I checked out promptly the next morning, got another hotel, paid for my pocket and have since then been extremely scared and anxious to be alone in any hotel room. Woken up in the middle of the night during the 2003 New York City blackout. I don't know how many of you will remember this, but in the summer of 2003, there was a widespread power outage in the Northeast region of the United States and parts of Canada. I was 11 years old and I was living with my grandma in an old suburb of Staten Island, New York. Because of this story, I'll always distinctly remember those two to three days without power. At the time, my family had just recently moved into a new house. I'd probably only been there for a few months. The house was old, probably built in the early to mid-1900s. As soon as we moved in, we immediately felt something in the house. Cold spots, random noises, shadows, voices. We realized that the house was haunted, but we never really felt that we had to leave because of it. My grandma and mom are sensitive to spirits, and we'd lived in other haunted houses before, so we were kind of used to it. Our ancestral house in the Philippines was much worse, so we really weren't in a rush to move so quickly after just moving in. In this house, I only ever saw shadows and heard voices, while my grandma and mom saw full-body apparitions. That is, until the blackout happened. So one night during the blackouts, it was hot as hell. The temperature was probably in the high 80s or low 90s with no air conditioning due to the power. So I asked my grandmother if I could sleep in her room. That was since it was on the third floor, the coolest part of the house. She obliged and I fell asleep next to my grandmother after playing Pokemon on my Game Boy under the covers for a few hours. I was woken up by a strange noise in the middle of the night a few hours later, probably around 1 or 2 a.m. It was freezing cold, so cold that I forgot about the power outage and thought that the AC was on. The noise sounded like a distant wailing, kind of like really high-pitched police sirens. It was loud enough to wake me, but somehow still sounded really far away. At this point, I'm not really thinking much of it since the window is open, and I assumed the noise was coming from outside. I'm still under the covers and wide awake, so I grab my Game Boy and start playing Pokemon in silence. That way I won't wake my grandmother. I was obsessed with the game. As I'm playing, I notice the noise getting louder and closer. This continued for another minute or so until I start to get really annoyed. Just as I was about to pull the covers off to investigate, I feel a weight shift on the bed and hear the mattress spring squeak by the foot of the bed. I look over to check if my grandma was still there or if she somehow f left without me knowing. She didn't. She was still there. I slowly peek out from under the covers and see a pale-skinned woman with long, dark hair sitting by the foot of the bed. She was wearing a light-colored dress, face toward the wall. Her hands were pressed against her face and eyes, and she was crying, which I now realize is the noise that I had been hearing. I was terrified and shaking, so I turned to wake my grandmother, but I realize she's already sitting up and she's praying the rosary in silence. She then turned to me and said, Don't worry, she won't hurt you. She visits me every night. I'll never forget it. I was freaked out and just shut my eyes until I fell back asleep. Anyways, after that night, I never slept in my grandmother's room again. I continued to feel a presence in the house, but I never heard the wailing or saw the woman again. My grandmother, on the other hand, said that the woman continued her nightly visits until we moved a year later. A house full of demon. I'm an investor. 
I purchased rundown houses, and I rehabbed them as a bit of a side hustle. I sold my primary house in Massachusetts in 2020, and purchased a few rentals in northwestern Florida on the two adjoining lots in need of major repair. It's in a pretty run-down part of town. Took me two years to rehab two duplexes in a single house. I stayed in the single house. Across the street from me was an old vacant church built circa 1930, and to the house of it sits a small vacant house on the end of a street. I asked the neighbors to see who owns the small house, hoping to buy it and fix it up. I was told that it sat empty for, I guess, well over five years, and someone had gotten murdered in it 15 years back. Still hoping to talk to the owner, I got my chance one day. That's when I was working on my roof. I saw someone cutting the yard on the property. I asked if it was for sale. He said he would consider it. Well, a few weeks passed. He said that I can check out the house. I walked over, he opened the door and let me inside, but he stayed outside. I pulled out my phone and made a video of the interior of the two bedrooms and a kitchen and a bathroom. I felt my foot get wet, so I thought the roof must be leaking. I looked down on one of my crocs and the toes covered in wet red paint. I began to look for the source of this red paint, but I didn't see it anywhere. Then another drip on my feet. I then noticed my left arm was cut and bleeding. I was shocked. Didn't remember how I got cut. I was trying to make sense of this thing. And that's when I get a burning sensation across my side. I lifted the shirt and saw three scratch marks across my belly. I ran out and told him I have to get a bandage for my cuts. I was just so confused on how this was even real. I began to replay the video, but it cut out, but the audio was still going. I kept quiet about this encounter. I just told my other friend about the house on the dead end street with a crazy low price. He became curious, showed up at my place. I didn't tell him what happened to me. While we walked over to the front of the house, gazed from the outside from the chain link fence. Right then, kind of got bad cutting his finger from the fence. Well, he went back to my place, bandaged his cut. He went home later that night. We removed the bandage and saw that the cut on his finger was gone. Nothing. I then told the story to him. A year went by and the small house was sold to another investor. Many months of renovation went by, went to an Airbnb vacation rental. A few months into the business, there was a large pool party in the backyard on a Saturday with over a hundred plus guests. I was outside making sure they won't park and trash all my properties. Then I had to leave to attend a family event. Forty minutes later, one of my tenants called and said the cops blocked all the roads leading into my properties. I drove as fast as I could home. When I get to my street, many of the party attendees were outside of the little house, with police and ambulances. I asked one of my neighbors. He told me there was a shooting inside the house with five people getting shot and one killed. The gunman was never found. I didn't believe anything until it happened to me, and the people that involved with this house. Now once again, it sits vacant, waiting for the next victim to draw blood. It's truly a demonic house. This happened 15 years ago, but it haunts me to this day. In high school, late 2000s, I had saved up all my money from summer jobs to afford a nice trip to Italy, where I'd study abroad for a bit. Since I paid out of pocket, it was important I behaved to stay on the trip. Or else I could be expelled or shipped back home early, losing out on the extra money I paid. Mostly hotel fees and ticket costs, but anyway. It was the boys and girls separated, so we all got assigned roommates. We'd always be buddied up each hotel that we stopped at. 
I really liked my roommate. We got along well. After hitting southern Italy, we moved up north, heading to Milan. The tour bus we were on got a flat. And after we changed to the spare, we were told that we had to stop by a neighboring town to change it to an actual tire needed. This town was in a tiny rural area where no one had cell reception because of how far out it was. The only access to the outside world was through a huge desktop computer in the concierge of a clearly old building that was repurposed as a hotel. We checked in and began unloading our bags. Now, once we're in our rooms, we're usually locked in with tape. If you break the tape or the seal, you get sent home for not following rules and sneaking out. So it's already night and we unpack. We're locked in for the night. My roommate, let's call her Penny. Penny and I noticed a tiny door behind her wardrobe. So we moved it together and opened the door. Think of like a Harry Potter's closet room. Like that, but inside was like much bigger. Tons of dust inside the room and dark as hell. Using our phones, we found a tiny light switch and we yanked it. All of the ceiling and floor and walls inside were painted white, and in the middle of the room was an old hospital gurney from around the 1950s. It had brown leather straps, both for the wrists and for the feet. So Penny crawls a bit inside, because she's like six feet tall. I'm going in there. She dares me to sit in it. Being the idiot I am, I do it. Then she straps me in so she can take a picture. The entire time we're laughing and cracking up, when the gurney suddenly moves with me in it. I scream. Penny runs to set me free. As we exit toward the doorway, we notice the gurney moves again, violently toward us and rush out of the room, seal it with the wardrobe. For the next three hours, we heard footsteps and the gurney slam against the tiny door. I couldn't sleep, so I said, fuck it. We opened our window shimmied the balcony of the second floor to get to our friends in the other room as to not break the seal. We tell them what happened, and everyone is spooked. Our teacher hears us making a commotion and rushes over to the room that we were in to ask what the noise is about. We explain in full detail what happened, and Penny is as white as a ghost. She's been quiet this whole time. The teachers don't believe us and threaten to send us home first thing in the morning for our behavior. So I challenged my teacher, told her I will dispute this with the student board unless she goes and sees for herself what's going on. She then went to the room and after two minutes returned and said that we could stay in the room with the others. Her face was a mixture of horrified and confused. Upon checkout, we asked about the room and the innkeepers acted confused, saying they didn't know what we were talking about. The teachers refused to speak about the incident with us. The rest of the trip was a blur, seeing as how Penny and I couldn't sleep at night the days after. Creepy Tall Figure My best friend, a 20-year-old female, and I, a 21-year-old female, were just recounting this story. I decided to post it on here. It was just past 3 in the morning, and I woke up to my phone buzzing. It was my best friend calling. She is quite an anxious person. She doesn't like to do things alone. So I picked up, and I had work at 6 the next morning, but I gathered it wouldn't be important. When I picked up, she told me that my boyfriend, male 22, had been trying to call me, but I hadn't woken up. He then called her and asked her if she would be able to pick him up. He was out at a friend's pub having drinks with the boys, but decided that he wanted to go home. Him and his friend, male 21, started walking back. We're in the UK, so the drive is only 10 minutes. But because it's country roads, the walk would be about an hour and a half, especially drunk. She asked me to go with her to collect them, so I reluctantly agreed, but 
you know, the circumstances. So on the way there, my best friend was talking, but in my head it was muffled, mostly because I was trying not to fall asleep in the car. Her car came to a stop, and I looked up and realized that we were not yet at our destination. I was confused, so I asked, Why have we stopped? To which she responded, I just told you there's kittens in the hedge. This seemed odd to me, but I looked over and saw some little ears. Because it was so late or early in the morning, there were no other cars around, so I also got out to look. When we reached the hedge, there was nothing in there but branches cracking. So we got back into the car, thinking we were just a bit tired and delusional. We carried on driving down the road. Eventually, we reached the boys. They were on a country road about a mile away from the pub at this point. My best friend has a three-door car, so we both got out to let the boys into the back seats. Once in the car, the boys were breathless. They were confused, but gathered it was just because they'd been walking for probably an hour given they'd walked a mile. After catching their breath, they told us to drive quick. Sophie, being Sophie, panicked, so she span her car round and floored it. At first, I suspected a farmer with a gun as we were next to a lot of fields and farmland. What they proceeded to tell us was far more sinister. We asked them what was wrong, to which they both started scrambling to tell us their version of the events. Eventually, they had calmed down, at least a little bit enough to be able to actually explain. They said they had been walking along and heard something in the bushes. They stopped, trying to figure out if they are being paranoid, if there is actually something happening. Silence. They carried on. Same thing happened. But instead of silence this time, they saw a tall shadow figure, taller than a human could ever stand. They said they froze in fear, but the adrenaline started moving their legs. The figure started to inch closer, so they just ran and didn't look back. We all got home safely without seeing the figure again, but part of me believed that those kittens were like a lure to try and get us to go into the hedges. We would have been the next victims after the boys, and I'm convinced that this thing was probably a skinwalker. We've not had an experience like this since, and I hope we don't again. Country Club When I Was Young I was maybe 10 or 11. My dad ran a bar in a country club, and from day one I never liked being there, especially at night. I would always bring my Xbox to keep myself occupied, and the way the bar worked was you had the main area where the bar was, and through a little hallway was the bathrooms, and those led to another room that my dad put arcade games in. It wasn't used very often, but I think it's because nobody really knew about it. Through another door was a little room where I would play my Xbox, and then behind that room was my dad's office. Outside, where the employees usually parked, there was a small loading dock and a gate that led to a bunch of old pools that were shut down a long time ago, even then. And one day I saw what I thought was a person. When I first saw it, it was wearing a black hood and moved very quickly away from me inside the defunct pool area. But when I really looked at it, I saw that it didn't have legs. Or what legs are supposed to look like. They looked like a blur of legs, and I saw it dip around a corner. So being the curious kid that I was, I went looking around to see if I could see who or what it was, and never saw it again. Another time I was just wandering around after getting bored playing games, and I heard a piano playing in the ballroom. That was just outside the bar in the pro shop. So I went to look, and no one was there. But there were imprints in the stool like someone was sitting there. 
and I've had multiple dreams even spanning into my adult life about being in there while the piano's playing. Nobody's there, but the piano is still playing. One night when I had the dream again, I was grown and walked into the ballroom and I heard the piano yet again. But I saw a small kid standing with his back turned on the stage. Then everything went black. I've also had multiple times where in the back rooms I would hear voices and doors opening, but no one would be there. There were a couple of rooms that were just off the kitchen, and I had only been in them once, but the power was shut off in those rooms. I guess because they weren't used as they were like locker rooms for the pools. I walked in one night because I thought I heard someone in there. I get in maybe three steps, and I hear a very loud crash. I turned and ran the other way. The last thing I'll tell you about is one night when my dad had to close up. I was sitting in the lobby just off the ballroom, and I saw someone just outside the door pacing around. It looked like a full person, legs, arms, eyes, mouth, expressions on his face. So thinking it was a patron of the bar, I brushed it off and looked away. When I looked back up, the guy is literally disappearing in front of me. I saw his upper half just fading away like Marty McFly in Back to the Future. I was so scared by it, I ran to my dad crying for the life of me, and I couldn't tell him what was wrong. I was pretty much just that level of inconsolable. The place never sat right with me, and I learned later that one of my friends snuck in there while it was closed years later. They saw the exact same apparition I saw the first time that was running. She also heard the piano playing in the ballroom and saw what looked like bloodstains in one of the rooms just off the kitchen. From what I was told, there was a guy that took his daughter hostage because his wife was filing for divorce and he killed her. But then himself, and apparently there were other deaths, but I don't know anything about them. The Paper Pad Monster Here are a few anecdotes from living in my childhood home, which I now believe to be haunted. Nobody else in my family experienced anything this vividly, but we all mostly agree it was haunted now. I grew up in a little coastal town in Connecticut with a lot of Native American history. As a kid, my dad would tell me that our house was built on a quote-unquote, as I'm sure you're all ready for, on an Indian burial ground, which I never believed because it sounded made up to be just spooky, but my dad isn't the most truthful person either. Regardless, I had some strange experiences in this house that I can't figure out to this day. I used to sleepwalk a lot in this house to the extent that my parents needed to lock our doors and windows at night to prevent me from roaming outside. My mom recalls multiple instances of waking up in the middle of the night to me fully asleep playing tag with nobody else there, or playing with Barbies while completely unconscious. There was also an instance where, while I was sleepwalking, I took raw eggs out of the fridge and hid them around the house like I was setting up an Easter egg hunt or something. I don't recall these things personally, but I do remember waking up sometimes in the middle of the night with a full sprint going down the hallway and being very confused. I would also hear voices at night. They would keep me awake a lot. Sometimes it was just my name being whispered repeatedly from another room. But there was this recurring instance of this thing that I called the paper pad monster. It would be this low whisper that would increasingly get louder, just monotonously whispering the words. Paper pad, paper pad, paper pad, over and over. I would follow the voice sometimes, and it always seemed to come from a specific corner of my parents' bedroom. They would be asleep while I was experiencing this, 
and always chalked it up to me having an overactive imagination come morning. I don't have any explanation for this, but the memories still freak me out. The voices weren't overtly menacing or anything, but scary in the sense that I had no idea who or what it was or how to make it stop. I lived most of my childhood in the house until we moved when I was ten. These encounters stopped completely. I didn't even think these memories were at all unusual until I started becoming interested in paranormal stuff as an adult. In my late twenties, I did some cursory research on my old town. And sure enough, the rumors about living on a Native American burial ground did end up being true after all. Look up the Nahantic Tribe Burial Ground, spelled N-E-H-A-N-T-I-C. If you'd like any more information on this town, my old neighborhood that is. The tribe's land was sold to developers in the late 1800s, and construction sites were digging up skeletal remains as recently as 1988. I have no idea what to make of any of this, well, stuff, still. But I'll never forget the paper pad voice till the day I die, and the guilt of living on the tribe's sacred land, albeit unknowingly, still haunts me. I won't forget the paper pad either. Preserved in Time I was spending a summer with my dad after I finished kindergarten. This was before starting first grade. We lived in a double-wide trailer out in the sticks on a gravel back road. The type of area where you had some woods to play in, or head across the street to a recently harvested cornfield to play kickball or tag or some other childhood game. My dad and I lived with my dad's brother and his wife as well as their two daughters. My cousin were a little older than me, about four years or so. We decided to play hide-and-seek one evening in the woods behind the trailer. So many spots to hide, laying down behind a fallen tree, ducking in a riverbed. Heck, if you were really crafty, you could pick a tree and climb it till you could see the whole area. We were on, like, round three when my eldest cousin said, is that an abandoned trailer? When we all regrouped and me and her sister both shot glances in the direction of her stare. And sure enough, there was. But it didn't look that old. Just had the standard moss on the sides and dirt build up as you'd expect a trailer in the woods to have. We sat there and stared at it for a second until my, well, until my eldest just piped up and said, You guys want to check it out? To which me and her sister, both younger and eager to venture, and Rebel quickly said yes. We get up right next to it, and we can see through the kitchen window, and it's definitely abandoned. But it's weird. Everything is so dusty and disorganized, but not trashed or ransacked. Just kind of like an unorganized clutter. We get to the front door, and oddly enough, it was unlocked. So we get inside, and the amount of dust in the air is so thick you can feel it when you breathe. Like trying to breathe through a t-shirt. We get to looking around, and there's so much cool stuff. An antique rotary phone, engraved wooden cooking utensils. Old glass maple syrup decanters. This place was like it was preserved in the 50s or 60s. We made our way back to the master bedroom, and it was so eerie. An old, freshly made bed with a heavy-duty wooden frame. A vanity with various perfumes and makeup items. Even a small jewelry box, one of the ones with a ballerina in it. We start looking in the closet. I see this old wedding dress preserves in a, like a clear plastic wrap. But it was weird, because it looked like it had less dust on it than all the other things. That's when a cold chill ran straight up my back, made every hair stand. I turned to my cousins and I said, I think we should leave now. They agreed, 
but my oldest cousin grabbed the jewelry box and said, Finders keepers. He took off with it. I wasn't going to fight her about it because I was younger and smaller and really just wanted to get out. As we're walking out, we notice one of those old candlesticks with a light bulb in it. And that was on the table lit up like somebody had turned a switch on. But there's no way this place has electricity. Immediately, we're all spooked and run out the door. As we're running away, we look back through the kitchen window again and all we see is what looked like a silhouette of a very frail old lady. She had visible frizzy hair, but it was so dark no features could be seen. My cousin still has the jewelry box to this day, and it still freaks me out. Scary Childhood Experience I'll just point out as well that one, we did not own a dog at the time, and two, I mentioned this to my mom not too long ago, and she said she remembers this night too, that I wasn't dreaming when I ran downstairs to her. I always thought that maybe I was making it up, but when she said she remembered it too, I kind of had to believe it then. Anyway, I can't remember how old I was, maybe three or four, especially because my little sister was still a newborn baby at the time. I used to hate going to bed at night. In fact, I hated nighttime in general. I would see things around the house in shadows, mostly. I think they were dogs or animals, at least, and I remember them growling at me if I came too close. I specifically remember one of them under the dining room table, and I ran to my mom screaming. The fear was so strong. One night I was in bed and laying on my left side. I remember this clearly as I opened my eyes and I could see the door in the distance. After a while of laying there, I felt what I can only describe as pawns begin to walk up to the side. It sounds impossible, which I completely agree with, but that's what I felt. And then something sit on my hip bone. I opened my eyes and directly in front of me was my dog. It looked like a long-haired spaniel type dog. And as gross as it sounds, I also remember that it opened its mouth and had vomit on its tongue. Ew. I remember feeling terrified as I turned away from that. Looked up at the thing sitting on my hip. It was a black dog with a thin body and sleek fur, like a greyhound's. And it had a pointed face and pointed ears that pointed upwards over its head. Its eyes stood out, but I can't remember any color. I quickly looked to my right and there was a Jack Russell Terrier type dog there and it started growling when I knew I could see it. I remember being frozen in fear as I looked up at the black dog and watched its head turn slowly, then suddenly snapped back to look at me. At that point, I somehow got out of bed and ran to the top of the stairs. Pretty sure there was a baby gate there at the time, so I have no idea how I got past it. But I do remember looking back into my room and seeing all three dogs turn to look at me before beginning to run toward me. I got down the stairs, burst into the living room where my parents and babysitter were. The dogs didn't follow as far as I knew, and I remember my mom asking me what I was doing. I was very clearly remembering, saying, I wanted to see my sister. No idea why I didn't tell them what just happened, but my mom didn't say anything else or make me go back to bed. She just let me lay on the sofa with her and hold the baby. I never had another experience like after that, but I was absolutely terrified of dogs from that day until I was 9 or 10. And like I said, my mom remembers me coming into the living room and saying, well, talking about the dream a while later, I've often spoken about it when the paranormal comes up, but never tried to look into it until recently. Can't find anything that really matches my experience, and I can't find any history in the house. Kind of a shame. But after we moved house, I never saw any shadow dogs again.
phone calls from beyond the grave. My family's always been somewhat sensitive to the paranormal. More than a few of us have had unexplained instances, but nothing like what kept happening a few years back. The year was 2000, and while the world survived Y2K, unfortunately my great-grandmother did not. A few months after her death, every few days we would receive phone calls from a, like a number caller ID, and it was saying 000 000 000 000. 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. Every time we picked up, it was a constant white noise like a TV channel that didn't come in right. The first few times, we simply assumed something was going on with the phone line and disregarded it. However, for whatever reason, we just always picked it up. Now, for those of you young ones on Reddit, the year 2000 was a different time. Cell phones were new and most people had landlines. The worst part was the fact that almost all the internet was dial-up meaning a simple phone call would interrupt the song you spent the past five hours downloading on LimeWire. So obviously these white noise calls became an annoyance very quickly. Finally, my mother called the phone company to see if they could see where it was coming from. Well, once the phone company investigated the number, they discovered the calls were coming from a payphone. But not just any payphone. This payphone happened to be located right outside the cemetery where we had a, well, had a few short months ago laid my granny to rest. Not only that, but the payphone was disconnected from a couple of years before and wasn't even capable of making calls. This settles it for my family. We decided it was my granny. So every time the calls came, we simply spoke to her the same way we always had and all was good. The calls continued for around two years at this point. I lived at the time in an area where tornadoes were rare, but when we had one, it tended to be incredibly damaging. One night, one came through the neighborhood causing a lot of damage. However, my home was thankfully spared. Not long after it passed, the phone rang. And this time, however, instead of white noise, my mother swears that she heard her ask if everyone's okay. Mom reassured her that we're all fine, everything's okay. And after that, the call stopped and hope she moved on to find her peace, knowing that we're okay. Ten years later, both my grandmother and grandfather have passed and have been buried alongside the rest of our family. My mom decided to move into her parents' home. At the time, I'm living with a boyfriend, and we decide to stop by the cemetery so I can introduce him to my beloved grandparents. Once I get back in the car, I check Facebook. My mother had only two minutes before posted a photo of a phone showing the same 000 number and saying after so many years, she's finally hearing from heaven again. I call her frantic because I'm literally staring at their graves at the very moment. She received the call while my ex and I were standing there. My only assumption to this day was my family really didn't like my boyfriend then and was willing to call beyond the grave to make that fact known. That was the last call we ever received, but not our last experience. To this day, however, we still have the same landline number just in case they ever need to talk to us again. My Paranormal Experiences in My Old House In the house I grew up in, we had a few paranormal encounters. Mostly mundane things like light switches being turned on, the occasional unexplainable footsteps. Most of the people in our house weren't believers in the paranormal phenomena. But my mom and I were. A few years before we moved out, there were a few weeks where the happenings became more frequent and more intense. The first happened to my mom when she was home alone doing laundry, just before I came home from school that day. By her account, while she was doing laundry, a hat that had been sitting on a laundry pile had fallen on the ground several feet away from the pile. 
that apparently moved with enough force to make a noise when it fell to the ground because it kind of startled her. She turned around. When she went to pick up the hat, a penny that had been sitting on the washer flung at the back of her head. She initially thought my brothers and I were playing a prank on her until she went upstairs and she saw me getting off the bus and no one else was in the house. When I got in the house, she looked terrified. She told me everything that happened. We went to the basement to investigate. It was a pretty comedic scene because she had a Bible and I had a cross made from wooden spoons. Sure enough, there was no one in the basement. I saw the hat on the floor and the penny as well as the change pile of the washer where the penny came from. We stayed down there only a couple of minutes when we heard something fall and we both ran upstairs. About a week later, my mom was doing laundry once again. She came rushing upstairs into my room and asked if I would heard anything, to which I said no. She asked me if I had been in my room while she was in the basement, and I said yes. She proceeded to tell me that she was about to walk up the stairs, and she heard an angry man's voice yell, Hey! into her ear. She dropped a laundry basket and ran upstairs to find me. After this happened, we decided to put a camera in the basement. We set up her, her Kindle tablet. <laughs> her Kindle tablet on a shelf with a stand so it couldn't fall. We turned off the lights and just left it overnight. It was an unfinished basement with no windows, so the only light was the one coming from the screen. What we saw the next day made me firmly believe what my mom had experienced, because at that point, they were just stories, and I hadn't really witnessed anything myself, or had anything happen to me. It seemed to just be her. We saw an orb of light manifest and slowly move across the top of the screen and then down. A few seconds after the orb moves off screen, the tablet gets picked up, and you can see the ceiling as if someone was holding it, and then it was just placed back down. I'll update this post if I can get the video from my mom. Another account from my brother, which we learned of a couple of years after we came moving up and discussing the events at a family get-together. My brothers, whose room was in the basement, had overheard the conversation and chimed in, saying, Yeah, there was definitely a ghost in that house. I saw the fucker. I got up to use the bathroom one night, and when I opened my door, there was a white mist in the threshold. I just closed the door and went back to sleep. I still don't believe them, though. I have this vague memory of a white figure I remember seeing when I was younger. So before I start talking about the memory, I should probably say that as of now I'm still kinda young, literally 15, but this took place like 10 or 11 years ago when I was like 4 or 5 years old, so I actually have the capability to talk about it now. Also. This would be the first time I actually talk about this experience to anyone online, or anyone in general. So to get started, I should probably state the obvious, and say that this could just be something that my kid mind thought up, and this could maybe not be real, but the experience felt too real to be fake, or made up in my mind at the time. The night it happened was a regular night for the most part and the only thing that was off was that my grandma was staying with us. But that only feels off now, because at the time she was staying with us all the time. She would sleep on one of the two couches that my family had. That night I ended up sleeping on the other couch, because I was probably too tired to go to my bed. Also, it could be that a four or five year old will literally sleep anywhere. So I fell asleep, maybe 11 p.m., 12 a.m., and at first it was a semi-normal besides literally falling asleep on my couch because usually at the time my parents would wake me up and put me in my bed if I fell asleep anywhere that's not my bed. But fast forward to about 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. I wake up out of nowhere, like literally nothing woke me up, and just woke up on my own. My grandma was asleep, the porch light was still on, 
But besides that light, it was pitch black. I was scared of the dark back then. And you're probably thinking, well, the Porsche light was on, so you don't have to be scared, right? No. It actually scared me more because it felt so unsettling to me back then. So the only logical thing to do when you're four or five years old and scared of the dark is to get into my parents' room to sleep with them. But I saw something, and I'd never forget it. I saw this white void or figure in the hallway to my parents' room, and I was way too scared to go next to it for obvious reasons. I think to wake up my grandma, but I just don't. I don't remember why I didn't wake her up. That one was on me. So I'm just standing there staring at the unidentified white thing in the hallway of my childhood home. But eventually I built up enough courage to just go up to it and just to fastly walk past it to my parents' room. I go to their room and I just fall asleep, not knowing what that white thing will be in my mind for the next ten years and many more. I wake up the next morning, I go out of my parents' room and it's gone. That figure that scared me previously that morning was just gone. Never told my parents, my grandma, and honestly, I don't think they'd believe me. I bet my grandma would understand, though, because she went through something like it herself in the past. We don't live in that house anymore. As of right now, we moved out over a year ago. My dad lives three and a half hours away from my mom. Lucky I spend the two weeks a month with both my parents. It's the present day, and I've yet to tell anyone about this experience until now. I don't know if I'm the only one who experienced it, especially as a kid. Six years ago, I had a premonition. To begin this story, I would like to preface it by saying that it's the most shameful moment of my entire life. I'll never not look at the person I was at this time with anything but disdain. But it was what it took to change who I am and who I am today. I hope that telling you that will lend my story credibility as it isn't something I would actually tell people if it wasn't for the fact it literally changed my life and my perception of reality. With that said, I can jump into how I had a premonition. Considering the story starts with the premonition, that's where I'll begin. I worked at a landscaping company. I had just moved out of my friend's parents' house. My friend was a heroin addict who had since passed away. I was quote-unquote raised by my father who kicked me out the day I turned 18. I was 24 years old. I started staying with a girl I'd started to see. It didn't work out, but I was living with her paying half the bills in her house at the time. One night before work, I had a dream that I was in the back passenger seat of my trailblazer, and I'm bleeding all cut up. I look out of the back passenger window. It's all shattered out, and I see a tree in my friend I had known since I was ten years old, who up until then I had seen only a handful of times in five years. So it was very odd to see him there. I asked him if, well, if I was dead. He looked at me with a look that pretty much said, you fucking bout to be. But he just said, no, you're just really messed up and an ambulance is on the way. My response was, fuck, I'm going to jail. And I wake up. I go to work and remember the exact house we were working at. We had done a few jobs there previously, I think that's why. I told my friend I worked with it. I'm like, huh? I worked it about my dream thought it was crazy, even told me I better start wearing my seatbelt because I never did. Fast forward roughly two weeks, my boss is congratulating us on how hard we've been working. Buys a crew a 12-pack of Bud Light on Friday. I think it was around the 4th of July and it was definitely summer. I drink two and take off, and at this point in my life, if I drank two beers, 
I'm going to go get a 12-pack and drink it till I pass out. I had no self-control. So I do that and buy a pack of 12 Bud Light Platinum on my way home. Unluckily, my friend who had now passed away that I was staying with called me. Told me him and a few of other friends were drinking at my buddy's and I should come by. So of course, that's what I did. Told my friend whose house it was that I wanted to sleep there because I had no intention of driving shit-faced. He said that's no problem. I end up hammered. I don't remember getting in my vehicle. All I remember is waking up seeing my friend I hadn't seen in five years and asking him if I was dead. It literally happened exactly how it happened in my dream. I was only conscious for a few seconds, my friend said, and I passed back out after, well, he said what he said. Next thing I remember is being woken up, getting my head stapled. My boyfriend sleep-talked for the first time. I will add that since the plot of the stories happened, nothing as strange has happened since. I, a 19-year-old female, have been with my boyfriend, 21 male, for over four years now. Throughout our relationship, he told me he keeps experiencing sleep paralysis and that it became more and more frequent. He had maybe one or two in the first three years, but last year they kept getting worse. We're both students, and for the past two years he's been living in a rented apartment with a good friend of his. Sometimes I'd spend the night there as well. One time in May, he told me he'd experienced sleep paralysis again, and that he was aware and awake but wasn't able to move or say anything, like his lips were glued together. He said he tried to scream my name, to wake me up so I could help him, but nothing ever came out of his mouth. He also mentioned that he kept seeing one of the corners of the room as a big black shadow that made him feel nauseous. He eventually got out of it and went back to bed. Next day... I was still there. He asked me to stay with him in case something happened again. Starting to get a bit scared, I guess. I tried to stay awake in case something happens, but I think I immediately fell asleep. So this is how I woke up in the middle of the night. I heard some sounds. I immediately opened my eyes. Here was my boyfriend, laying on the side with his back to me, resting his head on my hand saying some random shit in a language I've never, ever heard before. Looking at that exact same corner that he mentioned about when he had sleep paralysis. The weirdest thing is that it seemed like he was having an actual conversation. He would talk, and then would stop, like if somebody was answering. And then he would talk again, and so on. I was like, what the fuck is he doing? I called his name. He immediately stopped talking, and then the heaviest silence filled the room for what seemed like an eternity. Then, he started hysterically laughing for a few seconds, then passed out out of nowhere. I checked to see if he was okay, and he started snoring. At least, I knew he fell back to sleep. I wasn't able to sleep that night. I turned around and cried until I saw the light outside. Next day I told him about it, and he apologized for scaring me. I said that it wasn't his fault, but it was clear that he felt bad. We asked his friend if he heard anything, and he said no, which made me feel like maybe I was just dreaming. But then he added that he woke up as well that night, but wasn't able to move, felt like he couldn't breathe, and claiming that he saw the weirdest shadow in the corner of his room. The apartment is consecrated, but I always feel uneasy being there. Another thing I'll add, although I don't know if it's important or not, but my boyfriend's roommate has nightmares pretty often and would wake up screaming every time. I 
I think I experienced a paranormal activity on the 24th of December. Firstly, I recently finished my last semester of my grad school endeavor. So I've been enjoying much of my break by staying up ridiculously late, like up to 4 or 5 a.m. On the 24th, I decided to go to bed at approximately 4 a.m. A few minutes went by and I heard my door open, which I assumed was one of my parents, since they wake up at around that time to go to work. However, they usually check my room to see if we're, you know, okay. I supposed wrong. I didn't hear any footsteps, and all of a sudden I heard a tss, 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 as if someone was calling a dog to come over. Moreover, this was right beside me. I opened my eyes, and I was face to face in the opposite direction. My bed is in the corner, so whatever was making that sound was to my right, and my face was facing the wall, otherwise known as the left side. I have a small nightlight that shines light toward the wall I was facing, and I kid you not, I could see a female shadow with their hair floating. I couldn't turn my head because I was in a state of shock, nor as if I was in sleep paralysis. The noise ceased, and I let a few minutes go by to lessen the shock state I was in. Afterwards, I got up, turned on the light, went back to sleep. I woke up at around 11-ish and went to the kitchen, where I found my mom cooking the, well, cooking dinner. I told her what happened. She just kind of stared at me. She kept on cooking and said, Your father has repeatedly told me he can hear someone at night, and they make a noise as if they were calling out for a dog. It seems I have two crazy people in my home. We both looked at each other, and I let out a small laugh and joked about the topic and headed back to my room. Well, I thought that was where the abnormal activity ended, but it didn't. A few hours went by, and I came out of my room. It's right next to the living room, and I saw a type of mist or smoke in there. I assumed it was my mom's cooking. But that hypothesis went out the window and I felt a mist and a smoke cloud go into my mouth. I raised my voice and asked my mom if she was cooking tamales or burning chili. She said, no, I already finished cooking. I started rubbing my eyes because I could see this mist and smoke in the living room. My brother, who was in the living room, noticed my state of despair and asked me what was wrong with me. I responded, don't you all see this mist and smoke? But my mom and brother responded, No, what mist or smoke are you talking about? I went back to my room and locked myself in there until we had a, well, until we had dinner. I haven't experienced anything of late, but I do feel uneasy staying up, so I'm now taking melatonin to knock out earlier. I'm not a big ghost believer. But I like to entertain the idea because our world needs some excitement. <laughs> Thoughts? I think the spirit is attached to me. So I moved in with my girlfriend and her parents. She tells me a few months later about all the paranormal experiences that they've had, but they're light spirits, nothing dark and heavy. She lived there her whole life. It's not even an old scary house. It was probably built in the 90s, and it sits in a neighborhood in a busy area near a highway. She tells me it's all okay, and they tell it to leave them alone, and tells me all about the things that she's seen and her mom chimes in and her sister. Anyways, the first time I hear a sort of flicking and scratching under my pillow, followed by constantly messing with stuff around the room. These were the two main things, and it happened almost every night. I'm typically scared of these things. I feel it in my body and I freeze up no matter if I'm really scared or not. 
It's like instinct to me. My girlfriend is fine, barely ever gets scared, and if she does, I should be too. After a while, I felt it was messing with me, doing things under my pillow like the flicking shit and waking me up. My girlfriend has only heard scratching. When I told her about it, she just says, there's always something under the bed, so nonchalantly. I don't know, just something feels off. They've done rituals and sage burnings to send them off, quote-unquote, or to quote-unquote cleanse. The worst night was a week before we moved. I woke up to what I thought was a noise of someone's voice. I thought, oh well, whatever. Maybe it was in my dream. I would typically have lucid dreams. Then I sat awake for a few minutes and heard it again. It was a loud, woo, coming from someone under my bed. Shut up, dog. <laughs> it sounded like it was trying to say something, but didn't have enough energy to get it out. I felt it was my collecting energy, or it was perhaps collecting energy off my scaredness. And I'm not very connected to my energy as my girlfriend's family. I would consider them hippies in a way, but anyways. Girlfriend and I move an hour away. She thinks it feels clean, not heavy. I try to tell myself the same. There's just something about our room that makes me scared at night. Her room was nothing malevolent, but I feel my anxiety is heightened because of it. I'm scared of the dark for the first time in my life, and I hate being alone. I turn on every light, but last night I heard the scratching under my pillow. She never hears anything anymore, but the noises at the old house would start as soon as she went into her sleep cycle. If it was raking her longer than 20 minutes to fall asleep. Raking her? Anyway, I would notice the room felt light and calm. If she passes out, I would sense I wasn't the only one awake. Overall, I'm terrified. I'm lost. I don't know how to cope with this. I just want it gone. Weird experience I had a couple of days ago from a former skeptic. So a couple of days ago, some weird paranormal thing happened to me. I've been going like a whole week trying to debunk it, but I can't. A couple of days ago, I woke up at 5 a.m. to use the restroom. And things like kind of normal for me. Sometimes I like to wake up in the middle of the night to use it. I wasn't groggy or anything when I woke up. I splashed water in my face, too. I was awake, so when I went back to my room to lay down, I laid on my back first. I have a memory foam bed, so when you press down on it, it sinks in, but then goes back to normal pretty slowly, so it smooths and not in a forceful way. So I was on my back for long enough for my mattress to be back to normal again, like not having an indentation for me pushing down to get on it. And so then I couldn't sleep, so I turned to my right side, maybe like a minute past, and I felt the weight of a human hand push down on my bed push my mattress along with me. It was like as if someone was trying to wake you up. Pushed my mattress and moved me along with it. I wasn't asleep yet, but when that happened, got up so quick and freaked out. I didn't see any spirits, so we can rule out hallucination, sleep paralysis, or my mind playing tricks on me. What I felt was very real. I checked my mattress and it was moved, too. My box spring was showing. Something pushed my mattress, and it wasn't a delicate push. Like it felt like a human hand on my mattress pushed down and just pushed the whole thing. It was so random, too. Wish I was making this up. But I'm not, and it sounds so fake, but I feel so crazy. I told my parents and some friends. I have tried debunking it. 
I tried getting in my bed different ways and pushing down my bed with my elbow and turning to my side. Doing so many things to try to replicate it. Nothing. I can't replicate nor debunk it. It's been freaking me out for almost a week. I've tried talking to my smart friend who doesn't believe in the supernatural. And he told me to see if any of my bed was uneven or other things. And I tried it. And he even is stumped. It physically moved when I felt it pressed down on my mattress. The only other thing other than a spirit I could think of is like... Well, it wouldn't make sense because it happened as soon as it turned around, but, well, I was fully awake, I wasn't asleep, I didn't have a spasm or anything. I was on my right side, and when it pushed my mattress, I felt like my left shoulder get pushed along with the force. I know some people won't believe me, but I have no way of explaining it. I've tried getting in my bed, like, forcefully to replicate what I felt, and I've, well... I've tried pushing down first, then getting on my bed. I've tried elbowing my bed to push it down as far as I could, turn onto my side to see if I could make it happen among other things, but nothing at all has replicated that. Door unlocked and opened twice. Two different doors. All right, so something seriously weird happened just a little while ago that really creeped me out. I'm not usually one to see any paranormal stuff like my mom or my sister. So for me to say that, I think it was a ghost is super out of the ordinary. So I let my cat into my porch. I closed the door and I locked it. I then proceeded to eat my lunch while my mom was vacuuming the bathroom floor. Once I was done, I double-checked that the door was closed and went on my way to play some games in my room. About ten minutes pass, my mom enters my room and starts interrogating me about if I had just come from opening the back door. To this, I replied, no. I was on my bed the whole time, and I know I locked and closed that door. She then asked my older sister, who replied that she was in her room doing assignments for college. She was doing this the whole time, apparently, and that it definitely wasn't her. Creeped out, obviously, my mom explains that when she finished vacuuming, she heard the door alarm chirp signaling somebody open the door. And when she went to see when one of us, or which one of us, rather, went outside, it was like a good six inches apart open, and my dog had bolted all the way to my parents' room away from the living room and hid under the bed. When we checked, we checked all the back porch cameras. They didn't activate to any movement. It definitely would have if I opened the door or somebody was on the porch. We checked all the rooms in the house. Nothing. My sister then commented that the door to the garage had opened earlier in the day in the same fashion, and that two of the cabinets were wide open. But she didn't think much of it. Needless to say, I'm kind of creeped out, and I... Well... I know it wasn't my mom because she's very neurotic about locking doors and closing them. So much so sometimes that we get locked out by her. T-L semicolon D-R Somebody tell me what that means. I have no idea. T-L semicolon D-R locked doors opened like six inches by themselves two different times. Two cabinet doors opened completely open. Mm -hmm. Dog got scared, ran away to hide under the bed. No intruders in house. Everybody was in their own rooms. No explanation and camera didn't detect any movement. Sometimes the bedroom doors open a little bit, but that's just because of the drafts. And that said back door is metal, and it was more than just a crack. I mean, it was quite a bit open, and I know I locked it. I don't know, I'm feeling creeped out. I didn't really believe my family when they said they felt weird things or saw things in the house. 
since I'm a bit of a skeptic, but even this I can't explain. I wish my dog was afraid of something. My dog is crazy. Ask Reddit. When I was 14, I got home from school. I was in my room playing Sims. My room was right off the kitchen and dining area where we also had our sliding door that leads to our deck, which led to a backyard but had a gate on it. I did this for maybe an hour. My brother wasn't home due to about five, and my dad about seven. So I was just playing my game when I heard what sounded like someone or something on top deck. So I kind of froze. I started to listen in case there was something going on. Then some ringtone went off that I didn't recognize. It was clearly a phone's ringtone going off, and then my two dogs started barking right after. So me having more balls than I thought ran straight into the dining room area and the ringtone had stopped, but my dogs were persistently barking at the backsliding door, let them out to have a look at whatever it was. I waited and looked around inside a phone or something that could have caused the ringtone. Nothing. I followed my dogs to the deck, looked all around outside for someone to be hiding. Nothing. Our gate wasn't open either. I was freaked out, so I went by my friend's house who lived nearby waited for my dad to be home when I told him he just brushed it off to me being paranoid. Second, this is the second instance in this house, and it was when we were moving out. Now, we had lived in this house for about ten years, and it was a nice neighborhood, keep in mind. Well, my dad had met the one, and we were going to move in together in a new home. I was about eighteen at this point and had a boyfriend, and we wanted to spend the night together but neither one of our parents would have approved. Then I got the great idea that our house hadn't sold yet, and I still had our garage door opener to get in. So we wound up lying and said that we were spending the night at a friend's house and got some blankets on my laptop for what we thought would be a romantic night. We get there, set up my old room, and we're just getting ready to watch a movie on my laptop. Then we hear a loud-ass bang now, the house was empty, and no one had had access to it by my knowledge. Plus, it was about 11 p.m. We both just kind of stared at each other with a look of, what the fuck was that? Then another loud bang. Okay, at this point, I'm like, the only reasonable noise I could chalk it up to is our basement doors that led to either side of the basement. Well, that means someone's here in the house. Or it's a paranormal thing, and either way... Nope, 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 nope. Not trying to die tonight. My boyfriend gets up and says, get behind me. He just kind of stands in the doorway. I wait a second, then say, let's go. We grabbed our stuff as quick as possible and ran out to our car and made sure the garage was closed. We sat and waited to see if anybody would pop around the house, but nothing. That was the scariest thing to me because I've slammed those basement doors before, so I know it had to be that and there's no explanation besides someone being in the basement, doing who knows what, or a ghost. I've had many paranormal experiences throughout my life. These are just a few of them. In my childhood home, I remember having an imaginary friend. Stuff would move in the house, childlike footsteps that we would hear, and only stopped after we moved. I also apparently stopped talking about my imaginary friend as well. I don't remember much about the time. It was more of the experiences that took place after. In high school, I was in a bad car accident. I went down a ditch going too fast and hit multiple trees on the way down. The car was totaled. It was crushed and everywhere. Ex except where I was sitting, though. I distinctly remember feeling like someone wrapped themselves around me. 
and hearing my grandmother's voice telling me that it was going to be okay. She had died a few months earlier. My dad picked me up as I wasn't too far from home. We were calling our insurance and got a tow truck. When we got back to the scene, police were searching around the car. They had assumed I'd been thrown from it, and that there was no way I could have survived based on the state of the car. In college, I was staying with my aunt. I woke up to the sound of giggling. A small child was standing next to my bed, staring at me. I can still picture him clearly. That one scared me and had my heart pumping for a while. Also in college, I felt someone breathing on me in my dorm. I didn't have a fan at the time, and there was no air conditioning. Myself and others in the dorm all had experiences, but nothing ever felt threatening. I've dreamt of my uncle a few times. The first was the most significant. He had a message for my mom. When I shared said message with her, it was a private message, apologies for not sharing here, she started bawling, as if she had been praying and talking to him the night before and I had answered the questions that she asked him. Till now, I live in a home that's over a century old. We've had many occurrences. Woken up to a woman's blood-curdling scream. Pots and pans left on the stove found on the floor of the other side of the island in the middle of the kitchen. Footsteps. The kids mentioned seeing a monster in their closets though I haven't heard that one in a while. And more recently, lights flickering. Daughter's toys started to sing randomly after she'd put to bed. And one night, I slept on the couch due to illness, and I heard someone telling the dogs to settle down. That's what we normally tell them to do. I assumed it was my partner, and the kitchen light, which is automatic, turned on as though someone had walked in. There was no one there kept turning on and off throughout the night and the dogs wouldn't look away from the kitchen and would growl randomly with their haunches up. Things have settled down again. They amp up, then they settle down, etc. So I'm enjoying the reprieve. Encounter number two. My second encounter with the boy Danny happened in a dream. A dream that felt all too real. In this dream, I was driving down a highway in an expressway. I was driving a nice white car. The interior was beige. As I was driving, I happened to look over at a passenger. And there he was. Danny was in the passenger seat. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. And in this dream, when I looked at him, and he looked at me, I straight out in a shocked tone of voice asked him, Danny, what the fuck are you doing here? You're supposed to be dead. I shit you not. He looked at me with a happy-ass smile on his face, and just chilling there, enjoying the ride, and said, I am, but that doesn't mean I still ain't here with you. All I did was nod at him and said, fuck it. I reached for the volume to turn the music up. I remember feeling the bass from the subs in the trunk and I woke up. I just laid there in bed trying to grasp and understand what I just dreamt. For one, I didn't have a white car. I was driving this old rusted up four-door Honda Civic. Straight up piece of shit. But the sucker ran great and it was good on gas. Two, where was I driving? It seemed real as fuck. Fast forward a couple of months later, and I bought a 2002 Buick Century. First thing I did was slap a sound system in it. New radio, 12-inch kicker subs, 1,200-watt kicker amp. Car was nice. I lived in Palatine, Illinois at the time, right off Rand Road. This information is for readers to Google map stuff. I worked right off at the 290 in Higgins Road. I would jump on Route 53, it's like a highway and expressway to get to work. I straight shot short drive, really. 
One day I'm stuck in traffic on my way to work. While in traffic, I'd looked over at my passenger window and noticed a park. It's a park with a lake where you can kind of take a two-seater pedal boat out on a nice date kind of a thing. I'd been there once before, but I never paid attention to it, at least on my normal drives. This time I looked at it and I had deja vu like a motherfucker. The whole scene was deja vu. That's when it hit me. This is where it happened in my dream. My century was white with beige interior, and I had the subs banging, chilling in traffic. I was shocked at first, and in real life at this exact moment I said it again. Did it without really even thinking. I said, fuck it. Reached the volume and turned the music up. Still can't get his smile out of my head like he knew eventually I'd figured out. Yeah, it was a dream, but it was too real. My boy, my homie, my boyfriend's still with me. It's currently 6.23 a.m. Yesterday was my 40th birthday. I'm going to have a beer right now. Trying to figure out what's in my house. So I've lived in the same house for the better part of 25 years now. When I first noticed it, it just seemed that every now and then a shadow would be slightly out of place, based on natural lighting. Think elongated or bulged from what the shadow would be. You'd walk in and see a shadow, just a hair out of the ordinary. Could be night, could be the middle of the day. Leave the room and return a few minutes later, and the shadow would have recessed back to where it should be based on the lighting. About seven years ago, I saw a pair of solid black legs standing clear off the wall, walked past my bedroom door. I was so convinced that somebody had to be in the house, I grabbed my pistol, woke everyone up, checked every inch of the house from top to bottom. Absolutely nothing was out of place. I restate, slept in the same room for the better part of 20 years total. I am well aware of what shadows cast from outside look like. Following this, however, things calmed down for a few years. Now whatever it is has actively tried to not draw attention to itself. I don't have any feelings, maybe dread malice, nah. Unless I'm sure it's one of the area that I intentionally corner whatever it may be into that area. Recently, it's taken to moving around at near floor level, and about the size of a new cat. Likely once again attempting to go unnoticed, but it's gotten considerably bolder with its movements. Several times making me juke and turn on a light because I thought I nearly stepped on my cat, only for the cat to still be asleep on the other side of the house. Now the random moving shadow isn't dull. Not only myself, but everyone in the house regularly thinks that we hear the other call out our name, or that one of us has music, never distinguishable but audible enough to hear, coming from somewhere in the house. At one point I distinctly heard an unknown woman's voice say, I'm right here. I had to go outside and see if somebody was talking loudly in the neighborhood. Big surprise. Nobody was outside, and no extra cars were around. It reached a point where I went to both an optometrist and a psychologist to make sure my vision was solid, and that I wasn't losing my mind to stress or something. Completely clear on both fronts. I've made attempts to photograph or capture on video any proof, but as I said, for whatever reason it absolutely does not want to be noticed by anyone. I don't have any intention of trying to press it to do anything, nor am I concerned about its presence in the house. I'm just curious as to what it could be. And I'm curious if you had a good time listening. See ya.
The property I live on is haunted. I've lived on this property since I was two years old. When I was little, I thought it was normal to play with people who weren't really there. I guess I chalked it up to being what imaginary friend meant. As I got older, I stopped playing so much. I got tired and was typical moody teen. But when I never mentally stopped thinking of the people I played with as spirits and ghosts, I never told anyone about this. Here's where things get weirder. I'm mentally ill, and I experience hallucinations. I also have a form of dissociative identity disorder. At the time, I was the only personality, and I had just started recovering memory of being a system. Trauma reasons. So when I started hallucinating figures and feeling people in my head, I thought it was just the system reforming. Hmm. Around the same time, my older brother's life partner came to visit. She sees an FBI psychic fairly often, apparently. And for years, the psychic has been asking if she knew of a specific property. You may see where this is going. I do not. Sure enough, the property they had been talking about for years is the same one I grew up on and live on still. A fun fact about the area we live, we're only a few miles away from the old asylum. It's appropriately spooky feeling, even if it looks normal. So, the FBI psychic and my sister-in-law ask to do a cleansing on the property. So the whole family ends up working out where the corners of the property are and bringing containers of salt there. Sister-in-law warns us that we might feel weird that night especially as they do the cleansing. That night, I get really, really sick. I sleep badly. I have hot flashes and nightmares. When I wake up in the morning, I feel lighter and emptier than I've ever felt before. I no longer felt or hallucinated figures. I spent the entire morning trying to wrap my head around the idea that my brain was haunted. We later heard from the psychic and my sister-in-law that our property became a place of solace for spirits from the asylum. They helped the spirits move on to heal. Later, my sister-in-law came and found me. She told me that the spirits I played with as a kid wanted me to know that they'd come back one day to say goodbye properly. She also told me that my biological maternal grandma was watching over me. But she also tried to kidnap me when she was alive, so I mostly ignored that part. It was really nice to know that people I played with were real, that they came here to feel safe, that they cared about me as much as I adored them as a kid. Also, I now have the best wild story to tell at parties. No one can beat. Yeah, my brain was haunted for a bit. My dad grew up in an old hospital. My dad grew up in a small town in Vermont. His childhood home was an old hospital that had been renovated into a house. He's told me quite a few stories of unexplainable things that happened there. This one, however, is probably the most bone-chilling thing that has ever happened there. My dad's sisters would sometimes hold seances with their friends from school. And one time in particular, they decided to skip school and do one of the, you know, I guess do one in the closet upstairs while everybody else was gone. Two of his sisters and a girl from school piled into the closet and shut the door. During the seance, my aunt Anne asked, Is there anybody here? Please make yourself known. Immediately, my other aunt felt a hand on her back. She jumped to the side a little bit and Anne saw the hand coming out of a box on the floor. She said it looked dead gray and rotting. The girls freaked out and ran out of the closet. Doors and cabinets were slamming in the house, and they were so scared that they just ran out of the house and left it empty for hours. My dad came home from school, saw the front door open, 
so he figured somebody was home, was calling for Anne and her to just ask him why they left the door wide open. With no answers, he thought maybe they were messing with him. He was the youngest, and often his sisters would pick on him. He walked around the house yelling for them, saying it's not funny, and he didn't want to play along with their stupid games. When he got upstairs, he heard a bedroom door slam. He went to the door, tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. He banged on the door. Hey, this isn't funny. Come on, just open the door. No answer. He tried to turn the knob and pull as hard as he could, but it still wouldn't budge. He put his leg on the wall as leverage and pulled back and finally got the door open just a crack. He peeked through the crack and saw nothing. There was nothing there. Nobody holding the door, nobody messing with him. Then the door was ripped away from him, shutting itself again, and he fell onto the ground. He was shocked. He got up and tried to open the door once again, but it opened with no resistance this time. He inspected the room and no one was there. Super creeped out, he went downstairs and found his sisters coming back home. He asked them what kind of game they were playing. They looked scared. They told him that they haven't been home for hours because of what they had seen that morning, and they were not messing with him. The house actually mysteriously burned down years after this, and they were all adults. And I'm pretty sure that they also had a small graveyard close by where the old hospital used to bury bodies. His mom, who's passed away now, two of his sisters and he had all many experiences in that house. However, most of them were not as aggressive as this one. I think that the seance really woke something up that day. Lady in Red. Kind of. I've done my fair research since I've been an adult, and I've never forgotten this chain of experiences. I moved in with my father when I had turned nine. He was a single dad and worked long hours, and it was just him and myself living in a four-bedroom house in East Los Angeles. I was pretty grown up for being so young, walked myself to and from school, did my own laundry, could even make myself basic meals and stuff, so it was completely normal for me to get home from school, make a snack, and get cozied up with my PlayStation and play something for a bit before my dad came home from work. Skip forward to living there for about two months. I started feeling weird, like I wasn't alone in the house. I kept telling my dad how I felt. He tried something, tried saying that it was normal. It was a big move for someone my age, and I was just starting a new school. So I just started waking up and having panic attacks about dying. I seriously was having an existential crisis at nine years old. One day playing some PS1, probably drinking some Tang, I saw this shadow walk down the hallway. I knew I was home alone. I got so fucking scared. I told my dad and he brushed it off. Same thing happened a few days after that, except I was now positioning myself so that I was fully facing the door while being in my room. Nothing was going to get past me. It happened pretty fast, but I knew for sure that it was a woman. She had long black hair and was wearing like a weird older silk red dress. I asked to go to my dad's friend's house after school the very next day and continued. I made sure I was never home alone. This whole time my anxiety about dying kind of turned into an obsession. I started to not be able to sleep. I was scared to take showers with the door closed. I started sleeping with the lights on, and I never needed a nightlight before. This is where it starts to get even creepier. A few months go by, my anxiety starts to go away a little bit. I'm now down to just a nightlight on in the corner hallway light can still be turned off. She started appearing again, but she was going into my room. I would feel a slight 
pressure like someone sitting on the end of my bed, and then it would feel like someone was gently running their fingers through my hair. The first few times I remember being paralyzed. I know it wasn't sleep paralysis because I was positive I'd never fallen asleep. But when I would feel the pressure after that, I would curl into a ball under my blankets until I felt the presence to be gone. Never seen her again, but I swear, I never feel alone. And it's been 20 years. Has anyone spoken with a ghost? Unwittingly, I did on Sunday. I live in Baltimore, Maryland, and my parents still live in the townhouse that we moved into in 85. Growing up, other farm members would have minor experiences that could be written off. Now I'm 44 and still visit daily. My sister has three kids that stay with them in that home, two of which were younger than five years old. I'm completely convinced now that there's this little boy ghost that's living there as well. Sunday afternoon, I was at my father's and I needed to swipe some TP for my apartment. You dig? So I went up to grab some toilet paper out of the bathroom on the second floor. All the bedroom doors were closed. My mom was out to church, so it was dark and quiet. I knocked to see if anybody was in the bathroom and I heard, Hello? I said, Oh, sorry, buddy. You using the bathroom? And he replied, Nope. So I opened the door, and the freaking bathroom was empty. I shouted to Monk, my sister's nickname, who was in a room and the doors closed. I asked her about where my nephew Kai was. He was in a room with the door closed. They were in there watching TV. She didn't even know I was upstairs until I knocked and shouted through her door. I swore Kai was in the bathroom and didn't even realize what happened until it was over. Thinking about it further, I realize now that the voice didn't sound like it was in the bathroom, but maybe closer. It was faint but distinct. That's why I asked if my nephew was in there using it. The thing that gets me is it happened in real time. I spoke and it freaking spoke back. You dig? A bit of background on this child ghost, if that's what it is. My older nephew had an imaginary friend that he proved to me was real. One day when he was young, about the same age as my nephew Kai is now. But that's another story if you want to hear it. The short of it, he described him to me as a little boy with black and white striped shirt. He also said, he looks just like me. Kind of creeped me out. My father was born with a veil over his face. He served in the Navy. A serious man. He's seen things, doesn't talk too much about them, but he has told me about things he sees in between sleep and waking up. Calls it twilight. One day he said he thought he saw my nephew was playing on his bed while he slept. He woke up and saw a little boy sitting at the end of the bed. He smiled, hopped off the bed, and left the room. My father shrugged it off, but when I asked him how he looked, he said, told me the little boy had a black and white striped shirt on. That's all he really remembered. This was years ago. My younger nephew still has an imaginary friend, but not sure he's so innocent anymore. After five years, I need an explanation. There's this small forest close to my friend's house where we always used to went to walk his dog. We found out a kid has died there years before. We always had a sensation of another presence being there when we would be there after sunset. So one day we decided to invite a second friend who had quite some experience himself to come along. So after sunset, the three of us and the dog went to the forest to see if we could get contact with the entity. Stupid, I know. The second friend spoke some Latin and words at the edge of the forest. He said that this would help us. 
The moment we stepped into the forest, I saw a white entity in a tree a couple of meters, less than 20 away from us. It gave off a lot of negative energy, so I told my friends about it. They said that they felt it too, and this wasn't the entity that we wanted to contact. The second friend said that this one felt very dangerous. The dog was also nervous and scared at the moment and wanted to run. So we keep on walking away from the presence, and I think we pissed it off. I don't know why, but it did feel that way. After about five minutes, I felt another presence. This one felt friendly. We would hear crunching leaves behind us, but always just out of sight. And when we would stop to look, it would stop as well. One of my friends said that he knows this is one that we wanted to try to contact with, but that the entity wanted to play a little game. So for the whole walk, we would hear running and crunching leaves beside us, never seeing a thing. And the dog never got nervous or scared, so we trusted it. When we would get close to the end of the forest, the running and crunching leaves stopped, and the presence vanished. But when we were about to walk out of the forest, all of us froze. It actually felt like time stood still, or even like we were in another realm. It was very weird. We felt a presence again, a very heavy one. I can remember I couldn't move from the neck down, but when I looked at the exit, there was this tree in the middle of the path. The trunk was split in two about 50 centimeters off the ground, so you could see right between the two arms. Through the split, I could see a very clear silhouette of a young girl behind the tree. I could see the face, but it was facing us. At that moment, the dog started to bark. I remember the second friend said something in Latin again, and everything went back to normal. We could move again, and the entity was gone. All of us were freaking out and didn't understand what happened. So we immediately went to my friend's house after still don't know what we encountered that day, and neither do the others. Be careful for what you wish for when at the cemetery. So back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. Not really suicidal, but let's just say I stopped wearing a seatbelt, smoked two times the amount of cigarettes I normally would have, didn't care much about my well-being for the most part. Due to this depression and things getting worse mentally, I did a lot of dumb things, supernatural-wise. I've always known to not speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can kind of hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious and believe in the paranormal or supernatural 100,000%. Anyways, I live next to a huge cemetery and drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things to us humans, especially things that we're not capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery begging for one of the spears to get me into a car accident. This habit started November 2nd, I believe, so I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, November 6th, I was driving to work at about 4.30 a.m. I go the same way every day. I was coming up to a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was literally out of fucking nowhere, I heard a loud honk from behind me was rear-ended by one of those big white rg &E trucks that fix telephone poles and stuff. Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again, out of nowhere, I was T-boned by some random-ass old man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, completely wrecked. Literally demolished, and I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised, I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. 
This also happened literally on the main road coming out from my neighborhood about a mile down from that cemetery. There are never any cars this early in the morning. Maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. Also, while I was talking to the old man, they lived in a town literally 40 fucking minutes away and were driving to the park. The whole story is so weird, and it honestly kind of creeps me out. But yeah, I was in an extremely bad financial situation also, and was stuck without a car for quite a bit. When I was driving by the cemetery, begging to be in an accident, I meant that I wanted it to be fatal. So I think whichever spirit heard me or whatever wanted to mess with me or something. I don't know. Take it as you will. Maybe this was an extremely weird coincidence, but if not, always remember to be careful what you wish for when speaking to the dead. Haunted Rifle So my brother used to own this old rifle. It was a Masa Nagant, made in 1936. It was used by Russian military in World War II. Now, it didn't take long for odd things to start happening. I mean, like, day one, night one. Now he gets this rifle home, and we're both nerds about history. So we're examining the rifle, looking at markings, etc., Later that night, I was trying to fall asleep. I had my door open to my room when suddenly I watched a black shadow walk past my door. And it appeared to be in wall. Now, I'm a very logical person, even then. So I thought it was my brother going to the bathroom next door. But I never saw the light go on or heard the fan. Because he hits both. So I waited a bit. Got up, looked in the bathroom. No one was there and went to my brother's room, and he's gaming away with his headset on. Claims to have never even gotten up. Now this was the start of it. As the summer kicked on and school was out, a whole mess of stuff started happening. And I swear, in the middle of the night, it would sound like somebody in boots was marching in the kitchen. We would find cabinets being left open, even watched as if, well... I swear it was happening, especially on a few occasions, sometimes even hearing them being slammed shut. If you were watching TV late at night, it would feel like someone was right on top of you, like such a heavy presence on you. I even had things thrown off my desk. I had this one toy tank that sat on my desk, and I'd always find it across my room against the wall along my bed being messed up. Now, most of this happened at night, or when no one was home. But we all had encounters with the shadow, the marching, the cabinets, but I'm only one with the trashed room, per se. Now one last thing is my sister, who's 12, seems to be quite aware of spirits being present, like we'd go somewhere that was haunted first. I could tell you who was there, how they died, type of deal, before the guide would even tell you. She refused to touch the rifle, told us to go and just get rid of it. Day one, there were three attached to it. One was a shadow, which seems so obvious now. One was a female soldier who doesn't know she's dead, and a small kid who didn't really seem like a kid. Now, some of this part is a blur, but according to her, she would hear the boy in my room running around jumping on my bed would apparently do this when I left because he was happy I left the house, I guess. According to her, he talked to her once, said that I reminded him of a soldier in his village, and I was a bad man. Fighting with a ghost with a rake. The incident that scared me the most took place when I was about 14. For some background, I live in a three-story Victorian house. The incident occurred when a friend, and I'm going to call her Sarah, we went home alone, getting ready to go meet each other, and our friend of course. 
It was after school, so I had to change out of my uniform. I left Sarah, drinking a can of Dr. Pepper in the kitchen, on the ground floor, while I went to change into my bedroom on the second floor. I had nearly finished when I heard this almighty crash from the kitchen. So I ran downstairs to find Dr. Pepper, <laughs> Dr. Pepper all over the floor and the wall. I asked Sarah what happened, and she insisted that something had knocked it out of her hand, although I didn't really believe her at first. I helped her clean it up, and she gathered all the sodden paper towels up. But walking to the side of the room where the kitchen bin was, just as she raised the Dr. Pepper can back to her lips, get the last dregs out, the can flew out of her hand with such force it hit the wall to her right. I know it could be said that she threw it, but I saw the whole thing, and the way her hand snapped back. There's no way that she could have gotten such power from a flick of the wrist like that. It genuinely looked like someone had walked right up to her and smacked it out of her hand as hard as they could. It even cut her lip, and at that point we were both utterly terrified which only worsened when we heard heavy footsteps moving above us from the top floor. We ran as fast as we could for the front door, not stopping until we reached the relatively safe garden. Unfortunately, we then realized that we couldn't even leave if we wanted to. I'd left my keys inside, and Sarah had left her purse. We decided we absolutely had to go back in, but not without protection. S grabbed the garden rake, holding it across her body while I stayed close to her back. We grabbed our things, straining to hear more movement, and finally we heard it again. Just as we were leaving for the second time, sounded a lot closer now and faster, like they were moving toward us. We ran for the door, and this time with my firmly locking it behind us, hoping to keep whatever it was trapped inside, of course. After that, we refused to return to the house that evening until my dad came home. Still freaks me out to this day. I've had loads of other experiences, like touches and more footsteps and sounds of heavy doors slamming, glasses inexplicably breaking, even sightings of apparitions, which I'll share at a later date if you guys want. I'm also planning to do research into the history of the house, so hopefully I can find a possible explanation for this haunting. My stepdad is haunted. I, an 18-year-old male, who stayed up at late at night, lives with my parents. Mom, stepdad. I call dad. Well, he'll be referred to as dad from now on. He goes downstairs late at night to eat food. He has problems sleeping and deals with insomnia. So he gets hungry at night. But the thing is, he always goes down at 1.34 a.m., always on the dot. As soon as it hits 1.34, the door opens and he walks down without fail. He always stays downstairs for, well, what could be hours at a time. The latest he's ever stayed down was for four hours. I was downstairs in the bathroom, and when I walked out, his eyes were shut. It wasn't sleepwalking because you could interact with him, talk to him like normal. But when I walked back into the bathroom and peeped around the corner and saw him, he looked like a robot moving around and doing things so robotically. I walked out and tried saying goodnight by him, but when I received no response, I turned around and he was facing me and just standing there like a board, mouth open, like he was trying to say something. Oh, well, it was wide open, though. I was obviously creeped out and just thought it was a joke he was pulling. I just walked back while still facing him, turned the corner and heard shuffling, like he was rushing something. When I got back to my room and for clearance, I sleep on my bed the opposite way my bed's facing and on my stomach. So I'm laying at the foot of my bed, staring out my doors across the room so I'm facing it. Normally, the lights in the hallway are off, 
but I heard the light switch turn on. I looked out by my door and saw feet by the bottom of them, the shadow under the door invading my room. It was there for ten minutes. My eyes started watering for how long they were open because I didn't want to close them by all cost. When it leaves, I could not for the life of me fall asleep. Not because I was terrified, but I physically couldn't. In the morning when my mom's alarm went off at six, I jumped out of bed as my mom left her room and hugged her. I saw my dad laying on his bed, but he was looking at me with the same face he had when I saw him in the kitchen that night. Every night it still happens. I never left my room during that period of time, and I'm terrified if someone does. I never have seen anything around the house ghost-related, but my parents and sister have, and they all heavily believe in ghosts. I never talk to them about this because I'm terrified to even think about it. Simon Says Go Home When I was about 12, my younger sister and I were friends with another family in the neighborhood, the Andersons. They had three kids. Erica was my age, Simon was their 10-year-old son, and Katie was their 7-year-old daughter. We lived in a lake community and spent most of our summers at the beach with our neighbors. It was nice. Our parents were also friendly with the Andersons, and we would have barbecued together at the time. One day, my dad swung by the Andersons' house to pick up the three kids. That way, we could go to the beach with me and my sister, or my sister and I, whatever works. Their mother, Cindy, was home by herself while her husband was at work. We were only at the beach for about 45 minutes when all of a sudden, Simon turns white as a sheet and grabs his stomach. He says to us, something isn't right. Then looks at his sister Erica and says, we need to go home right now. We thought he meant he was feeling sick and might throw up, so we tried to convince him to go to the beach house bathroom, because of course we wanted to stay at the lake. He adamantly refused, saying he wasn't going to be sick. He just felt something was really wrong. He was clutching at his chest and abdomen and breathing super very fast. We finally went over to my dad and asked if we could drive us back to the Andersons' house because Simon wasn't feeling well. We all piled back into the car, sad to be leaving, but also worried about Simon. As we drove back to the house, Simon was growing more agitated in the car, begging my dad to please hurry because he needed to get home. The beach was only a few minutes away, so we arrived at the house quickly. Simon ran up ahead of us inside and made a beeline for the bathroom. We thought he was hurrying because he had to throw up, but it turns out something much worse was happening in that house. We followed him inside. When Simon pushed open the door to the bathroom, his mother Cindy was leaning over the sink. Empty pill bottles were strewn around her on the counter. She was hysterically crying. Apparently, she had planned to kill herself while we were at the beach. She wrote a note and taped it to the bathroom door, basically telling her kids not to come inside the bathroom and to call their father. From what I recall, she had emptied and downed two to three bottles of heavy-duty prescriptions. We called 911 and the ambulance rushed her to the hospital, where they had to pump her stomach and monitor her carefully. She survived thanks to her son's gut feeling. He'd never had the sensation before, to my knowledge, and I have no clue how he or what was going on at his house. All I know is that his persistence and intuition saved his mom's life. That's awesome. I think my house is haunted. So a few years back I was doing online school, so I was home alone for most of the day. And this day I was finished with my schoolwork, 
So I was just laying on my bed on my phone. And keep in mind, I was home alone. My dad and stepmom were at work and my stepbrother was at school. And suddenly I started hearing these loud, heavy footsteps coming from the hallway. Also, my room's on the second floor. And it sounded like someone with heavy snow boots was slowly walking back and forth from my room to my dad's room, which was left from mine on the same side. I just completely froze and paused the video. And I just kept walking back and forth and back and forth for, I guess, two minutes. But at the time, it felt like forever. Eventually, it stopped, but I didn't move as I was in shock at what I just heard. My initial thought was someone was in the house, but I never heard anybody walking up the stairs. And by the way, the stairs and the upstairs is covered in wood. But after a minute of me listening to see if I would hear anything, I got up to see what it was. So I opened my door, checked around the corner, no one was there. I went to the bathroom window, which looks out over the front yard and driveway, to see if I could see any cars, but there were none. So I just went back to my room and locked the door. Around the same time that happened, I don't remember if it was before or after that incident happened, but... One time, also home alone, I was laying on my bed on the side, and I heard a voice in my right ear. Now, you could say that it was my brain just being loud, and I would agree with you. But I can't explain the hot breath I felt on my ear when it talked. And it was so close to my ear, it sounded like it was yelling. But I know it was whispering. I can't remember what it said, but I know it was just one word. And that was the only time that ever happened. Fast forward a few months. Nothing strange like that happened for a while. So I mainly forgot about it. And one night I was going to go downstairs to get some water. And for some reason I always peek around the corner to see in the living room. Just to see if anyone is there. I get quite paranoid at night. So I walked down the stairs and started to peek into the dark living room expecting nothing when I saw this shadow figure sitting on the couch. The only thing I could make out was the head shape and its shoulders, but past that it was just a dark mass. I froze and just stared at it. It didn't even move, just sat there in the dark. After a minute of staring at it, I audibly said, Nope, and went back upstairs and locked my door. I still peek around the corner at night waiting for it to be back, but it never is. Ghost pulled off my Duna. I used to live in a haunted house where many unexplained things would happen. I would sleep on the couch in the lounge room because my bedroom was abnormally icy cold, and I worked out later why it was always colder than any other part of the house. It was because it was a room that a young man had died in. One night, I was up late and he had just turned off the TV. I'd just been trying to fall asleep for about an hour. The house is riddled with termites and rotten floorboards caused by both termites and mold, and the house was very old and would creak eerily at all hours. This one night the creaking was unusual and sounded just like slow footsteps slowly making its way into the kitchen next door and moving toward the lounge sounded too familiar and exactly like I had described. The kitchen door just slowly creaked open, and then more creepy slow footsteps proceeded. My heart began racing, and the hair all over my body began to stand up. Then I heard the footsteps outside the lounge room door, which was next door to the dining room adjacent to the kitchen from where the kitchen slowly would open, making slow creaking noises. The lounge room doors are made of glass, and the footsteps stopped outside them. Then I heard the slow, squeaky sound of the lounge room door handle being ever so slowly pushed down, and it was then that I was thinking that it was a ghost. I hid under my Donna 
with my eyes ever so slightly peeking out over the top of the Donna. The footsteps stopped, and then I slowly fell asleep when about 15 minutes later I was woken up by the feeling of being cold when I noticed that the Donna, which was covering my entire body, was slowly being pulled down over my body and was now down past my knees. I wasn't imagining this, and I was scared temporarily when I rolled onto my side, grabbed hold of the Donna, and pulled it over the top of my body. I quickly opened my eyes partially to see what happened, to be a tall, dark outline of a man's body, which I knew was our resident ghost. I wasn't scared. After five or so minutes, I opened my eyes again to see what looked exactly like a pair of feet and runners, and they were large and they were walking away and out of the lounge room. I chose not to do anything instead, falling asleep, only to be reminded the next day upon waking by the kitchen door and lounge room door both being open when I had shut them both the night before. Can anyone out there tell me what a Donna is, or a Duna? I think I received a voicemail from my deceased grandfather. I just want to start this off by saying I'm writing this to get it out. Because me and my family aren't too sure what to make of it. So this started on the morning of Christmas Eve. I woke up to hear my mother crying, being consoled by my dad. I ran out to see what was happening, and my dad told me that my granddad had passed away. Now, my granddad was a dearly loved member of the family. He was so amazing and always made us laugh. He had a heart of gold, so his passing on Christmas Eve really had us all shocked. We've all cried together. However, now we're trying to keep ourselves busy to take our minds off of what happened. A few days after my granddad passed, I went to visit my nan nan and auntie. This is where the story starts. My dad drove me there, and there was no one else in the car but me and my dad and my little brother, who was three years old. He drove me there without any issues, and I went to spend time with my nan nan. When I was at her house, I checked my phone, and I saw that I had a voicemail. However, no one had called me. I had zero missed calls, and I even checked my call history. I decided not to listen to it till I got home. I spent a few hours more at my nan's house before leaving. The night continued normally, and then I remembered that I still hadn't listened to the voicemail, so I decided to listen to it. Placing the phone to my ear and the voicemail begins to play. It was four minutes long, which was strange enough, however, I still listened. It was hard to make out what it was, but then I noticed my voice and my dad's voice through the broken up sound. I didn't think anything of it at first. Until around 52 seconds into the voicemail, I heard a voice very close to the speaker. It sounded broken up slightly, but my stomach dropped when I made out what the voice said. Hello, Bobby. Now, it might not sound strange to anybody else. However, to me and my family, it was strange as that was my granddad, what he would always call us, especially me. I pulled the phone away from my ear and instantly saved the voice message. I didn't tell anyone. Though, in case they thought I was lying or something, the next day I told my older sister and got her to listen to the voicemail. She instantly heard it, and her eyes widened. We listened around five more times before my parents came home and I got them to listen to it too. They all heard it at the same time. They were all shocked by it and didn't really know what to make of it. At first, we thought it may have been my dad who accidentally called me. However, his phone was connected to the car, and he was playing his music through it. The voicemail also would have had to have come from inside the car to even pick up the conversation. We're all slightly confused and don't know what to make of it. Three knocks on the door. My mom and my aunt live out in the suburbs, 
Not much around them except for a horse farm and some woods. My mother lives on the first floor, while my aunt lives on the second floor. They've lived in that house for three years. One day my grandmother broke down crying because she claimed someone was breaking into the house and stealing her things, misplacing items and leaving lights on. My aunt is a nurse, and dementia runs in her family, so she just assumed it was that. Regardless, my aunt installed cameras in the house to make my grandmother more comfortable, and obviously no one was breaking into the house. However, this year the indoor cameras caught the living room light was turning him on all by himself in the middle of the night. It even picked up movement and pointed itself toward the direction of the lamp. I chalked it up to faulty electricity. My aunt called an electrician. He checked everything out and said everything was fine. They ended up installing solar panels shortly after. Another time my mom was shutting off lights and locking her doors for the night. She woke up in the morning and the bathroom faucet was running full speed. Thought it was weird, but we just left it at that. Then, maybe five or six months ago, the knocking started. My aunt and mom were very frightened because it's a house full of women with a young child and an older woman, and it was only happening at night. They set up ring doorbell cameras and said if they heard it again, they would call the cops for obvious reasons. Not too long after that, they heard knocking on the mom's door but saw no one on the camera. At this point, I'm thinking it's the wind shaking the door and it's rattling the door, well, creating a knocking sound. This October, I went over to announce my pregnancy to my family. We were waiting on my cousin to show up. It was about 10 p.m. and we all heard a pounding on my mom's front windows. We're waiting toward the back of the house. I'm excited, so I run over to answer the door. But his car isn't there and he's not there. Looking back, my mom's two dogs didn't bark nor follow me to the door as they usually do. I love those dogs, but you could leave a room and they'll start barking. So for them not to even bark or follow me to the door was very weird. My mom checked the cameras, and there's no one there. Not even a notification. My aunt who lives on the second floor started hearing banging on her bedroom window and her front door. My mom continues to hear banging on her window and front door. And it's always three knocks. Some soft, some hard, and at different times throughout the day. Their cameras have yet to catch anything. But many family members who've come to visit have witnessed the same knocking. I need help. A hundred and seventeen female. Wow. Have no idea what to do. The last month has been filled with fear and paranoia. I had this incident around a month back. I don't know what time in the night this happened, but I'm certain that it was in the AM. I woke up with this feeling of dread and fear. My room was lit a dark blue from my LED lights. Near the door to my room stood my mom. I called out to her quietly. As she approached the foot of my bed, slowly, it became evident that it was not my mom. Only it looked like her. Her head began to tilt slowly as she stared at me. I moved to the foot of my bed to kick her away. But my foot went through her. She disappeared and reappeared at the side of my bed and began approaching me closer. As quickly as she appeared, she disappeared. I told my dad about it, but he said it was just a nightmare. So I pretend like I didn't feel, well, I pretend like it didn't feel real. Until that same day my friend, an 18-year-old female, we were driving around. Now I've always known she was a medium as we're both paranormal investigators. However, this really cemented this. 
I didn't tell her anything about these, well, the appearance of these things. But her eyes widened and she quickly drove out of the neighborhood that we were in. She was repeating herself, saying, We have to get out of here. She later described exactly what was there with me in my room, from the clothes to the height. That night we went to a Catholic church and prayed. I've been praying every night since and haven't been able to have the lights off. Everything was quiet until the last five days. Five nights ago I froze in my bed. I was laying on my stomach and felt a hand press on my shoulder. I couldn't move, but the same sense of dread filled me. Four nights ago I was laying on my side when I felt something brush my hair out of my face. Once again I couldn't move, but... Three nights ago I was again laying on my side when I felt someone laying behind me. Frozen in fear and dread, the last two nights have been sleepless. Even last night I cried to God, begging for protection. Does anyone know what this thing is, or how I can protect myself? My dead grandfather may have come to visit. Help. My grandfather died in 2011 of pancreatic cancer. I honestly don't really know him, and I only have a few memories of him. My family wasn't as close with him when I was born. We honestly never got a lot of time to spend time with each other. But ever since he died, I have had feelings of him, like as if he was with me in certain moments of time. It's kind of like I could feel his presence. It's weird. And I believe he has visited me, because I'm my dad's youngest child, and he never really got to spend a lot of time with me. One night I was sleeping, and I had woken up on my back with my head a little too much to the left. Kind of like how cats sleep with their heads turned to certain sides. I hope you get it. Anyway, so this position was comfy. I remember lying there, being super lazy to move. I laid there for a few moments. Maybe two minutes. Then I tried to move and I couldn't. And that's when I realized that I was in sleep paralysis. I hadn't noticed because I was too lazy to move in the first place. Anyhow... When I did realize, I instantly got really scared because sleep paralysis scares the fuck out of me. Then I looked to the right where the wall is, and I saw a figure on the wall, a head. I wasn't scared, I actually felt comforted, but still scared. Like a little bit. I had a feeling that this figure felt familiar, and that's why I wasn't scared. I couldn't pinpoint who this was, though, until I felt my head being touched. Something was rubbing my head in a nice way. It was just touching my head, and I felt so secure and not that scared. And I continued looking at the figure, and it never moved. But when it touched my head, I knew who this familiar vibe could be. My grandfather. For some reason when my head was being touched, I had the strongest feeling that my grandfather was the one touching my head. It was the least scariest paralysis I had ever been in. I was calm. After I came out of it, the figure left. I didn't feel any presence. I honestly feel like this could have been my grandfather comforting me. Maybe knowing sleep paralysis is something that usually terrifies me. I don't know. Not clickbait or a fake post. 
Can you help me relate to being my dad saw in the forest while walking the dog? It wasn't human, nor animal. He describes it as brownish in color, like a human silhouette with white flashing blinking light. And he also said it moved extremely fast. Also, apparently, nearby animals could bark at it and feel it. He described he could move at the speed of a motorcycle and that a colt was also nearby. I don't know how true his story is, but I always hear drums when I go into the nearby forest near our house. He says he knows that colt drums some things. My explanation is not that excellent, because I don't really know much information. Our dog also tried to go back to the place my dad saw the silhouette, yesterday and today. My dad usually never really believes in these paranormal things. But when he was talking, he seemed pretty scared when he was telling me and my mom. And if it helps for, you know, helping search for the entity, he said the cult was some kind of Asian genre cult. Please don't judge my information as I say again. I haven't seen this entity, and I do not want to. I fear nobody but God. If these kind of entities exist, that is the proof that God exists. Probably related to this, I heard a high-pitched fox-like scream in the backyard. I didn't tell anybody about it until now. I didn't think it would relate to anything. And also, nobody would believe me. And no, this isn't fake. Many of the posts probably are fake on the subreddit. But I can 100% guarantee you this post is true. I myself will try to research it. But it would be helpful. Anybody could help me. Maybe send me some suggestions on what the cult and the entity could be. Now, the last sentence I want to write maybe is a bit not safe for work, but he also said that in the cult, a woman once went naked into the city and pissed on the streets, and she was part of the cult too. I tagged this as shadow people, because this maybe corresponds to that the best. But again, if this was a human, he probably couldn't have the speed of a motorbike with zero start time. I'll try to maybe scan the EMF in my house and also look out for a ghost or some other shit things. I saw a boy with black eyes. Five years ago, my sister gave birth to her second child, and because her partner was working at Sort of a shift work as a security guard. I often went over to her house on the nights that he worked to give her company. And help with the kids. She lives about a ten minute drive from me. So the routine was usually me going over there around 5pm and leaving to come home around 12 or 1. On one of these nothing out of the ordinary nights, I left the usual time and drove home singing to tunes in the car. I didn't really feel tired as I've always been a night owl, and I was just eager to get home and chill out after the stress of rocking a baby to sleep for over an hour. It happened every night with my nephew. The estate I live in has two main entrances that both lead you toward a big roundabout which I have to turn at to go in the direction of my house. When I approached the roundabout, I could see a small light almost flickering on the street that continued directly ahead of the other side of the roundabout. So basically, it was straight ahead. I remember saying, what the f*** is that? And instead of turning left to go in the direction of my house, I made the quick decision to drive straight through and see what it was. The light was moving rapidly in a short space, and within seconds, my car was close enough to see that the source of the light was a torch that a little boy was using to move back and forth in a patch of dirt that he was kneeling on. He 
looked to be around four years old, and he had neat blonde hair and seemed to just be playing in the dirt alone at 1 a.m. in the morning. I slowed down the car and stopped in front of him. My window was already down, and he was on the same side of the street that the driver's side of my car was on, so we were a couple feet apart. Once I had stopped, the car was still running, but I had my foot on the brake and I was about to ask him what he was doing outside by himself when his head shot up really quickly and he started staring directly at me. His eyes were entirely black, no other color in them, and I saw them very, very clearly. I think it took me about three seconds to register what I had seen and kick in the flight mode and I sped off. I did tell my friends and family about the experience, but for some reason it was never something that lingered in my mind. It was almost as though I woke up the next day and just put what I had seen in the back of my mind. With some hindsight now, I think that putting it away in the back of my mind was my way of dealing with witnessing something like that. Almost as though my brain couldn't handle it, if that makes any sense. Strange Experience This was a while ago. I was about 14 or 15 years old, and at the time I lived in a very rural area. It was in Mexico, right off the beach, and I had no neighbors. Our closest neighbor was about 10 minutes walking distance. My house was not very well made. It had three poorly made walls around the house, and the fourth wall was more like a third of a wall, and then open air. From the front outside of the house, you can see what was technically a small living room and a sink. Inside that, one third of the wall area had our official small kitchen. Outside of the house, we had a big patio cover, and on one side, near one third of the wall, we had a small adobe fire pit, which we would use to cook nixtamal, which is corn prepped to make tortillas from scratch. Tortillas. Given a bit of background, at that time I was very Christian. I believed in Jesus' second coming. All these details are important. Anyways, it was a calm night. I remember I was outside in the patio helping my mom cook next to mom. My mom was inside the house in the kitchen area cooking for the next morning. Suddenly the wind picked up out of nowhere. I was surprised since there was no wind blowing. I turned to look toward the visible area of the inside of my house when I noticed something similar to like a see-through white bag but shaped like a bed sheet slowly flowing from the kitchen area to the outside of the house. I froze not knowing what I was seeing. I watched it go all the way out, but once it got out, it shot straight up into the sky. As soon as I lost its visibility, the wind stopped and I got extremely quiet. The first thing I thought was, oh my god, was that the rapture? Was my mom taken? Was I left behind? So I called out for my mom. Nothing. I called again, still silent. I ran toward the inside of my house with tears in my eyes, thinking, oh my god, this is it, I'm left behind. I yelled one last time. Then my mom finally answered, yelling back at me. What do you want? Why are you yelling? By then, all sound returned, and it felt normal again. I told her what happened, and she told me that we needed to pray immediately. This stuck with me all these years, never knowing what that was, what happened, and why it happened. I had no logical explanation because I went to check on the white thing that flew out, didn't see anything that could have been either a large white bag or a white sheet. Have you ever experienced bright billowing mist or smoke? Over my 52 years on this earth, I've had a number of paranormal experiences. But one stands out, and I'm curious if anyone else has had a similar experience. 
About six years ago, my wife and I were renting a three-bedroom split-level home in northern Colorado. Over the ten years we lived in this home, we came to realize that something just wasn't right about that place. It was, well, I was a hard skeptic before then. But after watching the water faucets turn on by themselves multiple times, hearing footsteps and voices, and even a growl in my ear, I was becoming less and less of a skeptic. One evening I was lying on my bed watching television, and for no reason at all, I looked up at the ceiling. Immediately upon doing so, a large white mist appeared, or what I can best describe as appearing like bright white smoke. However, this was different. It was about six feet long, two or three feet wide, and the edges were billowing or appeared like blowing smoke, hard. The center was just white, didn't have the same billowing appearance. Imagine someone blowing cigarette smoke really hard, you might understand what I mean. This wasn't something I was seeing out of the corner of my eyes. I was looking directly at it, and I watched it appear out of nothing. I don't recall it having any particular shape other than it being about six feet long and about two or three feet wide. After about five seconds, it suddenly disappeared. This was just as quick as it had showed up, really. Interestingly enough, it didn't leave me in fear. In fact, I was kind of left feeling very curious about what I had just seen. Normally, I would chalk it up to humidity or something like that. But considering all the paranormal activity we had experienced over the ten years, and the fact that it was during the winter, I just can't help but wonder. I'm really hoping someone out there may have experienced something similar. Keep in mind, I'm not what I would call a spiritual person, but I do have my beliefs in higher power. But I'm all about rational, and I approach the paranormal with science in mind. I don't believe in... Well, the psychic aspect, but faith tells me that this was something beyond my understanding, which overrules the skeptic side of my brain. It was truly amazing. If you've experienced something similar, please comment. I wish I could explain it, but I just can't. I'm sure I saw a ghost, and no one believes me. So I work in event management. And a few years ago, I was hosting an event in the evening for approximately 50 guests. The event was being held at an 18th century farmhouse, converted to an event barn space. It's about 15 or 20 minutes from the city, so we organized a bus to take everyone. I was the only one from the team representing that evening, so it was my job to meet everyone and make sure they all got home. The event was uneventful. It finished at around 11.30 p.m. It was winter, and it was pitch dark outside and freezing cold. I'm waiting outside the bus, counting heads. Then I needed the bathroom. I called my husband off the bus. He had come along for free food and asked him to take my place. I went inside. The place was empty as everyone was on the bus. I went to the toilet, washed my hands, then went to leave the bathroom. As you do so, you walk through a small rectangle-shaped room or a corridor. Now, it's kind of a warm light, not pitch dark, but certainly not bright. As I walk through this room, a figure passed me. Now, I say figure as I just couldn't tell you for the life of me what that face was like. They kind of brushed past and were quite dark. By dark, I mean I don't remember face or clothes, just that it was a person. Now the person took me by surprise as everybody should have been on the bus and the place was empty. So as they brushed past, I kind of said, whoops, sorry, and they just very quickly kept going. It was all in a split second. I just had a weird, uneasy feeling, but that was maybe down to the lack of communication of them being in there in the first place. 
To me, I thought it was a lady. As I got out of the bus, I told my husband that we have to wait. There's a lady inside of the toilet. We waited some time, but it was getting late, like 15 minutes or so. My husband went back in to check if she was okay. No sign of her. We went into the back where the man who owns the barn was. He helped search the entire barn and toilets and couldn't find anyone. We did a head count, and we had everybody on the bus, after all, really. I felt really, really weird about it for weeks, just a strange vibe I can't really explain. I'm convinced it was a ghost. I casually caught up with the man who owns the place a few months later, and he told me it used to be a stop-off for market traders, and there's certainly reports of haunting. Does that sound silly? Something kept me inside, and I don't know what. This happened to me when I was around the age of six or seven. This was when I used to live in Texas, Houston to be specific, in my old hometown. My parents weren't, well, very that well in money around that time. And the area around our old home was often known as a dangerous area. Usually people would die near my neighborhood because of often, well, shooting occurrences. However, unfortunately my house was, well, it was haunted. The cabinets would fly open by themselves, things would go flying off the counter, and many more other situations that happened inside that house. One day I was in the, just sitting within my room playing with my toys, minding my own business, till I decided that I could go visit my mom downstairs for something. When I tried to open the door, it wouldn't open, and I noticed that it was locked. Of course, I started to panic and tried to unlock it, but it wouldn't unlock, and I was just starting to get scared because I felt something dangerous was inside the room with me. Keeping me inside. I was banging on the door, crying for my mom, when I turned my head around because I felt something watching me, I had a bunch of dolls on a shelf in my room, and all of their heads were turned toward my direction. I started hearing slight whispering from my closet. I was banging on my door more and my mom heard my scream. She rushed up the stairs immediately, asking if I was okay, and to open the door for her. I was telling her that I couldn't, and something's keeping me in and that I couldn't get out of the room. She was trying to kick open the door, but unfortunately was unsuccessful. That's when my dad came home from work, and my mom heard him then run down the stairs to get him. She then gave him information on what was happening. As soon as my father heard what was happening from my mom, he ran up the stairs, told me to stand away from the door, and when I stepped away... I heard him banging and trying to pry open the door. It took a few tries, but he finally got the annoying door to open for him. They both rushed inside, asking if I was alright and what happened. And I was telling them I was hearing strange noises and sounds coming from the closet inside of my room. I proceeded to point over to where the dolls were. Except for the fact that their heads were all turned toward my direction. Afterwards, they made sure to leave the door open at all times and told me to never lock that door again. Black figure in the corner. Backstory. I've witnessed weird things in my house before. I have lots of stories, but these two are the ones that I actually saw something. So the first one, I was in grade one, and my sister was babysitting me while my brother and mom were at work. Our mom told us to clean the house. I was a bad kid and hated listening, so when my sister told me to clean, I was being a brat and I said no. 
So my sister grabbed me and dragged me to the front of the hallway so I could sweep. But I remember I was laughing while she was dragging me. I was being annoying like that. But when I looked straight into the hallway, a long hallway by the way, I swear to you, I saw a black figure that looked like a man. It was like the side view of a man. Had like a cowboy looking hat. Just straight up walked into the bathroom. I saw the figure on the closest door. It just walked by like nothing. Obviously, when I saw that, I screamed, started crying, but I didn't tell my sister why. But that freaked me the fuck out. It was the first time I'd ever seen something, and I fully remember that man or things walk. The other story, I was a bit older. I was in grade 7, and it was maybe around 8 or 9 p.m., and I was home alone. I was on my sister's laptop, and I decided to listen to music on my iPod. I got up, and I was facing backwards towards the living room, and I had my headphones on. But for some reason, I had the urge to turn around. So, I turned around and directly across from me was a corner. There was a black figure in this corner, standing kind of weird, with his arms a little out, and it was just there. I was shook. Didn't expect that. So I turned back and looked back again, and it wasn't there anymore. I'm glad to say I never saw black figures again, but I can't guarantee that fact. I've seen things out of the corner of my eye, or sometimes a quick glance, but I won't 100% say that those could be a black figure or a ghost, and I'm glad. I don't know what seeing a black figure means, but I never saw it again. Ghost encounter in my hotel in Bath, UK, last night. I'll preface this by saying this was not my first encounter with a ghost or spirit. This shit always freaks me out. I don't know if I'm more receptive to it because I grew up in a haunted house. Maybe I'm unlucky and, well, I'd appreciate it if the spirits would leave me alone. Okay, so last night was our third night in Abbey Hotel in Bath, UK. At some point in the night, I felt someone get out of bed, so I looked back, which was to my right, at the bed to see if it was my four-year-old, and they might maybe be needing help to go to the toilet. He was fast asleep, so I looked left toward the direction the person was moving to see that it was my husband but the shadow was too small, almost like a child, and walking toward my baby's travel cot and pack and play, and again looked back at the bed again to double check if it wasn't my son or husband, and both were fast asleep. I looked back again and it was gone. The shadow looked exactly like a person in the dark, but they were too short to be my husband and too tall to be my son. A bit freaked out, but I decided to try to chalk it up to not being fully awake, or so I told myself, because I really wanted to get some sleep and not freak myself out. Later in the night, I'm a bit restless, and all of a sudden a woman or a girl's voice shouts in my ear from behind, opposite direction of my son and husband. Something I think it wasn't an actual phrase, almost a jingle. A jingle or something else repetitive like they were just testing to see if I could hear them. I grabbed a pillow, put it over my head, and pretended to go back to sleep, never opening my eyes. If it was a ghost, I wasn't trying to give them any reason to believe I heard them. I was freaked out for the rest of the night, but fortunately or unfortunately, my one-year-old woke up a bit later and couldn't go back to sleep for hours so my husband was awake with me. I told him about it in the morning, 
but he doesn't believe in these things. He's always dismissive. So his response was, okay, so you have some vivid dreams. So now you're just going to read about it instead. I did ask the hotel receptionist in the morning, but he wasn't aware of any ghosts specifically at the hotel. But of course, the building is over 500 years old, and there's a lot of hauntings in that area of Bath. Two experiences, one of which happened to me and one that was described to me. The first one happened to me personally. About a year ago, I was in the hospital for a severe respiratory infection that wasn't COVID or the flu. I have COPD, sent me into respiratory failure. They had placed me on a BIPAP machine to help me breathe and treated me with steroids and antibiotics. They were able to take me off the BIPAP after a few days. They then placed me on the high-flow cannula, which allowed me to talk. So it was early evening of the day and I was placed in this new device. My sister was visiting me and a nurse and a respiratory therapist were in the room doing their jobs. The bedside on my left was cluttered with monitors and the breathing machine. There had been a bedside three-drawer nightstand there, but they had moved it and placed it by the door to make room for all the equipment that they were using. While all of this was going on, the food service orderly brought in my dinner tray. Because the area near my bed was full of machines and people, they placed the tray on the nightstand next to the door and left. I had no appetite, and it was left on the nightstand for the orderly to pick up later. So the nurse and the RT were doing their thing, and I was talking to my sister, when suddenly the tray flew off the nightstand, sailed across the room and crashed into the bathroom door, sending food onto the floor and all over the door. Everyone was silent at first. Then my sister said, I guess someone really doesn't like the food. Their nurse agreed with her and called someone from housekeeping to clean up. I was in that room for about ten more days and nothing else happened. But that was pretty freaky. Later during the same stay in the hospital, I told a night nurse about the food tray incident. And she told me a story about something that happened to her at a small rural hospital. She said that there had been an elderly woman patient who was terminally ill and was kind of difficult. She said the lady had long fingernails painted bright red and she would scratch at the bed and clothes while she was talking to the staff. The woman ended up dying in the room, but life went on. She then told me that a few days later they had put a young girl in the room and then late one night the little girl came running up to the nurse's station, crying about somebody being in her room. She said there was an old woman with long red fingernails scratching at the pillow and telling the little girl to get out of her bed. Needless to say, there was no one in there. Childhood Ghost Might be cliche so far considering this is the internet people lie all the time, but I'm hoping somebody hears me out. When I was a kid, I used to see a tall woman wearing white with black hair. They would enter my little sister's room, followed by a small baby crawling behind her at nighttime. My sister and I had all sorts of experiences with being suddenly grabbed I think we all know the difference between a muscle twitch and an actual grab. She never saw the woman, but she did hear a woman constantly tell her, they need me. It was terrifying, and I've always been plagued with horrifyingly vivid, violent, and graphic nightmares and night terrors, even to this day. But as an adult, I question the legitimacy of what we experienced as a kid because, well, we have no proof. Fast forward to present day. I'm 30 and she's 26. She is a baby now. 
When I was on the phone with her not long ago, she stepped away with her kid who was crying, and I heard a hissing whisper say, Stay with me. Which gave me the heebie-jeebies. But I joked about hearing a ghost as soon as she left, and she froze. She asked me what it said. I told her to which she replied with, Dude, there's a fucking ghost in here. And omitting his name. My husband doesn't really believe me but I hear it all the time. So of course I'm like, that's creepy as heck, but okay. A couple of weeks go by and she recently messaged me saying her son was acting weird the moment she heard something again. He looked directly into the corner of the room and whined. He's two years old, so it's that baby whine that they do when they don't like something. Today she sent me videos from her camera monitor thing. Her son was sleeping and woke up saying, stop it, over and over. And then later on repeating, go away, go away, go away, wiggling around uncomfortably. I cannot help but be completely and utterly creeped out by this. My sister isn't somebody who makes shit up for funsies and fake videos. I asked her if I could share it here. She said no, which I guess I understand. And I know there'll be naysayers, I get that too. But I'm starting to question it more and more. Not really looking for any solutions or advice, but if you do have any, I'm down to listen. Or any input at all. More than just a dream. This happened to me when I was 18. It was just a week or so after my abuela had passed away. For context, I was still an agnostic. Not just in a religious sense, but spiritually as well. It's not that I don't believe in ghosts. But, well, I don't believe in ghosts. If that makes sense. Regardless... I fully believe that this experience was a spiritual encounter, and to this day, it makes me question the possibility of an afterlife. I was dreaming, just a dream about something random, a normal dream whose plot I can't remember, nothing deep, when I was interrupted by a flash of bright white light that filled my entire vision so fast. Then right in the middle of it, appearing just as fast, my abuela's face was there. She was smiling at me and covered in this white light. I was so startled I was jolted awake, sitting up in my bed with an audible sharp inhale covered in cold sweat. I've never done this, not even for a nightmare. The thing about this experience was she came to me so abruptly so unrelated to the plot of the dream and the feeling inside that I had just by seeing her face then caused this feeling of discomfort. It wasn't this pure comforting feeling, but this visceral gut feeling like all my primal instincts, like they were just going off seeing something like that. And like I said, I'm spiritually, well, I guess you could say spiritually agnostic, And having told this story to family members, I can kind of taste their doubt, and I accept it. Nobody can ever be 100% certain about the possibility of an afterlife, or a visitation without having experienced it. And because it happened during a dream, most people just brush it off as such. But to this day, I know what I saw. I know that wasn't part of my dream. I know there is a force behind her smile. Looking back, the story brings me comfort, knowing I saw what I saw. But I'll never forget that feeling of uncanny fear in the moment as long as I live. I guess that's what happens when you've seen a ghost. If anyone has any stories that relate, please share. I've never heard of anything like this. Don't buy antiques. 
Okay, this is the worst time that I had the strangest dreams coming across my sleep since I ever bought something at an antique shop. And silly me for buying something very old. Well, I bought a handmade canvas statue of a bulldog. It was kind of in a lying down posture and it was $40 at my local antique shop. I thought it looked nice for my room as I was decorating, so... I purchased the statue, placed it in my room. However, a few days after buying this dog statue, I began to have strange dreams of random creepy things. Not so scary, but, well, very strange. Made me scratch my head and try to think deeply of what it's trying to tell me. Until now, I had a very, very strange dream and just made me decide to throw away the dog statue, once and for all. Here's the dream. I was laying in my bed, inside my room, when all of a sudden, I heard footsteps going rapidly, fast. It was from the left to the right, and I could see the shadow moving fast. Then all of a sudden it jumped on my bed, Somehow I closed my eyes in my dream and asked who it was. Yeah, I literally could speak in my dream. Rare occasions, but what shocked me the most was that I felt the footsteps while it was running. I heard it moan deeply, like it was answering my question. I then asked again, Who the fuck is this? I asked it kind of pissed off. And it moaned again, like it couldn't talk, but it could moan. So, I immediately woke up after this stupid situation. And personally, I'm not scared of the paranormal in reality. But when you go to haunted places and come across a ghost trying to peek its little head out and see if you're there. But in dreams, you can't control yourself 100%. And whatever you visualize, it's going to show up. And could show itself right in your face, at one point anyway, while in your sleeping state. Now, soon I'm going to be throwing this statue and buying me a dream catcher. Go on to warn everyone here and be aware of what you're going to buy at an antique shop. You just never know what you're really bringing back to your home, huh? I saw a skinwalker. Let me start off by saying that I'm very into the paranormal. I've seen spirits since I was very young. My friends think I'm actually psychic because I have so many experiences. I'd like to research the paranormal, especially haunted places I live near. I used to live near a canyon that I spent a lot of time in. I found an article about a group of kids that had an encounter with a skinwalker, which is what led me to want to go on a night hike with some friends. One of these friends was also interested in the paranormal, but as far as I know, didn't know any history about the canyon. The other friend was a skeptic. I didn't tell them what I had learned, as I was pretty sure nothing would even happen during our hike. For context, both my friend and I We were very muscular over six foot tall guys, and I'm a very tiny five foot one girl. Now, on to the good stuff. It was late at night. I went out to a hiking trail that my friends and I had hiked pretty much every week growing up. We knew the trail well, so just going my light and full moon, we didn't need flashlights, I was just walking behind my two friends. We were talking quietly when we all heard what sounded like an elk being attacked. It was so loud I swear it was almost right next to us. I can still hear that blood-curdling scream. We stood there a while, waited to see if we could hear movement from any animals, but when we didn't hear anything, we kept walking. There wasn't really any predators up there. The only thing that could be is maybe a mountain lion, but those are very rare. We walked for a few feet when we heard a large branch breaking. 
My friend that was leaving froze and yelled, Fuck this, I'm out. Ran back to the car. My other friend and I didn't know what was going on. Then my other friend goes, Nope, I'm out. And books it back to the car too. I heard a branch break in front of me about six feet away. I turned to look and saw a large gray wolf staring at me and then shifts into a large dark-skinned man with some sort of animal pelt hood thing and glowing red eyes. I've never ran so fast in my life. Made it back to the car and sped out of there. My friends told me that I all saw it was a wolf, which isn't native to where we live. I told them that I saw the wolf and turned into a man with red eyes. There were footsteps, but no one there to make them. This happened to me back in the summer of 05. Let me set the stage. Oakwood Cemetery, Syracuse, New York. Main entrance. Hot August day, somewhere around 11 or 12. Sun streaming down, bright blue sky, not a cloud to be seen or a breath of wind. All was utterly still, warm and quiet. I was the only person there. Oakwood is a beautiful, old, rural cemetery within the confines of SU's campus. It's been around since, like, 1859. So as you might imagine, there are some impressive monuments and statuary on the cemetery's grounds. I was in town to visit a friend and had some time to kill. So figured I'd take a walk into the cemetery and have a look around. As previously noted, I was standing at the main entrance, which is just off the main road. There were no cars on the road at the time. This, compounded by the stillness of the day, made it ridiculously quiet. It's important to stress how quiet it was because, well... The driveway into the cemetery is made of gravel. On top of the gravel was a small scattering of dead leaves, twigs, and small branches. So with every step I took, there was an audible corresponding crunch. Imagine my surprise when I heard similar crunching footsteps on the gravel just behind me as I walked. I stopped, turned around, no one was there. No animals either. Not even a squirrel. Shook my head, turned forward again, and continued walking. And again, behind me, crunch, crunch, crunch. I stopped again, turned around. Absolutely nothing there. And this time I spoke up. I'm only here for a visit. I mean no disrespect and I won't stay long. Please, let me proceed. And this time, when I continued walking, there were no more accompanying footsteps. It wasn't scary, but it was definitely odd, not to mention unexpected. I have no explanation, and again, no one else was there. And there was nowhere that anybody could hide, especially given the bright sunshine. Anyway, that's my little experience. I was dragged by my feet out of bed. My husband was working in a town called Moose Jaw in Saskatchewan. We usually just rent a short-term room or a house where he's working, since he moves around a lot. This time, he was renting the attic of an old house on Main Street. It was a large old home with multiple levels. Each level was being rented out as the owner renovated the home. I'm the type of person who loves staying in older houses. I especially was excited to stay in this house because of the strange architecture. You had to take a steep staircase on the side of the house up multiple floors to get to our suite. Once inside, you walked right into the bedroom with the kitchen and the bathroom along the back wall. 
As soon as I got into the house, I had a strange feeling, like chills down my spine strange. I told my husband and we chalked it up to the moving jitters. Things got stranger from here. The bathroom and kitchen were both chucked into small cutouts in the house. The roofs were so short I could barely stand straight up, and I'm five foot two. In the bathroom there was a little door and a little hidden wall behind the old clawfoot tub. Every time I would go to the washroom or take a bath, it sounded like somebody was like lightly tapping on the door. A couple of nights in, I started to have really, really bad nightmares. Ones where my husband would have to wake me up because I was screaming so loudly. It felt like I was pinned to the bed and I wasn't able to escape. I had never felt anything like that before. Can't explain it, but it felt like I wasn't wanted, like something was warning me to get out or else. I stopped sleeping during the night. I was so scared of having nightmares. I would sit in bed and look out the window just hoping for daytime again so I could leave the house. I must have drifted off to sleep at one point because the next thing I knew I was being dragged out of my bed by my feet. My husband was sleeping next to me and I remember grabbing onto him as though my life depended on it. He freaked out, jumped out of bed and whatever was pulling me stopped right in front of the steep stairs. We didn't stay there another night still sometimes doubt that it even happened, but thankfully my husband witnessed it and can reassure me that I'm not crazy. Whatever was in that house was not friendly and didn't want me there. I will never go back there again. Weird Encounters in the Forest So about two years ago, I was hanging out around with a group of mates in the small forest. Now we've done this more than once, and never really had anything weird happen, except on two separate occasions. The first encounter we had was a weird formation of stars slowly moving around in the sky in a triangle, and within a span of two seconds, going incredibly fast, moving out of our view. All seven saw this so I know it wasn't my imagination. Now the second encounter freaked us out the most. This happened at exactly the same location as where we saw the star formation. We were just casually hanging around the midsummer, and around 2.30 out of the blue I saw someone standing near us. Now I should point out that he was standing behind one of my friends who I had just talked to three seconds ago. Everything about this guy striked me as off-putting. I should point out that it was about 30 centimeter, excuse me, 30 centigrade at the time. But this guy was wearing clothes you wear in Siberia during the winter. He also wore sunglasses despite it being nighttime. Now the moment I saw him, I instantly felt an intense feeling of dread. The other felt this exact feeling as well, by the way. I asked him what the fuck he was doing here, and he just said, listening. After he said that, that he was moving a couple of meters, but there was something really wrong with the way that he moved, as it looked like this guy glided over the ground. Now, because he got closer, I told him to stay the fuck back, and he just looked at me. That moment, my fight or flight kicking in hard as I got the feeling that this guy was a genuine threat so I got ready to defend myself if he attacked us. But just a second or two after he looked at me, he just vanished. Like we were all looking at him, and one moment he was there, the other he wasn't there anymore. After our initial confusion, we decided that we should book it out of there. We ran as fast as possible out of the forest. Now, just a few notes. We didn't use any substances that could influence what we were experiencing. We didn't consume any drugs, alcohol, or something else. We also all remember well what happened that day. We are all quite well known with that forest. And because it's quite small, we've been everywhere in there, and never have we found any signs of homeless people living in there. 
or gliding ones, I bet. Ghost or demon following me? To start the story off, I live in the ghetto, at least for a while, with my dad and my stepmom, and my little sister, but she comes in later. Ever since my dad moved into that house, I've had weird experiences, like scratching on my closet door. But anyways, he married my now stepmom, and she had experiences too. But once my sister was born, things got worse. I would wake up and see people standing over my bed, butterflies flying into my pillowcase, which seems nice, but I'm actually terrified of them. And even her toys would turn on by themselves. But one night in particular, I woke up and saw a strange man standing over my sister's crib. We shared a room, just looking at her. We eventually moved houses, and I went to my friend's house, and we played the Ouija board, and I was asking it questions that had answers that she didn't even know. I asked if the ghost is attached to one of us, and it said that it was attached to me. I then asked if it was one of, you know, one that was in my old house. It said yes. I asked if it was a man standing over my sister's bed. It also said yes. He said that he's a demon, but attached to me because he likes me and my family. When I got home, though, strange things would happen. A piece of stone that was cemented into one of the living room walls fell out in an odd way. My dad watched it happen and told me. It came out, stopped for a split second, then fell and shattered into the floor. Another strange incident was a toilet flushing by itself. But that's not the creepiest. Me and this demon have created some sort of friendship and communication. I hear taps in my room and that's his way of telling me that he wants to talk. One tap means yes, two taps means no. One night I felt very heartbroken. I said, when's the person that's meant for me going to come? Because I normally just talk to myself to kind of calm me down. And next thing I hear is a tap right next to me. And a man with a very scratchy voice whispering in my ear. He's coming. A month after that, I found my boyfriend. And the activity has calmed down a bit. The Little Kid This time I was around 13. And not alone, I had my little brother, seven, and my mom's best friend's daughter, eight. We were sitting on the floor in the living room watching TV. My mom and dad had a friend here in the kitchen with them. Everything's pretty normal. I had goosebumps a couple of times. After a while, we all turned our heads in the same direction. Me and the kids. Something just passed in the hallway between my parents' room and mine. Like if something just left the bathroom. The kids looked at me weirdly, so I asked, You saw it too? They said, yeah. Kind of scared. So I told them, it's probably just my parents or their friend. I stand up and go into the kitchen, asking, Who was in the bathroom? They looked at me and said, What are you saying? We haven't moved from here. I got suspicious. I decided to go and look for what happened. I looked in my parents' room, the bathroom, and even my own room. Nothing. I thought I could be imagining it. The kids saw it, too. But I forgot about it, and months passed. One night, my grandmother, on my father's side, needed help because she was sick. So my mom and I took the car to go to her apartment. On our way back, my dad called us, so I took the phone and said, Yeah, why are you calling? He asked when we'll be back. I said, Uh, in 20 minutes, I think. Then he told me, 
something really weird happened. He continued, I was watching TV and saw someone walking in the hallway between my room and yours. I instantly remembered what happened months ago, but didn't say anything. He added, Thought it was your brother because it's almost the same height as him. I waited 20 minutes, but didn't see him going back from the bathroom. I thought maybe he'd maybe fallen asleep on the toilet, so I came to see if it was empty. I came in your brother's room and he was sleeping. I told him that we would talk about it at home, and we did. I said, Remember that time I asked you to come into the bathroom? Well, me and the kid saw the same thing as you. Like a little kid running there. We tried to look at the past of the house, but we haven't found anything. I haven't really gotten scared because, I mean, it wasn't something bad. Still, we saw it a couple of times before it stopped completely. The Ghost in the Benji House, an experience I'll never forget. I'm in my 50s now, so this happened in 1989. I was attending the University of Texas. We always attended the Texas OU game. There were four of us staying in my boyfriend's best friend's childhood home in McKinney. His parents were out of town and their home was used in the Benji movie. A scene where Benji runs through the white picket fence. It was a historical Victorian home, three stories. Each room was labeled the red room, the blue room, etc. On the third floor was the creepy red room. I wanted to do a seance. The guy who grew up there didn't want me to because of the creep factor, but we did it anyway. He told us the house was haunted, but laughed it off. Nothing happened during the seance that I remember, but I heard footsteps above us all night and couldn't sleep. The following day was the game, and it was raining and cold, and my, well, my bestie and I didn't want to go. Too bad, because it was a great game and last-minute win for Texas. I was so creeped out and tired since I didn't sleep, so I climbed into the bed with my bestie since... She and her guy were staying in the master bedroom. The guys left for the game and we fell back asleep. We were on the second floor and awakened by a door opening and closing from downstairs. We bolted out of bed, thinking it was the parents and we were in their bed. We hear a lady talking and say, Hello, Mrs. T. We'll be down in a minute. We didn't get a response, but heard her coming up the creaky staircase. We both feel embarrassed and come out of the room. There's no one there. We go downstairs. Nothing. No one. We were so freaked out, we left the house on foot in a drizzling rain, waited for the guys to return. Once they return, the guy who grew up there said it was the lady in the back who haunts the house. He told us stories of her always moving the photos of the piano and into another room. She also moved his mom's wedding ring by the kitchen sink on the daily. He didn't mention any of this until our experience. Turns out his mom was on the local news years later, or earlier, discussing the history of the home and the lady that haunts it. I'll never forget this experience. Maybe not too spooky for most, but my ass was scared enough to leave that house in the rain on foot for the day. Don't know if I'm experiencing a ghost or not. Help. I've experienced a few weird things in my apartment the last month. I can't recall if it's happened earlier than a month ago, but pretty sure it's at least the last month. I've lived in my apartment just about a year, never felt anything before. It's either a ghost or a presence or someone is entering my apartment while I'm sleeping. Two major things that happened. One, a few weeks ago I woke up thinking that my dog had jumped to my bed. He's a big dog, so I can feel the mattress weighing down when he lays. Usually he stays by my feet, but 
but since I was cold, I called him to move up so I could hug him. I called out several times without response, so I eventually sat up to kind of drag him up. It sounds crueler than it was, and this was only to realize that he wasn't there. He was in his bed in the living room outside my bedroom. At the time, I was just blaming it on a dream and that I was just tired. I don't have my dog with me every day, Thursday through Sunday only. Two. This happened this morning, and I'm honestly freaked out. Last night when I was about to fall asleep, I was awoken by the sound of, well, imagine someone blowing out breath, a loud one into your ear. That sound. I can't recall feeling air, but I was also about to fall asleep. I just pretended again that I was dreaming and tried to fall asleep. This brings me to this morning. When I exited my apartment, I realized my door was unlocked. This has happened about two times before the last month, and I've blamed it on being tired. I usually check if my door is locked in the evening before I go to bed because I'm paranoid. And I'm certain that I locked it last night, which makes me believe that I did it the other two times as well. I've sometimes seen the lamp over my bed moving, amongst other smaller things, but blamed it on a draft or the ventilation. I don't know if ghosts or presences can move things or unlock things. Also, the previous person who rented my apartment is a bit crazy, not just saying it, but truly honestly. It took me months to get all of the keys, hence why I think it might have something to do with that. However, nothing is ever missing from my apartment. I was at my parents over Christmas, which is like five days, and my apartment was normal when I came home. I also never saw anyone the times I woke up while sleeping. Spirits and Dreams I've always felt energy everywhere I go, and my family have always been in tune with spirits. Ever since I was five years old, me and my brother have witnessed spirits in our homes, and always had a huge fascination with them too. Since I was around 13, I had intense sleep paralysis. I also witnessed a dark energy in my home. My entire family also witnessed this dark mass of energy multiple times too. Around this time, my parents were super negative, always fighting. Dad super verbally abusive and physically to my mother. Mother was an alcoholic, so it set a lot of shitty energy going around this room. I also started to receive visitation dreams from past relatives. They would pass on messages. Me and my brother used to hear footsteps in the attic, and an old guitar which was enclosed in a case would also play. That one freaked me out the most. As the years went on, and my brother always said that there was a dark energy in our home, but our parents could never see it or believe it. Eventually, my parents divorced around two years ago. I started to become more in tune with energy around, like, well, three years ago. And my sleep paralysis began to stop. I guess I was in more control. These last couple of weeks, I had an off feeling of energy, as if someone was going to pass soon. My grandmother had gotten very, well gotten very quickly in decline in health terms, which I feel will come to an end soon. Overall, my question is, do any of you believe I could have a connection with the spirit, or could I just be looking too far into things? Last week I had a dream. In this dream I found out I was pregnant, and then had a visitation dream from my grandparents. They were so happy to see me, and that they, ooh, we were just catching up. As if we see each other all the time, actually. And last night I had a dream I was in the forest with about ten women. Got a sense of family from them and protection. But they were trying to explain to me that I have this gift to connect with them and how I can always reach out to them. I then further dreamt that I had a baby girl. 
unsure if it was connected to the dream from the previous week. I'm scared. Advice wanted. All right. My room has a layout in such a way where when I lay down and look at the end of my bed, I can also see the doorway, which leads into a dark hallway with the ceiling at around six or seven feet. This is important. I was home alone on an average Tuesday night. My family was out shopping while I was staying home. I usually stay downstairs and watch TV to pass the time. But at around seven, my family shops late was getting dark, and I was getting bored, so I decided to head upstairs and take a nap. But when I passed by the slightly abandoned room across from mine, I got a weird feeling someone was watching me. I ignored it, thinking it was either my two cats or my dog. They liked to play in there, and the litter box was in there too. So I went into my room, turned off the light, plopped on my bed, and fell asleep. I didn't have any nightmares or weird dreams, but I did wake up in a cold sweat. I was scared, and that feeling from before was way stronger. I looked at my TV, which was still on. I wasn't surprised because I left it on for a bit of light, but it doesn't cast light into the hallway. I decided to play my 3DS for a bit. Then I heard something. I don't remember the sound, but I looked into the hallway and I froze. There was a tall girl with a hat. The girl was crouched. She had long hair and I couldn't see her face. She had a dress or a kimono and a hat. I wanted to hide under the covers, but she couldn't have moved if I wasn't looking at her. But soon after what felt like an eternity, she went downstairs. I grabbed a baseball bat and ran into the bathroom, which was the only room in the house with a lock, and called my family. They had to do a lot of grocery shopping, so they told me to call 911. I called. The police checked my house. There was no sign of forced entry. My mom put up cameras around the house. This is when my family checked the footage. The only motion caught was me running to the bathroom. I felt scared walking to the bus stop alone after that. I felt that possible ghost or demon's presence following me. I don't know what to do. I finally decided to post this story online. A voice said, pretty, in my ear. Several years ago, I was living in a house with my mom, dad, and dog. I was around 16 or 17 at the time, I think. My room was upstairs while my parents slept downstairs. I sometimes listen to music or have a YouTube video on in the background to help me go to sleep. And sometimes I don't. That particular night, I didn't feel like I needed the extra sound to fall asleep, so I was just laying in silence with the AC buzzing in the background. My bed was pressed into a corner of my room and I was on my side facing the wall. I had only closed my eyes and settled in for a few minutes, so it wasn't one of those half-asleep things. I was very much awake. When I heard this deep, guttural, throaty male voice breathe the word, pretty, into my ear. I froze and the first thought being that somebody had broken in and I was about to be assaulted or kidnapped or something. I waited a second before turning my phone on and whirling around, pointing the light in the space behind me. It was empty. My dog, who'd fallen asleep in my room earlier in the night, was on the floor, having been woken up from the voice. The light or the sound of my bed creaking from me moving. Not sure which. They were just looking around in confusion, ears perked. I was absolutely terrified after checking my room and the rest of the upstairs for signs of a trespasser, I lay back down and turned on a YouTube video to calm me down. I eventually went back to sleep, but 
it wasn't easy. My dog had been asleep and my parents had been asleep downstairs and no one had broken into our house that night to whisper pretty into my ear and then vanish. But to this day I can still remember almost exactly what that voice sounded like and I'm 99% positive it wasn't a weird dream thing. You know, since like I said, I just settled into sleep and I just I was still awake. I also have no history of auditory hallucinations. There was one other odd or paranormal thing that happened to me in that house, but the two events don't seem to be related at all. It was like a brand new house with like two previous owners, both of whom I'm pretty sure were still alive at the time. I have no idea what happened, but something or someone absolutely whispered pretty in my ear while I was trying to sleep. The scariest thing to happen to me as a teenager. When I was a teenager, I had experiences. This is one of them. I don't know what this is, but to be honest, I'd love to know if somebody could help me figure it out. Now first let me explain the house so you can better understand the layout. When you walked in the front door to your left was the living room. To the right was a closet. And behind that was my room. That was a den that used to be a bedroom due to the unforeseen circumstance. Making from the front door 20 feet to the kitchen, and from my bedroom 10 feet to the kitchen, the stairs to upstairs were to the right between my room and the kitchen. One night I was in my room on my bed. I was with my cat, Sammy. I was watching TV as I heard footsteps. I felt confused because everybody else was upstairs asleep. My cat got to the edge of the bed and stared at the door as the footsteps that I now recognized as high heels moved from my bedroom to the kitchen and then back. It was always stopping at my doorway. It would stand there for a moment, then pace yet again. A feeling of fear hit me. My cat never stopped looking at the door as these steps kept it for pacing about an hour. The next night I had pushed them out of my mind, till late at night again I heard the footsteps. This time there was two sets, dress shoes and high heels. Again my first thought was my parents, but they were upstairs asleep, and so was everyone else. My cat looked at this door and I pet her as I did the same. A feeling of fear hitting me again this thought of, if you go out of your room, it will not end well. About an hour till they stopped and asked my parents if they had been up or heard anything that last two nights. I just got a confused look and a no. Side notes. I've seen ghosts before in this house. They've scared me, but not made me, you know, feel fear. Never the feeling of it when I left my room, of me being unsafe. Due to the ghost that I've seen, I had put a protective barrier around my room so ghosts couldn't enter. It was not something I did on purpose, just with the deep desire to be safe in my room. I also found out that the house had no threshold and was the only one in the house that could see or feel anything. Elizabeth and the Doorbell My family lived in an old row home built in the early 1900s. It was truly an odd house. We moved about 13 years ago, and my entire family still talks about the house. We had a ghost. Her name was Elizabeth. Found in old records of the house. We never had any bad feelings about her or anything like that, but for the most part, she protected us. My brother had a seizure disorder since birth. My elder sister and brother had the third floor, more so of an attic, and my parents were on the second floor with the nursery where I was. My room was the nursery, 
that was attached to my parents' bedroom. You had to walk through it to get to the stairs to the third floor. It was a weird setup. Elizabeth rang the doorbell, fast and repetitive until my mother got out of bed to check on us. She could walk through my room and I would be awake and sitting up because of the doorbell. I knew she would run up the stairs to check on my brother and sister. It was a very common experience. Every single time my brother was having a seizure, would have been missed during the night. Elizabeth never failed to let my mother know something was wrong in the night. One other time to note, the doorbell was not rung from my brother. The doorbell started ringing particularly loud this night. My mom bolted through my door and made eye contact with me, went upstairs. My brother was fine. The doorbell was ringing louder and louder. But this time my dad woke up because this ringing is lasting way longer than normal. My sister was spending the night a few blocks away at a friend's house. The only child unchecked was her. The doorbell was still persistently ringing. My mom threw shoes on, headed out the door to check on her. Doorbell still ringing in this. My mom pulls up to the house. My sister is spending the night at and it's surrounded by police cars. Apparently, the father of her friend came home very drunk and began attacking her mother. I don't know how many details about what happened there except that my sister wasn't safe. The doorbell stopped ringing at the exact time that my mother's car showed up when she pulled up at that house. 12.49 a.m. Do I work in a haunted fire station? Need advice? Station 4 Ghost, 929-22, 10 p.m. Heard a large bunch of keys rattling in the hallway leading to outside. No doors opened or closed. While sitting in the living quarters, didn't hear anyone. Just keys. Looked around. No one was left in the building. Locks were all electromatic. No physical keys are used. 2.18.23 8 p.m. Going through with some equipment on the trucks. Lights blinked on-off twice. Not like they lost power, but turned off and on. About five minutes later, they turned off. Asked the guy I was working with why he turned them off. He said he was in the kitchen and didn't do it. 3 10 23 11 p.m. Doors slamming shut upstairs while both of us are in the living quarters. No classes and no cars in the lot. Checked upstairs. No one in the building. 6 26 23 11 25 p.m. I was laying in the bunk on my phone and I saw a head look around the corner. Couldn't see anything but a silhouette. No noises but I was sure someone looked at me. 7.12, a.m. Sleeping, woke up to roll doors, the truck being slammed shut. Went out to the bay to look, everything was closed, and I vaguely remembered leaving one of them up. 9.12.23, p.m., lying in my bunk, upstairs, opening and closing, Heard doors. Heard it twice. 12, 17, 23. Busy night. Got to bed around midnight, and at 3 a.m. I heard doors being slammed upstairs to the point I woke up. I've been sleeping with a loud fan on because of these noises, but didn't use it tonight. Also heard the roll-up doors on the trucks being slammed shut. Next morning, the guy I worked with asked me what I was doing out in the bay at 3 a.m. He heard the same things. This station has a lot of history. A lot of firefighters have passed through these doors. Many others claim about hearing similar sounds as well. Mostly doors upstairs and on the trucks. I had many other similar experiences, but I just started logging them this past year.
I'm pretty sure my childhood home was haunted. I live in a pretty big family home for 26 years. The house itself is only about 34 years old. My parents built it. We were the only owners until we sold it. My grandma passed away when I was seven, and I think she would often visit us in the house. I can tell because she smoked, and we would smell cigarettes every now and again. No one else in my family smoked, or our friends don't smoke, and it wasn't all the time. <sighs> then I'd be sleeping and feel someone poking at my head. I initially chalked it up to my covers touching me, but it happened even if I wasn't covered. I also felt like someone was resting their hands on mine. I had my own room at this time, so no other siblings were in there. I could often feel someone standing by my bed or by the door or closet. It didn't always feel eerie, and it wasn't every day, but still. Then one night, I dropped my sister off at her friend's. She said she would call when she was ready to be picked up. I sat in my room alone, just playing on my computer with a huge bang and knock came crashing into my bedroom door. It wasn't the floor settling or anyone downstairs. I opened the door and no one was there. I was so scared I drove to the store until my sister came home. Rubber bands would also randomly appear, another sign of my grandma. The neighborhood was not far from an ancient Native American burial ground. This all very well could also just be sleep paralysis and nothing at all. However, I will say I've always felt very connected. For example, before my grandma passed, we were in her apartment getting her ready to go to the hospital. And when I looked out the window and saw a bunch of motorcycles and cars, no connection to those, but they are vivid in my mind, I thought to myself, she's going to heaven. I didn't know she was even sick. I also saw a black and white version of my mom emerge from her bathroom closet when I was on the toilet. My mom's alive and was in her bed at the time. I was using a restroom. Then I had a random dream about my brother-in-law getting in trouble in a very certain way, and the next day he did. Nothing criminal, just personal trouble. Encounter number one. I want to start with stuff that happened when one of my best friends passed away. I won't get into the backstory. My boyfriend, Danny, passed away the day before Memorial Day in 2007. I took his passing hard. A couple of days after his burial, I came home and I was looking for a parking spot. Danny and I lived on the same block, still under the parents' roof and the only parking spot that was available was straight up right in front of his house. I couldn't park there, not at first. I was still fucked by his passing. He was 26 years old, and I was 24. I must have circled the block a good five times until my girlfriend at the time kind of got fed up and told me to just go park. Before I started reversing, I had this weird feeling that Danny had kind of saved that parking for me. I know it sounds crazy, but I looked toward his house, and out loud I thanked him for saving me a parking spot. Twenty seconds tops I was parked. And then I saw this orb, a little ball of light, but as bright, well, it was bright-ass flying over the truck. My girl was looking at me like I was tripping. She didn't see what I was seeing. I get out of the truck and start walking to the house. And this ball of light is following me from across the street. But high up, like two-story levels of a two-flat. But it was like in the trees. I'm getting loud at this point with my now ex because she's laughing at me. And I'm like, how the fuck don't you see it? We get in the house and this ball of light... I should you not. It's now in my room. And at the moment I knew it was Danny like saying goodbye. 
When I said I took his death hard, I, well, literally hurt my heart. I couldn't even make it to his burial because of how distraught I was. I've never cried like that and living in Chicago. I've lost other friends, but shit, not even the breaking with the first love hurt like that. I remember saying in my room that I was really talking to him, and I told him that, well, he had to go to the light. I told him not to worry and that I was going to see him again. And within a few seconds, the little ball of light disappeared. Jake I wonder what ever happened to my imaginary friend. His name was Jake. Coincidentally, my name's Jacob. Leave me alone, I was a kid. Jake and I used to do a lot of things together. See, I only had sisters growing up. Desperately wanted a brother to play with. In came Jake. We used to play with my toys together. Used to play together before going to sleep. You see, Jake used to keep me calm and protect me from the red-eyed man in the closet. And that went on for at least two or three years. Even after the red-eyed man went away. I do remember a few times that he was mad at me. One time being that he was choking me as I was trying to sleep. Another time was whenever I was in the room alone, night or day, I would feel a heavy pressure and this feeling of malice. Well, one day my older sister and I were reading an article. We were at the dentist's office. We were reading something about imaginary friends. The guy's imaginary friend tormented his family so much that they had to move until he finally got rid of it. My sister happened to recall the night I woke up choking or while I was sleeping she could see something standing over me. Needless to say, that absolutely terrified me, and I decided right then and there that Jake was no more. After the checkup, at least. As soon as we got home, I went to the room and I told Jake I didn't want to be friends anymore, and he should go home. Don't remember much after that, honestly, but I do recall after Katrina, the apartment we lived in ended up getting flooded, and during our last visit there, I felt that familiar sense of malice and pure anger coming from what used to be my bedroom. Jake was still there and said, yeah, he was M-A-D, to say the least. Still haven't seen or heard much of him since then, and I'm hoping it stays that way. Fast forward and I have a son, he's two, and sometimes he points in the air and starts talking to whatever's there. I'm not scared, given all of my experiences, but I just hope Jake or the red-eyed man doesn't make another appearance anytime soon, and I pray nothing worse finds its way to him or any of us. A Visitor My grandfather passed on the 15th of this month. I spent four days by his side while he was on hospice, only left to sleep for a few hours by food or, well, anything else for the family that was there as well. On one of the nights we watched the movie Signs as a family. There's a side story here for that movie. My grandpa watched it with my two cousins when they were crazy young. When my aunt came back home, she saw all three of them wearing tinfoil hats while watching the movie. So we all put tinfoil hats on and watched it together. Then I took home my tinfoil hat. Tuesday night is when he passed away, and my mother and I were the only ones there when it happened. It was the oddest circumstance as well. My mom is his first child, and I'm then, of course, his first grandchild. We cried, said her goodbyes, and let everything take its course. The funeral home picking him up, etc. But before we left, my mother left something in his hand before he passed. But now we couldn't find it anywhere. We checked under the bed, under his arm, gone. 
nowhere to be found. And even after they came and picked him up, they couldn't find anything. While we were searching for what was in his hand, a nurse said, I found a dime. This was under his bed. My mom spoke up and said it was mine. I didn't say anything because it was the last thing on my mind. We were all going to our cars, but before we left, I grabbed his digital clock that I bought him. So that way he could know his day and time and temperature was for the day. And, well, I thought to myself, if there was any residual energy in this clock, I want it to be with me at home. Thursday night I'm going to my car and I put my shoe on and I see a shimmer. It was a dime. So by my computer I have a dime, a digital alarm clock, a tinfoil hat, and a guitar that my grandma gave me, grandpa, when I was in 8th grade. This is all in one corner of my game room. My wife texts me the other night from the living room saying, I think you have a visitor. With the video attached to it, it was our puppy staring at that corner for a solid 30 seconds looking up and down at something right next to me while I was playing on my computer. Vivid Childhood Memory, Haunted House When I was young, which is like under five, my parents were still together, and my younger brother and I spent a lot of time together at our dad's brother and father's house. My dad's brother had four kids, so we spent a lot of time there with our cousins. There was a bedroom that was converted into our playroom, just a smallish room with lots of toys. We would always have weird feelings in there. But one time in particular, a few of us were standing in the middle of the room when all of a sudden the toys started moving on their own. Items were being pushed far onto a shelf and they moved forward before falling off to the ground. It all happened in slow motion like an invisible string was pulling everything to the center of the room. We were creeped out to say the least and told the adults, who somewhat dismissed it. Another time I was playing with a stuffed lion in the playroom. I put it in this little wooden shelf and locked it. I went out to the living room where everyone else was, then went back to that room to find the shelf unlocked and the lion three feet away from the door. I was about three or four. I remember being angry at whoever was moving it and started asking everyone back in the living room if they moved it. They said, no, go ask your cousin. My older cousin, who was 10 or 11, was in his room with music playing loudly and was annoyed I even knocked on his door. Definitely wasn't him. One of the scariest memories I have was in this house. I get chills thinking back to it. I was sharing the bottom bunk bed with a cousin of mine. The door was open and faced out to the hallway. I'll never forget this dark silhouette of a man turned from the living room down this hallway and started walking down the hallway toward us. We were both awake and looked at each other scared. He had red glowing eyes and was very tall, but somehow resembled our grandfather's figure. He looked as if he was staring at us down the hallway and then stopped, turned into the playroom. We told our dad about it the next day. I remember my dad picking me up to explain how tall he was. My parents divorced. I haven't seen my father in over 15 years. My biological grandfather is dead, and I don't communicate with those cousins anymore. I never want to see that house again. A spirit, my imagination, or night terrors. For about three years straight, late into my teenage years, I started seeing a small girl dressed in what I could see as a white dress with black straight hair standing at the corner of my room looking at me at night. The entrance to my room had a small sort of alcove so you have to take two steps or so to get into the main portion of the room. There was a corner here. So, where my bed was positioned, you'd not be able to see my door. But that corner 
was visible. There was just enough light coming in from my window to light this corner up ever so slightly, so I could just about see the pattern of the wallpaper. But at this corner for years, a small girl stood peering around the corner, almost like a shy child might. This would happen consistently on nights I had some trouble sleeping, and it was almost like I could feel I wasn't on my own. When I opened my eyes and looked over there, she'd be there. I could blink or rub my eyes and stare for seconds at a time, sometimes up to a minute, and she would be there. This convinced me that it wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me. I could sit up and continue to stare. She wouldn't move. She'd just stare. When I turned the lamp on next to my bed, she'd disappear. Night terrors are not just things children suffer with, and it can be pretty awful to deal with them. Once I moved out of that house, this stopped happening and I always looked for her around my room at night, in case she had followed me. Which is another reason that makes me think it wasn't just my head or a night terror. My question to you is twofold. Has anybody ever had this happen before? And could this just have been night terrors? It always freaked me out, but I never felt in any danger of anything because she never moved. I asked a couple of times during the night for her to come closer, or say something, or leave, but there she would stand until I turn on the light. I feel like I'm being haunted by a live person. My father's in the hospital and has been for over two weeks. He will not be coming home. He is going to a nursing home for end-of-life care due to his medical issues. Since he went into the hospital, I have not slept well at all. Every time I close my eyes, it's like a hallucination playing in my mind. A hallucination of events that have not happened, such as seeing him laying in a hospital bed and a priest giving him last rites or picking up the phone to be told he passed. Or the family sitting around him. He takes his final breath. And then, with each of them, it cuts to a part, and it's his funeral. This part is always the same. It's been going on for two weeks. Yesterday I was lying in bed, and I turned to get out of bed. My father was standing at the bottom of my bed and looking at me and jumped over the covers and when I looked he was gone. He said this to a few people and I've gotten a few different reasons like I'm crazy, etc. Maybe it's a manifestation or a live poltergeist sort of thing. I've been told to go to the hospital and ask for forgiveness for things I did when I was younger and that maybe it would stop. I haven't visited him since New Year's, because I live like three hours away and I don't drive. But he told me when I was leaving the hospital that he loved me, which is strange, because he's never ever said it to me before. And then I video chatted with him via my mom's phone on Saturday. And he kept saying it was this un... Well, saying that it was unusual in general. We've never seen eye to eye on anything. And early last year, he was telling me he hated me and never wanted to speak to me again. I was expecting him to tell me to get out of the hospital when I went to visit, but in fact, he wanted me there. But didn't want my siblings. I'm so mentally and physically drained and I just want, well, whatever their hallucinations, I guess, to just stop. But they don't, well, they only get worse. And now I'm seeing him in my house. Anyone ever experienced anything like this or know what to do or am I just crazy? The Gentleman in the Mortuary So I worked at a mortuary for a little while 
embalming and cremating and picking up bodies. This story slash experience isn't super scary, just very weird. The room we embalmed in was your average white clean filled to the brim with chemicals and bombing tools and three stainless steel prep tables. I spent a lot of time in there giving after death care to our descendants. Decidents, excuse me. So the scary factor of being surrounded by dead people wasn't really a thing for me at that point. Although some nights I slept there when I was on call and it was certainly eerie every time something creaked, or when I put the lights out, all that was left was a deep red glow from the lit-up Coke vending machine that we had. There was one day, though, that actually spooked me to the point of asking my co-workers about it. I'd begun the usual routine, but something caught my eye. I looked up and noticed a man standing in that bright white room wearing a black suit and tie, watching me do my work. He was almost translucent, so pale, an old man. Needless to say, I went ahead and exited the room as calmly as I could. When I told my co-workers about it, they all sort of glanced between each other and smirked. Almost unanimously, they said. Oh, yes. That's Mr. I forgot his name in parentheses. We've all seen him. He wears a suit, right? Always standing in the corner of the room. I'm a skeptic for the most part, but events like this make me wonder. It was so normal to see this man, but no one really knew why he hung around the mortuary like that. I wonder if he was ever mistreated after he died. Not every mortuary worker is a stand-up person. Why would a ghost or spirit linger somewhere other than where he or she died? Anyway, we had occasionally seen creepy things in the huge empty field surrounding the mortuary as well. I'd like to think it was our minds playing tricks. Knowing where we were and what we did probably heightened our nerves enough for us to perceive strange happenings. But I'll always wonder who the man in the mortuary was and why he was in the embalming room. Moving painting at grandmother's house. When I was very young, my grandmother had a painting that hung in the living room of her old house. This painting was of two women in yellow dresses at a piano. One playing while the other listened and pointing at the music, as if in the act of teaching the song. I would often sleep at her house as a child. I have countless distinct memories of seeing the figures in the painting moving at night. Not in an intelligent way, but in a sort of acting out the scene sort of way. Like how a gif is on the internet nowadays, constant looped actions. When the figures moved, the woman playing the piano would begin to actually strike the keys and tap her foot to the rhythm, while the other woman would nod her head in approval or disapproval as she judged the performance. Occasionally tapping the sheet music too, perhaps to draw the other woman's attention to something she missed in the piece. There was no sound. I was so young and saw the painting do this so often that I thought nothing of it. Simply accepting the idea that some paintings can move on their own. I remember being confused at first when Harry Potter came out and seeing Harry being astonished at paintings and pictures moving in the wizardry world. This was my first indication that what I witnessed wasn't normal. I didn't think too deeply on it at the time. Decades later, I remembered the painting and noticed that I hadn't seen it in many years. I asked my now very old grandmother about it. She told me she had wrapped it in a cloth and locked it away in her closet. I jokingly told her how I was young and thought I saw the painting moving at night. She became dead serious and told me, My dear, why do you think I don't put it up anymore? Thanks for telling me you saw it too. I thought I was crazy all these years. Sadly, I was unable to locate the painting in her closet. My grandmother is a bit of a hoarder and has many storage units filled with countless antique items. 
She says she thinks it must be one of the units, but that her memory's not as good now. She may have gotten rid of it and forgotten it. Wish I could find it again. Maybe when I have some free time, I'll go through the storage units and give it a good look. A spirit of an old man chained up in her basement. This was back in 2005, when I was 10 years old and still lived in my old neighborhood. My house was very creepy. You would see things out of the corner of your eye and see shadows moving. Well, this is about the corner room of the basement where the old spirit was. I never really cared about seeing the shadows in the house because I was sleeping upstairs sharing a room with my brother, so I thought I'd be safe. Then he started to sleep in the basement, so I followed him down there. He didn't let me share the room, so I took the corner right next to him. One day I was taking a nap and then woke up all suddenly, but I didn't think anything of it, so I went back to the bathroom and did my business came back to my room and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw myself on my bed, sleeping. I didn't come to grips with it until I heard chains moving. I looked toward the end of my bed and saw an old man chained up. It looked like he was trying to talk to me, but I started to scream. Then I felt being pulled, like being pulled myself and back to my body. I woke up screaming. My parents came downstairs and came into my room and asked me what was wrong. I told them about what happened. The look, or the look on my mother's face had basically confirmed that it wasn't a dream. She had told me the exact same thing had happened to her, but thought it was a dream. Now that we both had the same thing happen to us, she called a friend to see if it was a dream or not. My friend's mom had a gift. She could see things others couldn't, and sometimes astral project. Well, as soon as she walked into my room, she gasped. She could see the old man chained up by the bed. She went to him and started asking him why he was chained up. Apparently, he was chained up by some white people back in the 50s because he was a black man. He died by starvation and dehydration. The lady came and told us that, well, all we needed was to call a priest and to bless the house, and everything would be fine. The week after a priest came in and started to bless the whole house, my mom's friend went back to the room. The old man was gone. Needless to say, never slept in that room again. My Ancestral Home a hotbed for strange sightings and sounds. The house in question has been my grandmother's ancestral home, which I have inherited and plan to renovate and refurbish. Although right now the house itself is unoccupied, we have relatives living in an adjacent house within the same property. I pretty much grew up in that house, and as a kid, between 7 and 11, I once saw a little ghostly boy walk into the room, and no one else could see it. A few years later, I saw a figure of a woman lying right next to me in the bed, which froze me in fear. I tried to wake up my mom, but I was too scared to even make a noise. Almost two decades later, it was just my grandmother who was living in the house. The mother of my aunt, aforementioned relatives, passed away under undignified circumstances, to say the least. She was naturally unpleasant, prone to picking fights, cursing and yelling, and overall an unpleasant person. Not too long after her death, my aunt and her children allegedly started experiencing strange phenomena, like randomly opened doors and disheveled wardrobes where everything had been pulled out. Even hearing strange noises and seeing the weirdest things like legs suspended from their ceiling. I have to verify some of these claims, however. And then at 7.30 p.m. on the dot, my grandmother started to hear her voice around the house, cursing, yelling, and retching. 
This continued for a number of days until she brought over a priest to bless the area or something like that. Last year, my grandmother passed away. But just a few days ago, my cousin who walked toward that house to find her kitten had gone missing. Swear she saw the disembodied head and face of my grandmother just looking at her. She says it was just a face, no body, but that it didn't scare her at all, and that all she felt was good about seeing her. Despite my own experiences, I still don't know what I believe about these. But I'm inclined to figure it out, given that it's my house. Would like to know any thoughts. Thanks. Saw the Grim Reaper Two days from now is the year that passed of the death of a close friend. He died in a famous plane crash. I don't know if I could call it paranormal or anything. But the incident that happened to me was two weeks before his death. We went on this trip to do bird watching. We planned on doing LSD in the evening that day. All five of us took a dose of what I believe to be 200 UG. I don't know how much about this stuff, but it was my third time and it was his first. Also turned out to be his last. Trip was a blast. It was later at 3 a.m. that scared the shit out of me, and it still does. During the trip, something about him was just off. He was lost in his thoughts sometimes and making weird faces. We didn't mind much as it was his first time. At like 2.30, we headed to our room. There were two rooms to accommodate five of us. There were two beds in the room where all five of us stayed to talk. Effects were wearing down, or well, sort of off or down now, and we turned off the lights. It wasn't pitch black as the street lights outside were lit. My friend was beside me in the same bed as we were making jokes and laughing uncontrollably. He was quiet the whole time. As he was beside me, I turned my head and saw this thing. I couldn't make out if it was him or if it was next to him, but it was this entity. A dark figure like a foot taller than us. I saw it less and I felt it more. Like it was looking through me and I felt it and I said right there. I think there's death beside me. Guys on the other bed laughed. But the one next to me was still quiet and I froze up. I still could feel that thing beside me. I didn't want to be there and I was totally frozen. We went to bed after some time, and I couldn't sleep, and I waited till morning. In the morning, I convinced myself it was the drug playing tricks on me. Only after two weeks, I believe what I saw was not some hallucination, but death itself. Some ghost stories my family has told me. My entire family has had dealings with ghosts and paranormal, which from a young age has cemented a, well, a love and a belief in the supernatural. Here are some tales from my family. 1. My mom in the early 90s had a typewriter that she was typing a small two-sentence poem on. She heard my second oldest brother crying in the other room, stood up to calm him. As she was walking back to the kitchen, she heard the sound of a typewriter typing. She goes in there, and the two sentences that she had written were repeated a few times, all by itself. 2. This one takes place when my mom and dad had started dating. After going to dinner and a movie, my dad decided it would be funny to prank my mom by driving past St. Patrick's Cemetery in Wadsworth, Illinois. As they were going down the road, a creature that my dad describes as looking like a bear with the face of a dog rushed out of the forest and started chasing my dad's car. 
My dad hits the gas in his Beretta GTZ and doesn't lose the creature until hitting about 55 or 60 miles an hour. My mom said it had pitch black eyes. A paranormal researcher said it sounded very similar to a hellhound. 3. My second oldest brother spent the night at his friend's house, and according to his testimony, woke up in the middle of the night and saw a little girl in front of the bottom bunk he was sleeping in. The little girl asked, Do you want to play with me? My brother kicks the top bunk and says, Your sister's in here. His friend goes, Dude, I don't have a sister. Needless to say, my brother didn't stay long. Has other stories from that same friend and his haunted house, but this one sticks out. 4. My sister told me once that a clock on her wall, which had a thing you flipped up and then hung on a wall so it wouldn't fall, meaning you'd have to lift it up first and then pull it out to take off the wall, and it flew off her wall and hit my then seven-year-old nephew in the head, still has a scar from it. Something latched on to me when we moved into his house. Some years ago, my sister and I, together with my grown-up sons, decided to move together into a large old house that we had found for a ridiculously cheap price. We were so pleased with the amount of space that we didn't ask any questions. Like, for example, why was it so cheap? Well... My eldest son and I went there for our first night. It was in April, and it was very cold. The heating hadn't been switched on yet. We found out later that it didn't work at all, but that's a different story. Because of the cold, we decided to sleep in the attic. My son slept in what was going to be his room, and I was on the landing. The night I had one of the worst nightmares of my life. One of those where you pray thanks and you're back in reality after you wake up. Well, next day after breakfast, I pushed it from my mind. We proceeded to move in. A short while later, I started getting sleep apnea. I'd never had it in my life, put it down to me getting older and putting weight on. It was quite horrifying. Constantly feared that one of these apneas would literally kill me. But I plowed on and went to work and did lots of work around the house. At some point, I began having these extremely weird dreams where I would endlessly regurgitate a light-colored, grainy, pulpy substance. It wouldn't go on and on and on until I'd finally wake up. These dreams kept on happening. But I thought they must be symbolic. Maybe I wasn't content with the new situation or the new job or something. I eventually found out that the previous owner had hanged himself in the attic, in the very spot where I had decided to spend my first night. Still didn't make any connection as I'm a pretty down-to-earth person. Only after moving out of the house because of the heating never getting fixed, when suddenly both the sleep apnea and the nightmare stopped, did I start to think that maybe this poor man's soul latched onto me, in hope of, well, I can't tell. I don't think I helped to move on. It makes me sad. Awakened from a dream by a groaning, rotten apparition. A chilling encounter in my bedroom. I was asleep, taking a nap and dreaming. Suddenly, the dream space felt off, as if being controlled by an external force. The dream had a plot I was aware of, but then it began to unfold in unexpected ways. Next, I found myself awake, my head on the pillow looking toward my bedroom door. Upon closer inspection, there was a woman in a white gown staring straight ahead, but not at me. Initially, I noticed her short hair. Then the erratic movements of her head and arms caught my attention. Her head would tilt quickly, almost unnaturally, as if she had tics occurring every few seconds. 
With each movement, an afterimage of the body part lingered in its previous position. This definitely unnerved me, but curiosity overcame my fear. After about eight seconds, she slowly turned her head to look at me, aware that I could see her. Her features were startlingly clear, resembling a rotten visage as she had died, been buried, and worms had consumed her face, evoking the realistic terror of a zombie far more vivid than those in Thriller. She continued to stare at me, tilted her head almost like she was puzzled, and began to hear a groaning sound, zombie-like. I realized I was paralyzed, unable to move, and I thought to myself, I want to wake up now. The eerie part was, upon waking, my eyes were watery, almost open, fixed on the same spot where she had been, but she was no longer there. I moved into this place about a year ago. I was told that a large family used to live here. The last tenant's mail still arrives here. I found a little gold spider toy that belonged to a child. Come to think of it, I actually have it in my room sitting at my bookstand, which is toward the direction the apparition was looking towards in the beginning. Has anyone had similar experiences, or can tell me what just happened? As a security guard, I started believing in paranormal stuff. So when I was younger, I didn't really know what to do as a job. Me being naturally a large guy, everyone always joked that I'd make a great security guard. Well, I ended up listening. My job was basically at night going to buildings where the alarm was triggered. Weird stuff happened all the time. But this one really had me creeped out. It was like 12.30 a.m. and my shift had just began. I immediately had to follow up on an alarm in a school. So I went there and first checked the outside. Nothing unusual or weird to see. So safe for me to go inside without calling the police. For those of you who don't know, in an alarm system, you can see certain zones that are triggered. We had them mapped out, so we'd know where to look. Here the alarm went off at the first floor hall. I turned on some lights and walked upstairs. Checked out the alarm sensor and didn't see any dust or something that could have triggered it. My eye spotted a book laying in the middle of the hall. Didn't think too much of it, to be fair. I've seen weirder things than a book. Pick up the book, lay it on a nearby shelf. Just before I reset the alarm and I head back out. The moment I sit back in my car, I hear the noise of an alarm being triggered again. I didn't think anything of it since it's pretty common for sensors to just have, you know, issues. But before I surpassed the sensor, I'd have to go check again. I head upstairs to check the same sensor and the damn book is laying in the same spot where I first picked it up on the floor. Needless to say, I bolted down, surpassed the alarm system with all risks included and got the hell out of there. Never told anyone. Years later, I'm talking to a colleague who sounded all panicky at the phone when he started telling the exact same thing happened to him. And believe it or not, at the exact same school, he was terrified. Glad I changed jobs now. Never have to deal with the haunted places anymore. I might actually drop a couple more things on here from what I've seen. Should I be scared? Currently, I'm in my living room watching my baby cousin. She's asleep, so I'm watching TV and just relaxing. The clock hits 1.57 a.m. And my extremely heavy, fully metal-enforced front door opens. I assume it's just a family member coming home late, so I think nothing about it, really, but... Fifteen minutes later, my sister comes into the living room and says, Why the fuck is the front door wide open? 
I had no idea that it was, I get very confused. My sister continued to say that she had bad gut feeling that she should just come out to check on me and the baby. I check my camera facing the front door. All it says is zero activity recorded. For context, these cameras reset at 12 and show every single pixel change. So every minute or so it has another update that says motion detected, caused by wind or dust. So I'm very confused. I continue to check the camera facing the driveway and there's one human detected notification timed at 1.57. So I click on it assuming that I will see one of my family members that came in. As I watch the video, I wait to see somebody walking up, but instead, I see a glowing orb going straight toward the front door. I try to convince myself it's nothing, but I can't help but be scared since none of this seems coincidental. My sister having a bad feeling, the camera facing the door having recorded nothing, the glowing orb also may just be tripping myself out, but all of a sudden it's freezing cold in my house around one hour later. Plus, my dog seems terrified. And on top of all that, the baby I'm watching is very, very much a deep sleeper. Thank God. But she sat up out of nowhere and just looked forward for like 45 seconds until I touched her, and she simply laid back down. Should I be scared? Experience with Trapped Bird Foreshadowing slash omen of near death and premonitory feeling. This is a story very near to my heart. I'm wondering if my experience with this bird was something maybe others have had, or if this was just a specific thing to this event. Warning. Domestic violence related. When I was young, I was having lunch with my grandmother, and while we sat on the porch, a bird comes darting in, makes a big circle above our heads. It looked absolutely terrified. It then started flying into this corner over and over again, confused. This really caught my attention as it was very unusual. I asked my grandmother to come look. She immediately puts her hand on her heart and says, this is not good. She tells my grandpa who gets a long pole and a t-shirt. He's able to cover the bird and set it free. My grandmother said something like, Poor thing. It must have been horrible. It makes my heart sink. My grandmother really looked distressed. Later on, she admitted having an overwhelming feeling of being in a life and death situation. The very next day, my father enters her home without permission and tortures and tries to murder my mother. Again, the same people, me, my grandfather and grandmother, who saved that bird the day before, saved my mother, who was being brutally beaten and locked into a room. First, I hear someone who calls my grandparents. My grandmother and grandfather come to the house by truck. My grandfather stops my father at gunpoint, and my granny holds my mother, who's then saved. I cannot stress this enough, but I know as a fact, deep, deep in my heart, that the bird that flew in that day was a message about what was to come. That was one of the scariest things I've had to experience, and also the reason why I think there's more to the world than our eyes can see. Red Eyes When I was about five or six years old, my sisters and I used to share a room. Most nights my older sister and I would see two distinct figures. She would see a lady in white standing in the doorway, directly in front of my bed. I would see a man with red eyes, or at least I thought it was a man. All I could see were these red eyes. The 
though my sister could see the lady, she said she never really spoke to her. She just stood there getting closer every night. While I, on the other hand, would see a pair of bright red eyes staring at me from the closet. A disembodied masculine voice would whisper, JJ, come to the closet and play. Over and over. Sometimes my older sister and I would jump in each other's beds and hide under the blankets until morning. This was going on for months until my dad decided to get the house blessed again. We never saw them after that. I'm 24 now. My wife and I recently had a baby. I've been having weird dreams recently. They had always started with me standing in my son's room, staring at the closet, and the familiar set of red eyes would stare back at me. My most recent dream, he actually spoke, his voice a lot deeper and booming than I remember. You didn't come play with me, but your son may be the one to play. He said that before he woke up, called my dad and told him about the whole thing. He told me he remembers, at least he remembers me telling him about that man years before. But then, just then, he went silent for about five minutes. When he spoke again, he recounted seeing the same figure as a child. He also told me he remembered having the same dream after I was born. I've blessed my house twice already, but I can only protect my son so much. I just hope, I really hope, that he doesn't go back to playing in that closet. May never see him again. Four different experiences in one night. So when I'm in high school, I was staying at a friend's house one night. They had two spare bedrooms because his sister had moved out to go stay with their mom. The other was at his grandmother's. Late one night, we were in the kitchen looking for something to snack on. We started to hear the squeak of the rocking chair coming from the grandmother's room. Experience one. We decided to just let go and go to his room for some gaming. We were going to take our mind off of it. About an hour later, we decided to head to bed. Well, he did at least. I went to the second spare room, the sister's old room, and was just lying in bed playing on the phone. A few minutes after laying down, I could hear heavy footsteps in the hallway, as if someone was wearing boots. It had a hardwood floor, so it was pretty loud. The steps would go from the kitchen to the bedroom and back, and this continued for about ten minutes. Experience two. Well, finally the steps stop. Quick side note, whenever a car would pass by, the headlights would shine directly into the room. Anyways, every time a car passed by and the light came through, there was a shadow of a large man in the corner probably about six or seven feet tall. Experience three. Well, all of a sudden it gets like dead quiet, like absolute silence. No snoring, oh, excuse me, they spelled that wrong. No snoring from his dad. No cars outside. No barking dogs next door. No geckos. Then without any warning, the closet door slammed open fell off of his hinges. Experience four. I said, Fuck this. I know and I'm not wanted. I quickly gathered my things and left. Never stayed at his house again. When I told him about all of this the next day, he was just like, Oh shit. Yeah, that's Dan. He's a dick. The Boy in the Closet When I was ten, my family moved into a house that was the original train station for the town in the late 1800s. We had been there for about a week. Everything seemed normal for the most part. My parents didn't have a key for any of the interior doors because they required a skeleton key. 
I should point out that the layout of the house was strange because the only way to get into my parents' room was to go through my room. Anyway, one morning at breakfast, my dad was late waking up, but when he came to the table he started asking me who my friend was that stayed the night. I tried telling him that I didn't know anybody, but he was adamant that somebody slept over. I took my mom, and while I was trying to convince him that no one was in the house that night, my dad, who wasn't one to be scared of anything, turned pale and was completely uncomfortable. He told us that he saw a boy about my age walk out of his closet, so we got out of bed, excuse me, got out of bed and followed him into my room where the boy went into my closet and shut the door behind him. My dad said he knocked on the door lightly, told the boy to stay out of his bedroom, and then went back to bed. The problem with that story is that well, we had just moved into that house. My parents had boxes stacked in front of their closet. The biggest issue, though, was that both closets couldn't have been opened in the first place because our landlord hadn't gotten us a skeleton key yet. To this day, he doesn't like to talk about that night, and it still freaks him out. Years later, I did some research at the local library. Found like a little bit of newspaper that talked about a nine-year-old that died on the railroad tracks outside of the house. That was when it was still the railroad station. Thanks for still tuning in to Paranormal M. See ya. And the dogs, the cows, the geckos, and the birds appreciate you watching. House Sitting in a Haunted House Three years ago was one of my friend's birthdays. We started early around 12 and went all out till 3 a.m. One of my friends asked if I could watch their dog when they go to France. I agreed and they showed me around the next day. When I went over, I had a gut feeling something else was there other than a dog. So they showed me around, and it was a tiny cute house with a garden. They forgot to give me their house keys, and it was like 90 degrees. So I texted them, and they said that there was an AC, and I could take it out from outside. I took it out and got into the locked house so I could let the dog out. I have a feeling this will be the reason of what happened that night. I worked in a restaurant. I got done at 11 p.m., so we had a group hang out and talked about some scary stuff that happened to each other. One of the women told me that there were two different ghosts that lived at the house that I was staying at. One was a sweet old lady, and the other one was not a nice guy. The not-so-nice guy was mostly in the main bedroom, and she said that it's best not to go in there or it'll make the ghost mad. But I already did, because the couple said that's where the password for the Wi-Fi was. So I went to the house and let the dog out and hung out. Then I went to bed and had my music playing, so the dog came up on the bed to lay next to me, and it's about 1 a.m. One minute later, the dog jumped off the bed, and then I felt the mattress on the left side, which I was sleeping on, moving up and down aggressively. Note. The dog's medium-sized and eight years old. It lasted for a few seconds, but it was something I wouldn't forget. I told a couple of what happened, and they said that they never happened to see them all at once, but they have occasionally seen things move. That was the first night I was there, and I had four more nights left of this. But nothing else happened. Guessing it was because I broke into the house to let the dog out. My Grandfather Haunts Her House by Having a Party. So a little backstory to this situation. My childhood home was built by my grandfather and my grandma, and they both lived there until they got divorced. And my mom lived her childhood here as well. My grandfather was an alcoholic and had a bunch of people at the house, 
partied and drank with them and played music, even when my mom and aunt were kids and sleeping at the house. Well, years go by and my grandfather passes away. We move to the house after my grandma passed. I've known that both my grandparents' spirits live and wander around that house ever since I was a child, because my mom used to go to a medium and she told her a bunch of stuff that were really scarily accurate, that most of them were messages from my grandfather about her porch stairs being broken and needing a fix, our dog being sick and wondering what's in the shed in our backyard that wasn't there when he lived there. Anyway, I've always heard music playing, even when all the TVs and radios have been off. Usually during nighttime, like I'm still currently hearing the music clearly. A bit muffled, but you can tell it's music. I've gone through the whole house, turned the radio off, and made sure the TVs are off, but I can still hear it. Everyone else is asleep since it's almost 3 a.m. Since I'm now hearing it, it reminded me how my mom told someone a couple of weeks back that she experienced exactly the same thing quite often. Even my grandmother says her house comes to life when no one is here. Every time she stays here, actually. This doesn't freak me out, but it does drive me crazy. But also somehow brings comfort since it's a family member, since, you know, said them themselves. There's no need to be scared or worried. And tell the dogs not to bark, because it's only him walking outside. I don't know if that made sense, but I hope it did. I hope the party ends soon so I can sleep. Strawberry Moons On a warm day in early of June of 2017, it was just a normal day. My fiancé at the time was away on military orders, so I was staying with my mom. She lived in an older farmhouse half a mile from town. I spent middle school and high school growing up there with my three stepsisters, half-brother, and blood sister. My two stepsisters were staying at the time, being the youngest was still in school, therefore visiting her dad. I started working out during the day, sometimes at night. During the day I would go for runs behind the house there, there was a farm road between fields of corn. Perfect for running and beautiful. I was looking on Facebook and read there was supposed to be a quote-unquote strawberry moon. So I snuck out into the porch where it was filled with darkness and took a picture. It was breezy but warm out that night. I decided to work out after going inside. My daughter, nine months, was asleep on the couch in the next room. Walking into the house, there's a foyer. Straight away is the bathroom and to the right is the kitchen. I went to the bathroom and looked in the medicine cabinet for Tylenol. Went back through the kitchen and stopped to get my phone. I looked straight ahead out of the kitchen and door and window just to see a lit up face staring at me looking wrinkled or burnt. It was creepily smiling. It had frizzy hair, a pale face, but rosy cheeks almost. The rest of its body I couldn't see. My mouth dropped and its smile only widened. I ran across to the other side of the table and went to peek again to see if I was just imagining shit, or if it was just a reflection. But it didn't move an inch, still smiling at me. I ran upstairs frightened and told my stepsisters I just saw a clown outside. I don't know why I said clown, it was just the first thing to come to mind. I do believe it was paranormal. Anyway, we ended up calling the cops just in case it was actually a person standing out there trying to scare us. Something sleeping next to me. I'll start by saying that I'm a believer. But still, something like this might be experienced only once in a lifetime so I'm willing to share it with you. When I was 18 years old, went to my grandparents' house in the countryside. I enjoyed going to when I was a child there, but 
There was no one living in it as my great-grandparents died, but my aunt came also to take care and look after me. The house is pretty big. The rooms, too. The room where this happened is maybe ten meters long or two and a half meters large. My cousin came the first night to say hello and spend the night with me. He was much younger, like fourteen years old. I slept on the edge of the room and him on the other edge. That night I couldn't sleep because a cat just... Brow bugs from where chicken were staying. Hmm. And those bugs were biting me all night. Hmm. So in the morning I couldn't wake up early. And while trying to wake up in the morning I heard my cousins talk with my aunt in the kitchen. And he was swearing to hear that something was there next to him all night. Of course, nobody believed him. When I woke up, the only question that mattered to me was if there was no bugs in that place, and he said no. The next night, slept in the exact same place. At a certain time of the night, I was asleep, but tried to turn, and felt that something was behind me, as if a person is sleeping next to you and you just can't turn because they're too close. I was terrified and couldn't even turn around to see what's there, and couldn't get back to sleep either, so I stayed awake till sunrise, and at that moment felt like something was getting up without too much noise. It was going toward the door. The door was closed and stood closed, but had a somewhat of a big opening under it, let's say two centimeters. Then I woke up too and went out. My Dad's Experiences with Skinwalkers I have hundreds of stories from my father about paranormal encounters that he's had. He has two of them concerning what I believe to be skinwalkers. Both of these take place in the southeast during the late 80s or 90s. Excuse my writing, because I'm not a writer. To begin with, my dad is a Native American and spent a lot of his childhood and early childhood. The first one, my dad was walking around in the woods of a reservation with his friends. His friends were back at the car. He was walking about 50 feet away from them. He saw another Native man behind a bush, but he could immediately feel something was wrong with him. The guy had on no clothing as far as he could see. No jewelry, no makeup, or anything distinguishing. His hair was pulled back into a ponytail. They held eye contact for a long time, what felt like hours. In reality, probably it was less than a minute and a half. He was temporarily frozen with fear. He called for his friends, but none came. He turned to face them. Then he looked back and the man was gone. Within seconds, noiselessly, no sign there that anyone was there at all. The second was definitely a lot closer to what most people think of when they hear about skinwalkers. My dad was out in a secluded forest when he heard a piercing scream come very close by. He described it as a mixture of a native throat cry, the ay 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 sort of sound, mixed with that of a feral cat or a hurt bird. They brushed it off first this time. Then they heard it a second time, and it was just as close as it had been, despite them moving. They decided to get out of there. It was deafening and about ten seconds long. It happened about three times as they were leaving, and never once sounding any farther or closer away. Nobody believed me. This was a long time ago. I was around 13 or 14 years old. So my brothers had this cool friend, and every time he would go, I would ask to go with. Well, this one time we were hanging out, he was telling this story about some fire that happened a long time ago. I don't remember much about it, but he said that whoever's here a man that would appear at night at your window. I didn't 
think much about it at the time because he liked to joke around. After we got home, I started thinking about it, though. Like, how would a man just appear out of nowhere and be at your window? I laughed it off, thinking it was stupid. So that night I woke up suddenly because I needed to use the bathroom. Well, my bed was under the window, but facing toward the door, so I was able to see lights from cars. For a moment, I saw the light of a car pass. Then, in between a shadow of a man, I freaked out and laid there, thinking it was all in my head. Nope. Again, the light of a car, then the shadow. The shadow looked like it had been an old cowboy hat and wore a trench coat of some kind. Well, terrified, I lay there motionless. Each time a car passed, the shadow of a man was still there. After the sun started going up, the shadow began to disappear. Then I got a little courageous, see if I could see him. Well, I did. I caught a glimpse of him. I yelled and yelled for my parents. They came into my room, turned on the light, and asked me what was wrong. I told them that a man was staring at me from the window. My dad looked at the window and said there's no one there. I kept telling them that he was there, but they didn't believe me. Even when my brother came into my room, he said that I was just scared of the story his friend told us. Nobody believed me. I kept seeing him for a few nights and suddenly he vanished. No longer saw him, and to this day nobody's ever believed me. Someone whispered my name this morning. So I have a son that's six months old. We're struggling to get enough sleep these days. Mostly because he's a reckless little dude. Anyway, he woke up at like 6.30 this morning. So I went to the living room to try to help him get back to sleep without bothering my girlfriend. I'm super tired at this point, so I lay down on the couch with him hoping he'll get tired and maybe sleep for another hour. He doesn't. After about 30 minutes, he gets grumpy. So I put him on the baby nest next to me and... Baby nest? Okay. I lay down on the couch again and suddenly out of nowhere I can hear a strange whisper calling my name. The sound is loud and clear, like when a sound is played in reverse. It was weird and super creepy. Sat up in the couch, goosebumps all over my body, looking around the dark living room trying to find the source. I first thought it was my girlfriend, but she never whispers my name like that. She always calls me babe. She was sleeping. My boy is looking at me. Did he hear it too? I told my girlfriend this and she believed me instantly. She woke up several times that night with this feeling of someone watching us. It's not the first time she tells me this either. I say it's her being overprotective. But after this morning, I'm not so sure what to believe. I've experienced a few strange episodes with stuff disappearing and reappearing. Chandeliers swinging. Light flickering and cracking noises. But I've always blamed it on the wind, temperature change, bad light bulbs and the like. I've always been fascinated with ghosts and paranormal activities, but never really been responsive enough to experience anything physical or specific like seeing, hearing, or feeling, until today. Anyone else experience this? I can still hear the whisper in my head. God damn. Woman in a Castle When I was in elementary school, our teachers took our class to a castle, Piavera Castle, in the northwest of Italy, if you want to take a look at it. And since we got there, I had this feeling that something was off. Our tour guide sort of walked us through the castle, telling us the story of when it was built, etc. We were going to the second floor. And at some point at the left of the stairs, there was a closed room. Just a rope. You could actually see what was in there. My classmates weren't playing 
really paying any attention, just going up the stairs. But for some reason, I looked in that room and I saw this woman dressed in black. She had shining eyes and they were white and silver. She was just standing there with her hands on her belly. I was eight, maybe nine years old, so I was pretty scared. I decided to just turn my head and forget about it. When we had lunch, her tour guide brought us to the castle park. We were on the grass and I was looking around. A bit in the distance, I saw her again, and I asked my friend if she could see her too. She told me that nobody was there, but as she was telling me, I was seeing her, just like I can see my hands right now. During the afternoon, the tour went on a little bit, but I couldn't see her anymore. Before going back on the tour bus, we used the bathrooms. We were pretty tired, so there really wasn't much chit-chat and noise that you'd expect from eight or nine-year-olds. I was waiting for my turn, and all of a sudden I heard this loud scream and a crying sound. No one of us was screaming, and it appeared that I was the only one who heard that. After that experience, I had other experiences with hearing voices, screaming my name with an evil tone, just saying hi to me, hearing footsteps while no one's home. Even seeing someone when no one's home, but I think I said that already. Anyway, I frequently have dreams about something that's about to happen. Childhood Memory Glowing pair of blue and red eyes side by side. I vividly remember going up to the third floor in my childhood home one evening, around 6 or 7 p.m. It was fully dark, and when I was young, I can't remember how old I was, maybe around 10. I looked into one of the dark rooms and saw two pairs of glowing eyes, two red eyes and two blue eyes. They were looking back at me from outside the window on the far side of the room. The blue eyes were in the left, and the right eyes were on the right. Red, if I recall correctly. I remember thinking that they looked like cat eyes, but they seemed to be glowing since there didn't seem to be enough light for them to reflect or look the way that they did. Hope that makes sense. They looked almost iridescent, there's no ledge or anything outside that window that would be impossible for anything to stand or sit there. I was really scared of the dark and all things paranormal as a child. So it was surprising that I wasn't absolutely petrified. I just sort of looked at it for a few seconds from the doorway and then ran back downstairs. I mentioned it to an adult who told me it was probably just cats. When I came back upstairs with the adult about an hour later, it was gone. I never saw it again, and I don't know of anyone else in that house who has. Strange of me to go upstairs at night without an adult in the first place, since I get quite scared, as I mentioned. But I thought my mom was upstairs, and I was looking for her. Turns out she had gone out. Her room was next door to that one. To this day, I still check to see if a ledge or anything exists when I visit the old house. I've ruled out the possibility of it being lights from the neighbors, or from any electronics in the room. Also, the window was open, so there's no glass to reflect anything, and there is a fly screen on the window which wouldn't have reflected light that way. Two-year-old sees eyes in his room. So we don't normally use my son's bedroom except for play and clothes. He's two, and he sleeps with us. Two nights ago I left the door open so he could freely roam in and out. You can see down the hallway to his room from the living room. So this wasn't a big deal, safety-wise. He's just quietly playing in his room for a while, when suddenly he sprints out for obvious, genuine distress yelling, Scary, scary eyes! He's pointing to his room, I ask him what's wrong, and he keeps repeating, Eyes! So I take his hand and ask him to show me. He takes me to his room and points to an empty wall. 
There's nothing on this wall except a window covered by a curtain. He was pointing to the right of the window. I reassured him that he's safe and it's okay, and privately dismissed it as an act of imagination. About an hour later, he points down the hall again, yelling about eyes. As soon as I move in to investigate, he just gasps in shock and says, Gone! And that was it. Fast forward to today, we're babysitting for a friend. The daughter in question is 12 and a skeptic, and they're playing in his room. We did not tell her about the eyes. I hear him talk about the eyes again, and she comes out to tell me pretty much the same story I experienced two nights ago. This time I ask him to show me where the eyes are specifically, and he points to the same spot as before. Can't see me as he's in the front, just facing away, but the second I looked up to where he was pointing, he gasped and said, Gone! Just like the first time. I've tried asking questions, but I don't think he has the vocabulary yet to really answer them. All I can get is that the eyes are there, and that they're scary. He came to see me. One night I came to sleep. Nothing weird. It was in winter. My bed was a bunk bed. And I always slept on the top part, because the bottom one had all my plushies on it. I fall asleep easily. During the night I woke up because I was cold. At first I thought, Oh, Mom probably had opened the window and forgot to close it. So I turned my head on my right looking at the window. That's when my heart skipped a beat. I saw a human shape, translucent white. In front of the window, looking in my direction, it looked like a man. I got scared and tried to hide myself in my sheets. I was breathing slowly, trying to stay silent. That's when I felt my hair being touched like if someone was looking at them and touching it. I even felt that one strand of hair was being lifted. I couldn't help but scream like if someone was trying to kill me. I heard my mom and father running in the stairs. They entered my room and I was crying. She came to hug me and asked what happened, and I told her everything. She wasn't even concerned. She told me to calm down, that it wasn't bad. We talked about it for the next morning, and she told me. Don't be afraid. I think it's my father who died when I was 15. He wasn't trying to hurt you. I think he came to look at his granddaughter. I couldn't believe it. But it never happened again. And I mean, I haven't saw that man again. Because I experienced tons of things like that in my life. My grandma on my father's side, which was sort of a witch, didn't know until I was 15... And she had some supernatural ability to see things normal people can't see. She always told me I had the same ability, but I never wanted to believe. Neither try to control it, so... I keep seeing things that genuinely scare me. My first experience seeing something... To this day, I have no clue how or what. I was seven years old, and the memory of it down to the last detail is etched in. I was sleeping next to my mom, happened to wake up in the middle of the night. I saw a little boy dressed in a white shirt, blue shorts, similar to a typical school uniform of primary school boys. He entered the room. It didn't quite faze me at that point for some reason, but made me wonder who this could be. My first thought was that it was my cousin of the same age, but he wasn't even in the same city. The boy came in, walked toward the wall on the left side of the room. Toward the top of that wall was a Jesus picture, the modern-day white Jesus type, and to the left was a suitcase on top which my favorite stuffed teddy bear was. The boy stood next to the suitcase, 
and seemed to stare at the Jesus picture above him so I could see his back. I woke my mom up and pointed at the boy. I asked her who the boy was. She said there was no one there. That was when it hit me. I screamed and pretty much had the entire house up, my sisters and grandparents. I was wailing away in fear, trying to convince my mother that the boy was right there and I could still see him. My mother then asked me to close my eyes, which I did do. He was still there and my wailing and screaming continued. Then she said she'd pray for me, which she did. After maybe a couple of minutes, I checked again and the boy was gone. At one point, I seemed to remember seeing something whitish dripping off the boy's face. But that bit's a quite, well, it's kind of hazy. It's difficult to say whether it was a hypnagogic hallucination or what, really. But the whole ordeal lasted for at least 15 minutes while I was up and continued to see the boy throughout it. Unexplainable occurrence in my old home ten years ago. Let me start by saying I'll remember this until the day I die. Because it's something that marked me and made me change my mind about ghosts as a whole. When I was younger, about ten years ago, me and my mother would watch movies together in her room. I would always pick the film, and this time round, my favorite film at the time, Cool Dog. I can assure you the film is complete dog shit. Halfway through the film, my mom turns on her side because she cannot watch it any longer, and just near the end, though, the bedroom door handle started shaking violently. When I say violent, I mean the thing was goddamn shaking off its hinges violent. For context... My mom had switched all the door handles in our apartment, so instead of pulling down to open a door, we'd have to pull upwards to open it. Don't ask why. I myself don't know why she chose to do that. Anyway, this goes on for about 10 or 15 minutes of constant up and down, but the door stays completely shut throughout, not opening once. The fear I felt at that point, I've never felt anything like it since. I've looked for answers, scientific explanations, and some reason to know how this could have happened. But I haven't found any. No one was home, only us. And no windows were open. So no wind, if you could think that the wind was the cause of this anyway. Turns out that the person that lived there before us was an elderly man named George. A week later, my mom asked about him to several neighbors. Turns out that the old chap died in the apartment. You'll never guess where they found the body. In front of my mother's bedroom, died of a heart attack. Make whatever this story, but believe me or not, but I know what I saw, and I know what happened, and it haunts me for life. Three knocks at the door. I feel like I've dealt with spooky stuff all my life, starting from when I was young. My sisters have experienced things, it's not just me. It's almost my entire family. My sister used to cry and talk in her sleep because she said something kept bothering her. She was around three or four years old. It got so bad to the point where my mom, Tias, and grandma had to get the egg out because she was screaming and crying, leave me alone, in her sleep. I remember one time me and my brother were up at around 2 a.m. because my mom and her boyfriend were arguing. It was a toxic household. We were in the kitchen just because we'd be noisy and honestly, you just can't sleep when two people are being that loud. My mom's boyfriend went in the kitchen, and he said he was going to go smoke. And while we were in the kitchen, we heard three loud knocks on the back door that led to the back porch. Now there's the door that leads to the kitchen, and then the back porch has a door which leads to the stairs in the apartment. And 
then there's outside. So all doors were locked. Anyway, we heard the knock come from the inside door right outside the kitchen leading to the back porch. I know the knock was from the inside because it was the only door that has a rattling glass panel on it from how old it is. My mom's boyfriend goes, What was that? And we all just kind of looked at each other confused. So I opened the door and it was nothing. Just a dark room with all the stuff we don't use anymore. I turned on the light and all the windows were locked and the door leading to the stairs was locked. Me and my brother just decided to ignore it, go to sleep, and my mom's boyfriend just goes out for a smoke. We didn't talk about it after that. I feel as if my house is having a bunch of paranormal activity and I have no idea on what I should do. I've been having these weird moments within my household and I cannot tell whether or not I should actually dig down and investigate or if I'm just being terribly paranoid. A few days ago my father said he'd been getting these dreams with my cat and he'd been trying to protect my cat. He mentioned a black figure coming at him within his dream. He grabbed them by the throat trying to protect my cat. I couldn't tell if he was lying or not, like I couldn't tell if the intoxication of the alcohol was speaking for him, or he was actually telling the truth about his dream and the fragments that he remembered. I didn't think much of it till my brother was on a phone yesterday. It was never my intention to eavesdrop, but I just overheard his phone call with his friend. He mentioned something like a bad spirit ruining his energy, so he felt jaded in a way. I kind of have no idea what stuff he'd been talking about. That's what rose somewhat a bit of suspicion within my mind. Because my friend always talks about how there's always meanings to dreams and she's somewhat of an expert on these things. This morning I'd just been in the bathroom. It was 5.30 a.m. or around there. I was brushing my teeth. Suddenly, a jar of detergent that was on top of my toilet for some reason just flung off. It wasn't even near the edge in the slightest. It just flung off, though. I had no idea how. But there was zero force for it to have flung off like that no idea if this makes sense because I'm not good at explaining it all. Can someone tell me what could be happening? Exposing myself to the paranormal. Slight skeptic here due to never having my own personal experience. I cannot help be, you know, a see-it-to-believe-it kind of person. However, I've had too many reputable people in my life who have, you know, shared stories. I can tell by the way that they talk about them that they truly believe that it happened. My sister is one of them. She is so terrified of it that it's hard for her to share experiences with me. It's not like she can't think of a good story. I can see it in her eyes that she feels true terror. I explained to her my standpoint, and she said that, well, if she didn't have these experiences, she probably wouldn't believe either, since the possibility of ghosts is hard to compute scientifically. It kills me not to know. This is probably completely ignorant of me, but I'd like to put myself in a position where Maybe I'll be able to get an experience, whether it be a visiting, like a haunted place. A good friend visited a hotel in Mexico where the bathroom faucet kept turning on, drawers kept opening in their own, and the bathroom door would completely close and open on its own. Or maybe I'd use a Ouija board, obviously doing research on how to safely use one, or as safe as possible. Does anybody have any advice about any of this? Do I have a chance of experiencing something? Or because I'm not, what I've been told, you know, sensitive to the paranormal. 
I probably won't have any luck, huh? If I use a Ouija board, will I put myself at risk of being forever haunted? The most research I've done, excuse me, the most research I've done is listen to the Two Girls, One Ghost podcast. Which is sure, some of it may be fabricated, but for listeners, thrill or whatever, then any advice is welcome. Some interesting things happening. So, since moving into my house in the last three years, some interesting things have happened. I live with my mom and two-year-old daughter. I thought I'd share them. A few years ago, I was in the bathroom. I brushed my teeth, put lip balm on, and dropped the lid. There was a black bath mat at the sink, and behind that is the bath. So there's nowhere really for it to go. It's a really small space. Looked up and down. Basically looked from the bathroom for like 20 minutes and I couldn't find it. Told my mom she came, looked, nothing. It was a white lid. I thought stuff like, well, I thought stuff it. I can't find it. Hmm. I even said to my mom, it's like it fell into another world. I went back like hours later to grab something, open the door, Turned the light on, and clear as day, it was sitting smack bang in the middle of the black bath mat. It sent shivers down my spine. It was so odd to me. There's no way it could have, well, how I could have missed it. So I picked up the bath mat and shook it while looking. In the last year, I lost a necklace of mine. Same thing. Looked all over the house, bathroom included. Couldn't find it. Then went into the bathroom late at night, and it was sitting on the sink, right there, clear as day. Could not be missed, right in the middle of the left side. I emptied the whole sink top off when I was looking. Everything. Wiped down everything, too. And the sink while I was there. I didn't wipe over it. It just wasn't there. A ghostly message at the movies. This encounter happened to me in 2010 when I lived in Chicago. I went with my best bud to catch a science fiction movie at AMC River East, my favorite theater in town. It was a matinee. We sat in the balcony in the cavernous theater number two. No one was in the balcony with us. I gave my bud some money to get some popcorn and soda. As I sat there watching those annoying pre-movie commercials, I heard the chair behind me squeak. It sounded like somebody sat down right behind me, but you'd have to enter from the side of me and be able to see you walk in. I didn't think about it too much until I felt a hand on my shoulder. When I looked at it, like, why is this person touching me? I saw red nails, a big old wedding ring, and a pearl bracelet. I heard a woman's voice say, pick up your phone. It's your mother. Do as she asks. I didn't really recognize the voice because it was more of a whisper, but then I felt a gentle stroking of my hair. I could smell a floral perfume. At that point, my buddy had returned. He looked at me and asked well, who that lady behind me was, but he couldn't describe her well because of the shadows. The theater lights started to dim and the trailer started. A few minutes later, my phone vibrated. It was my mother. My grandmother had just died unexpectedly and I needed to go home to help with funeral arrangements. She thought I'd be the only one who could keep it together to organize it. At the funeral, my grandmother's hands were crossed, like you'd expect. She had shiny red nails, her wedding ring, a pearl bracelet, and I could smell her rose perfume. It was the last thing my grandfather bought her before he passed, too. A 
entity has haunted me since I was a little boy. When I was little, I don't remember much. So this is according to my mom. But these things haven't left. So she told me the truth that I had a friend. A friend in air quotes. An older woman about my mother's age at the time, 28-ish, would sit outside with me and watch me play. Even if my mom thought I was alone and she was outside with me, this woman would be there, and we talked a lot. As I grew up, I would see her out of the corner of my eye, and still, like tall around 5 foot 6-ish, wearing a plain white but torn sundress or a nightgown. As I grew older and she would show up out of the corner of my eye, I would suddenly feel dizzy and sick, like I just got punched in the gut. One night I fell asleep early, not something unusual since I was watching my siblings and basically raising them during this time, and I had a horrible nightmare of my siblings getting ripped apart by all sorts of demonic-looking things and terrifying secrets of others all around me. I woke up to find I was paralyzed. I could barely breathe, thought it was a night terror and waited, but it was different. The cold and even my four blankets was enough to warm me. Then from the shadows, the woman walked from the shadows. That's when I saw her face was melted together like someone had glued her face together and messed up. This is still happening to me. My girlfriend has started seeing her too. We've both been blessed by a priest and several other leaders in other religions, but so far, nothing. I wouldn't normally care. Recently, my girlfriend and I have started waking up with very deep scratches that look like nails raked across her skin. But instead of nails, they're talons. Shadow people driving a car. So this happened a few days ago, and I still get the chills. I swear this is real, and I'm not making up the story. One evening I decided to drive to an abandoned hospital with my girlfriend. Just because she's socially awkward, and that seems like a good place for hanging out in the past, so I was pretty confident that this was going to be a pretty normal place at night. I was wrong, however. There were people, so I kind of wasn't afraid or worried that something paranormal was going to happen. We went a bit farther away. After a while, we were talking, but my girlfriend wanted to have the lights on, which in my opinion is stupid. Not because we were doing anything, but I felt something. And right as I did, a car with no headlights rolls behind us to a big bush, as if it was watching us. We went out after a while to smoke a cigarette. Then I saw a shadow near a tree walking away from the general direction of the car that rolled past us. The thing was that you could see pretty much anything since there was a full moon. But not that man, he was dark. It seemed he was so slow and walked as though he was an older man. We went into the car. After just a few seconds, there was a shadow that ran so fast, I just caught a glimpse of it. It was as tall as a person, but I looked everywhere and no one was there. Then I asked my girlfriend if she had seen what I had. As soon as she said, yes, what was that? I switched in reverse and booked it. This has never happened to me, and I wasn't a believer in the paranormal. After that night... I've been watching videos on this topic and found out that what we saw wasn't human. My deceased sister apparently spoke to my friend. So I remember I was quite young. This happened in grade three. My friend and I were at recess, and we were talking when she told me she had received a note. A legit piece of paper on the ground in her room. The writing was claiming that it was my older sister. I can't remember what she said it said, but all I remember is her telling me that it was my sister. 
I wish I could remember what that note said. But the thing is, neither of my siblings had died. My sister was well alive. So whatever, I brushed it off. Then the same year I was eating dinner with my mom and sister, when my sister brought up my mom's first child. They died a baby girl. The baby girl my mom had lost in miscarriage. I remember being shook as fuck because this was my first time ever hearing about this deceased sibling that I had. But the fact that my friend told me something, claimed to being my sister, and I never even knew I had a deceased sister scared the hell out of me. No, I'm not going to 100% say that my friend was telling me the truth. But I just find it weird that she said sister, and this sister was dead. And I know 100% I've never mentioned to her about this deceased sibling because I didn't even know about it until after she told me she received this note. I don't know what that was, but I find it creepy as fuck. I don't believe this was my sister, though. She was a baby. How is that possible? Do babies grow up in heaven? Like, I don't know, but super weird. The spirits of victims who commit suicide need answers. 33-year-old female here. I don't know if this is the right place to get answers or help, but I'm going to try. I have two instances where spirits have come to me. I've been dealing with depression for some time now. And of course, with depression comes suicidal thoughts. I take no drugs, I don't drink, so I'm clear-minded and I know this is real. One day I fell asleep after crying for hours, praying to God to help me as I drifted off to sleep in the chair. A random first and last name popped into my head. I don't know why God has wiped my memory because I can't remember the name, but as soon as I woke up, I googled her name and it said she was 32 and committed suicide. This has freaked me out till this day, still trying to find answers as to why this spirit visited me. I get chills when I think about this. Another incident happened in September. This is where I drifted off to sleep in the bathroom and I had a vision of Stephen Twitch Boss on September 28th. I only knew Twitch committed suicide, and he worked with Ellen DeGeneres on her show. I knew nothing else about him. Next day I was scrolling on Facebook. I see a post of Ellen wishing him a happy birthday. This freaked me out once again. I googled his birthday. September 29th. I was shocked. This can't be a coincidence. These spirits visited me, and I want to know why. I'm scared, to be honest. Has this happened to anyone here? Been seeing the same demon in my dreams for 23 and a half years. It all started when I was six years old. I was asleep in my older brother's room on the floor. I woke up sat up, rubbed my eyes. Then I saw this thing it was staring at me, standing directly in the doorway. It had white hair with a bald top and crown on its head. It wore overalls and had deep sunken eyes. It had light gray skin and long black claws as well. Almost as soon as I saw it, it bolted toward me, grabbed my ankles and started dragging me out of the room and into a dark hall. I screamed. Nobody heard me. Then it said something that's also stuck with me since. You'll see me again. Ever since then, at least once a week for 23 years, the exact same thing happens. Same entity, same everything. If this is just some decades-long recurring dream, why does everything seem so real? 
Why does its grip feel so real? Why does it always say the exact same thing? Why am I able to smell it every time? Why does everything else in the room look like the exact same as if it were really me being awake? Even now I'm almost afraid to type this because I'm worried that I'm just dreaming again and that it's going to appear in the doorway at any second. Please help me. I don't know what this thing is. I don't know why it won't leave me alone. I don't know how this dream seems so much more vivid than any other dream. I don't even know if it's real or all in my head. How do I put an end to this? What is it? Anything helps. I can't deal with this anymore and I can't deal with the overwhelming dread and fear. I can't deal with not knowing. I just genuinely can't keep going with this anymore. It makes me afraid to go to sleep. Black silhouette woman figure pacing back and forth in my great-grandmother's kitchen. I was pretty young. Not quite sure my exact age, but I was old enough to know what I saw. I was probably 10 or 11. I was staying at my grandparents' house to visit with my grandfather and play with my little cousin for a week or so. I had an air mattress set up in the living room to sleep on while my two cousins slept on the couches that are in the living room. The way the house is set up is you can see right into the kitchen from the living room, especially where my air mattress was. It was a perfect view of almost the whole kitchen. I was sleeping and everything was fine. No nightmares or anything like that. I didn't watch any scary movies or anything before bed. I woke up from my sleep and just looked around for a second when I looked straight. I noticed a black silhouette woman pacing back and forth. I could only see above the waist because she was behind the kitchen table. She was just pacing back and forth. When I saw this, it freaked me the hell out. I got up and sprinted to my great-grandmother's room to wake her up. I told her I saw a ghost. I remember my heart was pounding. She got up to go check, but when we went out to the kitchen, the figure was gone. I've never seen it again. At least any other time I'd been there over the years. My grandmother says I was seeing things from playing. Well, too many video games, as she put it. But I know what I saw, and no one can tell me otherwise. I don't know what else to make of the situation, just kind of freaky and thought I'd share my one only true experience with seeing a real ghost. I guess my only question is, why would they be pacing back and forth? Advice needed on spirits. Activity when I go away. When I leave my house for an extended period of time, paranormal activities happen scares the girlfriend shitless. I was away last week, and Wednesday night girlfriend was woken up by every entire light bulb in the house being on. Other times when I've gone, she's heard people walking around upstairs and pulling chairs. She wasn't a believer until she met me. I've met mediums, and they say I have the gift, and I feel them too. Worth to note that when I return home after an extended period of time, when I come near the house, I can feel a clear, bitter presence. It feels hostile, grumpy, and unwelcoming. We lived here for years, and moving out isn't an option now. Why are the spirits coming alive when I'm away? Is there something we can do? I do feel their negative presence affecting my mood. I've sometimes wondered if they'd leech off my energy and become mad when I'm gone. We would really appreciate some advice. What can we do? Is there something my girlfriend can do to calm them when I'm away at least? There's a crawl space in the attic which I rarely visit because the presence is so strong it makes me afraid to be quite frank. It doesn't help that you have to crawl an inch yourself for ten minutes to get there. Last year there lay a dead little black bird there on its back. 
I don't know how it got there or died, but it doesn't help the creepy presence. I haven't removed it yet. I just got a really bad vibe from it, like I'm really not supposed to touch it. Lennox Hotel in Boston. Any similar experiences? I have stayed at the Lennox Hotel in Boston many times on work visits from New York City. It's a really nice and historic hotel in the Back Bay area. I hadn't experienced anything paranormal before, but on this visit a couple of odd things happened. The first was two nights ago. I was in a light sleep phase, and then suddenly my bed felt like somebody had sat down on the corner of it. Since I was half asleep, I didn't think much of it until the next morning when I realized that was kind of weird. The last night I woke up in the middle of the night, and in the dark next to my bed it looked like a figure of a man was standing there. I knew it wasn't a real person, and I wasn't really scared, since they were more of a figure. I couldn't see any features other than the fact that he might have been wearing green and was either bald or in a hat or didn't have a lot of hair. I assumed my eyes were playing tricks on me, but they didn't adjust after a few moments so I actually kicked toward that area and when the figure remained, I finally turned on my flashlight and then the figure was gone. A Google and Reddit search shows that the hotel is often recognized as being haunted, but I can only find information about room 300, which is not the room or the floor where I stayed. Apparently room 300 is haunted by a poker-playing, cigar-smoking, friendly ghost named Red. I also read that women were murdered in a room at Lennox in 1890, or excuse me, 1989. But I'm not sure how that fits into my story. I just had my first ghost encounter at work. I work in a relatively modern office building with three floors. There's toilets in the cellar and the first floor. I always go to the first floor because they're more modern. And in my office, it's on the same floor. So I just sat there minding my own business. I was in a stall in the closet door of the bathroom. So I can hear when someone enters or leaves. Very shy. The door stayed shut the entire time. It's a creaking wooden door with a giant glass panel. So when you open it, you can hear the creaking noise from the glass wobbling inside the wooden frame. All of a sudden, unprompted, the urinal just starts flushing. I just wondered, no one's entered the bathroom. Hmm, maybe the sensor just got bugged about. But I didn't even finish that thought and I hear the tap slightly open and water flowing from it. All right, somebody must have gotten in without me noticing. The tap closes gently and then silence. I specifically wait for the second of the door for it opening and closing, but nothing happens. So, well, I quickly finish my business. Get up and get out of the stall. The tap is still slightly open, so it dribbles just a bit. There's no paper in the bin from someone drying their hands, so I wash mine, completely close the tap, and get out. So I go back to my office, check which colleagues are in the building. It's December 29th, so naturally there's not a lot of people here today. Turns out I'm just not the only male coworker in the entire building. I'm also the only one on the entire floor. I also thought maybe it could have been a guest from one of the top people on the floor, but there's only one working on the top floor, and she's an online meeting the entire day. I think I saw my deceased son, and it makes me emotional. Months ago before moving to a new home, I began to wake up during the night and feel as if I was being watched. My wife miscarried our first kid. He was my first son, and I was shattered when it happened. 
Well, one night I woke up, not really sure what time it was. My wife was asleep and all the kids were sleeping. I check on them periodically. But being a father, I like to know my kids are safe and sleeping peacefully. I know my son was in the living room, gets nightmares, and I'll run in there and assure him that I'm there. However, the night I woke up, I faced the wall but felt this presence. I felt like I was being watched. I sit up instinctively and see the silhouette of what I thought was my son standing in the doorway. Hey buddy, you okay? Have a nightmare? No answer, but I saw the blonde hair and a smile and what dim lights came from the television that was in the living room. I begin to get out of bed and what I thought was my son dove around the door frame. I walk out of my room and see my son sound asleep. Buddy? My heart starts racing now as I approached my son, check to make sure he's sound asleep and not trying to fool me. Undoubtedly asleep, and I had no other sons then, I began to look around the house, but the image of my son in the doorway kept replaying in my head. What if it was my deceased son? Was he always watching? Nothing like this has happened since, but I can't shake the possibility that if it was him, it felt so broken. Bubble outline slash white shadow type figures. All of my life, I've seen what I call bubble figures. They are bubble, translucent outline or white smoke-like figures. A few months ago, I stumbled onto a post with similar experiencers, labeling them as cloaked alien beings. Those that made this declaration have seen the cloaked and uncloaked versions, allegedly. Before moving back to Texas in June, we lived in Alaska for three plus years, and for the majority of that time, a figure was always consistently at the end of my bed. Moving back to Texas, I see or feel one in the doorway of my current bedroom. I don't know if it followed me or if it was something new. I don't know if this is related or not, but due to intense sleep paralysis in my teens, I always sleep with the light on and I've always had vivid dreams. My dreams in Alaska and here in the beginning were so vivid and disturbing while happening practically every single night. It would be as if I woke up exhausted every morning from a full night of various run for your life scenarios. What I keep coming back to is consistency. There's always one consistently lurking in the same spot around my bedroom. Sometimes more show up, especially when I talk about them which is why I've spent my life pretending that I don't see them. I don't know how to find answers on my own. So, are they spirits, watchers, aliens, or something else? I look forward to hearing from those with similar experiences. Ask Reddit I don't know if this is paranormal or just flat out strange. When I was in high school, my next door neighbor and I were best friends. Just in front of our homes was a trailhead, and it led to a creek path that traveled for miles down to the city and up toward the mountains. I used to bike to school on it and walk my dog, a very common route that was safe in the daytime. My mom, however, like to warn me of going out on the trail at night, for there has been a history of murder and rape occurring on the path at night. Just the unfortunate kind of thing that happens on a public trail used by tons of people. So skipping forward a little, my friend and I were going to hang out one night. I had to get something inside my house, and he was going to meet me at the mailboxes in between our houses. As I opened the front door, I saw him staring down the street, yelling. When I shouted back, he 
turned to me with a shocked look on his face, turned back to what he was looking at. He came toward me and pointed toward the light post that's on our side of the street directly across from the entrance to the path. He thought that I was playing a joke on him, pointed out a person that was sitting beneath the lamppost with their head staring directly at the ground. The person's hair fell into their lap and they remained motionless. We called out several times to what seemed to be a woman, possibly drunk and taking a moment to herself, but she didn't move an inch. As we began to go inside to let her parents know, she stood up, keeping her head facing the pavement, and walked slowly across the street toward the entrance of the path. Terrifying Nightmare I usually slept around 2 or 3 a.m. because I'm a senior in college. Yesterday night I came back to my room really tired. I slept around 12.30 a.m. and had the weirdest dream. In the dream, I was traveling in a car with friends and cousins. We went to a large open place with lots of stores and food stalls. I got separated from the group. I was looking for them when a strange man walked toward me. His fist was closed as if he had something in his hand. He walked toward me and sprinkled and threw whatever he had in my face. It felt like liquid. I think it went in my eyes and I could feel some pain but didn't know why. The group of people I had come with found me. They had seen the strange guy and what he did. They suspected that he had done some black magic. <sighs> we hurried back to the car and go to a priest or someone who could help us. In the car, I could feel a voice inside my head telling me things like, You should die. There's no point in living. I told them that it was a female ghost asking me to take my life. I don't completely well, I don't completely remember how the ghost tormented me, but after some time I kept saying that the only way out is for me to kill myself. And as we were on the way, we lost our path and crashed into a tree. I don't completely recall what happened next, but I think the ghost had left my body towards the end of this dream. After that I woke up. Do such dreams mean anything? It was a very Vivid Nightmare Ask Reddit I grew up on a farm on the west coast of Scotland. This farm was on the top of a hill about three miles outside of the nearest village. The oldest part of the house, well, now used as the kitchen, along with the room above it. This part of the building had been continuously in use for at least, well, 500 years. Although there's evidence of people having lived on that spot for far longer, my older brother and I shared the room directly above the kitchen. We had a separate staircase for everybody else. Several internal doors separated us from the main house. These doors could not be opened silently. Our grandmother, who we lived with, she told us not to worry about the noises at night and that she thought the farm was haunted. We laughed it off to begin with, but I swear that once or twice a month we would be woken by heavy, fast-moving footsteps running up and down the old wooden stairs outside her bedroom door. Up and down, up and down, for around 20 minutes at a time late at night. Far too heavy and fast moving to be her grandmother. Sometimes the steps would pause, creaking on the floorboards outside her rooms for a minute or two at a time. We never ever left our room if we heard anything, and I'm still not sure what it could have been. It still spooks me out thinking about it. Got more spooky tales on growing up in a very old farm in Scotland, along with some of my grandmother's stories working in various old hospitals in Glasgow, if anyone's interested. Why? 
Why am I always seeing this man? I want to know what I should do. Today I've seen a shadow in my room. I don't know if it was light, because all of my lights were off, and it was dark. But I've been seeing paranormal stuff. For example, not too long ago I've seen this man in a trench coat and a hat, but I couldn't see his face. I went to search up what he was, and they said he was a sleep paralysis entity. But I was fully awake, and he didn't move and continued staring at me. Multiple of my family members have seen him, including my little brother who I've never spoken to him about the hat man, till I said I saw a man. My brother said that he did too, made a picture with a man in black with a hat on top. I was really freaked out, but I also remember seeing him when I was like four or five years old. I fell down a lot of stairs, but my mom specifically told me when me and my sister were upstairs, we were coming down when I felt a push, got knocked down. My sister tried holding me, but she also got pushed, and my mom rolled over and said that she saw a man on top of the stairs. I don't know if he's like following me or my family or if something is up, but it's really bothering me. And not to mention, my dreams have been really weird. For example, in my dream, I was at home when a dark shadow with white eyes started chasing me. And also my grandmother, who passed but was also in my dream, telling me that she was alive. I'm very confused and scared, but I'm thinking about getting baptized. Can anyone have an explanation for what's going on? I'm really scared. I can't sleep. My first time having sleep paralysis. The past few weeks I've been having horrible insomnia. I've been so tired that I'm having double vision. Chronic migraines have been happening every day. Just life in general has been pretty bad because of the lack of sleep. I finally got to sleep around 4 in the morning the other day. I don't even remember falling asleep, but as I was sleeping, I heard someone say, Hey, watch out! There's something on your back! I was home alone. I tried to move to see who was talking, but couldn't move. I couldn't even open my eyes. I started to really freak out when I suddenly felt something on my back. It wasn't super heavy, so my first thought was that I left the door open and my cat was on my back. But then I felt long claws scraping my neck. Claws much larger and sharper than that of my cat. The claws were just kind of running up and down my neck and spine. Not cutting, just scraping. Then I felt breath on my neck was heavy, and with every exhale I could hear a low growl and feel the wet breath on my neck. Finally I heard someone shout, go away, and the thing seemed to crawl off and I was able to move. I woke up at six. The bedroom door was still shut, so I know it wasn't my cat. I was so confused and freaked out. I've never had sleep paralysis before, and I'm assuming that that's what this was. But I don't know who was talking, but I heard the same voice throughout the day. I chalked that up to lack of sleep, and now I'm just hearing voices. Meeting my great-grandmother. When I was 11, I was at my grandparents' house one day. My grandmother called me into the kitchen because she made me soup. When I was about to start, well, taking it to the dining room, I suddenly felt as if I was in a trance. There was a woman in the doorway, but I couldn't see her very well because there was a bright light emitting from behind her. It was so bright that I could really only make out the bottom half of her. I could tell she was older because she had wrinkles and spider veins on her legs. She was wearing a floral dress and an apron. It was like I was looking at her under a magnifying glass. 
I could see every detail in her skin and every vein so clearly. She looked like she was moving her feet left to right, like you do when you're bored or tired of standing. She said to our grandparents' dog, who was staring at her intensely, Ella, come here, kept calling her name. Then I snapped out of my trance when I heard my grandmother calling my name. I asked my sisters and my grandmother if they saw a woman in the doorway. They said that they hadn't. And I know it wasn't my grandmother because she was in the kitchen with me and she wasn't wearing a dress. Later I told my mom what happened and she said her great-grandmother used to wear a floral dress all the time and also an apron and a rolling pin because she was always baking. She showed me a picture of her and she looked familiar. I'm now living in that same house and I get an uneasy feeling whenever I pass the doorway. My Ghost Story When I was five, my family moved houses. It was a big deal for us to move from the old cramped house to one that could fit our growing family. The farm near our development had been abandoned for nearly a decade at the time, and most every building had collapsed, save for two, the old farmhouse and the barn. For sake of privacy, I'm going to refer to the farm as the W.B. Farm. As I grew older, the farmhouse had become dilapidated, yet the barn still stood strong. The neighborhood kids always thought the place was haunted, and the older kids told stories of a woman looking through the second-story window of that house. There was no flooring in the house, as they discovered. My parents never wanted me near that place since I was dangerous, but I finally got my break when my friend's dog got loose. We searched and searched, and eventually got to the barn, which was the only structure left. The barn was massive, so the door didn't let much light spill in. We searched and searched, but we didn't find the dog. However, we did find something else much more disturbing. Animal bones had been left behind in a pile. Disturbed, we started to go when we heard a loud, disembodied voice telling us not to go. I don't think we had ran any faster in our lives before, never to return. And this year, everything left of the WB farm was raised. And I can't say I could have been happier to see it go. I was seven and experienced this nightmare. Several years ago, I had a single chore. It was to walk the dog in the morning and the afternoon. Every day I would do this as normal. Glancing at the other apartments as I was walking to the giant garbage bins behind the whole entire apartment complex and back. My absolute favorite thing to do as a seven-year-old girl was a profound love for felines, to pester the cat that belonged to one of the neighbors on the bottom floor. The cat would sit on the windowsill. You could never really see inside to see what was going on because the blinds on the right were always closed, and the other side of the window was the fluffy cat's paradise. Sometime in, I guess, maybe September, I was walking the dog again. And let me remind you, not a soul dared to put Halloween decorations up. These weren't decorations. I looked at the window to check up on my favorite little furry critter, but instead of seeing her, I saw what looked like a bald, wide-eyed man. His face was smushed up against the glass, and his face was as pale as paper without writing. His mouth wasn't open, and his face looked like something out of one of those circus things with the magic mirrors was all twisted and looked desperate. Like the idiot I was, I ran off, not bothering to check it out and see if it would do anything. When I was done, I returned as quickly as I could to find the man was nowhere in sight, and neither was the cat. I could still see the handprints and smudges, 
but he himself wasn't there. A connection? But when I told my mom about what I saw the little boy walk out of my sister's bedroom into my parents' room, she told me a story about a neighbor that lives a house down from us. She had told me that the lady's son had killed himself. I'm not sure why, but many people have said that he walks around in the streets and just stands in a spot. I haven't seen him, nor do I want to. Not only has my mom told that story, but my friend's mom has also seen that man in the streets. She told me that when her son was younger, my friend's little brother, they were outside talking to a family member and it was 7 or 8 p.m. Not sure the son was playing really, but while the mom was talking, but all of a sudden the son kept nagging his mom about a guy. The mom ignored the son, thinking he was just seeing a guy walking. It's normal in our neighborhood, but the little boy kept nagging and he kept saying, Look at the guy standing. So she finally took a look and the guy in the distance is just standing there. See, look, I'm not sure if she saw his face or anything. She didn't really specify, but... She went back to talking to the family member and when she looked back up, the guy was gone. By the way, I'm not sure if I'm missing some stuff. She told this story a long time ago. I just, this is what I remember about this story. And when I said that, it probably connects to the story I posted before because it might be the guy as a little boy just looking around because I haven't seen the little boy since. One of my many ghost stories. Just for some background information, I grew up in a reservation where ghost activity was fairly common, and my grandmother's house is known to be one of the most haunted houses on the res. Okay, now into the story. When I was around six or seven, I was sleeping in the living room with my brother, and I was already passed out. My brother began to hear footsteps coming down from the stairs the ones that led to the living room, and it was really late, so he was confused. Our living room didn't really have a wall toward the stairs. It was more like railings, so he'd be able to see who was coming down from the stairs before they made it all the way down. The footsteps made it all the way down the stairs, and there was no one there. We were often told that our passed away grandfather would traverse the house at night, and he thought this was him. My brother tried his best to not get scared, and watching TV while the footsteps kept walking up and down the stairs. Eventually he woke me up, just as a way to comfort him, but we both sat there and listened. Then all of a sudden the footsteps bolted up the stairs and back down, repeating this at least four times before we heard the steps go all the way upstairs and all the doors starting to slam. This woke up my grandmother and when she opened her door to see what was going on, it stopped. We explained to her everything that happened, and she believed us right away, like it already happened to her. Heard footsteps walking around at 3 a.m., Last week I was visiting family in Nicaragua. I was staying with them in a guest house in a room with my dad. The room has its own bathroom, and my cousin set like a divider and made my bed and my dad's their own little private room with the curtain separating them. My dad had the habit of waking up super early in the morning and making a lot of noise when walking to the bathroom. However, the night before our flight back home, I was awoken by the sound of footsteps walking around. My initial thought was, there he goes, up so early. I expected the light to be turned on, but they never did and kept pacing around. 
My second thought was, why is my dad just walking around with no flashlights and won't turn on the lights? I grabbed my phone that was on my bed and checked the time. It was 3.02 a.m. At that moment, I realized it wasn't my dad, and I laid frozen in bed. By 3.20, I heard some sound coming from my dad's side of the room, and I see a flashlight. I asked him if it was up. He said, yeah. Then he got up to go to the bathroom, and as he walked to the bathroom, his footsteps sounded lighter than what I previously heard. The footsteps sounded heavy and fast-paced. I told my dad about what happened, and he believes me, and so did my cousins and family members. They said they've also heard strange noises coming from that room, usually when it's empty. I'd never been scared, but that night put doubts in my mind. Something in my house mimicked my mother's voice. I'm 30 now. This happened when I was 16, and it's always stuck with me. I was playing some original Paper Mario one afternoon after school. As I was playing, I heard my mother call me from downstairs. LEDN42 Lead 42. Okay. So the false mother is saying his name, and his name he's posting as his Reddit title. Got it. I'm calling him Steve. Steve! I paused and called back. Yeah, what's up? False mother. Come down to the office, please. I need some help with something. Okay, I'll be right there. I said, good helpful son. I went downstairs to the office to find it empty. Confused, I went to the kitchen, my mother's bedroom, all the places he'd normally be. I went to the garage to find that her car wasn't even there. Hmm. Went to the living room to find my father reading the paper. I asked him where my mom was, and he said she wasn't home yet. I stood there for a while processing that information before my dad asked what was wrong. I told him that I definitely heard mom asking me for help in the office. He simply shrugged and said that he didn't know what to tell me, went back to reading his paper. So yeah, something called out to me in the voice of my mother asking for help. It's confounded me to this day. Ask Reddit One night when I was about 12, I was home alone with my dog. Shiner was unusually very calm and relaxed about everything. But tonight, she was acting a little antsy, so I opened the back door and let her outside. It was a nice night, so I stood out there with her. She was barking and growling at the end of the yard for some reason. I figured it was the neighbor's cat going under her shed again, so I went over there to calm her down. But when I was about halfway to her, the motion light pointed at the shed that it was flicked on. Shiner came running back to me, whining. She stayed between me and the fence and seemed to be trying to lead me away from it. I saw something move behind the shed. It stopped to where part of it was sticking out for a few seconds. And then it went to the rest of the way behind the shed. I have no idea what it was. The part sticking out from behind the shed was a few feet above the ground and just curved downward. It looked kind of like a pipe. My dog wouldn't go back outside the rest of the night. When I went to my bed, my bedroom was the closest room to the shed. She sat on the corner of my bed looking at that window all night. She would just stare out there and growl every so often. And every once in a while, the motion light come back on. For a few days after that night, Shiner would not go near the shed if I took her out of the fence. My home might be haunted. I often hear what sounds like people 
and they're walking above my bed. The only issue is that I'm on the top floor apartment and have two floors to myself. I will also hear what sounds like people walking above me when downstairs. I have three cats and one dog. I always check to see where they are. My dog is always with me. I don't see the cats making this kind of noise. I was outside once with my dog and oddly after watching a lot of spooky videos on YouTube, I saw a shadow person poke its arm out of the bush. Unless my neighbors are always dropping things and the walls are incredibly thin, I think my home is haunted. There's too many noises, too many weird cold and hot spots. I don't know if this is the right place to post this. How do I tell if there are spirits here? How do I go about engaging with them peacefully and learning? I once bought the Satanic Bible to read for information. I wanted to see what was so appealing to the black metal bands that I read about. It sat in the same place every night when I would go to sleep. My pup never messed with it until I got to the chapter on how to sell your soul. I woke up to a shredded book. Good dog. So I'm hesitant to mess with these kinds of forces without guidance. There's so much to read online, I was hoping somebody could point me in the right direction. Girl Ghost Crossing the Street During an Accident This has been this tragic story in my old town about a man who was hit by a drunk driver getting into his car from a store. It was extremely sad, and this person was well known by everyone. Future politician, blue-collared business owner, just a great guy. Apparently there was this beautiful girl who was crossing the street after this happened. She crossed over from where the accident was, was looking over from where that person was responding to. Most passers-by were vehicles and they didn't realize. They were more focused on the accident, but a good amount of people stated that they saw this girl. Even the first officer on the scene thought this girl was involved in the accident and was just waiting to give her statement. When he asked her where she was, people looked at him as if he was in shock. There was no girl. The man ended up dying on the scene and the girl vanished. But what's spooky is some nights, you'll drive by and apparently you might see her walking in that area or just staring at an old accident scene. This legend has grown in my town and more people are stating that they've seen this figure. What do you all think? My opinion is the fact that this man died right there, but who knows? Could have been an angel taking him to heaven, or maybe the people who saw have a better intuition than others. Anyone have anything similar? Girlfriend working in healthcare. Can a spirit have followed her to her apartment, and then mine? Short story, my girlfriend and I live separately. I pass half weeks there, she lives in her apartment in Montreal. We notice that her lunchbox, putted in the top of the fridge, dropped onto the floor of the kitchen a week ago. It was the second time I noticed it, it was weird. Maybe some shaking made it slip over time, because she's on vacation for a month. But it's kind of heavy too, so I don't know, it was weird. I spend the rest of the week at my place. I live in Laval, a city close to her. For Xmas, she came to my apartment for a couple days. She smokes outside, two days in a row after that she re-entered the apartment. We both hear a sound similar, like a window or door being shut. But it is, and we're in the living room next to that window door she used to go outside. The cat also hear it, because she fixed the door for a couple of times. So yeah, those weird things seems to be when my girlfriend is around. 
I game mostly in the evening for years in that apartment and never heard that sound before I would have noticed. My girlfriend works in emergency, so she'd deal with the death people. Maybe some spirits glued to her body and follow her. Ask Reddit. About three years ago, I was alone in my room. I was casually cleaning my old room when I took a glance outside my door. For context, my old house has a massively long hallway. The light on the end of the hallway was on, as was my bedroom light. The entire hall was at least somewhat illuminated. As plain as day, I could see a shadow peeking out at me from the other end of the hallway. Two things still stick with me to this day. First was the size. Based on how far I was from it, and in relation to the doorway, it was probably only three or four feet tall. The second thing was how vague the figure was. It's hard to put words to it. I could see the shadow clearly, but I couldn't perceive it. It sounds stupid, I know, but that's the only way I can describe it. If you've ever seen something that your brain doesn't want to see, you understand the feeling. It's almost as if you had a hard time focusing on the thing. I remember specifically stopping dead in my tracks and staring at it. After a solid 30 seconds, the figure ducked into the room it was peering out of. I went and checked the room. There were no signs of anyone being there funny part of it is, is that this is the only experience I've had. I've never noticed any paranormal before since that. I guess that one experience rattled me enough to stick with me through the years. That feeling on the stairs. Has anyone ever got the feeling when going up the stairs that there's something behind you? But nothing going down the stairs. In my hometown, a small little town in southeast Idaho, where I basically grew up, we had a house, and I swear there was something there, but only when I was going up. Despite whatever ability or whatnot to scare or sap paranormal stuff away, it was always there. When I went up to the stairs, never had a problem going down the stairs. Now, there was a problem at night when looking down. So when I was younger, I would never go down at night, scared to all hell of the dark and all. It isn't really the feeling of somebody in the closet or under the bed, though. Though the closet is a whole other bag of worms altogether. That feeds into a phobia I have of small, dark spaces. Anyhow, back to the story, I've never felt the same way about any other set of stairs in my life. Even old and creepy steps, they never bothered me like the ones in my own home. For context, the stairs in question are an inside set of steps that go down about 8 to 12 steps to a landing, then turn to the left one step down into the basement. Be it night or day, it always felt like something was behind me on the way up, and at night... There was something down there. Abandoned house on my old street. So I've just come across an article about an abandoned house on my old street. When I was younger, me and my mates would always say it's haunted. Me and one of my mates lived on that same street and had weird dreams and nightmares. I had a dream that we went inside. We fell through the floor onto spikes and died instantly. He had a dream that I walked inside and made no noise and never came out and never reappeared anywhere. This house is pretty spooky. I'm going to attach a photo of the main headline, and it'll give the caption as the link to the article. So the main points here I want to make. We saw two figures in the middle window of the house with glowing eyes staring at us as we stood across the street trying to decide who's going to knock on the door like the stupid kids we were. The 
the next is, whenever I did a paper route, at least when I was younger, I tried to avoid this house. I got told I still had to deliver there, so I did. I ran down the path, scrambled for a newspaper, put it in, and it was pulled from my hand through the letterbox. There was no noise on the other side of the door. This house has been abandoned for maybe 12 years at that point in time. Even as I got older, still freaked out by that house. Ask Reddit. I was a teenager. I went on a hike in south central Pennsylvania by myself in the Appalachian Mountains. It was the day I was playing hooky, so there was nobody else at the small trail, at least that I could see. You had to drive there and there was no foot traffic. I was young and had been talking and singing and horsing around the whole time, totally unconcerned. I was yelling things off the top of the mountain, and on my way down from the mountaintop, I heard my dad's voice call my name and ask for help. I thought I was having a stroke. I stopped and almost started to follow, thinking, what the fuck is my dad doing here? Did he follow me or something? Then I came to my senses, told myself, my dad is sitting in his office like an hour or more away. I heard it two more times in the space of about a minute or two, calling my name and telling me to come here and help me. It sounded so insistent like it was urgent, and it was without a doubt my father's voice. I never ran so fucking fast. I used to do this hike in bare feet, and I remember fucking my feet up hurrying down the mountain. Never went back, and to this day, don't know what the fuck that was. I immediately drove to my dad's office, and he was sitting at his desk working. <laughs> Presence sitting on bed. In the house we're living in at the moment, that we bought about ten years ago, it's happened on a few occasions. We felt a presence sit down at the end of the bed. At first, it happened to me only. After a couple of times of it happening, I told my partner, but he didn't really believe me, thinking I must just be imagining it, until it happened to him. He was having a nap, and then he didn't want to sleep in the room for a while after that. The scariest one was one morning. I was in bed alone. I was on the left side of the bed facing the right side, to which there is a large mirror on the wall. I was half asleep until I felt a presence sit down behind me on the edge of the bed, and it pulled down on the blankets that were covering me with the weight of a presence bearing down on them. I was afraid to open my eyes and looked in the mirror because I would be able to see if something was sitting behind me. After thinking about it for a few seconds, as much as I wanted to dart out of the bedroom, I slowly started to open one eye to see myself in the mirror. Then gradually looked upwards in the mirror to reveal absolutely nothing. I was relieved to not see something, but then terrified not knowing who or what was doing this. Now it hasn't done it for a while. Keep feeling like something is blowing on my hair. This is just a quick post to ask a question to see if anyone else has experienced this sensation. The past three events in a row, as I'm laying in bed, I suddenly get the hairs on my neck standing up and my shoulders hunch. Then it feels like something is exhaling on top of my head. It's not sleep paralysis as I'm fully awake when this happens. It literally happens about two minutes after laying down. It usually takes me an hour to get to sleep. It's not like a gentle blow, it's like a short, sharp exhale with a loud whoosh noise. I know this sounds bonkers, but my whole life I've experienced strange connections with the other side. Through physical reactions, or hearing people call my name, or them touching me in some way. 
haven't been diagnosed with any form of hallucination disorder, so I'm pretty certain that this is another form of communication with the other side. It also weirds me out because the top of my head is pretty inaccessible due to the layout of my room and bed. My room is in an L shape with the bed parallel to the door in the top right corner of the room. I sleep against the wall with my head almost on the corner, so unless something is in the wall I have no idea why this keeps happening. finally want to slash need to tell this story. So a while back in March and April, I was at a motel. It was me, my friend, and his girlfriend. They were on the bed. I was sitting on a chair at a desk, but facing the bed toward my friends. There was a mirror on the desk, a big one, and we had the bathroom door open with the light on. So we had better lighting in the room. You could see the bathroom mirror in the desk mirror where I was sitting, but you couldn't see the desk mirror in the bathroom mirror. If you're looking at the bathroom mirror from the desk mirror, I'm being specific as to allow people to make that scene in their mind. I kept seeing, sometimes blatantly, but mostly out of the corner of my eyes. Chaotic yet symmetrically moving wisps in the bathroom mirror. Cloudy things. Small, but almost seemed like they were materializing from them. Both looked right at the bathroom mirror and looked at it from the desk mirror. At one point it looked like a face and was pulsating into existence. Then I saw behind me out of the corner of my eye and also when I turned around for like 10 seconds, a straight up reaper dude, or like a dementor looking thing. Like one of those things from Lord of the Rings, I'll never forget it, and it growled at me. Suspected dead friend reached out to me. So I was trying to fall asleep. I was half asleep, and then something started putting thoughts and images into my head. Like I could clearly tell that they weren't my own thoughts. And something was, well, trying to telepathically communicate with me. It was a scary and distorted image of a face. It appeared as a thought in my head. I don't remember what it said exactly, but basically that it's from someone who I think is dead, but they're still alive and I need to go see them immediately. The thoughts didn't mention any hints of who this is about or where I needed to go, but a person came to my mind immediately. A friend who committed suicide a few months back. And somehow I instinctively knew exactly where I needed to go to a particular abandoned building where I used to hang out sometimes. I didn't go because I really wasn't a safe place to go to by myself late at night alone. And I was frankly very terrified of this whole thing. But I regret not going for some reason, even though it would have been a terrible idea. I still wonder what would have happened if I had went. I wonder if I'll ever try to communicate with me again. Dreaming my daughter's dreams. Okay, this is weird. My daughter, Eleven, has had nightmares or at least very intense dreams for years. I, on the other hand, never remember my dreams. Okay, Gecko, relax. Except on the occasion where she crawls into bed with her mother, and I sleep in her bed. Then I always dream very vividly. Last night this happened again, and I had two nightmares with a storyline that's very fitting of what my daughter would have. Well actually fears that she has. I mentioned this to my wife and she says this happens to her as well. She sleeps in my daughter's bed. In the years this has happened, she's switched rooms, beds, mattresses, and, well, everything, multiple times. I'm a pretty level-headed guy, but my gut feeling is telling me something is afoot. 
Any insight from any angle would be welcome. I mean, it's not truly a bad thing, but my spidey sense is tingling. Anybody else believe almost all paranormal phenomena is linked together? I saw Bigfoot as a child and would have told you for most of my life that it was a flesh and blood creature. But after going down the UFO rabbit hole, I found myself genuinely believing that most encounters from ghosts to cryptids, UFOs, and everything in between are actually our brains trying to make sense out of experiencing some kind of interdimensional being. The Ariel School incident is a prime example as what each child saw was informed by their own cultural beliefs and worldview. Many Bigfoot encounters have strange lights and orbs, and even instances of them seemingly vanishing behind an impossibly thin tree. If you've seen Interstellar, that puts forth what I believe most ghosts are in some way, as in something a dimension above us interacting within our dimension. I don't know what subreddit to put this on, as people seem to be unusually vehemently disagreeing, but, or usually vehemently in disagreement, I believe they meant, or they think I'm just taking the piss out of them. Exiting the Simulation Short, sweet, and to the point. Last night, while sleeping, I woke up in a dream to a location that seemed more real and more tangible than our current reality. Albeit brief, I felt more alive waking up while in the dream than I do now. When I came in my dream, I just was blindfolded, and then there were people there who were aware that I was awake. I sat up in a panic and they said, You're not supposed to be here they shoved me back down into the dream. Being thrust back into the dream caused me to wake up into our current reality entirely befuddled. I've experienced sleep paralysis and I've also experienced what I believe to be an alien abduction, which I've shared before. I'm not sure what any of this means or if it means anything at all, other than the fact that I want to go back to wherever that was. That didn't feel like a dream felt more real than what I'm experiencing right now, typing this out. I don't know. Camp Capilano, Vancouver, BC Haunting So when I was growing up, I would spend some of my spring breaks at a cabin in North Van, near Capilano. We called the cabin camp Capilano, and I would go at the local community center. I believe the cabin we went to was in the 1992 movie, To Grandma's House We Go. It was the house the grandmother lived in. But anyways, I had stayed at this cabin multiple times with this group, and we had other kids, and we stayed there with our leaders also. We had always all slept together in the side of the cabin that had a quote-unquote boy sign on the door. Never really thought anything of it, but the last year that I ever went to that camp, we stayed in the girl's side. I had thought the cabin felt sad and strange to begin with, but for some reason sleeping on the side we left empty the previous years gave me anxiety. 